Audible Studios presents The Battle, Book 5 of the Play to Live series, written by D. Rus, performed by Michael Goldstrom. Chapter 1 Game Menu Activating Broody Henskill System Language Calling a Series of Scripts Hardware Usage Allocating 0.08% of Server Resources Loading World Metrics Locating a Soul for the Newborn Creature Negative Response Spawning Consciousness from the Void's Amorphous Pool An Echo Passed Through the Virtual Worlds No Response there wasn't a single being or avatar powerful enough to break through the barrier. Roar! The risen creature's solemn roar shattered the temple's stained glass windows. The basilisk froze for a moment, hearkening to the sounds of the astral world, then uttered a sorrowful moan. Alone! Alone in the entire world! Only somewhere far east! Several days' walk from here glimmers the spark of the unborn king in need of service and protection. An emotional upsurge of such proportions made the mighty creature suffer, whereas it would have killed off any smaller creatures, or it might have turned them to stone, as in the basilisk's case. It was just like when whales turn insane from the sonar sounds of submarines and cast themselves onto the shore just how flocks of birds get their brains baked when hit by the AAA's anti-missile radiation. The thousands of intelligent parasites swarming under the basilisk's feet suddenly became enraged. Hundreds of them got stomped into the royal stone, but the rest showed their nasty attitude. Steel glistened as they swung their blades, the background magic rose twofold, causing burning pain. A swing of the mighty tail finished off the weaklings. The flashing eyes behind the impenetrable transparent film cast fear into the minds of the enemy, slowing their attack. The basilisk rose to its full height, its shoulder blades pressing into the dome of its stony trap. With difficulty, it turned its armored muzzle to the east. Ancestral duty called. To defend the king, that was its first priority. The walls reinforced with magic shook, but did not give. Yet the damage from the irritating little insects could no longer be ignored. Roar! The furious basilisk used a badass ability from its abundant arsenal of skills. The astral echo beefed up the ancient magic. It liquefied molecular bonds, damaging the ammunition and sharply interrupting all enemy attacks. Thousands of arrows dug into the armor. Drops of colored poison bubbled and sizzled on the scaly hide. The sticky flame reluctantly flowed down the giant body, burning right through the monster's flesh. The background magic rose beyond all reason. The portals to the divine abodes hummed loudly. The monster's spine quivered with the resonance of the high circle spell. The basilisk intuitively pressed up against the farthest wall of the cramped prison. Kaboom! Its eardrums popped. The flash momentarily blinded it. The massive mithril ground muscle and bone. But all for the best, the spell knocked out most of the annoying foes. The hail of falling stones cleared an escape path. Dragging its broken limb, the basilisk made for the opening. Its precious blood stained the ground, seeping through the smoldering armor. The basilisk tore its way through the city like a mutilated battleship pursued by an enemy mosquito fleet. Low-ranking wizards and warriors fell by the dozen from the windows of the collapsing buildings. Portals opened here and there. Hundreds of creatures poured from them, small yet far from harmless. Survival instincts against the call of duty. The basilisks would stop at times to shake off a pack of enemies, sending several to meet their maker. The rest it chased away. Then the monster would turn to the east again and head toward its king. But its pace was slackening. It had almost made it out of the damned dant hill, but its weary muscles could no longer carry the several thousand pound body. The monster fell. 
bringing down a chunk of the outside wall along with one of the gate towers. Forgive me, master. I have failed you, was the basilisk's last thought, picked up by the astral world. Game menu. Generating world event message. System language. Ending scripts. Hardware usage. Allocating 0.08% of server resources. Loading world metrics. Analyzing the creature's actions and its impact on the alter world. Adding mental vectors of the immortal. New entity accepted. Soul disembodiment denied. Awaiting respawn. Echoing through the virtual worlds. No resonance. I stood in the castle's inner yard, legs far apart as I tried to keep my balance. The ground shook after the deafening boom. What a blast that was. We really outdid ourselves this time, judging by how the enemy's undermining of the sorry ammunition fell through. Perhaps there is no such thing as the sun god in the altar world? I quickly pulled up the interface, checked the stats, then switched to the religious resistance tab. Everything was still the same on the dark side. The first temple with its Makaria and a level four altar. Also Loth's and Ole's sanctuaries, plus three temples unassociated with any particular divinity that had never been found. Finding those temples was a high-priority task, too. They could have been hidden in the blind zones, concealed from the all-seeing eye of the Fallen One. I gotta ask the Fallen One, I thought. Might Tavor's former lair be one of the lost temples? At the bottom of the stats was something of the highest importance to many players. The 9% experience bonus for all of the Dark Pantheon's allies. Unlike us, the Lightsiders had updates. And it wasn't that some of their six gods had left the Altar World or vanished in the Great Nothingness, as I had hoped. Moreover, even the busted-up Temple of the Sun God still counted as theirs, meaning they had fourteen total, and that indicated that the heart of the temple, its altar, had not been destroyed. Still, we'd messed it up good. The altar in the Sun God's main temple went down five levels, from six to one, but we needed more than dumbass physical attacks to bring this sanctuary down, perhaps some kind of dark-ass desecration ritual or an immense expenditure of magic. So from that day on, all of the Sun God's followers were in for an epic fail, minus 5% experience. Might seem like nothing at first, but multiply this baby by tens of millions of players and myriads of mobs that were getting taken out daily, and that's the kind of immensity that makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up. And I liked it. Gotta expand the newly earned experience and make the Pantheons financially equal, I thought. I'll send Bada Boom to all accessible temples of light to slash their levels down to something pathetic. It was a good idea, but way too fresh to put into action. It needed a careful thinking through and strategizing. The twitching staff distracted me from planning and digging through the interface. Looks like we just found ourselves a bigger fish to fry. Tossing my head, I focused on what was going on in the world. What I saw made my eyes widen with amazement. Suddenly, I knew why everything had gone silent. The demon soul trapped within the staff's crystal had already utilized the divine blood staining the blade. The staff's adamant tip shone like a polished nail. Man, that thing was insatiable. The pink blade struggled to reach the ruby-colored drops on the shaft. It trembled and writhed, like a dog trying to dig a nasty flea out from underneath its shoulder blade. I didn't risk looking at the staff's specs. The first attempt was enough. When the chain of error messages had given me gray hairs and almost made me wet my pants. No thanks. Let the enemies freeze up instead when they try to check out the first priest's new badass weapon. The staff's greediness really showed how priceless divine blood was in the altar world. Down with squeamishness. How many chances does one get to rub out the sun god and claim the precious ingredient? But as I reached for the thickening drops of blood, the sudden roar and the swing of the staff's tip made me pull my hand back as fast as my borrowed agility would let me. 
Another instant, and my precious fingers would have been all over the dusty pavement. You never want an adamant wound. Trust. My own fear, combined with the prospect of becoming handicapped and the resistance of the asshole demon, made me fly into a rage. I lost it. I took it all out on the staff, both my frenzy and all the pressure that had built up over the past few days. Are you nuts, you fucker? Attacking your own master? Damn your dirty little soul! Don't count on my mercy. I'll stick you into a pile of seraphim shit, so that's all you'll have left to suck on for the rest of eternity. Yeah, I picked up a few things from Asmodeus. The staff realized what it had done and began to tremble. It uttered a high-pitched whimper and even tried to maneuver its tip in a puppy-like attempt to lick my hand. That's right. I chilled out, regaining control of my emotions. I reached cautiously for the black shaft to pat its sticky exterior. It was heavily stained after the brutal sword fight. Shreds of different creatures' skins and chunks of innards were dangling from it. Came designers, a plague on both your houses, lovers of high detail and dismemberment. I remembered personally checking every box in the user agreement and the scroll bar tracking the position of my pupils. Everything had been recorded to the last minute detail and verified with my very own digital signature. But that lump in my throat. I just wanted to puke. Quit shaking, I whispered quietly, regretting having snapped at the staff, especially in the presence of subordinates. I looked at my palm. Surely that cocktail had a drop of divine blood in it. Otherwise, why had the staff gone berserk? I carefully took the hairs out of the scarlet mess. Then, grinding my teeth, my intentions genuine and honest, I licked up the chunky jumble. Status alert! You have once again tasted divine blood, yet another particle of divine essence will remain with you forever. You shall surpass the other mortals even more in your skills and abilities. But beware of arrogance and don't deem yourself equal to the gods. The stairway to heaven is long and fragile. Some even think it has no end. My lips involuntarily spread in a triumphant smile. Thank you, sun god. I wonder what's going to happen if I drink the blood of all the altar world's gods. Should I complete my collection, so to speak? I looked around smiled and waved to my worried-looking mother. She stood by the sandbox, awkwardly pretending to be looking after the kids from the last perma-bunch. I had already gotten word from the officers that she was well. She had recovered from her captivity shock and was avidly trying to maintain the Iron Lady image, being the mother of the clan leader. The first temple no longer resembled a giant transformer. Gone were the ear-wrenching hum and the pillars of the immensely powerful magic streams. We had beaten the enemy's astral attack. The lookout by the altar shared an amusing screenshot. A trio of weary gods taking turns downing dwarven extra dry from a weirdly glowing bottle. A little stress relief. Like most of the contemporary AIs, the 311th one had been trained in a Russian-speaking family. Thus, our national character had rubbed off on it somewhat. Do you know a single Russian movie where they don't show clinging glasses and booze being poured for everyone? I bet not. Anyway, it was about time for me to get a physical damage immunity for my precious self. My thoughtful gaze settled on my troll bodyguard. Hit me, Snowy! The albino troll nervously shuffled his feet squeezing his wonder club, which had been blessed by the power of three gods. That thing could have taken me out in just one hit. Alas, a double-handled smashing weapon was by far not the most common in the game. It could have resulted in me getting an immunity from clubs and giant hammers only. That wouldn't have been so bad, but there were other things I wanted protection from. A hail of arrows, for example. It always pissed me off that I had to hide my ass behind my shield and shrink into a ball when under fire. And so did catching red-hot presents from a pack of snipers with my forehead in the heat of the battle. Wait, I said to Snowy, who heaved a sigh of relief.
Glancing around, I spotted that omnipresent goblin. The limping Tamerlane had his crossbow cocked. Its bolt twinkled dimly with green light. Praised be the game conventions. Never would a weapon fire an accidental shot into an ally's gut. Never would the bowstring become damp and loose. Never would the shaft lose its elasticity. Tamerlane, shoot me! Snap! Stinging pain shot through my kneecap. The goblin had instantly obeyed the order without a second thought. I bet he enjoyed it, too. And why the knee? To avenge his limp? Thanks, I said hoarsely, watching as the bolt slowly disappeared, leaving behind a bloody, smoking mess of flesh and bone. No biggie. Regen's taking its course. Should heal soon. I clicked out of the poison and a light half-hour wound alert, then greedily read the next pop-up window. Status alert. The divine essence particle is reacting to the first hostile impact and is dissolving in your aura in order to preserve itself and its bearer. Partial long-range weapon immunity received. Damage reduced by 70%. Chances of getting a crit and an injury are reduced threefold. Partial poison immunity received. Damage reduced by 20%. Shit, I should have told Tamerlane to swap that alchemy-ridden bolt for a regular one. Then the whole bonus would have been applied to physical damage only. Oh well, never insult luck by telling her that the chest of gold she has made you stumble upon could have been bigger. Overall, this shit kicked ass. I took screens of the system messages, forwarded them to my teammates, Krill, Orcus, Widowmaker, and the Analyst. The guys had all taken cover in the castle in light of a code orange threat. The instant I got back from my mission, they gathered around me, ready to report. They were eager to congratulate me. But instead, they got to watch a play called The Taming of the Rebellious Staff, an adaptation for vampire audiences. I had to make my gang quit their stupid staring and join the bloody show. So I retracted the adamantine tip with a quiet rustling sound and held out the grimy staff for the boys to look at. Hurry! The divine blood is already thickening and turning into crystals. Soon you'll be munching sand. As always, the analyst was the first. He walked up to me, cautiously reached for the evil, hateful staff, and passed his hand over the shaft. I nodded encouragingly. Eat it. Don't be chicken. The analyst exhaled sharply, as if about to knock back a shot of Everclear. He licked the tar-like crimson substance off his palm. His eyes sparkled with delight. This shit's working, guys. Have some. Yo, Tamerlane, stab my liver. I hate those stealth bastards who sneak up on you and slice you to ribbons. Ouch. Cut the wiggling. Thanks, bro. My teammates clamored as they crowded around the nervously growling staff, pawing it like it was some kind of hot babe. Luckily, all the innards had evaporated by now, leaving but five dark stains on the shaft. Divine artifacts have longer lifespans than the bloody FX. I bet the technogenic archaeologists from the distant future will get a chance to excavate this colossal scarlet diamond. Things like these don't just disappear. Unless the white whinny swipes them, obviously. Oh, speaking of albinos... Snowy pried the last dried-up blood drop off the staff. Carefully holding it in his fist, he looked at me pleadingly and asked, It's for Bamba. May I? Overcoming greed, I nodded and smiled encouragingly. Sure, Snowy. You deserve more than a weekly handful of gold. The troll blushed, turning black, and shrugged. I don't need much. Just to make Bamba happy. She just keeps getting prettier. Got twice as big around the waist. But her temper's getting worse. She's so unrestful. Rushing about like a cave ogre. I struggle to keep her entertained. Holy shit. I scratched my nose thoughtfully. Might that ex-old lady actually be expecting? What now? Don't be surprised if you suddenly see little spotted baby trolls running amidst the kindergartners, right? Wow. The staff was immaculately clean again. My clanmates were discussing the pros and cons of different immunity types. 
tough call, I must admit. Frankly, divine blood was the most precious of ingredients. Its possible auction price terrified me. Alas, the blood was also perishable. I yawned, trying to sort out my moral principles. Should I switch from the holy hemoglobin to the uniquely crafted crystal? Bah! My vials, which had once been filled with Makarian blood, were already jingling with the luxurious stuff. Why not catch one of the gods, throw him in the press, and squeeze him dry? Or, better yet, trap a few dozen gods. Yeah, so the whole clan can become immune to the four magical elements and all sorts of stabbing and hacking weapons. Then we will tell the entire altar world to suck it. Thankfully, I personally didn't need that. But I wasn't the only one capable of getting such a sick idea. I recalled Tavor pickling a personal god in a glass container. Thinking of that lunatic raised a whole new series of questions. Was it possible to seize a castle that had lost its master? Was I rotten enough to squeeze the magic blood out of a helpless god? And what did the fallen one have to say about that? Wow, knowledge is a pain in the ass. Bada Boom caught my attention. He was coming from the portal hall where all the clan members had a respawn point. He was wearing the default clan outfit, a pair of pants and an undershirt issued to anyone who got respawned in their diaper after yet another death. Bada Boom had a pensive look on his face. He was focused on the internal interface, ticking off his achievements on his fingers. Child Slayer, Widowmaker, Invincible, Enemy of Faith, God's Personal Enemy, Executioner, Elite Executioner, Unmercenary, Holy Unmercenary. He nearly bumped into me as I grabbed his shoulder and said, You keep that last one to yourself. It makes our clan stronger if we're the only ones to know about it. While the others are too scared to put on their best gear in PvP, our warriors come out on top. No equipment can be lost with these stripes. Seeing his absent stare, I shook him. Bada boom! You follow? Huh? Yes, sir. Of course, sir. Thank you for your trust. Just jumped up nine levels and got loaded with artifacts. But I'm screwed outside the clan. I'm on everyone's KOS list, and that includes all of the light leaders and their followers. I smiled. Don't be chicken. We're all wanted men here, but together we're strong. That's how we prevail. Ready for another big bang? The warrior's face spread in a contented smile. He stood up straight and saluted in the old French manner with two fingers. Sir, yes, sir. Requesting permission to hit the armory for ammunition. Granting permission to rest while that gravestone pops up in the cemetery. The analyst and Widowmaker can plan our course of action. We'll most likely act at once, during X hour, or else we might scare Lightseas prematurely. Then they'll block off their temples. Bada boom, thank you for your service. An honor. I nodded gladly, then turned to the others. Analyst, Widowmaker, know what you gotta do? Get the basics down by tonight. I'll go see the Fallen One, then it's my off time. Don't wake me, don't touch me, and drag me out first in case of fire. The warriors must keep watch, bunch of lazy asses. Here I am. Two feats of heroism in a day, while they're jacking off. Enough! Sleepy time's granted after the all-clear signal. At ease! The fighters quickly left. I winked at Orcus, who secretly gave me a thumbs up. That's how we roll. Happy with my day and my own ignorance, I headed to the temple. I had a few questions for the Fallen One. For instance, was he willing to donate blood to create the juggernaut uber golem? Because my divine blood supply just went bye bye. Chapter 2 Over the course of the last month, residents at number 18 were enjoying the unusually silent nights, sleeping like babies. The gray panel high rise suddenly seemed like it was no longer in an industrial neighborhood. Gone were the illegal immigrant workers who had occupied the basement and evaded all eviction attempts by employing their cunning tricks. The few bums wintering in the attic had disappeared, 
taking with them their bouquet of aromas, which often intermixed with the heavy smell of the damp stairwells. Something had also forced the rowdy, violent teen gangs off the inner yard. Avoiding each other's gazes, the little brats had agreed that it was better to get wasted in the next-door park instead. Not that the pressing sense of fear, the fleeting shadows at night, or the sudden disappearance of their three buddies had anything to do with it. About five hundred people in the city were declared missing every month, so another half a thousand missing reports really made no difference, especially since the deathly ashes spell worked great on the bodies that had been sucked dry, turning them into inconspicuous waste piles. All in all, the vampire's pride was safe. Sure, a truck had indeed killed a young bloodsucker. The smokescreen magic had worked just right. The driver hadn't seen the vampire who'd been blinded by the headlights. The vehicle imprinted the vamp into the pavement. Having no soul is not always a good thing. The vampire's identity had dissolved in the Earth's gigantic infosphere. The planet's exhausted magic resources left him no chance of reincarnation. A few days later, a sneaky warrior decided to use the humming power lines as a tightrope. He burned up. His charred body dropped to the ground. Then a ranger vanished without a trace. He had descended into the mysterious dungeon marked with a symbol of two glowing green hills. Living in the concrete technogenic megalopolis cost the clan the pseudo-lives of its fledglings. But the nest's other half fattened rapidly on the countless herds of unsuspecting low-level wildlife. Thankfully, the vampires received XP not only from the ranks of their victims, but also from simply drinking from sentient beings. Yet it wasn't that long ago that the clan had been facing a grim future. Trapped on the frontier and put on a farming conveyor belt, so to speak. All the vamps had been deposed to their starting level and were being slaughtered for their precious loot. The blood-filled vials, the alchemic ingredients, the slowly disappearing treasures of the ancient nest, all of this fully covered the temporary expenses of the few dozen immortal occupying the valuable dungeon. The clan's patriarch, having respawned during a routine genocide, found an exceptionally rare loot around his neck. The unbreakable portal amulet. The precious trinket was supposed to fall into players' hands, but the ancient vamp had been in close contact with the immortal for a while now. He had made up his mind to organize a rebellion. The NPC controlling algorithm smoked and smoldered, set ablaze by the creator's spark of one of those inconspicuous humans with dreamy, dazzlingly blue eyes as he reached for the amulet. The patriarch already knew how to respond. The mental call of kin did the job. All the fledglings formed an impenetrable wall around the clan leader. They shot one last piercing, hateful look at their tormentors. The amulet was activated. Due to the lack of a bind point, the vamps got evacuated to a random location. Who would have known that the once strong veil separating the two worlds would come apart like that? It now seemed a mere rotten curtain rather than an unsurmountable barrier. The randomizer coin had been tossed and set edgewise, casting the rebellious clan into a different dimension. It turned out to be a stone anthill flooded with magic lights. Thousands of glowing bars, myriads of unsuspecting warm bloods flickered before the vamp's infrared night vision eyes. The clan, excited from the battle, and still suffering from the transportation shock, dove into the pleasant moistness of the nearest crypt. The crypt's narrow-eyed dwellers put up no resistance. They served as a decent food supply for the first week of the vampire's adaptation period. By the time the piles of the paralyzed on the cold concrete floor began to cough quietly and die off from an unexplained fever, the clan's rangers had already familiarized themselves with the neighborhood. In just a month, the nest was preparing for the blood ritual. The youngest fledgling picked out a midnight bride for himself. The unattractive, pale girl would stand by the open window for hours, even though the weather wasn't great. 
she'd stare at the pavement flooded with moonlight, unable to take the final step. At last, a bat alighted soundlessly on the windowsill. It stared firmly into the girl's eyes, instantly crushing the warm-blooded creature's weak will. The bat then scurried to the girl's hands, which were white from the cold. Its short, symbolic bite left the clan's mark on the hand of the future bride. Not that this was necessary. Anyone who might have competed with the vamps was now on the other side of reality. But good things don't tend to last long, the patriarch knew. He was wise and experienced. Thus the nest quickly marked its territory, grew in strength, and swarmed the land in search of a better cover. The world which had been created half in jest, now matured, rose to its feet, and turned its heavy warning gaze to its creator. I stopped halfway to the temple. My pointy ears caught the sound of shuffling feet and someone's barely audible muttering. Grim! I dashed behind the Malorn tree. Shit, he'll see me for sure. I punched the trunk where the magic tree's liver was supposed to be. Hide me, bitch! The tree grunted. Its branches creaked, its embroidered leaves rustled, and with surprising agility, formed a solid wall. The old goblin hurried past, dropping scrolls and dripping ink onto the marble path. My first mentor must have gotten word about our triumphant return, and was now eager to make it go down in history. Grimm had come to consider himself not only a leader, but also the foremost chronicler of the Path of Darkness. Alas, the clan, the allegiance, and of course the first priest, were all of great interest to the homebred parchment waster. Go figure where he got this ingenious idea. By now, there were at least a dozen grateful clanmates hunting the clown. They had all been mentioned in his scribbles. Grimm wrote with the speed of C-3PO, while his attention to detail and fastidiousness surpassed those of an IRS worker. Don't get me wrong. It's flattering to go down in history. Perhaps these parchments will be worth a fortune in a thousand years, unless, of course, they're mistaken for mythology or folklore. Myths of the Dark Pantheon, or the Thirteen Feats of Max the Damned. Not bad. The unexpected delay proved fatal. As I raced up the stairs to the first temple, hurriedly saluting the guards, the sound of three portals popping open reached my ears. Don't tell me the gods have taken off for their gorgeous away land. Shit, of course they have. The throne was empty. An overturned bottle rolled down the stairs. The sparks of divine presence slowly whirled through the air. Well, gotta work with what you have. I hastily went through the inventory. Must get the vials and fill them up with the precious stuff. It had become more difficult to pull up the inventory window, a side effect of going perma. The bag itself would appear when summoned, no problem at all but the convenient menu with its tiny sections and icons was slowly fading away, just like the compass, quick slots, and other stuff that didn't work with real-life physics. Already I had to strain my willpower to the utmost for an entire minute to get that window to pop up. Honestly, it was easier before by hand. The perma-veterans said promising things, though. The inventory itself would stay, as would the intuitive knowledge of its contents. Making the desired object pop into your hand was but a matter of practice. Damned optimists. Living in the now. What about a hundred years from now? Everyone carrying a five-ton bag on their back with a real flesh-and-blood greedy pig on top? Yikes! Of course, the altar world was nowhere near reality yet. But flesh and bone was creeping in, forcing out its magical and the otherworldly aspects. The rising universe was casting away the unnecessary, struggling to fulfill the game designer's wicked fantasies, strengthened by the player's hardened faith. And I, a man who had twice felt the freezing cold of the cosmos in his soul, was not at all convinced that we could get what we wanted without some form of retribution. Every digitized flea, every physical constant broken by someone's unbending will, 
and every magic law imprinted into the game metrics sucked the strength out of millions of its micro-creators, bit by tiny bit. After a few minutes on all fours, I filled eight whole vials with the sparks. Great luck. I'd almost run out. Just yesterday I had been scraping the stuff off the bottom of the last vial. This was no way to go, considering that the astral mana absorption scrolls were going to play a vital role in the upcoming skirmish. The portal to Inferno was in demand as well. Guess the Koreans had it tough and had to resort to magic at last. Or it could be that the virtual press had leaked a premature article on the First Temple's Guardian's Brave Battle with Demonic Legions. The screenshots kicked ass. Thousands of different level monsters filling everything up all the way to the horizon. And our line of attackers, a few hundred strong. Hail to the insanity of the Valiant! The final screen was meant for those who doubted our victory. Another field, bestrewn with the shredded remains of monsters. In the foreground, the warriors excitedly discussed how to split the countless loot. The new gear they donned testified to a high abundance of war trophies. Starting tomorrow, the numbers of those interested in joining our clan will grow immensely. I can see it. I stashed the unbreakable vials as deep as I could into the inventory, then looked around for more. Had the drunk gods left a few trifles for their followers, by chance? Everything was empty, as if a horde of pillager goblins had passed through. Just empty glassware. Hmm, did I say empty? Why is it glowing, then? I carefully picked up an unexpectedly weighty vessel. There was a little liquid at the bottom, not more than a few fluid ounces. I looked closer. Astral bastard. Alcoholic drink. Two servings. Take a bottle of dwarven extra dry. Add a bundle of burthorn from the third heaven, mix well with divine power, and infuse for ninety-nine years. If you're lucky, you'll end up with a pitiful imitation of the fallen one's creation. Effect, opening of an additional astral channel. Respective mana flow, increase. Duration, random, depending on celestial body positions and solar wind gusts. Hmm, nice little trifle. I could see why the fallen one created this concoction, but I didn't need it. The altar restored my mana faster than I could ever use it up. Nine hundred points per second. But it'd be a shame to waste a perfectly good bastard. I carefully poured it into vials. The divine drink barely filled, too. Just as the prompt had promised, the minimum dosage of any elixir is about one fluid ounce. I looked at the vials and smiled. At least they might come in handy as two neon light sticks. Now I could walk about caves surprising bats. Yet the irony put my thoughts back on their usual track. The thing is, the admins had looked far into the future. The gaming project is expensive, and it must persist as long as possible, drawing one generation of gamers after another. The AI and the intricate algorithms were constantly producing new lands. Monsters leveled up to match the gamers' levels. Distances from major cities were generated randomly, adjusting to whatever group entered the dungeon. Monetary incentives were implicit in the long-standing gaming industry. Farmers were painstakingly restoring the perennial plantations. Crop yields grew, as did the trees. New species were being bred as if Mendel himself was at work. Even the doughnut and mango cantaloupe trees soon ceased to surprise. The game included mutation and hybrid-creating mechanisms from the start. If you could secure decent mana and gold flows for your experiments, more power to you. Produce all you want. Yet creating something useful and capable of survival was akin to winning a lottery. Although this didn't discourage the scores of self-reliant adventurers. Not long ago, one dumbass had managed to breed an almost exact replica of roasted sunflower seeds, the ultimate Russian snack. And now several areas of the Russian cluster were littered with the shells of the damn things. Plus, a stupid side effect— they took four times as much time to decompose as regular trash. And how addictive, these seeds! Stylish and tasty, they also restored one health point each. Certain rodents 
jumped aboard the health train and would restore a hundred HP per minute by speed-biting the seeds. The admins had clever traps in other areas besides agriculture. The best mounts took years to mature and receive proper training. No gray store-bought horse could be a match for a full-grown three-year-old Mustang. The demand for these fine-bred stallions greatly exceeded supply. The cattlemen's short-sightedness was to blame for this. They'd overlooked the fact that very few buyers had the money and patience to care for a herd year after year. Virtual farming gradually went from being an object of ridicule to a career that evoked envy. The process itself wasn't anything out of the ordinary or particularly fun. Get up, start the game, shovel manure, feed the horses, and give the sick ones magic potions. Then, it's off to the field, and after that, boring training. But it was all worth it. Moscow and Beijing were filled with the first Porsches and BMWs from the suddenly rich digital horse manufacturers. And pigs? You could get a big roll of skins, a load of ingredients, and a thousand servings of first-rate bacon from just one well-fed hog. The developer's prudence and imagination never ceased to amaze. A neutering option had been programmed in and was used for selling animals abroad. A whole Versailles drama could unravel around the acquisition of a non-sterile elite breed. Crafters hadn't been left out either. The cleverly hidden steel was being worked on in the swamps and the few places of power. It acquired new characteristics every day. In the real world, intricate smelting, forging, and blade sharpening could take months. Oddly enough, magic only slowed everything down. Rune marking, crystal insertion, and magic effect application also took time and ingredients. We were, in a sense, going back to the Middle Ages. A skilled craftsman could spend a whole year making an elite item whose characteristics resembled those of an artifact. I've had to learn all of this after making the top of the local power structure. I'd become the master of the Valley of Fear, whether by choice or not. De facto, if not de jure. The water meadows just begged to be turned into farms. The five mighty hills were perfect for castles. It had been a while since Lurch had had his eye on the ample lumber supply, the scanty malachite mine, and the marble mountain range. For some reason, my evil overlord castle was steadily turning into a diamond-studded sissy hut. I gotta stop this, I thought. The valley also had tons of spots for regular farming and leveling up. We took out the stray monsters rather quickly. The random number generator would give us a headache from time to time as it brought some of the vermin back to life. But our warriors had grown familiar with the spawn points, the medium-sized dungeons, caves, and other game content. These places were marked on the clan maps and subject to constant farming. Many attributes came with being the top clan. Steady leveling up without the risk of running into a PK and losing a favorite freebie. Guaranteed freebie buffs and mandatory resurrection by the top cleric in the event of death. Praised be the fallen one, for I have managed to give all this to my team. Maintaining a high morale and faith in righteousness were key, of course. But humans are humans. They want to eat well, sleep safely, and feel cool. And don't even get me started on women. I still silently thank the greedy pig god for pushing me to open the House of Pleasures and summon up my ear choppers. Anyway, back to the long-term projects. It looked like there was some sort of temporary anomaly in Tavor's lair. My mother had been held captive for over six hours, while not ten minutes had passed on the surface. My gallant zombie cavalry attack had taken 109 seconds. The observers hardly felt a second go by. They had only heard my portal snap shut at the same time as Mom came back with a boom and the Inferno autologger pinged. Maybe this anomaly was another admin trick, overclocking at a specified location. Or maybe it was just a glitch within the growing world which begged to be utilized, given all the business tactics it could accommodate. For instance, a bottle of quality cognac got up to 50 random characteristic points after a year of distillation. 
stuffed the sleeping god's crypt with this elite yak, and come back in a day. Stars and buff points galore. Let the enemies cry cheater all they want. They can drown in jealousy and choke on their cravings. So what that I'd found an ancient liquor stash? That could easily happen to anyone. So dig through the dead lands. Help the grass grow. Appropriating Taver's former lair jumped up a few spots in my virtual planner. Okay now, I need to unwind and get a few hours of sleep. I wasn't nearly as badass as I tried to appear to my subordinates. I had my doubts and second thoughts, although I suppressed them whenever I could. I switched to the Magical Abilities tab. Take a portal to the beacon in my private quarters. The base bind point had to be changed occasionally, and not always by choice. That's why there was no such thing as too many evacuation zones. Not everyone's a portal whiz with fifty fixed points to spare. Pity that the artifact was an awfully rare and versatile thing. It was irreplaceable in the spy world. The painstaking rituals with penta, hexa, and octograms could not help. The depiction of a portal arch was just too difficult and time-consuming. Like golem-making, it was a long and expensive process, and few spent time leveling up in these skills. I nodded wearily to Lizzie, who had all the couch kitty rights to my bedroom. She hid the blades in the leather lacings. The so-called armor left ninety-nine percent of the lush, seductive flesh uncovered, barely concealing the privy parts. Guess there's been a spermatoxicosis outbreak among the game designers. But my complaints were unjustified. The project was too costly. There was no room for improvisation and someone's erotic fantasies. The corporation knew its audience too well. It had probably run a bunch of tests looked at how the pulse and blood pressure of zit-covered teens varied with the different breast sizes being shown. The mighty storm missed nothing. Big Brother sees all. Long gone were the times when postal services would carefully read your letters to better target ads. Stone Age tactics. Now, even the free welfare TVs vigilantly tracked the position of the viewer's pupils, determining what female faces attracted you the most. A week of unobtrusive monitoring, and already every interactive ad banner you ran into would be smiling at you with a painfully familiar face of that first love of yours. In response to Lizzie's raised eyebrow, I waved my hand and began to undress. I carelessly hung my gear on the marble statue as I said to her, All's well. We completely duped the enemy. I'll take a couple-hour nap. Why don't you put Orcus in charge of the off-duty ear choppers? The castle's teeming with guests. They're waiting for the gathering that's been rescheduled for tonight. They might wander off and start making trouble. Fallen one forbid. Lizzie's pensive gaze settled on the soft velvet bed. I shook my head. No, Liz. I need a nap. Shoo! The she-elf snorted and headed for the exit like a runway model, pointedly shaking her firm athletic buttocks. Just like a cat, wandering alone. She was hot as hell, and she was grateful to her creator in a special, passionate way. But there was just no spiritual connection, like I'd experienced with Tali. And Liz simply didn't knock me off my feet like Ruata. Speaking of whom, drifting off to sleep, I pulled up the princely interface and confirmed my attendance at the upcoming meeting. Regretfully, most of the control functions for the House of Night were locked by the moderators. Yes, everything was by the book. The treasurer controlled the finances. The gunsmith ran the armory. But still, there were ways to get around that. I gave the guards a holiday. Free access to the wine cellars. Fish on the menu for a month. And all armor was to be painted pink. Now I can finally sleep. Chapter 3 Random Quotes from In-Game Forums and Open Chat Peeps, did everyone's Patriarch quests get cancelled? OMG, I've spent six days collecting the Alliance's ears, trampled the original city NPCs, lost two PK items. WTF? How do I PM? Alt plus F4 on the virtual keyboard, noob. 
Thanks. I'm fed up playing light. Why we got so many jerks? These noobs don't know shit. Their temples busted up. The sun god looks like he ain't seen a dentist in 50 years. All the quests fell through and minus 50 XP points. That's it. I'm switching to the dark side. Adios, Pinocchios. Bada boom, PK. Not funny. Get your latest Ultra World News issue. 1.5 gigabytes of info, stats, screens, and never-before-seen videos, all for just one gold. The sinister poisoning of the light leaders, the patriarch's murder, the temple massacre. All this for an insanely low price. 10% of sales profit will be donated to the City Restoration Fund. 10-pound mithril fragment for sale. Remnant of the alchemy bolt that destroyed the temple. High-value item. The basilisk's remains rotted away before they could be looted. Looks like the monster was damaged mostly by the explosion. None of the lone fighters or the spontaneously assembled groups could defeat it. Our guys guarded the corpse for two hours so that the dark kamikaze wouldn't get through to loot it. Judging by the screens from the Chinese raid, there could have been at least ten artifacts up for grabs. They say the Brits offered Bada Boom a million gold for looting rights. He's an ass. The tombstones were piled up with stones. The graveyard's never been so crowded. Three friggin' thousand people waited for three hours. You could come up with a cure for cancer in all the time he stole. Yeah, and you'd be the one to do it. Be grateful that they got piled up, or we might have returned and gone through our bags. There's a shitload of gold in there, plus items. What's your PK counter looking like? Wouldn't you like to know? Hey, please share the link to the vid where the Fallen One's first priest kicks the sun god's ass. Don't fall for it. It's a cop autobot. They'll run you in. The motherfuckers from Enjoy Movies bought up the rights to all video content on the temple battle. Warning. Player Eugene has been silenced for 72 hours. Charges. Violation of the EULA Section 7.2. Report number KA783641Y. Violation of law and order has been generated and sent to the criminal court. You've done it now. Can't be his first time. They give a warning to first-timers. Now nah, the virtual cops issue warnings. These are copyright agents. They have more rights. The Light Allegiance is looking to buy the assembly instructions of the bomb that brought the temple down. Similar or alternative models also accepted. PM. Prank inquiries will get you on the KOS list. Calling volunteer guards for light temples. All levels welcome. Did you catch the Russian sign on the sun god's temple ruins? Nice pile, it said. The nerve! Sign our digital petition. We demand that the admins punish those who summoned the mega boss within the city limits. Restore XP for the thousands killed. Ban the pilgrim murderer. Restore the city to yesterday's date or give 41 million gold for speed repairs. The Crafters Guild is buying adamant in bulk. The Chinese have an adamant bell for Yu Huang summoning at the Jade Palace. A piece can be cut off. Thanks for the tip. The monotonous PM ping woke me. I had good filters that blocked over 3,000 messages in half an hour, but the high-priority A-list was still full. Many were eager to get in touch with the first priest, who was suddenly so active at the auctions. Bada Boom's chat must have been a mess. One kill alone could get you a load of threatening PMs, and that guy's banked 2,000 stars. I had to cut him extra bonuses for all the trouble he was dealing with. Perhaps a Hero of Darkness Gold Star inscribed with a 0001? In just a hundred years, any collector would give his right arm for something like that. But then, he was already getting tons of freebies, and he should be watched closely. Lest he go off the deep end and becomes a suicide bomber, the fallen one forbid. He had gotten the holy unmercenary upgrade, and the next public bombing would get him scores of fallen players' items. Bam! A millionaire. Even my fat, inner greedy pig could not ignore such a temptation. Well, this party couldn't last long. His PK counter had already gone through the roof. Loot could not have meant much to him anymore. Something to think about. Perhaps I should go myself, I thought. As I pondered the question, the message filter kept up its efforts. My PM pinged twice. Fuck y'all broke through all the filters, along with a very helpful fat hack writer from the top 20. It can't go on like this. I need a long-legged secretary with an IQ of 130 plus. Seriously. It was about time to get an intelligent assistant and set up a bureaucratic barrier to ward off the people. I just couldn't handle all this red tape on my own anymore. I glanced over the first fifty messages just in case. They were mostly congratulations, threats, 
obscure requests, and retarded demands. How do I become a first priest? Greatly appreciate it. What are your staff stats? Congrats, you kicked some ass. Hey, lend me a hundred gold, pay you back tomorrow. Want to join your clan? Druid, level 16. So-so gear, but leveling up fast. Sincerely, Gandil the Destroyer. I've lost about 30 gold worth of buffs because of you. My bros were the Avengers. Pay me back or they'll paint the walls with you. What a bunch of lamos. Oh, where do I get a secretary? Camo? She's tough and cunning, never speaks of her past. But Spark did not see a threat. The ex-slave was as honest as she could be. Instead of lying, she preferred to say nothing at all. Camo would only shrug and blame everything on someone else's secret, the Fifth Amendment and some NDA agreements. I wouldn't have tolerated this secrecy from anyone else. We had no use for shady characters. Wanna lie low? No problem. There are tons of clans out there gladly accepting random strangers. Yet, I kept an eye on the ex-slave. The girl was clearly hiding. Never left the valley, avoided public gatherings, and tried to stay out of sight in general. She'd spend most of her time in the fourth wing of the Supernova, which was the rehabilitation center for former slaves. Everyone there had been deeply traumatized and had all sorts of anxieties and phobias. Alas, I was wrong. Camo turned out to be an ordinary level 90 wizard, pretty good for a slave whom the Chinese looted daily. But far from the hidden race of rogue camo wizards that used to storm the cat's castle. A pity, actually, with all the weird stories, the biography gaps, and the failed attempts to pass for an ancient, figuring that girl out wasn't simple. Lurch kept a watchful eye on her as well. Orcus was trying to dig up more info. A hound would always be near her, accompanied by a goblin guard. Camo was not easily provoked. She was perplexed as to why she had been given a chain mail. Freezing a bucket of water was beyond her expertise. She specialized in spatial magic. No, I can't dump my mail on someone that obscure. I was skeptical that we could outwit a special forces agent from one of the leading clans. Not that they would ever have sent such a weirdo to do such an important job. Their spy would have had a crystal clear backstory, solid as a concrete wall, no gaps. But then, you never know. I heard a racket outside my door, someone mumbling, a drow growling, and even the sound of a slap, it seemed. The door opened silently. An ear chopper slipped in. She was carrying a breakfast platter with coffee and toast. The guards had stopped letting servants near leaders, thus depriving them of their tips and gaining quite a few enemies among them. Every NPC servant had gotten some guard admirers to squeeze for jewelry money. But the comely ladies had no intention of giving up their sacred cow, the right to cook for the clan leader and hold out their palms for the shiny coins. The castle staff was slowly coming out of serfdom. They bought their freedom. Durin happily took their gold, but kept complaining that these measly cents wouldn't even cover a pretty female servant's yearly salary. She'd become an out-of-pocket expense. I had long ceased to follow the logic of things around here, especially after one of the guard orcs submitted a certain request. He was tired, you see. Fifty years of combat, covered with scars, about time to retire. He had asked for a plump lady friend, a tavern lot, a little loan, and a temporary tax exemption. And the cheat picked the busiest intersection near the castle. Those lots will cost more than the whole of Fifth Avenue in a century. I had to gulp down my breakfast on the way. Krill was venting away into the private channel, pressured by a hundred of the more persistent relatives staying in the castle. The promised gathering kept getting rescheduled. The celebration ended with a terrifying act of God. The ethereal beauty of the virtual world bared its fangs. The moms cried, the dads yelled, the grandpas threw their weight around the grandmas flew into a temper. No matter how those who were ill-informed about digital technologies had pictured the virtual world, everything turned out to be much more complex. Mystical, yet just like reality, it only got more and more terrifying for them. 
I took a portal to the altar, taking the scalding hot coffee along. I hurried to the main hall. A blind man could have found it. Scores of voices echoed through the surrounding halls, interspersed with hysterical shouts. Thanks for the sound signals. By the time I got there, I already knew the overall mood and could guess what kind of questions they'd throw at me. My coffee dripping all over the white marble floor, I avoided the goblin's reproachful glances. One of the hellhounds followed me, purring with delight as it slurped the hot drops of coffee in midair. Its eyes started to glow as it began to stagger. Are you kidding me? High on coffee? A few more hellhounds rushed out of a nearby hall, their armor jingling. They were very aggressive, following me with wild eyes. They ignored me, interested only in the coffee. Shoo! I regret to say I was a little harsh with the doggies. Their hind paws paralyzed, their lean asses scraped the tiles as they tried to keep up. I could hear their piteous, gimme, cry, and could sense their fear. Thoughtfully scratching my head, I whispered to Lurch, It's a celebration, after all. Get all the hellhounds a hundred coffee each. Make it hot. Glancing at the first hound, whose sagging muzzle now looked like that of a Sharpe, I added, Except this one. This one's had enough. I hesitated for a moment, wondering if I should pass a clan-wide ban on feeding coffee to hounds. No, it's worse if these guys find out. Everyone will want to know the exact reason for the ban. And I can't say I'll obey the ban myself, much to Spark's delight. Oh, in Lurch, have a goblin personally take a barrel of the best coffee to Spark. It's to look presentable, you know, like a leader. All right. Time to act before Krill is mentally raped. With so much stress, he might just run off to the wild. At eighteen, killing monsters is more fun than being a scribe. I entered the hall through a side door, then got up on the podium that had been thrown together in a rush. I set my mug down on it with a bang. That drew attention, but the hall didn't get any less noisy. Demands for goods, loans, provisions, and explanations poured forth. Bunch of cavemen! I tried to stare them down. Like hell. A thirty-year-old can't manage hundreds of worried parents and seniors, especially after they've sensed the magical opportunity to gain eternal health and immortality. So, what does he do? Summoning the power of the fallen one within my soul and mixing it with my faith points, I clenched my fists and entered my anchored state of a feudal lord. I am the master. This is my land. My people are behind me. The darkness shrouding the corners deepened before my eyes. Obscure shadows flitted by as a whisper echoed in my mind. The air grew heavy. The demanding voices died down. The elderly opened their mouths, suddenly recalling what asthma felt like. The crowd rushed toward the center of the hall, staring in awe at my growing figure on the podium. Even Creel got scared, swallowing heavily. I began to speak, mentally applying Tian Long's pressure. My words fell on the guests like heavy boulders, making them cringe as if they tried to dodge. Those who demand their children back, forget it. They are our clanmates. We have assumed responsibility for their futures and well-being. That's the same responsibility that you've dumped on strangers by sending your kids to the hospice. Consider your children to be in military school, army regime, relatives visit on designated days only. Once of age, the students will each choose their destiny themselves, and your contributions are always welcome. Upbringing isn't cheap like it might seem. One of the brawnier men summoned up his courage and raised his hand to ask a question. A tramp with balls. Good thing everyone showed up with real avatars. I was no great physiognomist, but could easily tell determination and cowering apart. Had I faced a crowd of orcs, trolls, or other such avatars, I'd have had more trouble distinguishing their emotions. Save your questions! My nearly subsonic growl sent a shudder down their backs once again. Quiet pings signaled the exit of a handful of seniors. 
I hoped it was their sensitivity that forced them to leave the virtual world, not a heart attack. That was where another popular feature of the Fiverr capsule came into play. The owner didn't just get a hot toy. They received a wide variety of custom modules, from the simplest physician to a personal hospital with an ER. People used to reach for the phone in an emergency. Now, they climbed inside the capsule. It sewed up wounds, administered shots as needed. No way, grannies, I thought. I can't let you dominate the scene. Your numbers and authority are a distraction, just like your petty questions. For now, all I need is to put you in your place, and that's not easy. The hospice was a one-of-a-kind place. You needed money and connections to get your child in there. Except for a few welfare clients, most of the parents were well off. Solid middle class, mostly businessmen, government officials, criminals, and so on. Most of those present were over sixty. Grandchildren are almost always cherished more than children. What a paradox. But then, after parents have marked their child defective, they really shouldn't be surprised when their relationship cools. Now, the elderly have seen their beloved grandchildren get well and have set their hopes on the amazing attainment of eternal youth. I saw the fire in their eyes on Parents' Day, saw their attempts to find a catch, their burning desire to prove their own suspicions wrong. I continued making my point. As for joining the clan, the number of applicants is growing. But I must warn you, simply wanting to join isn't enough. First, we only accept those who've gone perma. That's a permanent condition. There's no way back. Think about that. Second, our demands are high. You must willingly undergo testing and background screening. You must swear loyalty to the clan and the alliance. And you have to live by military rules. You're sure you're ready for this? No darksiders are cardboard characters. Forget that Hollywood fluff about good and evil. The word dark and light mean just about as much as blue and purple. Neither one is morally superior, in case anyone was wondering. Judging by how many drew the cross upon themselves, our nominal dark title would remain a problem. I was surprised by the presence of churchgoers. The world's religions had come together in protesting against virtual worlds, especially the perma phenomenon. In fact, the battle for eternal souls had flared up like never before. Every confession wanted to retain its monopoly on the afterlife. It could never be ascertained whether a suicide bomber actually got his seventy virgins in the real world, while the promised virtual world, Padishah, was teeming with girls of various breast sizes who awaited their hero impatiently. Had I gone overboard with the fear effects, I wondered. I don't need ideological enemies. I need loyal, grateful followers. I exhaled, dispersing the darkness with a snap of my fingers. Then I squinted, estimating the hall's area. It should be strong enough. I activated gilding, the ability that I had fairly stolen. The crowd gasped in unison. Royal gold covered the ancient stone, replacing darkness. It reflected the torchlights, creating a disco-like glow. Beautiful. Just the thing for a celebration, but quite uncomfortable for a conference. More, Lurch whispered with enthusiasm. I'll pass, I whispered back. I raised my voice again, drawing everyone's attention. Get this! The colors of the opposing sides are meaningless. They're just there for convenience. You can wear white clothes as you commit black deeds, or you can— Boson interrupted me, waving his fist. Nuff agitation, sir. We got you. Let's get down to business, cause I got stuff to take care of in the real world. You know, before my bitch finds out I'm off duty. I'll settle things with her, then go see my kid. No shit, I'm here to stay. Ain't gonna get rid of me so easy. I nodded understandingly. Blockheads like him were unstoppable. They were persistent to the grave, no party-jumping politicians. In other words, completely honest guys which we so needed. I went on. We'll help with the post-perma technicalities, give advice, put you in touch with the right people. We'll pick you up in the alter world, help you adjust. As you become fully digitized and pass all tests, 
will accept you into the clan and welcome you to the valley. Please sell your things and real estate first. Ask us for good lawyers and agents. Everyone grew tense. The seniors frowned, sensing a possible condo-stealing scam. The younger ones, heirs to the properties, also shook their heads worriedly. I grinned. Easy, citizens. Nobody wants your concrete caves. You can enter the altar world broke as bums. Nothing will change. The clan has a 10% acquisition tax, but it's not applicable to real-world currency and doesn't even cover a fraction of our expenses. This castle I bought myself. Cost me over five million dollars. During the last raid, I used a special scroll worth two hundred thousand bucks. Mercenaries, heavy artillery, buffs, and supplies, all out of pocket for me at this point. I wiped my greedy pig's nose as I met their bewildered glances. These numbers sounded serious, even to well-off treasury looters. Yes, you're right, Piggy. This economy's going to hell. That's enough. From the next raid onward, we're covering expenses first, then splitting up the leftovers. And every golem gets an officer's share of the trophies. This anarchy had to end. Like Lenin used to say, socialism is control and record-keeping. Great slogan. We'll do for semi-feudalism. A wizened old lady raised her shaky hand above the crowd. I nodded my consent, allowing her to speak. Is it true that, after going perma, the mind is also rejuvenated, like the body? As I listened to her cracking old voice and saw her cheek twitch involuntarily, I realized the full meaning of the question. In the virtual world, she was in a body free of illnesses, but her aged brain could barely function. Her crooked spine... Her shaky hands and constant squinting were almost like a habit. It is true, but you'd better hear it from... I glanced around, searching for someone from Xena's team. Whiz! Leave Harlequin alone! Get your ass up here! The green goblin rogue was in the middle of shamelessly seducing Harlequin under the pretense of providing security. Reluctantly, she abandoned her fun and stepped away from the shocked fellow. Slapping Harlequin on the leather-bound behind... She reached the podium in one agile jump. She revealed her sixty-four teeth in a smile, winking at the old lady. Hey, girl, don't whine. You'll be standing up straight in no time and feeling those panties grow wet in the arms of a sexy hunk. Don't you frown. I'm ninety-five and life has just begun. I see those old eyes glow with interest. Let me tell you, after going perma, your mind clears up. Your consciousness grows young fast, but the body ages, trying to match your self-perception. At some point, these two vectors meet, and you gotta be careful not to get stuck in the virtual world's forties-fifties range. The altar world's full of such ex-geezers. So what do I do? The old lady asked worriedly. The she-goblin raised her fist by habit, adding flair to her speech. You must live, seek excitement, feed your mind, enjoy new sights, discover things. Fall in love, dammit. Of course you'll be a burden for the clan for the first year or two. You'll have to learn to be young all over again. But then you'll find a real eternity, no shit. I guarantee you that you and I will think back to this day sometime while hot boys will be waiting on us in an elite male whorehouse. Wiz bowed playfully to the generous applause. She jumped off the podium and disappeared in a crowd of excited seniors and gloomy children who were already mourning their inheritance. I feared for our elderly. Throwing them in nut houses under false diagnosis didn't cost much. Neither did knocking them off. In our barbaric age, a bunch of punks could bust your skull over a crappy cell phone, let alone real estate in the capital city. I decided to let Orcus warn them. Those who could still think clearly would understand. As for the rest, sorry, natural selection. We weren't a homeless shelter, after all. Yeah, right, natural selection. Whom am I trying to trick? Boarding school, of course. In five years, maybe. Right now, it's the dream orphanage of millions. And now, we would just throw in a hundred high-spirited seniors and ban video recording within the supernova limits because had a vid like that hit YouTube, I would have been charged with mass murder by inducing hysterical laughter. Man, why can't I have ten years for everyone's leveling up needs, I thought. 
These kids have extremely high potential. Give them time, and they could move the altar world. Alas, we had no time. But then, it wasn't long ago that I had dreamed about the possible freebies following some spatial anomaly. The task of seizing Tavor's former lair got a higher priority and finally climbed to the first line in my virtual planner. I sighed, rubbing my temples. A few hours of sleep weren't enough after a day of insane stress. But there was hardly time. We'd have to take breaks in the third millennium after restoring the first temple. I turned to my clanmates and said quietly, Krill, stick to the plan. Orcus, analyst, we need to discuss something ASAP. And please refrain from calling the paramedics right away. Chapter 4 An echo passed through the infosphere of the Alter World, a segment from an unknown source. My eyes full of tears, I mourn the sun god's wound. That crafty first priest mustn't die. He is to live forever, drowning in pain and agony. By means unknown, he had escaped the perfect trap, casting our pawn off the chessboard. The sun god's temple lies in ruins, his most loyal servant killed, the astral flow distorted, and an attack on the fallen one thwarted. He deserves eternal life, eternal torment, eternal fear. I call upon the sun god's strength. The adamant I have is insufficient to inflict a mortal wound on the fallen one. This could disturb our plans. At least seven ounces are needed to overpower a divinity. I am aware that this amount can be acquired only from the heart of a dead god. But if Tyche is gracious to the Olympians, perhaps such a priceless treasure can yet be found within the sun god's armories? Kaboom! I could feel the familiar infernal heat on my skin. Gray ashes stung my eyes as gusts of wind forced their way into the open portal. Lurch's anxious calls could barely reach me. He demanded that I close the portal lest it damage the tender elven plants. I made sure that my three accompanying hellhounds had successfully gotten through, then ended the spell. Shaking off my clothes and habitually looking around for threats, I whispered melancholically, Minus two million. There's only nine hundred in the treasury. What kind of leader am I without gold? A costly luxury it was to visit Asmodeus. He needed a summoning pentagram, no kidding. But a picky bastard like him would throw a fit over ingredients. He always demanded that everything be drawn in chalk, made only from the ground bones of a righteous man. The candles must be from albino dragon fat, and that the gems marking the points be perfectly clean. Goddamn jeweler, carbon allotrope grade, F.L. Flawless Connoisseur. And, of course, none of these materials ever showed up at auctions, so go figure where anyone was to acquire all that luxury. Wait, could the top demon be summoned by force? Mega boss, home delivery. Mob raids from the comfort of your own castle. Roll out the ballistas and the catapults and pull in the inner guard. Quite convenient. I decided to bring this up with Asmodeus. He'd be very interested. It would mean a double attack on the enemy's dominion. We would take out the boss while the demon crushed the leaderless army. We'd take the tops, he'd take the roots of the crops. It was a win-win situation. If you didn't take into account Asmodeus's personal efforts, of course. I couldn't hope for an agreement. An experienced demon would find a way to cheat if he wanted. That's why I always had to stay ahead, just to evade that knife searching for my back. There must be a balance. For every freebie he got, I had to have something too. As I pondered over this idea, I typed away on the virtual keyboard. But Spark distracted me, insistently ramming her helmet into my thigh. F -f fix I heard her gurgling growl. Well, looks like the coffee pusher's in for an unpleasant surprise. Cravings blurred the hound's tender minds after those brief moments of a blissful high. The four-legged creatures turned into a wild pack of buffed-up berserkers, damn their asses. 
The castle goblins were still looking for the scattered servants. Meanwhile, Orcus, along with some officers, was hurriedly updating the supernova defense system. Emergency doors and platforms were being built into the countless corridors. Gimmick's crossbow rings were set up on the major intersections. It turns out that an inside job by an insane or treacherous ally could be quite damaging and surprisingly effective. The moment those fifty green marks inside the perimeter suddenly turned an aggressive claret red, the guards on duty took two whole minutes to figure things out. That was unacceptable. But who could have known that the hound's animal nature would overpower the laws of the game, making the ex-intelligent creatures temporarily forget whom they were allied with? The scandal was hushed up and blamed on a hellhound wedding. The hounds had fun and leveled up. The analysts got new leads, and a hundred of our warriors lost XP and began to plot revenge. This was another issue to settle. I couldn't have allowed disputes among clanmates to cause low morale. So from that day on, the hounds were put on patrol duty and passed on to various farm groups for enhancement. And every night, a fighting match was organized. Group fights in the arena for the aforementioned members. To do away with anarchy, battle tactics must be flawless. All in all, it also turned out to be a nice social event. I closed the organizer interface and tightened my armor. The hellhounds were focused and furious after the brutal hangover. Irritating them was a bad idea. Nevertheless, I smiled. The doggies reminded me of St. Bernard's with their small rum barrels slung under their necks. Only these barrels were filled with strong, fragrant coffee. Spark was ready to take the diplomatic inferno by storm. She beat her chest with her paws and threatened to give up all their local alliances for the precious coffee. I almost pictured myself as a crafty Anglo-Saxon buying up Manhattan Island from the naive Native Americans for a set of necklaces, but I did not approve of her request. We desperately needed help, both hired and friendly help. Bug had looked pretty serious predicting legions of lightsters beneath the walls of the First Temple. The hounds barked something sympathetic, then dashed toward the Dominion's outer limits, quite poor and low-level lands. The hounds were not in a hurry to meet the local prince. Ruling demons were of a rather harsh, unpredictable temper. I only shrugged. By me, he wasn't so bad, especially with threads of oaths binding his aura, and me being armed with the adamant staff and casting the fallen one's shadow. That was enough to diminish your own fear and shove it deep up, hmm, a safe location. Anyway, what you had to do was to try not to think about the fact that you're going to meet with a real avatar of Hell's most ancient creature. The virtual info sounded convincing enough. Asmodeus, one of the most powerful and distinguished demons, the devil of lust, adultery, jealousy, but also revenge, hatred, and destruction. The prince of incubi and succubi. He rules over the fourth circle of demons, the vengeful retributors of evil. He controls all the gambling houses in hell. According to the Kabbalah, he is the fifth of the ten archdemons. Yep, that's my buddy. All right, no need to cower, I told myself. I'm no weakling either. My name appeared over four hundred times in the Alter World wiki, more than Asmodeus's. And I'd also made the Top 100 Alter World's Most Influential Persons list in yesterday's Dorbs issue. Actually, I got 69th place. But hey, no big deal. It wasn't so far from the top ten. I'll get there. I picked out a cleaner spot on the basalt, made myself comfortable, and with the face of a meditating Buddhist activated the summoning ring. A minute passed, then another. No response. Man, what if I'm getting killed and desperately need a demon's help? Did that even occur to him? The ring clearly worked. The 24-hour timer started ticking backwards. Kaboom! The shockwave of the cargo portal threw me against the rocks. The 15-foot arch had appeared in the very center of the summoning point, right under my ass. I felt like a mushroomer who accidentally sat down on a moss-covered mine. War efforts. Crit! 
Medium spine injury. Duration, 30 minutes. Feel the discomfort of old age and watch your health starting now. Effect 1. Stooping. Minus one-third agility. 15 degree spinal curvature displacement. Effect 2. Compassion. Better relationship with all NPCs whose age exceeds the halfway point of their race's life expectancy. Bunch of clowns. I moaned as I got up, pain shooting up my spine. Looking like the letter S, I held my lower back. I'll see these jokers dead. I pulled a huge bundle of scrolls out of my inventory, found the green healing tab, and flipped through a few pages. I tore out the medium injury healing parchment. Minus forty gold. Through the spell's wavering glow, I saw a gigantic top demon squeeze his way through the iridescent portal haze. It was one of Asmodeus's elite warriors. I wanted to back up fast, but that would mess up the healing spell. Plus, the radar identified the monster as friendly, so there was no need to worry. The master is in the middle of an important ritual. We kindly ask that you wait. If, however, you need immediate assistance, you'll have to cover the ammo cost. One million seven hundred thousand gold. Your choice? I'll wait. How long? Nine hundred heartbeats at rest. You are allowed military assistance from the Second Legion. Total power, sixty thousand levels. I shook my head. Thanks, no military aid needed. I'm here for a private talk. The demon nodded understandingly. Then he glanced sideways and, seeing something, added quickly, instantly losing his assumed aggressive air. Optional. Invitation to the castle. On mutual courtesy terms. Turning to where he was looking, I saw the bundle of nerves rushing our way. I instantly got a toothache. A cold shudder ran down my back. Invitation accepted. Follow me. The demon sighed with relief and backed up into the portal. I followed him right in. A second of confusion following the sudden transfer was accompanied by a polyphonic echo of someone's Ha! The demon and I got dragged over the tiles and thrown against the castle wall. What kind of day is this? I rose with difficulty, listening to the demon's swearing as I looked around. The familiar small citadel. Demons and my clanmates were on guard duty and the yard was full of ear-choppers in training. I watched as the girls lined up. The instructor assumed an intricate pose and demonstrated a cunning trick with his leather wings to them. Ha! The manicured fingertips shot upward all at once, accompanied by a hundred exhales. The girls raised a cloud of dust higher than the castle walls. This move was complex as hell. A power attack, but an instant one, without a spell. It looked like a wizard's air hammer. The only discrepancy was that the girls were mostly rogues and assassins. They saw us. Nelson, the former senior lieutenant from the first ear chopper perma batch, barked, At ease! and ran over to me. He had proven himself worthy in battle with Varanus, which had earned him his current rank and the nervous twitch in his eye. My bad. The second was due to the fact that it's hard for a male to head a division of cheeky drow beauties. When I used to work in hiring, I saw the ear choppers as not only warriors, but future warrior brides. Relentlessly, I tried to whack the nasty feminism out of them, encouraged loyalty and tenderness, fought their matriarchy and bitchiness. But drows are drows. The world's infosphere ruined them just like everybody else making them into wild Amazonians, the polar opposite of obedient housewives. It would have been easier to put a woman in charge of an all-female battalion. There were plenty of worthy female warriors, many of them middle-ranking commanders, but two factors stopped me from doing so. First, I wanted to emphasize the natural family model, the man being the head of the household, the warrior, protector, and provider. Our sons had already been scarred enough by watching their amoeba-like fathers cower before their dominant moms. Surely this meant tons of work, especially for those who had yet to be fathers, but I had to start somewhere. Second, I wanted to see if names really did affect destinies. So Nelson worked his ass off doing something he was clearly not very competent at. Hang in there, bro, 
No pain, no gain, I thought. You have several Napoleonic war victories ahead of you. I saluted the lieutenant. Report. Howdy, sir. All is well. No incidents. Personal guard is on duty and training according to the plan. What stage? Covering the basics right now. Right wing hit with diving transition. I would have roared with laughter if my ass didn't hurt. And how is that going? Not too well, the lieutenant said honestly. Only nine warriors got the hang of the hit power, still having trouble diving. Forget the flying. Show me what the hit itself can do. Nelson nodded and turned to the excitedly chattering crowd of she-elves who had sat down on the cool flagstones. Butterfly attack, he commanded, flinging a shiny silver coin at her. The girl swiftly shot up into the air. Her right arm swung forward. Ha! Her invisible bat hit the coin mid-flight and sent it right back. The coin whistled like a bullet right over my ear. It ricocheted off the steel shield of an off-duty squad captain just as he approached me. The loud ring drowned out his swearing. The coin ended up stuck in an oak pole. The demon accompanying me growled discontentedly. Demons were wary of silver. Yet the coin caught the attention of some devil child running by. His eyes twinkled greedily. Damn, I thought, these girls are like Jedi's. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee, I whispered in amazement. Aye, aye, sir, that's exactly why our guys nicknamed her that, said the captain excitedly. His shield was covered with notches. His right leg barely moved due to a recent injury. A bracelet with typical drow markings adorned his mighty wrist. It was the bracelet that a she-elf marks her chosen one with. Looks like the guys are having a good time here indeed. How are things overall? I asked, twirling my finger ambiguously. Fine, Asmodeus is restoring the army. We're terrorizing the enemy, crawling over their castle walls. Every night we follow your orders and search the drows for any unique traits. Yeah, while mapping their birthmarks and intimate hairdos? The captain ran his hand over his bracelet pensively and smiled. That too. The girls are flaming hot. I shook my head. Easy on the epithets. I'd rather hear you call them sweet and tender kitties. The altar world is malleable like clay. We bend it, it bends us. Every random word or thought has weight. You hit the critical mass, and your flaming hot girls might just set you on fire, so watch it. The captain nodded solemnly. Understood, sir. Thank you. I'll make my pussycat perfect. I'll be an ass if I have to. She'll follow me to hell and back, like we're one. I glanced appraisingly over the 180-level warrior's mighty frame and smiled, but his face remained serious. I'm not making the same mistake twice, he said. I went perma by choice, out of depression. My kids grew up, and love gave way to routine existence. Why I stayed with that bitch, I can't say. She'd walk around the house in a faded bathrobe, her hairy legs sticking out, her lips pursed accusingly. She'd given me the best years of her life, you see. And for what? Joe's got a better car, Bob's house is bigger, and Bubba's got a longer dick. I got sick of it all. I looked him in the eye and wondered if he'd cracked. The captain smiled understandingly, sounding optimistic as usual. Don't take this the wrong way, sir. Alter World's my home. It's where I became myself, not the clown that the TV and the teachers tried to make me into not whom my parents wanted me to be. I am now the way I had always dreamed of being since long ago. But somehow I've forgotten my dreams. This world is crystal clear, and so are we. No need to suck up, lie, or grovel before anyone. It's all simple and fair. I'm strong, handsome, and healthy. There's gold in my pockets, armor on my back, and a sword in my hand. My bed's filled with beauties, my friends fight by my side. I envied his way of looking at things. Where can I get a pair of such rose-tinted glasses, I wondered. That's new life euphoria for you. Hormone rush, adios enlarged prostate gland, and memory loss. Time got turned back. Fifty years in reality, minus two years of perma, and you have a twenty-year-old captain. Magic math. Feeling like a smart-ass old bastard, I made a note in the planner. 
hold off this fellow's promotion until he faces reality. He hadn't been crucified in the dark dungeons yet, hadn't dug up slaves from their damp oblivion after they had been buried alive for several years. He didn't see the situation clearly, which could prove dangerous on active duty. I was distracted by a messenger imp. The creature was patiently shifting from foot to foot, clopping his hooves on the stone tiles. The blacksmiths must have shooed him as a joke. Having caught my glance, the little creature reported that the temperature in the archdemon's private chambers had been lowered to reasonably tolerable. A warm chair was awaiting me, along with a glass of magic mulled wine and an attractive succubus from Asmodeus's personal escort. As the messenger talked, his brow twisted in an obscure manner, as if he had no control over it. By the mix of jealousy and bliss on his muzzle, I could tell I had been granted a marvelous reception. I nodded, tossed the demon a silver coin, and headed to the castle entrance. The demon hissed and ooed, juggling the coin like a hot potato. At last, he managed to throw the tip into his skinny wallet and hurried ahead of me, courteously opening the doors and showing me the way. His tail wiggled at the thought of what he could spend his unexpected tip on. As far as I knew, silver was rare in Asmodeus's dominion. The precious metal was reserved for military purposes. Asmodeus's study was rather hot. He was clearly nostalgic about infernal resorts. The roasters in the spacious room were still giving off tiny streams of smoke when I came in. Soft armchairs and a table laden with snacks had been politely placed by the open stained glass window. As Medeus looked tired, a bit emaciated, but happy. A massive demon was sitting next to him, his silver armor glistening with spikes and magic runes. Poor furniture. As Medea said with a friendly gesture, Have a seat and meet Lightfighter. He's my right-hand man and the general of the legendary Silver Legion, which we will surely get back in shape with Inferno's meager grub. If only you knew what it took to pluck its essence from the virtual worlds. But it was worth it. It will bring a hundred times as much gold as had gone into the pentagram. Those stupid puppets spawned out of the well of power are no match for the true one. I stared at the real-life demon in bewilderment and blurted out the first thing that came to mind. Why does he look so... lost? The general really didn't look very well. His gaze was vacant, and he was drooling as his fingers crushed the oaken armrests, making them creak. Asmodeus laughed. Don't be afraid to say it. He looks like an idiot. But it'll pass. Give him time to pull his shattered mind together. Two thousand years of oblivion can really leave a mark. While Lightfighter was busy defragmenting his memory, I nearly went nuts in disbelief. Did Asmodeus really turn to other realities, or even to the great nothingness itself, to retrieve the soul of his ancient ally? What if? Tolly! I waved away the succubus that had crept up behind me and tried to give me a gentle shoulder massage, warming my neck with her hot breath. Leaning forward, I asked anxiously, Can you pull anybody out, even if they died in a different reality? A mortal? the demon asked in a businesslike manner, sensing a potential profit. Yes, I nodded, brimming with hope. When did it happen? Almost three weeks ago. And fail. Impossible. The soul won't last more than nine days in the great nothingness. It will drink from the river of oblivion and fall asleep, awaiting its next incarnation. Had this been a great hero, a mighty emperor or a theomachist of some kind covered with unique astral marks, then sure, the marks are like shields. They help temporarily preserve the mind and prevent emptiness from penetrating the subject's consciousness. The soul of a mortal is about as firm as fog. Someone like you, who has become a little firmer like clay, would have lasted about forty days. Lightfighter is pure silver, although he was on the edge. Two thousand years is no joke. And I am noble steel. 
The gods are mithril and adamant. The stars will go out, yet they will remain, waiting and hoping. I hung my head. As Medea said insightfully, Don't disturb her. Nothing good will come of it. Let her rest. She won't recognize you now. Until the soul reaches the next level of perfection, a series of rebirths awaited with short naps in between. A larva needs room to grow. Sighing heavily, I nodded. Sleep, Tolly. Sleep, my dear. As Medeus hurriedly broke the pressing silence. How is our mutual business? Did the dwarves speed up the order? I tossed my head, driving the sad thoughts away, and said slowly, I told them it's a rush order. Ole paid them a personal visit and gave them his blessings. The first ammunition and weaponry is already in stock. Sorry, but I can't open portals to send it. It's too expensive. The clan treasury's become a zombie mice cage. I paused for a second, blushing in embarrassment. Yeah, the kids summoned the mice in a snap. No spells or ingredients. So I had to try it too. And what was the quietest place in the castle? The treasury, of course. I didn't have the heart to destroy the raised creatures. The wide-eyed rodents, digging through the gold, reminded me of one fat-cheeked piggy. So now they lived among the coins, ingots, and mithril waste, squeaking discontentedly when Durin would bring in an empty cart, and purring happily whenever his cart was filled with coins. They even helped unload it which was why the noxious treasurer reconciled himself to their existence and even gave them an allowance. I cleared my throat. Ahem. I'll send your legions to the valley at X hour. You can pick up your gear then. As Medeus shook his head and said, The astral watchers have crossed all limits. All neighbors are watching my dominion. The moment the troops leave, I'll have guests from all the four sides of darkness. So we need scare tactics to make them afraid to even look at you. Lightfighter suddenly moved. He wiped away his drool and emptied the goblet of precious wine in one gulp. Then he grabbed the succubus, refilling his goblet by the waist, and cried excitedly, Let's crush the strongest enemy in a surprise attack. I shook my head. Hello once again. It's a good idea, but now's not the time. You've yet to familiarize yourselves with Varanus's abandoned lands. Expansion is unwise if the new borders cannot be protected. I suggest we... Hmm. Show off the power of the Inferno and the Alliance combined. We'll get more mercenaries, heavy artillery, golems, platforms with mobile dome shields, and siege and field machinery. The two demons' eyes flashed in sync. A legion's march! Let the ground shake beneath our feet. I nodded. Precisely. We could then officially invite audiences from the neighboring dominions and the press. They can have a proper look. We've nothing to hide. There's no power like ours in all Inferno. Lightfighter said pensively, I fear they might join forces in the face of an external threat. As Medeus waved his hand dismissively, Those jackals can't trust each other. I smiled. I can have ambitious clans infiltrate the lands of any new alliance. My place is teeming with candidates. So it's settled. In five days we march. I'll have emptied out the well of power by then. We'll have something to show. A toast! We clinked our golden goblets together. Here's to our partnership. The hot, sweet, two-year-old mulled wine enriched with spices burned my throat and gave me ninety strength points for the next four hours. Some wine cellars, Asmodeus has. I could use a few myself. Asmodeus, I have a favor to ask. The demon grunted ironically. Of course. What can I do for you? Someone needs a body switch? No. I mean, yes. I do. You see, I have to get into Tavor's body. Can you do that? Chapter 5 Selected Letters from Laith's Mailbox Sender Bug Grumblers 
Congratulations on the successful destruction of the first temple. I hereby declare you an idiot. After your show of strength and the incredibly powerful artifact, they finally started to take you seriously. The invading army is recruiting allies. Everyone wants to join. The new Europeans alone boast over 50 independent units. The Polish, the guests from the great kingdom of Ruthenia, and the Ivano-Frankivsk state, the German Totenkopf clan, the Lettish Forest Brothers, the Rodents from Free Georgia, and the Knights from the restored Livonian Order will all be paying you a visit. Also, look out for the new clan, Just Cause. Their goals? To fight the dark terrorists, to free the child hostages, and to establish a protectorate over the First Temple. Thanks to their infinite monetary resources, they were able to quickly recruit over 2,000 high-level mercenaries, equip them with high-end gear, and gain all the gaming mass media support. Their officers are mostly cyber-athletes from English-speaking clusters. Instructors and camo fatigues have been cited. Their class and clans remain unknown. Sadly, we also have leaked important information. The forced alter-world improvements have been noticed. Our sworn friends have decided to take us out in a snap. Unidentified caravans with gold have been sneaking from castle to castle by night. Info packets with fabricated breaking news are available for free. The Russian cluster is like Mordor at this point, an eternal battlefield with ruins and molten brick. Stand strong, boys. The First Temple is our source of power now. Our folks have always favored the dark side of RPG and willingly obeyed its mighty rule. We must not disappoint them. We must strike. Preferably first and without giving the enemy the chance to retaliate. I'm offering you a subversive act coordinator, a one-of-a-kind pro who passed our scrupulous selection process and was fully trained by the company. Take good care of him. Sender. XXXXX. Shui Feng. After many a risky effort and serious expenditure, I've managed to acquire the battle plans of the more aggressive Asian cluster forces. On the Shui Fong clan's initiative, a revanchist coalition has been formed, totaling 27,000 warriors. One quarter of them will come to the First Temple on Low Immunity Day. The rest will storm the castles of the guards of the First Temple Alliance. Upon a successful siege, each castle will be looted and destroyed. Then it's on to other goals. All of the Russian cluster navigational beacons have been taken into account. A supplementary exploration was conducted. Trophy storages and slave pens have been prepared. Chains and window bars have risen in price. Territory maps have been updated. Take heed, my lord. Spies have been recruited from among the Alliance's top ranks. Unfortunately, I can't confirm the names or the coordinates of the castles under siege. Attached... Please find a list of the most prominent allies and enemies of the revanchist clan. The Mao's legacy clan is paying dearly for working with the Russians. The Maoists will be crushed within the next few days if they don't get help. Most of the country dwellers are waiting. Quite a few sympathize with the Russians. However, in the event of a conflict of interest, national pride will overpower all external influence. P.S. I ask to be compensated 700,000 gold. Artifacts, spell scrolls, and additional financing are required to acquire further information. Attached, please find a detailed list. Sender, Dan, Veterans. Sending you three torches of true light like you asked. Careful! Theft and espionage have become a real problem. Seizing information, pawning, kidnapping, and robberies are a favorite pastime for both novices and high-ranking companies. Damn them all to hell. The new torches are virtually gone from the market. As you know, they can be acquired only when a dungeon is visited by a player for the first time. Outward expansion has noticeably slowed after the turmoil in the Ultra World's political arena. Inferno is more promising in that regard. I hope you will do us a favor and allocate a dungeon for farming. Levels 200 and up with a big-time boss. P.S. The messenger will also give you 20 large accumulators. This is not a gift. Two million gold, nevertheless. Could you charge them with mana at the Lath Oil Station? We'll pay you back in those torches and with our hospitality. P.S. 2. Your cigarette business share for this month is 105,000 product units. They're taking up storage space and attracting thieves. 
open a portal or I'll send them to you by caravan. P.S. 3. It's General Frag's B-Day tomorrow. Don't forget to congratulate him. He'll be pleased. Sender. Administration. Technical Support Service. AI Scarlet 9. Stream 112. Warning. 417 complaints have been filed against you in the last 24 hours. Due to the number of complaints, the case has been investigated by an AI lawyer. Due to the following violations, blind aggression, racial and religious intolerance, intentional large-scale damage of virtual corporate property, your account has been blocked for 30 days. You have no right of appeal according to EULA Section 16.4. Report of administrative breach sent to the virtual police. Sender, Virtual Police, Penal Department, AI Crimson 14, Stream 771. Your digital passport has been marked for a 7th degree administrative breach. Minus 9 citizen loyalty points. Your free VertNet access has been limited for 365 days. A surveillance unit will be installed on your equipment upon your next login. Cost of unit is 210 gold rubles. Thank you for your cooperation. Tavor's corpse looked pretty beat up. The adamant shoulder wound never closed and continued to bleed onto the gold embroidery of the gray velvet cloak. A look of hatred and fear was frozen upon his bloated face. The drooling body was swaying monotonously and shifting from foot to foot. With a deep sigh, I looked into the enemy's vacant eyes. The spark of insanity was long gone but the threatening serpentine stare remained, making you want to clench your fist and scowl as if by instinct. The last thing I wanted was to slip into his loathsome hide. It might soil my delicate astral essence, the fallen one forbid. Things like these weren't just used underwear. They were soul containers. A washing machine would not help. Procrastinating unwillingly, I squinted at the scarlet sun, as Medeus, the Fallen One, knows about this. He's watching me, so please, no surprises. Let's prove each other's trust, reap the benefits, and part ways peacefully. As Medeus shook his head as if offended. But we are allies. I replied with a crooked smile. You'll never have weak fools as allies. You'll eat them alive. So let me remind you, I'm neither weak nor foolish. I hoped he didn't sense a change of heart, for the longer I delayed, the more doubtful I grew. I was forced into this risky venture by the lack of time, along with the habit of doing everything myself. If I succeeded, I'd be a hero. If not, I risked losing my immortality. All right, it's time, I thought. Straining. I carefully pulled a 500-pound aerial bomb out of my inventory. The sand in the arena creaked under its weight. Whatever happened, I would not allow my body to remain with Asmodeus. I did not wish to be his puppet. I'd put on a suicide bomber's belt if I could, programmed to self-detonate, just to be sure. But this was a feature the game didn't yet offer, and I couldn't think of a similar alternative. But I was willing to work with what I had. I handed Nelson the detonator and sent him a dual request. You know what to do. In case of an attack, or if I exceed the time limit, or if you receive a command from someone named Tavor, it's detonation time. Plan B, if the bomb doesn't work, just kill me. I've no buffs or gear, and just over 6,000 HP. Once I'm down, it's all crits, so you should be done in no time. But first, I sent Nelson a private message. Chop off my right hand. Never mention this order to anyone. It's secret. Understood? The ear chopper nodded. I handed him a parcel that he was to give to me. A small bag full of valuables. Mostly charms, survival kits, and communication devices. Also personal abilities and spell scrolls on parchments. Gates, portals, banishment from darkness, religious outcast, astral mana absorption, etc. All those things that set me apart from the average players. Give it to me after the soul transplant. Do not forget, I am Tavor. Yet he must confirm his every order with the password I gave you. That's it. I burned my bridges. 
I turned to Asmodeus. Let's begin. I wasn't afraid of being watched. All potential blabbers had been chased away. Only NPCs were left out in the tiny inner yard, my loyal servants and Asmodeus's demons. Asmodeus smiled promisingly, shook his hands, and, reveling in his power, taunted, Fear not. It won't hurt. A direct flight. No layovers in the fiery Gehenna. Boom! Ready! My heart skipped a beat on the word boom. But ready had a different effect. Pain shot through my shoulder. A wave of hatred and fear swept over my consciousness. Tavor's body was overfilled with raging hormones. Unable to balance myself, I fell to my knees. Tavor's body had an odd center of gravity. A foreign mind entered my brain, shutting off my instincts and rapidly taking control. My heart raced in fear. I inhaled hoarsely, taking in air into my reluctant lungs, nearly all of my muscles cramping. God damn, escaped my dry lips. The sounds of healing magic came from nearby. My loyal clanmates were doing everything within their power to alleviate my suffering. Slowly I went from minced meat to a steak well done, so to speak. As Medeus moved his hands like a psychic, smoothing out the invisible folds. He said soothingly, You'll get used to wearing it. It won't feel so tight. Now, had you missed, that would have been a real discomfort. What? I stared at him indignantly, distracted from the panoply of new inner sensations. As Medeus shrugged indifferently. What did you expect? This isn't a petty heart transplant. Your soul could have failed to acclimatize. You risk your life even squeezing a zit with infections and all. All right, don't fidget. Your shoulder wound has opened up again. It's festering. Seraphic adamant, blast it thrice. As Medeus furiously scratched the star-shaped scar on his neck, I looked at my shoulder. After the healing magic, the wound had dried and closed up a bit, but it was far from being in fighting condition. Shards of bone had pierced the bluish skin and sparkled sugar-like under the infernal sun. Damn, I had hit Tavor good. A bad wound, noted Asmodeus. To ruin such a quality body. It'll take six months to heal, if it heals at all. You should reconsider how you jab your spear into anything that moves. It's a heart of a dead god, not some rusty pigpen post. Ignoring his grumbling, I turned to the ear choppers. Bandage me up good. Butterfly, make a shoulder belt with that foppish scarf of yours, my arms dangling like a flaccid cock. The warriors tensed up, but didn't move. I frowned at them, perplexed. Well, don't be so pig-headed. Wait. Oh, right. Cursing, I turned my dry eyes to the virtual interfaces that I struggled to open. What a cascade of windows, like I'm in a different game. Epileptics, turn away now or a seizure's guaranteed. The familiar default GUI styling was gone replaced by a bunch of stupid frames, relief shadow fonts, and useless communication and channel stability indicators. The myriad of highlights and the marks of the custom fan mods made my head spin. The forms around me were designated with critical points. HP notifications flickered all around. A paid dual stat log and a PK counterestimator loaded up from some external database. They were followed by an aggression indicator favorite attack combo, and much, much more. Damn cheater, be you banned eternally in the bundle of nerves' body. When I finally located the private messenger window, I sent the ear choppers the password. 32 Orange Wolf. Instantly they rushed over to me, sticking out their shoulders and supporting my reeling frame on all sides. It wasn't easy. Tavor had changed significantly since I last saw him. The three-hundred-level warrior was like some epic ballad hero, broad as an ox, with a four-hundred-pound iron-forged body. Boy, did the bastard fatten up. The injured joint would crunch every time black blood spurted from the wound. 
The ear choppers suddenly had to learn field medicine. I hissed in pain, cursing the adamant along with Asmodeus. This divine metal needed to be controlled. I wish they'd ban private ownership. Having a blade of such caliber was like owning a nuke. Good thing there weren't many adamant smiths. At least I myself knew of only one. I decided to get a simpler weapon. Rarely was there a need to maim players. Adamant was the last resort when everything else had proven useless. Only then should the bloodthirsty staff come into play. The ear choppers finished bandaging me. I sent them away. As I walked in a circle, I avoided looking at my old body, which the warriors now pressed carefully into the sand, face down. My new body had a slight limp. There was some double vision. The tightness of the shoulder belt and the painful sensations made my posture a bit awkward. Walking the body around like a stubborn horse, I ground my teeth and, gently pressing the wounded arm to my chest, hummed a song. Look below, there's our field over there. With our one motor gone, we can still carry on, coming in on a wing and a prayer. I stopped short, noticing Butterfly singing along soundlessly and slapping her chiseled thigh in rhythm. Elven music lover. Everything seemed to be working, albeit with difficulty. My consciousness was somewhat blurred and slow. A lack of neurons, perhaps? You were one crafty serpent, Tavor, but not too bright. I sat down in the lotus position right on the sand and pulled up the virtual interfaces. I greedily browsed through my new goodies. And some goodies they were. Level 300! How did he manage to get so far, son goddammit? Time trick? Or by the efforts of a whole conveyor belt of slaves? His stats were stunning. A fortress of a man. Forty thousand health, armored like a secret vault, and with a muscle power of a stamping press. I knew this strategy too well. Like me, he had chosen the path of the immortal loner. But his numbers were nuts. Were they even normal for three hundred level players? Would we all get there in some two, three years? I wondered as I examined his gear. No, his stats were not the result of some miracle. Most of them came from his heavy armor items enhanced with divine bloodstones. I wasn't familiar with them, but they filled up all the expansion slots. Tons of bonus stats! The armor had been crafted. It had a futuristic look like something from a high-budget post-apocalyptic flick. Mithril plates, obscure-looking materials, welding marks, and molten plastic. All of various colors and bearing ancient military stamps. Clearly a product of modern alchemy. I barely made out the faded sign. T-51B. It looked as though Tavor had gathered a bunch of junk from the long-gone titans to throw this set together, loosely consulting the assembly instructions of an ancient teapot. Again, outstanding numbers. But the look... I mean, it wasn't too bad. After the wind-patched cloak, Grimm's ironic gift, my dress code wasn't so strict anymore. But alas, all his gear was labeled no drop. Could not be sold or lost. His hefty shell of armor came with a comfortable soft leather lining. Carefully looking under it, I found a homely gray getup for everyday wear. It was clean, but odd-looking. Homely, I should say. I was rightly outraged. I mean, WTF! I was risking so much, trying to beat the office plankton out of myself while carrying out massacres. Then, at the end, I loot a super cool dude to get nothing. The game algorithms had unfairly sealed everything off with nails of code. The jewelry helped cool me off. The handful of crimson treasures was worth a few million gold. Mostly amateur work. Awkwardly cut crystals of divine blood on twisted loops and wires. The interface spurted forth the stats of the divine stones. Titan's Ring. Artifact. Indestructible. Crafted by an unknown barbarian. Effect 1. Plus 700 life. Upgrade. Heavily damaged blood crystal. 
Enchanting bonus, regeneration, plus 25 HP per second. I wondered if Tavor also had a mad genius crafter who shat on gaming world laws. Or could he craft himself? That conceited moneybag had always had enough blind faith in his own greatness and in his right to do whatever. There were four of these rings. They canceled out the incessant shoulder bleeding, saving him several deaths. The earring in his right ear doubled crit chances and bespoke the current popular sexual orientation. Or that Tavor was the last male heir of a Cossack clan, which I doubt. Putting the rings back, I stopped my health decline along with the ear chopper's worried chatter. As Medeus was right, the staff must be used with caution. One careless stroke, and you'd not only make a player's life hell with a series of rebirths, but also make your PK counter go through the roof, and get insulting achievements. Bloody maniac or spawn killer. The weapon Tavord lost in battle came back into his inventory so it was bound to the body when it lived. Mithril butcher's hooks, surely the product of someone's sick fantasy, dripped poison and were speckled with rust. Tavor had fought with both arms, just what the doctor ordered for the types of enemies he had. Very few wizards could concentrate on a gate for six seconds while taking over a dozen damaging combo hits. I was no expert on warrior gear, but the weapon stats were impressive. I took a few screens of the armor and the giant hole puncher and forwarded them to the analyst. Let him figure it out. Finally, I got to the inventory. Wasn't much to look at. Tavor did have a safe lair, after all. Perhaps he just left most of his possessions there? Probably. Not very smart, as fate can play tricks there was always an above-zero chance of a mishap, like falling into a different dimension or the Stone Age. Personally, I always had useful things on me, even when back on Earth, from a mini first-aid kit to a gas tank to a multi-tool. A greedy pig nature, sure, but it had saved me more than once. No, Tavor was no bum. Far from it. I found a fine minibar with hundreds of precious elixirs in vials, elite grub from the famous masters, a huge folio with scrolls which beat my collection hands down, and I thought I had a lot. Web-winged noob! Warriors didn't own their magic. They had to have scrolls for all of life's emergencies, as many as their gold allowed. And Tavor's allowed a lot a hefty bag weighing almost fifty pounds. It sounded more impressive than it actually was inside. Twenty thousand gold. Not so much for someone so high up on the social pyramid. There was also a young sadist's kit. Chains, irons, ropes, and a suitcase with horrid-looking surgical tools. Fun. Specially made or sold at BDSM corner stores. That was about it. No treasure maps, no keys to secret doors, no crumpled up notes with passwords. Pity. The bastard was encrypted all over. All logins timed out every hour and got archived. Whatever was unsaved was brutally deleted. Even the built-in GPS maps were password protected. Moving your irises the right way was the only method of getting access. A move like that took but a moment and you could really feel the difference in security levels. Paranoid ass. I sighed and rose. A poor profit for such a risky venture. A little loot, but zero information. Shame. As Medeus walked up to me, held out his hand, and demanded, The blood necklace! I frowned. The demon had every right to his share, just as we'd agreed and the bastard had already figured out the prisoner's most precious object. Of course, the crystals were brutally holed and had lost plenty of bonuses, but there were about thirty of them on every wire, a vast array of stats and freebies. Plus, they were all doubled thanks to the mind-blowing, only-one-of-its-kind attribute. I shook my head. Only after I'm back and after you return my soul to its old container. As Medeus grumbled displeasedly, 
but technically I had the right to delay payment because the service had not yet been fully rendered. I took the bag of goodies, saluted my warriors with a fist, and activated the transportation scroll. So, Tavor, where is your lair? Chapter 6 The gateway's soft wings gently lowered me to the ground at the bind point. The magic's glow had barely subsided, and already my sense of smell was pointing me to the sleeping god's crypt. I recognized the range of scents, except for the carrion and... Ahem... Human feces? I blinked staring hard at the darkness in the corners and squinting at the burning torches. My field of vision rippled like a broken TV screen. My pupils dilated, shifting into night vision mode, then shrank right back, having caught the flame lights. I wrinkled my nose and tossed my head. At last the darkness receded. My elven vision caught the scarce photons and pulled the brightness up to a reasonable level. The pedestal with the sleeping god was still in place, but time had mercilessly swallowed up his warriors. Their reeking bones and shreds of skin were piled up beneath the walls. What a horrid lair! And where's my precious humongous? I'd gotten worried about him since yesterday. He did not respond to the artifact's call, nor had he come back with that mercenary in his jaws either. Years had passed in the underground over the last twenty-four hours. I recalled putting a lot of effort into the delay command and forcefully making that mercenary go perma just a second earlier. Or had the command I'd given in rage received the highest priority and outweighed the pet's preset limits? Teddy, where are you, dearest? One of the foul-smelling piles suddenly moved. Swollen eyes shot open. Pus leaked out of the numerous wounds. The creature gave a deep moan, then rose to its full and rather large height. Feeling for my weapons, I looked closely at the monster and gasped. Before me stood Humongous, disheveled and swaying on his feet. He had grown a few feet, lost all his gear, and had gotten noticeably thinner and more gray-haired. Countless wounds protruded in hideous lumps from underneath the tangled fur. His back paws were bending, the once massive muscles had been partially torn out. Seeing the ancient enemy before him, the bear growled wearily, bared his chipped fangs, and moved forward. I quickly put out my hand. Humongous, it's me, Max. I'm just in someone else's body. It's a disguise, see? Come on, my furry friend. Look into my soul. Version, I'll rip your head off, remember? The bear halted, tilting its massive head to the side, then inhaled deeply with its dry, chapped nose. It let out a sob of disbelief and a childish yelp, then started avidly licking my face with its rough tongue. There, there, it's gonna be all right. Sorry for leaving you in this tomb, I said as I wiped the huge tears off the bear's muzzle and let my own fall on it too. How long have you been here? Twenty years? Twenty-nine. Someone's hoarse voice came from behind. I turned my head sharply, only to get a mighty whack on my right cheek. It was as if a pellet had exploded in my head. My facial bones cracked nastily. Crit, you received 1.356 damage points in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Slight injury. Right facial muscles paralyzed. Duration, fifteen minutes. Recoiling, I breathed in through my broken nose, whipped out a butcher's hook, and went for the swift stranger. The skinny, bearded hermit with insane eyes wore a bare hide loincloth, barely covering his privates. He moved like a legendary ninja, lazily dodging my mighty blows, a spiteful grin upon his lips. I slashed with all the power and agility of a 340-level warrior. The mithril blade brushed against the air molecules, making them grow hot. But I could not even touch the bastard. Damn it, it's the mercenary, the same one I had forced into the altar world. Still a pitiful level twelve. But how? Finally, 
I got the good side of the randomizer. The enemy failed to dodge. He had to block my next attack. Instantly, one of Tavor's passive abilities kicked in. Part of the potential damage went through the block and got the bare-ass sucker. And you didn't need a lot of damage for someone who was just under level 20. The mercenary lost a third of his HP. His sparse beard shaking, he muttered something indistinctly and started punching. Oh, brother, he fought like a motorized sledgehammer. Eyes couldn't follow the two to three blows that he dealt in a row. A bloody mess filled the room as if a rat had crawled into an industrial fan. I dodged the best I could as I flew through the combat interface, trying to find a vial of something powerful. But all in vain. In ten seconds, I got turned into tender minced meat with crumbled bone. Finally, a mighty uppercut sent the mercenary flying. But as he left the ground, he rammed his feet into my liver. I spat blood as I fell back, spinning. Bam! My face crashed into the sarcophagus, then slid off with a nasty squeak, leaving a thick scarlet stripe on its surface. Shit! What kind of monster is he? Humongous howled, stepping forth and shielding me with his body. The bear trembled as if doomed, his stubby tail tucked up shamefully. The mercenary said indignantly, Bad canned food! Why you fight? Fighter meat's hard to chew! Want me to bust your bones and rip out your spine again? The naked man and the two-thousand-pound bear clashed within a foot of me. Their outlines instantly blurred as they reached insane speeds. The deafening blows resembled the incessant rattle of a SPAAG. In two seconds, the battered bear was thrown against the wall and collapsed on the ancient bones. God damn, they're all bear remains. Tens, hundreds of corpses, all at different stages of decomposition. Humongous? The mercenary spat in disappointment and stomped his foot. Stupid canned food. Now I gotta eat rot for another week. It gives me diarrhea. Bastard! I wheezed and charged at the madman. Wham! A kick threw me back, breaking yet another rib and adorning the divine sarcophagus with a second scarlet blob. The mercenary squatted leisurely, his horrendously large pupils fixed upon me. He hugged himself and began to rock excitedly. A yummy! Now the Iron Lord has a new yummy! A feast! Another feast! Oh, but life used to suck! Pain, death, can food's heavy paw. I punched the snotty nose, then died, then came back and punched again. And I got a strength point for each hit I dealt. The Lord grew stronger, like an LM-432. A hundred and nine thousand deaths, blood, iron, broken gear. The mercenary ripped a piece of meat out of the bear's side, which was still warm. The bluish, pointy teeth sunk into the bloody flesh. The bull terrier-like jaws ground monotonously. Five years of the same thing. It took so long to get strong. Pain. And then I tried canned food for the first time. Delicious. As I listened to his mumbling and tried to remember what he was saying, I was quickly searching for a way out of this shit which I'd voluntarily gotten myself into. Thirty years of accumulating points really showed. And now this deceptively low-level freak could have any top tank for lunch. I knew why he'd got stuck at twelve. No XP for pets or players. If he killed a god, he still wouldn't get shit due to the huge level difference. But the asshole's done well. Found a way to level up. I could have foreseen this. I got an agility point myself while somersaulting out of the sun god's crumbling temple. Had I danced like that for three decades, I wouldn't be swimming in my own blood right now. I would have massacred the shithead. So, this is the Alter World's future. Fart attacks from rotten meat, corpses piling up instead of vanishing, and battle wounds for life. Well, it was uncertain if we'd all get there. The Time Anomaly was a micro-universe for three creatures. Bears, the mercenary and the sleeping god with his disturbing dreams. Much of what was happening was a reflection of their thoughts and their perception of reality. And now, this wild hick was sitting before me, feasting on raw meat. 
I was like an ancient KV tank against the latest T90 model. Same technological gap, same construction difference. All of my power was derived from leveling up, and his from constant training. My proud level 340 paled in comparison to the mercenary's outrageous agility, strength, and hand-to-hand -hand combat stats. I did not want to die, for the spawn point was right there. I did not want to follow in Humongous's footsteps and become a sweet can. They wouldn't start missing me on the surface right away. Plus, it'd take time to get to the castle, bust through the defenses, and find passages to the crypt. I was in deep shit. Overwhelmed by bad feelings, I began to squirm, trying to sit up. The crystal shards littering the floor around the sarcophagus cut painfully into my palms. I wondered if someone had been nibbling on the lid. I looked and saw that the sarcophagus was indeed in a terrible shape. A web of scratches, cracks, and dents covered the thick, once transparent surface. Through a particularly large opening, I discerned a huge lacerated wound gleaming through the yellow skin over the exposed ribcage. Divine flesh. Divine blood. Blood? Wincing at the thought, I turned around and rammed my hand into the opening. I wished that Tavor hadn't thought of this before me, or it wouldn't work. The mercenary stopped short and jumped up. What you up to, yummy? Quit your fooling around! The sharp edges of the opening shredded my forearm. I howled with pain. Putting my whole weight into it, I finally forced my poor limb inside and sunk my fingers into the damp gash. The mercenary grabbed me by the collar and easily threw me aside. But it was too late. Turning away and holding my head down lest I should give away one of the clan's most precious secrets, I crammed my blood-spattered fingers into my mouth with a triumphant moan. Status alert! You have tasted divine blood again. Another particle of divine essence will remain with you forever. You are now another step above other mortals in your skills and abilities. But beware of arrogance and don't deem yourself equal to the gods. The stairway to heaven is long and fragile. Some even think it has no end. The damn thing actually worked. I met the punitive blow to the liver with an insidious smile. Status alert! The divine essence particle is reacting to the first hostile impact and is dissolving in your aura in order to preserve itself and its bearer. Partial hand-to-hand -hand combat immunity received, 90%. Chances of getting a crit and an injury are reduced threefold. Now I could fight! I jumped to my feet, took the massive healing vial from my belt, and downed the refreshing elixir under a hail of minor blows. The mercenary was enraged. His calloused fists knocked the dust out of my armor with a ringing sound. But his blows felt like a child's weak slaps. I was beginning to enjoy this game. My one good arm was broken in two places. This affected my strength and agility. But this weakling didn't need much. The mithril hook began to slice the air again. Cursing, the mercenary started dodging while I picked up new warrior abilities. I decided to try one of them. Vengeance. 30% chance of blocking enemy attacks and counterattacking. Duration, 20 seconds. Recharge, 10 minutes. And one more from the war cry set. Cry of rage. Instills terror into the enemy, decreasing their agility by 150 points. Duration, 30 seconds. Recharge, 15 minutes. I activated both abilities. The effect was instantaneous. The mercenary's dodging jig failed. I hit the bare-ass bastard twice. The blocks made his bones jingle. The asswipe's health plummeted into the red. That'll teach him to fend off steel with his arms. With a perturbed groan, the mercenary jumped aside, activated stealth, and made for the low arch in the far corner of the crypt. I lowered my weapon with a sigh of relief. He said he'd be back damned Terminator. The low underground vault still echoed with his cursing and promises of a plethora of torture. I couldn't catch him on my broken legs. Not that I wanted to. This situation called for magic, 
with its precision and long-distance damage. I wasn't about to engage that meat grinder in hand-to-hand -hand combat again. But the problem had to be solved. To leave the fucker in the crypt another day meant twenty more years for his strength to increase. That's the sort of rat I wouldn't be thrilled to have in the castle's bowels. But I had to put it off, having other business to take care of. I carefully pulled a portal beacon out of my inventory. Activating it, I hid it safely between the stone tiles and piled some random junk on top. The first task was done. The clan's on-duty wizard was casting spells every minute, trying to open portals to wherever the beacon was. The assault division was sweating in full battle gear, ready to come to its commander's rescue within seconds of their transportation. The only problem was that a minute for them was a week for me. I kneeled before my Teddy's cold corpse, sniffling, running my fingers through the messy fur, untangling parts of it. I'm sorry, bud. Sorry for going perma and for coming so late. You've waited for me. Died a thousand times, then respawned, trying to carry out the order, and waited. Waited for the master to come get you out of this hideous crypt. Thank you. Let's go home. They're waiting for you there. My broken bones creaking, I spat blood as I sat on the floor and reached into my bag. I pulled out the stack of scrolls, flipped to where the green bookmark was, and hurriedly tore out the healing spells for various wounds. I had six mild, three medium, and eight heavy injuries. Damn that bone grinder. Within a minute, I was no longer keeling over like a sinking ship. Breathing got easier, and my good arm was soon ready for action. In case I should run into the mercenary again, I filled my quick slots with magic tricks of different caliber. Pious indignation, a thirst for revenge, and the splinter in my ass all made me want to pursue the enemy. The arch he had fled through looked like a narrow technogenic passageway or some cable call center. There were rusty fasteners under the ceiling. The long dead lamps were covered with moss. A sound of clanging metal came from around the bend. The damp air smelled of car oil and dirty johns. As anyone who is familiar with the creations of Hollywood, I knew exactly what to do. Go forward and make every possible foe aware of my presence with a loud, Hello? Is anybody there? Of course I kept quiet. Regretting not having a pet, I pulled in my shoulders as much as I could and moved on. The passage was really narrow. Too narrow for trolls and orcs, and for armored renegades, too. My shoulder straps scraped the fluffy mold off the walls, exposing the shining loops of golden mana circuits. Those babies were impressive, so wide that Tian Long himself would have probably choked on the mana flow. The passageway became a spiral tunnel with a slight downward grade. A tiny stream babbled beneath my feet. The clanging sound drew nearer. I reached stop number one. Actually, Station One, according to the peeling sign on the wall. Only one light had miraculously survived and now flickered overhead. The rusty barrel of a chain gun dangled from the ceiling. Holy shit! That gun was ancient! And clearly unusable, its base was almost entirely corroded. The place itself looked like a small spherical cell, about twenty paces wide. The clanging came from a group of monsters. Three two-hundred-level worker droids were bustling near the tin-plated fuse box, supervised by a two-hundred-and-forty-level master droid. Looked like friggin' Star Wars. Titan's legacy, a reality invasion, or admin joke. Or just a hidden location, a trap for Stargate fans. Their money was as good as that of fantasy lovers, so why not? I squinted at the monsters not mentioned in the wiki. How I wanted to dig through their metal innards for loot. They all had green auras, meaning they weren't a threat for a badass level 340 warrior. But I wasn't used to dissing 200-level mobs, and my character was virtually a handicap, a dead arm, complete combat illiteracy, and total unawareness of his own abilities and combos, a crab with one claw which was stuck up his ass, so to speak.
yet I did have some tricks up my sleeve. Before attacking, I sat on the terrifyingly creature-like moss and quickly studied my battle interfaces. I deleted everything that required two blades and replaced it all with pictograms that called for one weapon only. Now I knew why most of my skills didn't work on the mercenary. I glanced over the abilities, the auras, the war cries, pumping kilobytes of them into my absolute memory. Then I pictured the upcoming battle in detail a few times and nodded to myself, satisfied with the plan. I downed a healing potion just in case, then pensively examined the acid cloud vial. After a moment of mercenary hesitation, I flung the delicate glass, shattering it amidst the bustling droids. As they darted out of the green mist, I greeted them with a chilling cry of terror. They froze in funny postures. I swallowed anxiously. That was one hell of a war cry. I almost paralyzed myself. I raced to the nearest foe. The cheat mod highlighting its most vulnerable points flickered helplessly. Not finding the enemies in the database, it marked the droid's optical sensors orange. Then, as if in doubt, it circled their joints, armor plate junctions, and their external blocks of unknown function. I agreed with the pseudo-intelligent program algorithms. Like a mad hammer man, I crashed the hook into the now armorless droid, sparks flying everywhere. The opponent's health went down rather slowly. After all, the speedy one-hand weapon was intended to be used as one of a pair, and mostly against wizards. These steel dildos required something heavier. Finally, on the tenth blow, I smashed the delicate optical sensors, triple critting the poor worker droid. One by one, the enemies came out of paralysis. A plasma burner, a red-hot soldering iron, and an insanely fast drill flashed in the jumble as they came at me. Ouch! My day stopped being so slow. I quickly finished the first foe with reckless hand-to-hand -hand combos. Headbutt, knee, elbow. Tie boxing in all its glory. Now, on top of everything, my busted forehead was bleeding right into my eyes while my elbow joint crunched as I moved. Well, talk about misguided zeal. Tavor's body was having a stupefying effect on me. I'd never been known to headbutt steel before. We exchanged a series of small blows, occasionally interspersing them with timely combos. The mighty hits drew groans of pain. The odds were in my favor. Insanely high HP plus armor several inches thick. I turned my enemies into scrap metal within minutes, losing three-quarters health and gaining a tiny bit of XP. The loot, however, left me puzzled. Half a bag of screws and cogwheels, as well as a few handfuls of unknown coins. The value was clear. Copper, silver, gold. But their octagonal shape with a hole in the middle intrigued me. The total coin weight made me happy, being almost twice that of the alter world currency. I wondered if a money reform was in order, perhaps an introduction of a new temple coin into circulation? The enemies had also left behind a small tool case resembling an undersized chest. The lock was medium difficulty and called for a rogue or an assassin with some solid abilities. The other options were to hammer away at the chest with little chance of success or to use a spell. The latter option was pricey but quite common. Tavor turned out to have a whole stack of spells suitable for a task of this nature. Guess he'd been here before. I activated one and... Fail. Damn, I kind of forgot that there was a chance of failure. I tried again, and fortune turned me down a second time. I ran the risk of busting the lock. Thankfully, on the third attempt, I succeeded. With a nasty creak, the chest bestowed a zip kit upon me. It consisted of a rechargeable battery, a PC processor, a worker droid diagram, and five platinum coins of the new design. Fascinating. The currency reforms and my very own army of drones were beginning to seem quite feasible. Considering that not a second had passed on the surface thus far, the underground was growing more appealing. Having healed myself, I continued to squeeze my way forward through the passage. Another fifty paces, and I reached a second station. Saw the same drones, 
only ten levels higher. I figured I could take them. A minute's planning, visualizing the coming fight, and a little strength buff. As the smiling Yuri Gagarin would say, Let's go! Baring my teeth at the thought of my own awesomeness, I carefully let a few explosive vials roll into the room. Swearing in the middle of my battle cry, I charged into the mess. Zero conspiracy. Our fight could be heard for miles around. Forget the quiet rustling of the blades sinking into pliant flesh. The deafening sound of metal crushing metal took its place. Everything happened just as I had planned. A little more health lost, and the blows were slightly harder. The circular saw mounted on one of the enemy's arms was a bother. Its damage was mild, though. The effect was mostly psychological. The saw buzzed like a dentist's drill as it cut through armor, sending sparks flying. Then it sank into my flesh, creating a bloody halo, getting stuck in the bones and filling the room with the burning stench of a crematorium. Rough. More zip kits and coins for me as I opened the trophy chest on the first try this time. Platinum, memory and encrypted connection units, battery packs thin as chocolate bars, assembler droid instructions. I wondered if they had a plumber. My blood boiling with excitement, I went on, overcome with curiosity. At the fourth station I encountered some serious resistance. It forced me to part with an expensive trump card. Gimmicks crossbow turrets. The bolts mostly ricocheted off the steel, but they helped me win. As I collected the trophies, I bit my lip, wondering if it was wise to go any further. Was it time to flip off the ambition switch, take what I had, and leave? I was already familiar with the dungeon structure, a downward spiral with a series of stations. The monsters were a slightly higher level at each one, and the loot got more abundant and diverse the deeper you went. It was the thirst for trophies that made me continue my descent. Or maybe I'd had enough of solo farming. Handling the clan's managerial paperwork was not exactly my ultimate dream. Station 5 greeted me with three level 240 master droids and one level 300 guard. I also saw the first warriors, with ugly armament adapters on one arm and semi-transparent force field shields on the other. Hesitating and pensively fingering my chin, I wondered whether I should risk fighting or not. Shit, these were Tavor's movements, not mine. I've never had this habit. Damn how I wanted to return to my own body. A bone crunched under my foot. The aggro radius of the guard instantly grew ten paces wider. The red dot of his weapon found its target. There was a brief squeal as he pumped up his laser and burned right through my foot. The damage was considerable, but I was grateful that it didn't hurt. I had to fight without a plan. The threat was severe, I knew, so I quickly used the last two turrets. The passageway here was narrower. The enemies lined up, only to get minced one by one. Laser shots came from behind them continuously while I could hear the crossbow's measured clicks behind myself. Setting a new clumsiness record... I almost got Tavor's kick-ass avatar killed. It was like one of those times when someone has to play the piano immediately after an arm transplant. I was the guy who played with one finger. The battle dragged on. Ten minutes of minor pain, clanging steel and blinding flashes in the dungeon's darkness. I killed the droids one after another. The healing vials were starting to make me sick. Weariness began to affect my agility and strength. The guard was the last to fall. His low-grade mithril armor provided pretty good protection. But like most snipers, he didn't have much health. He was easy to finish off after his force field shield gave in. Catching my breath after I'd won, I picked up the new loot of a yet undetermined rareness, then spent quite some time on the chest. I wasted all my scrolls destroying the lock. Enraged, I blunted my weapon against the rusty piece of junk. The game physics broke down on the hundredth blow. The crude iron surrendered to the mithril at last. Hmm. I didn't see much need for having supercargo droid instructions on hand. But the weapon cartridge, the plates of add-on armor, 
and the omnipresent stack of battery packs were a delight to behold with their futuristic designs and perfect forms. The platinum wasn't so pretty, but was a pleasure to stuff the wallet with anyway. Somewhere far behind, I heard the rapid firing of the crossbow I'd left at Station 4. That meant enemy respawn. I had to hurry back before they ran out of bolts and before the monsters crushed the defenseless shooter. I wouldn't make it any deeper anyway. Plus, the chances of running into that mercenary grew as I went down. I didn't need that. I promised myself I'd come back. The dungeon was a unique find, frozen in time and growing in levels. I'd bring the guys here, and we'd be stuck here for an eternity. Only a few days' worth of surface time, and we'd have entire decades down here. I deactivated the half-empty turrets, deciding to leave them by the sarcophagus. They could guard any divine blood from the insane mercenary. I decided to also throw the third crossbow in there, to make an equilateral triangle for full coverage and maximum firing capacity. It was time to go. Up above was a massive, unattended castle awaiting its owner. And that owner was racing back at full speed. Chapter 7 Slightly earlier, the vet's south castle, Light Wing. In the portal hall, I was greeted by a gloomy commandant in addition to the ordinary guard. He wrinkled his face discontentedly, his gaze heavy and hypnotizing. I've been informed of the purpose of your visit. Let me point out that the sanctuary fireplace had accepted the gifts not more than three days ago. Further feeding of the flame is useless, or perhaps even dangerous. Only General Fragg's direct order forces me to comply. Take me there, I interrupted his grumbling speech, and headed for the exit without waiting for him. I understood why he was like that. Aside from other duties, his post implicitly forced him to be the castle fireplace keeper. He wasn't all too happy about having to let a stranger into the castle's inner sanctuary. But I had neither the time nor the desire to explain everything to him. Thus, having concrete insurance in the form of Frag's papers, I pushed forward like a tank. As we neared the control room, the passage intersections grew scarce, while the wall thickness and the numbers of gun slots and guard posts drastically increased. Finally, we passed a massive door that led to the castle artifact and stopped by the sanctuary's small arch. I'll take it from here, I said, as I placed a hand on the commandant's shoulder to hold him back. Ignoring his protests, I threw the heavy curtain back and entered. The castle furnace flame was glowing calmly right in the center of the round room. Beneath the walls, potential gifts had been laid out, perfectly cut logs of the rarest trees, select coal, oil pitchers and boxes of semi-precious stones, including lazulite, malachite, cat's eye, and others. With a courteous bow, I neared the furnace, which was black from the heat, sat down, and assumed the lotus pose near the circle of stones around it. Untying the bag, I carefully pulled out my own offerings. Despite the obvious rarity of my gifts, I wasn't sure they'd suit the goddess's taste. You can't always get it right even with your own girl, let alone a celestial dweller. Thus, in preparation for the upcoming event, I'd had to employ all of my connections, as well as monetary and mental resources. The bundle of black branches from a swallower, the only plant that could survive on the basalt plains of the Inferno, had come to me at the price of the lives of a dozen ear-choppers and the loss of three precious levels. Alas, even the top healers could not resurrect the fallen with a hundred percent XP return. At first, the flame recoiled in fear. Then, as if getting used to the smell, it reached for the thin branches distrustfully. It licked them, then flared up, the blaze greedily consuming the mysterious gift. A finely crafted mithril cage contained a sleeping lava-dwelling salamander, also found in the inferno, 
The creature was the result of four days of camping near an active volcano. To enchant such a high-level critter had proven quite a challenge, even for the star of the Aphrodite-worshipping rangers who caught it using the goddess's power of love. It was much more difficult than fooling a wolf. You had to take risks, facing hardships and constant deaths. I'd rather not speak of the incurred expenses. I tapped the salamander on the nose to awaken it from its trance, then threw the cage door open and tossed the rare creature into the furnace. The happy squeal of an animal returned to its natural habitat drowned out the commandant's uneasy breathing coming from behind the heavy curtain. Watching the salamander dance amidst the tongues of flame, I smiled, somewhat jealous of the vets. Few sanctuaries had their own fire spirit, but theirs did now. The last gift was a handful of rubies, not low-grade pea-sized ones, but select stones the size of a pigeon's egg. They had been acquired at an auction and cost us fifteen pounds of gold from the clan's treasury. Biting my lip in anticipation of the coming pain, I thrust the gift into the raging flame. The light goddess's creation parted at first so as not to touch the aura of the fallen one's first priest. But its curiosity and greed soon took over. A single tongue of the flame reached for my palm and, like a shy, homeless cat, carefully licked the precious stones from it. My gifts were accepted. Gently petting the quivering flames, I said quietly, Hestia, I call upon thee. Nothing had changed in the stuffy crypt. It had the same slaughterhouse feel with a nauseating decor of a low-budget horror flick, ancient bones, impenetrable darkness, and a stifling stench. Humongous's cold corpse had shrunk, its skinny sides had dried up completely, and the glassy-eyed stare was heavy with silent reproach. I couldn't just walk by. Gritting my teeth in rage, I squatted by it, petting the massive head and whispering soundlessly, I won't leave it like this. I'll have a monument erected on this very spot, made of Inferno's black gold marble, to commemorate your eternal loyalty and honor your unparalleled sense of duty. I stepped aside and took some screenshots from different angles. Then I compressed them, preparing to mail them to the leader of Gimhe, an ally clan. The Koreans were rumored to have a legendary sculptor who worked miracles even with ordinary clay. Sure, he wouldn't refuse a man who had saved a hundred of his relatives from a terrible fate and had helped his clan reach the very top. I then arranged the massive crossbow turrets in a wide triangle around the tattered sarcophagus. Checking their range, I made semi-reliable parapets out of the surrounding junk and maxed out the turret's aggression settings. I cast a doubtful look upon the yellow marker indicating the charge of the magic batteries, then turned on anti-stealth. This would deplete the mana accumulator three times faster, but would help detect an invisible enemy, should one sneak up. Alas, I could not recharge the ammo cartridges. One needed to be a master golem builder or a light siege machinery operator to do that. Despite the depressing atmosphere and having faced some rough situations over the past couple of hours, my soul purred and sang as if I had just gotten a relaxing massage. The reason was simple. I was no longer under time pressure. I no longer felt time slipping through my fingers, no longer feared being late. The magic formula, a week here equals a minute in reality, relaxed the tightly wound springs of my mind and put an unintentionally silly smile on my lips. I had over thirty important books I needed to get to fast. Memoirs, strategy and tactics, personnel management, and big team psychology. Plus abandoned forums, blogs, and alter-world news portals on top of that. I barely had time for short analytical excerpts before my morning meetings. It just wasn't right. I'd lost the day's political pulse, ceased to understand the hidden motives of things. And lastly, I'd had a few hundred letters hopelessly awaiting thoughtful replies. Damn, I could have done with simply lying around in bed in no hurry, oblivious to Kronos and his breath. What a bliss! 
Of course, the crypt needed major cleaning and a complete makeover for starters. My feet waded through the crystal debris as I walked around the sarcophagus, noticing teeth marks on it. I sat on the floor, leaning my back against the divine resting place in a buddy-buddy way. It was the primary jewel of the place. The sacred blood, a strategic resource, impossible to pay for in gold. The quality of sleep itself was awfully important. Any blockhead could have awakened the ancient god, the fallen one forbid. Who knows what he might have done then? I had no doubt that before me lay a true time master. The interface marked the NPC as uncategorized, classifying it as a titan and bashfully withholding the name. Its crimson life meter, which was only six percent full, instilled fear. After my first visit to the crypt, I rummaged through the wiki, immersing myself into the atrocious details of the Olympic gods' lives. Kronos, the son of Uranus and Gaia, the first gods to come out of the primordial chaos. Uranus hated his children and returned them to their mother's womb. Resolving to ease mommy's fate, Kronos castrated daddy with an adamant sickle. He then married his sister, but did not show his own children much love either, devouring them right after birth. One day, his loyal wife tricked him, feeding him a stone in baby blankets instead of the newborn Zeus. Of course, Zeus wasn't the nicest guy ever, but that's a different story. Overall, I did not like the Olympians, especially considering that they made up the pantheon of light. The U.S. developer's imagination was limited by a narrow-minded education system and a disdain for the histories of other countries. If it's not shown in Hollywood, it doesn't exist. The sun god turned out to be the perfect prototype for a Helios or an Apollo-type avatar. You had to dig deep to understand. The timid Asclepius was Apollo's son. But who was he really? An A.I. gone perma? A true divine incarnation? Or just a binary code slowly acquiring flesh by the power of our faith? The amorous Aphrodite was the perfect fit for the role of the fairest one, granting protection to paladins, farmers, and courtesans. She played her dirty tricks on those who rejected love and stifled passions. As the fallen one had told me, the birth of Screwyall would have been impossible without the presence of a goddess of love marriage, and birth in the world. Hestia was the keeper of the hearth. Most real estate owners, even mayors, worshipped her as either their first or second divinity. Her freebies were too good to pass up. Higher comfort and home safety levels, more luck for crafters beneath their blessed roofs, and fine bonuses for those who defended their homes. Hestia, the virgin goddess who turned down Apollo and Poseidon the elder sister of the first-generation Olympians, yet too weak for the altar world. The sun god had taken advantage of her weakness, unwilling to restrain his lust. I take what can be taken, the logic of the master of life. My recollections of the sun god's patriarch were full of rape and violence accompanied by odd rituals. The sun god trusted no one from his circle, avidly seeking a way to get all the mana flow for himself and brutally crushing any and all dissenting views. His sickly sweet claims of democracy were a smokescreen for total tyranny. Man, was I familiar with this tactic. Hestia wasn't the only pretty lady of the light pantheon. Nike was next on the list. The winged goddess of victory, the sister of strength, might and jealousy which, according to the ancient Greeks, always accompanied the winner. Nike held weapons and trophies in her hands, symbolizing fine rewards for her worshippers. Higher XP and loot, more rare items dropped, cumulative bonuses for victories and goodies. It was no surprise that most of all the sun god's worshippers offered her expensive gifts. And lastly, Hermes. I could only applaud the sun god for finding such a helpful and completely safe candidate. On one hand, Hermes was the master of commerce, theft, intelligence, alchemy, and magic. On the other hand, he was a merry rogue in winged sandals, always eager to please, 
he went wherever he was sent. All this I considered as I pondered the fate of the sleeping God. Was I to finish him, to acquire an ingot of precious adamant, yet lose this unique location? No, to kill the sleeping is sheer impropriety, and I was not eager to part with the ability to pause time. But to waken him? Fuck that! Loth was already plenty enough for me. The very thought made me want to surround the sarcophagus with aerial bombs just in case. I could have built a mithril cage or a steel chest around him, but that was a bad decision. He'd probably bear a serious grudge against me for that later. I didn't need that, so I decided to set up something simple instead. Like a presidential bedroom suite. For real, I'd let Lurch have complete freedom with the interior design, funds provided. A golden altar, rare fragrances, and a magic singing sink with a five-octave vocal spectrum. No, better. Gorgeous priestesses to pray and polish the glass for years. I'd give it my very best, and I'd throw in one of those tiny doors with a fancy lock on the sarcophagus, so that visitors could slip in some flowers or reach in for a little blood. The rest of the crypt's decor quickly formed in my mind's eye. A wine cellar for aging alcohol, loot storage, small equipment repair shop, warrior housing for leveling up, officers' quarters, and my very own office along with a recreation area to relax in. Giving my imagination a break, I looked up and estimated the crypt's dimensions. Pity. It looked like I'd have to cut back on my wishes. Plank beds replaced the comfy couches as my imaginary resort shrank to just a nice set of barracks. But it mattered little. The key here was the opportunity to put my warriors through a time anomaly and level them up at the droid's expense. I wished I'd known how deep the dungeon went, what the last station number was, and where did the giant gold mana circuit lead. The first temple had less than six days of immunity left. About a hundred fifty years local time. Hell yeah! Of course, there were a few problems. The spiral passage would have to be widened to let the larger trolls, ogres, and golems pass through. I needed Snowy and my personal guard. Plus, the clan already had about thirty fat asses of different races. No more than five warriors would fit into one station at a time, even if huddled together. Not that that was needed. Each station had four monsters with fifteen-minute respawn timers. It was an ideal environment for lazily leveling up a small group. The monsters were rather high level, though, even on Station 1. Nothing, however, that proper rotation and support couldn't tell Pandal. I grew cold at my next thought. Within the next six days, my warriors would need to be paid for a hundred and fifty years, plus repairs, ammunition, and other expenses. Every second, a whole crowd of warriors would jump out of the portal after a week-long training session in the dungeon. They'd flood the pubs, their own beds, poor wives, and the house of pleasures. All of the dungeon loot was either scrap metal or high-tech gadgets. Good for amusement, not payment. True, the armor plates from Station 5 were made from some composite, including almost 2% mithril, but that was pitiful. The hold octagons that dropped instead of real money, I planned to keep as the clan tax. Couldn't give the droids away, either. The modules would go to the armory, but the rest of the scrap iron would have to be bought for gold. I couldn't keep all the loot. The boys would turn against me. That could result in a quiet protest or even a full-blown mutiny. Whether a working droid could be built was a tough question. I guessed that it couldn't. Otherwise, Tavor's guards would have been walking tank prototypes with an EMRG and reactive armor, not a couple of golems. Anyway, I had to monetize my right to this miracle. But I decided against auctions because of their commissions, virtual police, and blocking of finances. I resorted to a regular announcement board. But I paid for all the extra stuff to make an impression. The nice font, the anonymous postman, the topmost position, and the wide distribution. They needed to see that I was serious. I also paid for a rare expert rating service testifying to my seller trustworthiness. 
a guaranteed high trust score and my ticket to the top 100 Ultra World's most influential persons list. So yeah, it had its pluses. Thus I prepared two packets. Attention, Ultra World first-timers. Those gone perma, you have a unique opportunity. Don't like your digitized body? Sick of green skin? Scared of your own reflection? Ogre's natural retardation kicking in? Don't sweat it. I can help you. I can put your mind into a new body. Unique. High-level avatars available. Male and female. High levels, top skills, rich histories, and high NPC society ranks. The ritual is complicated. There are risks involved. An adaptation period will follow. Seriously expensive. PM with serious inquiries only. Also, I digitized the mercenary against his will. I could perform this trick again with full cooperation. So, attention, let me perform a miracle and bring back hope for those whose minds are preventing them from going perma. I have expressed digitization technologies capable of busting any barriers of a consciousness anchored in reality. Fast, safe, outrageously expensive. PM me. Supplies extremely limited. Thus I dropped another bomb into the merry gaming altar world. Something to chat about, to pull your ass hair over, to forget the quests of light for. For every kilojoule of the creator's spark I'd spend, I would demand several favors, both small and large, including an oath of allegiance to the fallen one. An eternity in exchange for loyalty and gold. I pondered for a moment, then sent a dozen orders to the clan and prepared to send out messages for the analyst, Widowmaker, and Orcus. I copied the shreds of Tavor's information that had remained accessible. I carefully examined his personal file dump, the virtual screenshot album, the template and log settings. I bumped into password requests over and over again, leaving me staring at an empty space. This was a master's touch indeed. A triumph of personal security. At least all this gave me a good idea. I resolved to hire specialists to develop a similar security system for my clanmates. Installation would be mandatory. While you're in another player's body, the chances of someone stealing your avatar were quite high. The info packets were lined up to be delivered and awaited their transfer to the outer world. I didn't want to delay. My mission was only half complete. The castle had not yet been fully seized. I got up and brushed off my clothes, then looked at the far wall appraisingly. The main entrance arch was sealed with a dull, semi-transparent magic field. This was the passage that had once been guarded by two huge golems, through which Tavor's rescuers had burst into the crypt. It had to lead to the heart of the castle. I just knew it. Broken bones crunching underfoot, I approached the arch. A motionless golem stood beside it. The precious mithril resisted moss and mold, but was covered in dust. The stooping, sullen-looking figure had clearly broken down due to its magic battery running low. And there was another problem. In order to get this type of machinery going, the dungeon had to have an incessant supply of charged crystals. And even then... In the event of an intense battle, the battery would be drained within an hour. Recharging it would take a high-level wizard a whole day of tedious work. Still, the golem was a fine trophy. Its controlling artifact would have to be replaced, as those things were usually password-protected or hopelessly tied to their operators. Other than that, my master of crossbow artillery had just got himself yet another cool piece. I approached the magic field of the arch. The iridescent magic film reddened and bulged out, reaching for me like a predator. Fuck! I started back, scratched my chin pensively, then slapped myself on the wrist. Damn Tavor's habits! Clearly this barrier was not part of the lower area of the castle's dome shield, which was closed and spherical. Didn't look like small travel altar either, which was a new mod for the dome. This tiny energy hog of a mod had just recently hit the market. Its popularity soared, noticeably choking the profits of the armored door and stained glass window businesses. A week ago, 
Lurch had sent me a request to obtain forty-three sets of force field doors of various elite-level capacities and dimensions. Oddly enough, Orcus and Durin backed up my amateur designer on this one, so I knew I'd have to cough up the money for it soon. Yet this arch was more complex than a magic barrier. It reached for me anxiously, as if yearning to taste warm blood. Wait, I thought. Was that last thought my own guess, or the body's memory? Well, here you go, insatiable bitch. I held out my hand, barely forcing myself to stay still, as the magic field threw itself at me with lightning speed. The crimson film wrapped around my wrist, bit down lightly, and licked off a drop of blood. In an instant, it determined whether I had the right to enter, or if it should bite my arm off. Exhaling, disappointedly, the magic guard turned a friendly green and pulled back. On the second try, my hand went through the field without encountering resistance. Holding my breath for some reason, I unhesitantly stepped in. It worked. The outgoing mail was sent, the PM inbox flooded with incoming messages. I sent the automatic log forwarding script to Widowmaker, then looked around carefully. Three stationary portals lighted a small platform with their glow. Live and rich. That was quite a bit of energy to splurge on comfortable and speedy transportation. The dusty ladder, which led somewhere far up and was poorly lit by widely spaced torches, reassured me in my conviction. I got the logic. Considering the crypt's time flow, to waste precious minutes going up the ladder would have been nuts. But I dared not enter the portals, Hell knows what torture chamber, guard housing, or complicated trap Tavor's perverted imagination might have led me into. It was better to go on foot. It wasn't as if I had a crown that could tumble from my head while climbing stairs. Plus, I had to place the last portal beacon somewhere along the way. Otherwise, why had I paid crazy money for it at the auction and crushed the other desperate bidders so unfairly? I highly doubted I could lead my clanmates through that paranoid magic field arch. During my five-minute rush up the stairs, I quickly paused to slip the beacon into a crack in the wall that my eye had happened upon. The massive door creaked as I entered the inner castle passageways. The relaxed guards sprang to their feet nervously. I made a stern face and sharply nodded in response to their salutes. The sound of the portal snapping shut made me wince. I listened to the approaching sound of heavy footsteps. A shortish fat man entered the hall. He had the flat ears of a wrestler. Instantly, he began bowing and chattering subserviently. Oh, wonderful! The master has returned. You've been gone for thirty-seven hours. May I inquire how much that would be in your time? Twenty-nine years, I was quick to answer, remembering the mercenary's count. Oh, dear! An enthusiastic look came over his face. He bowed respectfully. Then his gaze settled on my bandaged arm. His eyes betrayed an almost sincere alarm. Master's wounded. Shall I summon a healer? I waved him away. Not necessary. I've received all the treatment I needed. The wounds inflicted by divine beings don't heal so easily. I'm more worried about my memory lapses. Remind me, who are you? The fat man opened his mouth in astonishment, wringing his chubby hands in a funny way, and wailed, how do you mean, master? Oh, what a tragedy! Taver's body reacted to disobedience as usual. A heavy slap of the steel gauntlet crushed one of the fat man's ears, splashing the left side of his face with scarlet drops. I swallowed nervously and clenched my fists, regaining control of Tavor's body. With a slight quiver in my voice, I ordered, Answer me! Fearfully looking at the spiked steel fist, he assumed an impossibly contorted pose, staining the marble floor with blood. Then he murmured, Forgive me, master. I'm your manager, Pooh. As in Winnie the Pooh? I allowed myself a triteness. The little man chuckled obsequiously. If you like, may I provide a summary of the events that have taken place in your absence? You may, but on the way to the control room. Lead on. There was a hint of surprise in his eyes. My requesting him to lead the way must have been weird, but he obeyed. The manager even minced along backwards, multitasking. 
One eye was on me, the other was looking about as he blabbered the news and waved the servants out of the way with his stubby hands. The gatherer teams acquired a hundred and nine rare resources. Those incapable of acquisition have been transferred to farm teams as per your orders. They have gone up sixty-one standard levels. Twenty percent went to the venerable Ivan the Terrible, and the rest awaits you. I ground my teeth. And where is the venerable Ivan now? The manager skimmed through some papers and replied immediately. The Grand Master of the Torture Affairs has just returned from the A.U. with a new batch of slaves. By the way, there are some marvelous specimens for your menagerie, a pirated copy of the Flow, Soloist's Avatar, and the forcefully digitized Ms. Madagascar just as she appears. A hoarse and infinitely hopeless female cry echoed across the halls as if to affirm his words. The fat man smiled. They're working on them now. Soon the tender, obedient chicks will join the rest. May I remind you, there are some vacancies among the living bed and the throne mat slave girls. Ivan and the three girls from the last batch are to report to the control room immediately, I ordered. He needs to be personally present for an important sacrifice. Yes, master. The manager mumbled away into his communications artifact. The same instant, the castle shook. The corridor walls began to move. New crossings opened, the humpbacked ladders bulged out. Twisting like a Rubik's Cube, the castle once again turned into an unassailable monolith. Instead of a straight path, before us lay a T-intersection guarded by instantly alerted warriors. I froze, dumbfounded. The fat man nervously glanced at his inner interface clock. A routine castle configuration change, he said. Happens every twelve hours due to our code yellow state of alarm. Let's see, it's the delta layout, so we turn right here. Better not go left. The ninth assault resistance sector's there now. Three rows of traps and creatures from the bestiary. As I looked around, puzzled, and watched my stupid GPS draw a new map over the old one, the manager kept consulting his papers. Your worthless parent has had a lucid moment and requested the torture routine to be reduced from severe to moderate. Shall I refuse? I swallowed hard, and could barely refrain from my impulsive wish to rip out my own avatar's heart with my bare hands. Cancel the torture. In the entire castle. The fat man raised his brow in surprise, but didn't dare disobey. I added just in case. Temporary cancellation, until further orders. Pain emanations may betray our location to divine beings. The little man nodded with respect and held the communications artifact to his face again. Within a minute, it became easier to breathe inside the castle. The astral pressure grew noticeably lighter. The further we went, the more high-level sentries I saw. Here, the groups guarding the intersections each included a pair of assault golems, there were scores of high-tech barriers, bars, three-foot-thick pressurized doors studded with gun slots, pill boxes, as well as barrels of flammable alchemic substances and poisons. The holes in the ceiling, the dark cracks in the walls, and the slightly shifting floor tiles all promised many surprises. Whoever dare attack this place was in for a bloodbath, and for a level loss, considering the huge amounts of hired NPCs. Finally, the zigzagging corridor led us to an octagonal hall. There was a mithril door in one of its walls, considerately covered by a protective force field. The shapes of massive assault golems stood motionless in the corners, their spinal contacts pressed against the gold mana circuits. A mighty orc towered in the middle of the hall, three trembling female figures around him. The orc slowly turned around, making me pause. His nostrils were torn, his eyes dull. His lips had been cut off with a dull, chipped blade. His shredded cheeks revealed his molars. His face was lumpy from the numerous scars. Oh, fallen one! Who on earth had condemned themselves to this horror? The orc smiled crookedly as he approached me, opening his arms in a welcoming manner. Dear Tavor, he said, where have you been? 
I got keyboard calluses trying to get in touch. How hard is it to shoot Uncle Ivan a few lines? His initially affectionate tone slowly turned into a threatening roar. My body reacted of its own accord. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up. My upper lip twitched to reveal my fangs. Scowling, I stepped forward. Noticing the changes, Ivan barked with laughter, whistling and wheezing through his various openings and cracks. Ruffling my hair with his mighty paw, he said affectionately, Hurry, old wolf pup. So where have you been? Bumming around in the crypt? Milking the sleeping god? Kicking some droid ass? Assuming a happy air and suppressing my trembling, I replied with a crooked smile. Nah, just found me a hidden spot. An abandoned Inquisition castle. Your kind of place. Tons of great tools, from the Spanish boot to the Iron Maiden. I'll add you to the group. Let's go over there and see. You'll like it, I'm sure. But let's hit the control room first. I need to change up those castle settings. Sending him an invite, I quickly turned away from the frowning orc and headed for the door behind the curtain. Shivers of steel went down my spine. I could physically feel the orc's distrustful gaze. Funny talk you picked up, he said. When did you get him new words? In my twenty-nine years in the crypt, which also gave me hemorrhoids, the orc chuckled. But why go to the control room? Did they cancel the control artifact? I bit my lip as I stood at the door like an idiot, staring helplessly at the colored combination lock. Damn Tavor with his paranoia. Searching the number pad for fingerprints or signs of wear, I answered slowly. You know the artifact doesn't get all the jobs done. Failing to find any signs of what the code might be, like recent fingerprints or scratches on the keys, I put everything at stake. Stepping aside, I turned to Ivan. You still got the code, or are you all out of absolute memory? The orc grinned and approached the door as he asked, Finally made up your mind to up the Nova to a supernova? I nodded. It's about time. It ain't cheap, but it's worth it. Ivan drawled pensively. Sure, sure. He then grabbed me sharply, his mighty paw digging into my throat, and lifted me off the floor. No one knows the code except you. The place has been upgraded to a supernova by your old man. You talk, move, and look like a stranger. Who the fuck are you? Jerking in panic, I hit the icons of my most badass skills and hooked the damn butcher on the jaw real good. His 500-pound carcass made the floor shake. Dig that? That's the 50-level difference coupled with a class advantage. After all, I was a warrior and he was a cleric, albeit a perverted one. But I hadn't won yet. Ivan instantly jumped back up. Two scalpels dripping with poison flashed in his hands. It flashed through the air, and I lost my right eye. The next instant, the second blade sunk into my left cheek. The scowling orc pulled another set of scalpels from his forearm sheaths. I glanced around helplessly. The girls crawled away in search of cover. The golems stood indifferently by the walls. Golems, get him! Bite! Attack! Red alert! S.O.S. Help! Kill Ivan! I didn't know which of the commands had worked, but the instant attack of the eight giants caught the orc by surprise. In a second, he was buried underneath a pile of mithril bodies. The orc's feral sense of danger had prevented him from accepting the group invite. My plan to send him to the first temple through a portal fell through. Of all the several transportation options, I had only the Inferno portal left. Good thing my clanmates and I had foreseen the possibility of such an outcome. I was being expected at both points. I ran up to the pile of bodies, activating the spell. The portal opened. I threw two of the girls in. The third had climbed into a crack between two pillars and tried to kick me away. Fuck you, sweetie, I thought. Ivan roared and fought like a bear with a pack of wolves. The room was filled with the sounds of metal being crushed and mana circuits popping as the golem's handling mechanisms got ripped out. Howling with pain, I forced my way into the mess, seized Ivan by the collar, and dragged him to the portal with much difficulty. My strained moans blended in with the chaotic noise. 
My vision blurred. It felt like I was hauling a whale by its tail. At last, I felt my ass push through the portal film. I fell into the hot emptiness. Hello, Crimson Inferno Sun. Chapter 8 The basalt tiles felt unwelcoming. Moaning and groaning, I dropped to the hard stone. The air was knocked out of me. My broken shoulder crunched as blood gushed out of the reopened wound. Judging by the ear choppers welcoming cries all around, I had the right address. All thanks to Asmodeus. He'd created that horridly expensive portal trap pentagram, which distorted the coordinates of the nearby exit points and tied them to the small citadel. My plans to build a powerful farm raid service center in Inferno were nearing realization. Seize Ivan! I wheezed as I turned around, trying to figure out how in the world hauling a pathetic 500-pound orc had been so damn difficult, given my outrageous 1,500 points of strength. Oh, fuck. I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. No one had canceled the detention order, so I had actually been hauling a bunch of golems along with Ivan, weighing hell knows how many tons. Golems at ease! The torturer, feeling that he was free, tried to make a run for it. But Asmodeus's powerful arms stopped him. Lifting the orc up like a mischievous little kitten, the demon looked closely at his mutilated mug. What a specimen! A fine taste for enemies you got there. What do you plan to do with him? I turned over with a groan, nodding to the she-elves gratefully for rushing to help their leader. I pressed my hand to my throbbing shoulder wound, squirting tiny fountains of blood. Don't know yet. Can't take away a player's freedom without messing up your own karma in Alterworld. I'd send him to Loth, but I fear they might understand each other. Quartering the bastard with my staff to turn him into a helpless stub ain't a bad idea, but that would make me just like him, except that I wouldn't enjoy the process. As Medeas shook Ivan, who was paralyzed with fear. It looked like the orc already knew whom he was dealing with, and dangled in the air compliantly, looking around goggle-eyed. The demon said admiringly, The Inferno's been craving him like a child craves sweets. I can send him to the fiery Gehenna with little effort. We'll probably get paid for it, too, given his potential. And I'll put in a good word for you. What do you say? I frowned. Are we talking hell here, the real one, not an alter world? The demon gave an ambiguous nod. Reality is whatever we believe in. But I guarantee you, you'll never see this enemy again. Deal? Deal. I just didn't know what else to do with him. Yeah, I caught him, and now I needed something gruesomely radical. And I didn't have an Ivan side in me to give me sadistic ideas. Thanks very much for that. As Medeas exposed the black claw on his index finger like a cat, with a single motion, he slashed the orc's clothes off and turned Ivan's muscular back to himself. The claw moved quickly over the bare skin, carving demonic runes and cauterizing them at the same time. Ivan wheezed and jerked, blood running in bubbles from his mouth as he had not the strength to cry out. His eyeballs turned into terrifying scarlet blobs. So many blood vessels had burst under the pressure. As Medeas looked upon his creation with delight, then sharply tossed the orc into the air and gave a clap. With a bright flash, a portal appeared in the orc's path as he fell. It was hot with magma. Ivan gave a sob of terror as he disappeared inside. The charred figure of a sinewy man hit the ground in his place. I gasped. The new arrival heard my gasp and turned to me, fixing his blind, baked eyes upon me. The black crust that was his face began to move, rumpling with a crunch, dripping with pus and turning into a disgusting mask. The hoarse voice whispered with irony, Hell's all out of firewood. Gonna get chilly. Who's that? I looked at Asmodeus. An exchange, or a thank you gift, however you want to look at it. He's yours now. Heal him, I ordered the ear choppers. 
A few seconds of magic glow, and a strong, naked man stood before us. He was well over forty, with cold, piercing gray eyes. He gave a barely audible sigh of relief, then gazed at the crimson sun with a melancholy joy. This was the first public nudity instance in Alter World. The game labeled the new arrival as a level thirty assassin, so he had been either a killer or a spy, and pretty advanced for a real-world guy. Each one of us had started out as a level one character. Give him some clothes to cover himself. Golems, you are to obey Lath. Asmodeus, please return me to my old body. I'm sick of this cesspool. I might dive into the john next time instead and come out much cleaner. Butterfly started bustling about the newcomer with a predatory look. She measured his waist, chest, thighs, whore. Despite his nerves of steel and assumed bravado, the former sinner was noticeably shaking. At the sight of the archdemon, he made a move to cross himself, but stopped halfway, probably because in hell one's forced to drop any such habits. I threw off my bag and tensed up as I looked at Asmodeus in anticipation. This was the perfect chance for him to bunko me. My warriors grew anxious as they had been warned about such a scenario beforehand. The demon smiled knowingly. Who were we to try to outsmart a thousand-year-old being? He snapped his fingers. I twisted in an orgasmic spasm. I was back in my own body. My soul sang, my astral projection getting comfortable inside its familiar container, and, oh, was the bliss of perfect health intoxicating. The deal's done. Pay up. As Medeus held out his clawed hand. Wiping the drool off my face, I doubled in a fit of dehydrated coughing. With delight, I took a canteen of chilled kvass from my ear choppers, downed half of it at once, and exhaled blissfully. Noticing the sinner's thirsty gaze, I nodded understandingly and tossed him the canteen. His pointy Adam's apple bobbed rapidly as he drank, but his prudence overpowered his thirst, and he was careful to catch every single drop. As Medeus growled impatiently, so I reached for my bag. Of all possible creatures, an archdemon is not the one to be annoyed. That could lead to a very unhappy ending. Pulling out the precious necklace, I handed it over to him. I hereby confirm the fulfillment of all terms and full payment. The deal's closed. As Medeus indicated his satisfaction with a nod as he admired the precious stones. The blood of an ancient god was insanely valuable for a demon, not as regular gear, but rather as a ritual ingredient. The sound of bare footsteps came from nearby. I turned and saw the sinner who'd already put on some pants. With a bow, he said, still stammering a bit, Allow me to introduce myself. Igor Anisimovich Matviev, second guild merchant with absolute memory. I will pray for you for eternity. Asmodeus grinned ironically and shook his head. I frowned. And for real? The so-called merchant's cheek twitched. My bad, Your Excellency, County Secretary for the Second Department of the Governing Senate. Noticing Asmodeus's reaction, I spat in irritation. Look, Igor, or whatever your name is, get the hell out of here. The last thing I need is lying sinners. What you batting your eyelashes for like a girl? You're neither a slave nor a prisoner. A free man. You have both legs and the gates that way, so off you go. Having no further interest in this shady type, I turned to the ear choppers. You've done good, girls. Butterfly, take care of this lady singer and this pretty missy here. Calm them down if you can, but don't hit them. I'll take them to the rehabilitation center when I go to the first temple later. They have a few new open spots there. The sound of someone clearing their throat made me turn around. The sinner wasn't about to repent. His gaze was cold and calm, his voice emotionless. Once again, I apologize, sirs. I didn't fully comprehend the situation I was in. That's what happens when you're in the fiery Gehenna for too long. His composure impressed me. He was an intriguing and unique case, but his strong and independent character prevented me from getting the most out of the situation. I forced my feudal traits to life. 
the aura of the first after the fallen one, pressed down on the scene with insane force. My invisible power hung over all those present. The ear choppers squealed ecstatically, as Medeus wrinkled his nose and backed up a little. The sinner, impressed, gave a real bow this time. It is a pleasure to make your acquaintance, Igor Anisimovich Matviev. I am the court counselor of Her Majesty Catherine the Great's secret expedition. Igor looked hard at my face, studying my expression as he said this. I cast a helpless look at the ear-chopper captain standing next to me. He only shrugged. I could have used the analyst right then with his encyclopedic knowledge. Noticing our confusion, the sinner grew noticeably relaxed for some reason. He tried to decipher the long-forgotten terms. A counselor of state of the seventh rank is a nobleman by birth, same rights as those of a guard captain or a lieutenant colonel of the infantry. One and a half thousand rubles yearly salary. I shook my head. There is something merchant-like about you. Forget all those ranks and rights. Do you have any idea how long you've been in hell? Hell has no time. Struggling to remember, I rounded to the nearest hundred. Almost three centuries. The medieval KGB agent went white. His legs gave way, and he sat down on the red-hot yard tiles. Covering his face with shaking hands, he whispered quietly, How can this be? Martha, Anastasia, my youngest, Alex. I went on because of them, drew strength from holy icons, dreamt of staying sane and coming back to them. Kneeling next to him, I held his hands in mine. Igor, you're in a different world, in a different time. Everything's different here, although... Who knows, as Medeus here's an expert on hell, and I personally know where the stairway to the seventh heaven is, with its notably aggressive angels and seraphims. You might see your family yet. Go to rehab, take a rest, figure things out. Then we can talk and find something for you to do here, if that's what you want. My squad captain raised his helmet and pulled on his gorgeous bangs as he cried, are all sinners doomed to an eternity in the fiery Gehenna? As Medeus shrugged indifferently. Every man gets what he believes in. The captain took heart. Then we shall strive for something neutral, with a gentle post-mortal state. With parties and hoories, I straightened him out, reminding of our clan's policy. You'd better believe in the fallen one. There is no death there. Then turned to Igor again. What brought you to hell? He shrugged indifferently. Sinning. My private message window shook with a deafening distress call. I jumped in surprise, getting a bad feeling. Very few clanmates could activate the three zeros alert, and only when they were in deep shit. I instantly answered the voice call. Yes? Sir, this is Orcus. We've got problems. The lychees started early. They hit on every front. We need you here. Understood. Be there in a minute. Good thing I had assumed my feudal heir. It does not befit a warlord to wear signs of worry on his stern face for all his subordinates to see. I turned to the demon. As Medeus, the big game's begun. The light fucks went all out. Time for some serious ass-kicking. I'm taking the she-elves. Get your army ready. You might need it any second. Sorry, the parade's off for now. Or we can replace it with a victory parade, with the standards of the defeated clans flung into the sacrificial pentagram. As Medeus licked his lips savagely. Even better. Hey, why don't you take Lightfighter and two hundred elite troops from the Silver Legion with you? You need help, and they could use a break from their slumber, get some fresh blood, get their batteries recharged. I was grateful. Level three hundred demons would be a big plus for the clan in battle. But then, as Medeus helped me back down to earth by showing his true self and knocking off the benefits. Just don't forget to equip them. I saved some lettuce by counting on looted silver and hiring warriors bare-assed. Of course, their claws and fangs put steel to shame. But this isn't the first rebellion era. Can't fight without armor. What a crafty motherfucker. Fortunately, some of the Legion's gear had already been made, plus there were extras in the clan's arsenal. Certainly not the best match for their levels, but it was all I could think of. 
The next five minutes of preparation were accompanied by a rapidly growing hysteria in both the chat and PMs. The Allies were going nuts. Even the Russian cluster's social log was boiling. The Just Cause defenders brutally massacred the Dark Side youth in all newbie locations. Their battle units had appeared in hundreds of places simultaneously and started bloody genocides. This stopped virtually all the young ones from leveling up. Panicked cries and chaos. The Russian clans were forced to put all of their energy into finding avid player killers and guards for their nurseries. Pretty smart. One wrecker squad could divert an entire regiment, and that was exactly what was happening. Following a short disorientation after entering the portal, I immediately ran into Orcus. Grab that invite, sir. Hit the crypt. Everyone's already there. The clan wizard exerted himself as he summoned a portal. I bet my servants had aged a whole day during the seven seconds it took him to cast that spell. My ear choppers raced past me, hurrying to fall in. A red alert is no joke. It's like a fighter jet pilot taking orders when his plane hadn't even left the ground yet. The children of the night were buffing up in a rush, picking up extra weapons, getting their accumulators, and lining up outside in equal squares of specialized units. The demons jogged into the armory in a straight line. Lightfighter greedily drew in the evening air as he looked at the she-elves with lust in his eyes. A young servant drove my eight new golems into the heavy artillery yard. As usual, it was filled with the din of the elaborate sledgehammer, cussing voices, and the abrupt ringing of metal. I began to feel sick after slipping into yet another portal. My body was roughed up by the different realities, climates, air pressure, and all the other things that change when swapping one's locations. The crypt was barely recognizable. It boasted the comforts of a submarine. Quietness and mutual politeness were diligently upheld, as there are normally certain specifics to the communal lifestyle of a hundred intelligent beings sharing a small space. There were the three level plank beds with curtains, a TV, a few friendly gals from the House of Pleasures, flower pots, intricate doilies, and a bunch of photos on the walls. Hygiene was highly maintained, and every inch was being put to good use, considerably allotted toward someone's personal space. The warriors smiled to themselves at the moans coming from the heavy booth built for intimate needs. A huge red cat sat underneath a plank bed, clearly someone's quest familiar. It was licking its balls. The animal was nervous. It kept glancing around, obviously wishing it had eyes in the back of its head. It could have used those, too. A quiet pop sounded, and the familiar white plush flashed behind the cat's back. Its eyes widened, its muzzle twisting in panic. A strong kick in the ass drew a heart-rending meow from the cat's throat and sent it flying to the other corner of the room spread-eagled. The off-duty guards laughed in unison. The cat's tired owner cussed under his breath. I smiled. Hi there, Winnie. Crates of the best cognac stood beneath the crypt walls. Murky alchemic substances were being fermented in barrels. A stocky mule was taking inventory of droid assembly instructions, octagonal coins and sealed bags, and carefully packaged tech. Gimmick had settled in the far corner. He now sported a few wrinkles and a torn scar underneath his left eye. A look of sadness and hopelessness was imprinted on his face. His tiny work table was piled with droid innards. A little to the side was the crafter's area. It consisted of a field smithy, a grinding wheel, a stack of work materials and half-finished products. The work schedule hung on the wall, defaced with handwritten swear words. Over in the kitchen corner was a pretty chef with an unusually thin waist. She'd obviously gotten herself appointed to cook because of other things besides her culinary talents. The girl was smiling pensively as she slipped pieces of pickled meat onto the skewers. Noticing me, she gave a worried gasp, jumped to her feet, and hurriedly went through the supplies. Potatoes, onions, carrots, eggs, sour cream, ham... Fuck me. Damn Russian salad again. I waved her away and put my hand to my throat, indicating that I was extremely full. I then quickly followed Orcus to the officer's quarters. 
Heavy curtains separated them from the public area. These quarters were more comfy. Narrow, carriage-like beds, a dinner table about a forearm's width, and stools that could only fit one butt cheek, adorned with colorful handmade ass cushions. The hottie's servant poured coffee for the officers as they studied their cards. What's your plan? I asked. Preference Leningrad variant. One octagonal silver per whist. Want to join? Widowmaker finally looked up from his cards. His face spread in a happy smile. Sir Laith, finally! My clanmates cheered as they tripped over their stools to welcome me with hugs and backslaps. Whoa! I've only been gone for two hours, hardly a cause for celebration. The officers laughed in chorus. Max, for you it's been two hours. Our personal timers have just hit five or six months of offline mode. Fuck y'all and his zombie hottie had just celebrated their third anniversary with all their guard. Our bad, we invited him as an ally. But hey, he's our best attacker. He and his guys got the highest levels, so they are trying to take the next station. I didn't have any objections. The vets would also need a few top stars leveled up. Such a bomb could not stay secret for long. Info about the crypt would surely leak out. Can't seal up a bucket with a match. The clan stats blamed a bug. During the last two hours, the Children of the Night battle squad's levels increased by four on average. I surveyed my officers. Each one had gone up ten to fifteen levels. Not bad. I sat down and sipped cold coffee from someone's mug. Thirst would linger on for a few more hours after the oven-like inferno. Fill me in on the crypt situation. The analyst raised his hand. It's tougher than expected. First of all, due to the async time flow, we can't keep a permanent portal. It slams shut in seconds. Teleporting's our best option, but this invites serious delays. Every time you go to grab some smokes, you come back in a week. He waited for the laughter to subside, then continued. Secondly, no possibility of living space expansion. Our curtain is like a hollow spindle which goes deeper and deeper. It conceals the dungeon's spiral. Hammer through the walls, and you free the flesh-eating shroud. Then it's Hello Respawn. That's why we've limited the personnel numbers down here. Ninety persons is the most that can fit in here with minimal comfort. Ideally, that number should be thirty. The others voiced their agreement. After Supernova's luxury apartments, they'd grown weary of these busy barracks. And thirdly, farming's rough. We just aren't strong enough for this damn dungeon. Sure, we've shortened all the monster spawn intervals to an exact three minutes, but even at Station 5, our top-level 190 fighters have to face a 300-level guard droid. That's a foul at best. These guys get taken out time after time, even with the cover golem and the crossbow turret, which, mind you, are not cheap. Overall, Station 5s are ceiling, with a near-zero efficiency factor. Just too many deaths. Fuck y'all's troops are farming Station 6 right now. They're going for level 200. But what we need right away is new tactics and better gear. That's all I have. I tapped my fingers on the table as I thought things over. Understood. I've got a few ideas. But moving on, what are the lightsiders up to? Their faces grew dark. Orcus spoke. The lightsters had caught us by surprise. And no wonder. They've got pros, perhaps government agents. We're a joke in jumpsuits. Nine Alliance castles got attacked. Three were seized, including the Veterans Forest Castle. They're looting the castles in a rush to get rid of them. I gritted my teeth. How did this happen? Spies were clearly involved in two of these cases. Massive betrayal. They leaked the passwords and messed up the control artifact settings by taking over the control room and busting up the accumulators. What happened in the third instance is unclear. The Astromana absorption spell knocked off the castle's roof. It was most likely read from a scroll. They're figuring out all possible arsenal leaks. I gave a solemn chuckle. I've an alibi. I've been hanging out with Tavor. Orcus waved his hand, indicating that I remained above suspicion. That's not all. If we want to stay friends with the Chinese, we need to help them right away. The Mao's legacy spokesman is outraged. Their lands are being actively wiped out. Our allies are going down the drain. We've only twelve hours to decide whether or not we interfere. It'll be too late after that. The Koreans are also facing trouble. Can't say if we're to blame, 
but their sudden reinforcement increase was not met well. Their foes are joining forces and are quite powerful. The situation's expected to get worse. As he spoke, my officers unrolled maps depicting the current state of affairs and hung them on the walls. The maps had been drawn out with love and in great detail. Patterns and naked girls adorned the edges. My tacticians had had plenty of time to kill. Our economy also took a hit. They did some jobs in the original city, worsening our relations with them. The Alliance's cigarette factory's been destroyed. All NPC workers have been wiped out. Supply storages and ingredients are gone. The gigantic fly traps and the meal fleur fields have been attacked. The farmers got slaughtered, even the freelance ones. An analog of the Emperor's smoldering delight hit the market at dump prices. No age limit. Damn. Evil on all fronts. This definitely wasn't one of those usual game scuffles. This was the iron grip of some hardcore pros. You probably know by now that low-level areas are run by PK groups. The in-chat wailing can be heard all the way from the First Temple. But even worse is this. Half an hour prior to the conflict, several attempts had been made to capture our clanmates and high-ranking Alliance officers. Some attempts were successful. The Children of the Night had supposedly lost seven people. We haven't heard from the captives. Moreover, they failed to resort to Makarian blissful death, making us suspect that a divine power artifact is preventing them from doing so, probably deceased god relics or some half-beaten temple. Now that is bad. Orcus nodded in agreement. We've been offered to exchange children for captives. They've made ambiguous guarantees, something about blissful futures and international protection. Also, the clan's journalists are run off their feet by the new wave of disinformation spread by our enemy. They've set everyone against us, even in the real world. We're being sued on fifteen counts of kidnapping and detaining children by force. Church officials promise punishments, and the dock missed the control session. We've been expecting all of this, but we underestimated the scale. The PR experts we've hired are launching countermeasures. The lawyers are on it as well. We're fighting the image that the ultra-world mass media's hung on us, the dark terrorists who use children for shields. I gave him a thoughtful look. That TV have recording gear? Yes, the best kind. Good. There's something I recall about the sun god we could use against him. His patriarch has heard and seen some things he shouldn't have. Also, those reporters we bought, get them cracking. Tell our watchdogs it's D-Day. They gotta switch up their workbooks. Up our newspaper circulation volume. Make it a free mod. Widowmaker sighed. Yes, sir. Sir, doesn't this mean war? Chapter 9 The FOL, Forces of Light, Headquarters, Chat Log Excerpt Sir, Target 19. South Castle, the veterans, their domes of a higher caliber than we thought, were falling behind schedule. Send reinforcements from the first wave reserves, a new set of siege engines, and the third hundred Galicians. Sir, yes, sir. Reporting from the Gentle Breeze Resort, all terrorism suspects have been handled with Category C techniques. Twelve confessed, three agreed to cooperate. Proceed with the investigation. I authorize Category B interrogation. Sir, yes, sir. Report from the real-world raiding parties. Petersburg 6. Seventy-eight top clan officers from the Russian cluster have been denied access to the virtual world. We are requesting additional capacitors for EM dischargers, armored cars with the virtual provider's company logo, and increased defense forces. Some of our guard have been hospitalized following attacks by those banned from the virtual world. Moscow 3. Access to the virtual world denied to 62 top clan Russian officers and fighters. Our people on the force and in City Hall can do no more. We ask to be put in touch with our officers in order to neutralize the independent virtual center with a 1300 capsule capacity. Permission granted to bring back agents, chess player, and musician. Sir, yes sir. Newbie resistance is increasing. Our best PKs have been forced off a third of all the farm locations. The enemy is using a total of 6,000 players. Okay, these numbers are what we expected. Proceed to the second phase. Attack on the enemy's economic regions. Sir, yes, sir. Observer reports. Sir, 
Puppet is still not found. Analysts predict that he is most likely located at targets 4, 19, or 28. Proceed to subplan execution. Trap and bait. The aforementioned target's instructors are to come out of stealth mode. Fighting unit, status zero. Sir, yes, sir. Attention. Code yellow. Tactical plans mistimed. Clans partially out of control. Right cause. Denied orders to demolish the seized castles. Nominal clan leaders claim castles as private property. Most of the clan's forces are tied up in the youth massacres within city limits. Forest Brothers and 888. The instructors cannot stop the massacres at the ingredient storehouses. Attacks on the enemy production capacity are behind schedule. Werewolf. Have abandoned their permanent stationing locations and are attempting to seize a minor stronghold on the cluster's northern front. Are currently ignoring all incoming orders. Real World Groups Moscow 1, 4, and Petersburg 2, 3. Connection lost. Russians and Ava 4 have begun a large-scale strategic attack, allocating 90% of the analytical AI for a tactical response to Ava. It's a war, all right, I agreed. And we've lost the first round. Orcus, you and those cocky veterans have missed everything you possibly could. My counter-spy habitually jumped to attention. My fault, sir. Much good that does us. Have our intervention goals been prioritized? How about the situation forecasts, the available resources? Or do you all need more time to finish your card games with the clan's silver for prizes? It belongs in the treasury. We only took a little, and the prizes are nominal, Widowmaker put in, only to receive a punch from the analyst. The latter got up, drawing attention to himself, and thus muffling the incident. He briskly gave some numbers. Clan's available resources, 408 warriors, average level 177, ranks as the 19th strongest in the Russian cluster, but thanks to the crypt we are steadily gaining four levels an hour. Our second and third lines, 129 hybrid classes and 96 supporters, clerics, enchanters, mules and the like. I nodded. This was quite a force, only slightly weaker than the aggressive vets. The stream of those wanting to join us showed no sign of drying up, despite our overzealous efforts to catch the rotten among the recruits by thoroughly testing each and every candidate. We accepted every fourth applicant, which made the children of the night only that much more prestigious. Capes with the clan's insignia were donned with pride, like a National Guard badge. But our main powers were well concealed and out of sight. Additionally, our hellhounds have had good litters, seventy adult ones by now, plus pups, the third generations currently maturing. Most of them are ours, perma. The valley's quality grub is helping the packs grow exponentially. Another year or two and we'll face the Australian rabbit problem. Even now, the inferno dwellers have cut us off from a series of good farming locations. They're keeping the warm meat for themselves to get fat on. A disturbed howl came from the depths of the dungeon spiral. One of the hounds sent there to level up overheard our conversation and warned us. The analyst cleared his throat in embarrassment and continued in a quieter voice. As for the dragons, Vertebra's unlikely to go beyond the valley, unless Lena can talk her into it. The fledglings, on the other hand, are easy to persuade. Each can take out a ton of enemies who are unfamiliar with their fighting tactics. Then there are the hired she-elves, about three hundred strong, all of different caliber. That practically doubles the clan's strength. Add two hundred Silver Legion demons to that, I put in. Kick-ass levels, although quite fucked in terms of gear. The analyst nodded and paused for a minute, noting the info on his clipboard. And to top that off, our leveling up techniques are way beyond the joined forces of any alliances. We're like an infantry battalion in charge of a tank division. This is all thanks to Max and his talent for turning any pile of dung into money, as well as his odd luck and legendary greedy pig. I nodded discreetly, accepting the deserved compliments and tried not to look too displeased. The habit of feigning poverty, which I'd acquired back in the real world, made me uncomfortable every time my true earnings were brought up. The analyst continued, We have twenty of Gimmick's crossbow turrets, Highly efficient stuff and crazily expensive. They are no longer produced due to full exhaustion of ingredients and Duran's refusal to allot treasury money for them. He gave me a questioning look. But I only shrugged. If Duran didn't give him money, that only meant he'd hit his spending limit. Half the clan had been working to please the analyst lately anyway. The building of the Uber Golem has been sucking our resources like a giant vacuum cleaner. 
Then there are the three mobile domes with quite a few accumulators and a few dozen various catapults and arrow launching machines. The heavy arms unit consists of a dozen recon and assault golems and our key siege force. Eighteen heavy golems. It should be noted that an hour of this unit's work costs us a hundred and nine thousand gold. The juggernaut is being worked on relentlessly. He's about eighty percent complete by now. His orientation begins in three days. We'll need divine blood for the blessing, Max. What about those gods? Will they help out? The fallen one has promised to personally bless the golem. He was impressed by its potential power. The idea of becoming its godfather struck him as a fun one, which means he accepted. But other than that, I think the gods will give us a raid buff at most, or help out with a minor intervention. They don't know what it'll cost them later. Plus, they're paranoid. They're busy bulking up the astral projection shields and are about to get their own war going. We're like ants to them, bustling about, stinging their heels. Orcus frowned. We could sting them in the balls instead. Indeed, and we'll do just that. We'll castrate the fucks. Well, our list's pretty clear to me. What about the guards of the First Temple and other sympathizers? The analyst pulled up his virtual interface. The Alliance's mobilized reserve unit comes up to about 7,000 strong. But that's just the number of high-level first-line warriors. The entire head counts over 50,000. But it doesn't do us any good. They're mostly unskilled rubbish, crafters, relatives, untouchables, and other bums, each a level ten at best. I nodded understandingly. The ratio of worthless folks to top fighters was about seven to one. That was normal for Perma Clans. In the real world, an army that's fifteen percent of the population could unsettle a world power in just a few years. But such frenzied militarism was not only allowed in Alter World, but welcomed. Here, the tops were not just the biggest items of expenditure, but also the main breadwinners. How many of the Alliance's forces can be allotted for joint action? The analyst barked with laughter. Zero! Moreover, our allies all need help. Everyone is up to their balls in shit, don't you worry? Several of their castles are under siege. The chaos has spread to several locations. Their productive capacities have been seriously sabotaged. Even the auction's been undermined. Someone's bought out all our key craft and commercial components. Their prices have gone through the roof. Plus, the independent rating agencies just sent the Russian cluster Dark Clan's reliability ratings down the crapper. No one will give us loans now, not even on real estate collateral. Orcus clenched his mighty fists and growled hatefully, What a skillful bunch of bitches! The analyst agreed. Smells like a hardcore government agency indeed. But then, the first wave of attacks really wasn't that intense. Fifteen to twenty thousand at most. It's just that the Alliance is forced to cover too many locations. We can't concentrate all our forces in one spot, so the enemy sends their strongest to wherever we are poorly covered. We've lost the initiative and are merely responding now, being late every time. I raised my index finger and replied, That's it. That's the key point. We should mimic their tactics like in a boxing match, divert the enemy's attention with a series of smaller false hits. Let's see our plans for D-Day and what can be used right away. We'll destabilize the enemy's economy, spread chaos, foil their plans, seize leading positions. Those who partake in the massacres for fun shall have none of it. We'll experiment on them instead, or sell them. Those who have been hired, private military companies, foreign special forces, and other such foes, must be taught to stay the hell out of our lands. As I said this, I plunged Loth's blade into the table with a crack and let out my staff's eternally hungry, adamant sting. The others started back. This put a much-needed seriousness and decisiveness on their faces. Orcus nodded in agreement and drove his scimitar through the table with a threatening growl. So it shall be. Let's line our borders with millions of the enemy's tombstones, topped with their rusty helmets to symbolize our love for peace. So it shall be! A multitude of steel weapons were driven into the poor table. Wood chips flew into the air. Cracks appeared. The slain furniture fell at our feet as a symbol of our enemy's inevitable defeat. Hear the clan-wide orders! I fell silent for a minute, thinking things over. We must be brutal! As you already realize, this is no gaming event. This is lethal warfare! 
The Makarian wizards are to excommunicate everyone forever. Fighters are to take prisoners. We'll give them an object lesson in how to properly treat captives. Watch out for camos. Use your heads, or wherever the creator's spark resides within you. Try to digitize them or help get rid of the self-destruction system. Free your minds, forget the rules, and you will be strong. I remembered the Jedi-like she-elves, ground my teeth, and willed a coffee cup to levitate into the air. Bang! An invisible baseball bat turned the flimsy china into a cloud of moist dust. It made quite an impact. My officer's jaws dropped. Any questions? No. Then take my orders. USA Cluster, the Temple of Hermes. We're closed, god fucking damn it! How many times do I have to repeat myself? The 200 level warrior strained his voice. He was the commandant of the temple's National Guard and had already grown hoarse by now. An anti terrorist operation is in progress. Clear the court at once. There will be no quests, no gifts, and no blessings until the forces of darkness are utterly defeated. You'll have to live with your current XP gains and divine abilities. The massive doors had been sealed shut and barricaded with sandbags. Players shifted from foot to foot nervously as they stood in two rows, holding hands. Yet they did what they were supposed to. No enemy stealth suicide bomber would pass. Bent handmade bars covered the windows. The elite A-list personas slipped in and out through the temple's back door. Damn Russians, muttered the exhausted commandant. But seeing an unfamiliar fighter who wore the cape of the British Unsinkables clan, he got fired up again and yelled, Damn islanders! You, roast beef! I said we're closed! Sir, the Brit said in alarm, look what I found. With an effort, he produced the easily recognizable Sukhoi T-4 aerial bomb from his inventory. The commandant flinched and said in a husky voice, Where? Where did you find it? Careful, don't drop it. Sure, the stranger nodded, then smiled and released the bomb. Oops. The bomb fell nose down. Its sensitive detonator hit the stone tiles. Kaboom! The Commandant's single use ability to absorb any level damage was the only thing that saved him. Saved him from the explosion, that is. Not from being thrown against the wall super hard. Fragments of the bomb hammered on his steel armor. A hail of stone came down on him hard, mixed with sticky claret. Blood spurted out of his torn shoulder. The shockwave had dislocated the arm on which he wore his shield. His leg twitched crushed by a terrifyingly huge block of stone. But he still had enough health to discern a second islander race into the temple through the crack in the wooden gate. The commandant's ears were ringing. He couldn't make out what the damn kamikaze was yelling. Fu fu fuck you! Kaboom! A blinding flame shot out of the edifice. Its majestic roof shot into the air, then slammed back down on top of the falling ruins. The altar no longer conveyed a sense of divine grace. The delicate music of the celestial orbs gave way to a resentful silence. The commandant shielded himself from falling debris with his one good arm. He heard two more explosions in the northern part of the city, near the sun god's small temple. No one noticed the white whinny behind the clouds of smoke. He was covered in soot his tongue hanging out in exhaustion as he scrawled the unfamiliar Cyrillic characters on a large chunk of debris. Happy with the Temple Ruins, Agent Che. The Grand Duchy of Lithuania Microcluster The Arch Caves, a low-level dungeon, 288 players on site. A few groups had already gathered by the dungeon's exit. A terrifying necromancer was barring the way out. His pet was outrageously high-leveled for a noob. Under his supervision, three dwarves were quickly putting up an embarrassingly thick wall out of massive stone blocks. In just four minutes, the last stone was laid. The master dwarf quickly signed the brickwork, inscribed additional runes on it for durability, and huddled up close to the door to insert a tiny power stone into it. The necromancer pulled a group portal scroll out of his inventory. North Mikhailovich, 
Are you finished? Yep, the dwarf nodded. Let's fly. With a pop, they were gone. The young Europeans bricked inside the dungeon, finally got to appraise the work of the unknown mason. An indestructible wall with the master's autograph. This is for the butchery at the original city's walls. Armor 700. Health 40,000. A minute of silence was followed by someone's sad, rhetorical question. Sirs, I hope someone already managed to level up the group portal. British Cluster, the El Dorado Gold Mine Zone. On site, 1,744 prospectors, 2,181 hired NPC miners, 220 top guards. The ground was shaking. From the Black Canyon, a hitherto unseen horde of monsters was racing toward the region's most valuable assets. The Death Knight running ahead kept glancing worriedly at the recon golem's crystal of power. It was rapidly growing dim. His radar indicated that some of the diligently assembled monsters were beginning to lose interest in the chase and were falling behind. With a deep sigh, the knight activated an aggro-generating ability and sharply turned around. His actual role in the clan consisted of diverting the attention of mobs during large raids. It was the clan leader's sick imagination that had put him in the saddle and sent him to a high-level zone to put together a surprise for the laid-back Anglo-Saxons. Making another circle around the monsters, the knight used his ability to revive their rage. He then made for the narrow passageway which led to the El Dorado mountain valley with its web of streams. The monsters effortlessly crushed the MPC guards, trampled over their leaders, and with a triumphant roar dashed amidst the slag heaps. They crumbled up the pricey machinery, destroyed the narrow bottom hole passes, chopped up the top-notch miners, and slaughtered prospectors by the hundreds. Monsters that fell into the minds of larger clans were no small disaster either. The walls got painted with miners. Delicate supports were smashed to pieces, forever sealing the underground galleries. The event had begun. The knight gazed upon what he had accomplished with amazement. He took out a bucket of red paint and ran up to a perfectly smooth mountain ledge. As Max had pointed out, no punishment has meaning if the punish does not know why he got it hot. South Castle, the Veterans Dan gritted his teeth in exhaustion and rage. He looked on as the enemy's line of siege artillery finished off the minor dome shield over the castle's gate. Several thousand-pound counterweights of the massive trebuchets rattled as they sent giant mountain chunks through the air. The clan's cross-eyed snipers on the walls made for a pretty lame air defense. The enemy was good at improvising. The catapult would fire a ranger from time to time. For his remaining ten seconds of life, he would become a one-time spy aircraft, shooting over the castle to get updates on the current state of affairs. In half an hour, the vets would take yet another stylized tower off their flag. That would be the second of the day. What could three hundred guards do against over a thousand assailants? Was Max informed of the battery's coordinates? General Frag asked the counter-spy a second time, betraying nervousness which wasn't like him at all. The clan was dying. Without help, they would be forced to retreat back to their ancestral stronghold. There, the thousand united warriors would see their last battle as mere real estate owners. Perhaps they shouldn't have set their hopes on the fallen one with his quickly maturing yet still young and naive wizard? Yes, I've promised to help, although I'm scared to even think what's going on in his private channel. Half the Alliance's castles are under siege. Bloody bitches! the general snapped hoarsely, enraged. I need five hundred more to attack. Send Max this fucker's location. Maybe he can wipe that grin off his insolent mug and save our boys. Dan glanced at the nearest hill. There, a camouflaged observer sat comfortably sprawled out in an armchair with a foppish sunshade. Five warriors were kneeling next to him. Their hands were tied behind their backs and way above their heads as the diligent guards had left them. Three of them were vets. Two were laths, children of the night. It's almost certainly a trap, Dan said. General Frag nodded. I think the first priest knows it. 
If not, we'd better turn from him now before we've followed him too far. Although I think we already have. Dan looked at the thousand enemies as they gathered together to attack. Then he shifted his gaze to the few hundred vets falling in in front of the gates and noted sadly, Four minutes till the dome falls. We hired all available NPC guards. Regular personnel's been swapped for military. The Merc Guild refused their services. They're blaming accounting system issues. Lies. We've resorted to the rainy day supplies, the scrolls, the artifacts, and the vials have all been handed out. We'll pull another hundred fighters from the other castles, where the shield lifetime's a bit higher. And then, we fight until we fall. As the song goes, we hope only for a decent end, for strength and the hand of a friend. A portal! A watchman suddenly cried out, drawing the gloomy officer's attention. And sure enough, an iridescent arch had opened up exactly at the spot that had been indicated to the first priest. His lonely figure emerged from the portal. Huh? General Fragg wrinkled his brow in perplexity. What the fuck? Where the hell's he going alone? Vision and hearing amplifiers, quick! The enchanter guard next to him obediently covered the headquarters with the aura of Eagle Vision and Wolfseer. The portal scene instantly drew nearer. Yet they still couldn't make out the voices, so noisy was the sea of enemies. The first priest calmly pushed aside the astonished guards as he slowly approached the teacher. The latter was still sitting carefree in his armchair, petting a tiny kitten. The priest frowned looking at the captives, then shook his head, refusing the invitation to sit at the snack table. The teacher shrugged indifferently, then sharply snapped a kitten's neck. The metamorphic lizard's body began to shift its shape. The silver fur turned into a green scaly hide. The astral world rippled, casting the spatial coordinates into chaos and making magical transportation impossible within a hundred paces of him. Beyond this astral storm, five portals opened up. Thirty camos surrounded the priest, cutting off all escape paths, a sign of both fear and respect on their part. With a disdainful smile, the priest pointed at the teacher accusingly with his staff. His finger pressed the spring-mounted button. The pink stiletto flashed as it sank into the enemy's forehead, effortlessly passing through the film of his personal shield and pinning him to the armchair. A mask of surprise froze on the teacher's face. A thin streak of blood ran right down its middle. The priest shook the body off the staff, wheeled around, and slashed at the guards' backs. The adamant dagger knew no bounds. It was at one with the boiling blood, the dissected bones, and the wet flesh as it whistled through the air. The horrid chunks of the guards' bodies hadn't yet hit the ground when the priest charged at the first of the camels. He was quickly gaining speed. His shape blurred as he dodged the sudden nets, the freezing rays, and the boiling swamps popping up from the ground. The enemy tried to take him alive relying on their levels, numbers, elite gear, and unknown abilities. But the first priest was out for blood. The camos had to be killed, and adamant was the best and most precise instrument of mass extermination. The camouflage chainmail shirts snapped right off. Scarlet geysers sprayed the pink dagger, which was roaring in ecstasy. The scent of burning plasma filled the air as the omnipresent blade reached inhuman speeds. The officer's excitement gave way to a superstitious fear in the face of a mid-level character slaughtering the invincible camos in seconds, showing off hitherto unseen skills. Some of the officers took screenshots, others stepped aside to film. The footage was definitely worth it. In just ten heartbeats, the camouflaged foes backed up, leaving more than half their comrades on the ground. A strategic pause. The priest's figure froze breathing heavily. The portals spat forth another hundred camos. Was that all? Or were there more to come? It looked like that was all. They charged, clearly forgetting the orders to take the first priest alive, intent only on avenging their comrades. Steel flashed. Immense magic roared. 
The blades spun as they traced out lethal combos. Amidst this splendor, the priest's blurred figure renewed its dance. He was now using both hands, the staff in his right, Loth's spider dagger in his left, leaving a trail of darkness and horror. The priest was losing health by the thousands. The flames charred his flesh. Ice bound his muscles. Poison burned his lungs. His flesh melted right off the bones. His armor gave under the steel chopping his body. Yet he still sunk his dagger into one camo after another, piercing them with nine blades at once. The enemy corpses disintegrated into a gruesome tangle of spiders. The priest's body shimmered with purple flashes, completely restoring his health and signaling the achievement of new levels. Clouds covered the sky. Loth's divine face appeared amidst a web of lightning bolts. Her demented laughter echoed across the battlefield. With every fallen foe, the storm grew fiercer. The first priest got faster, and Loth seemed more and more pronounced as she materialized in our reality. People threw themselves on the ground in fear and covered their ears. The priest and the camos battled alone. The priest was winning. The risk of death decreased. He was leveling up faster than the remaining foes could slash his health in half. Prepare to counterattack, General Frag said, getting up with effort and looking at the battlefield as if bewitched. The first priest was now coming down hard on his enemies. They had fallen into their own trap and were now retreating but only a dozen made it out of the no-portal zone. Their personal portals snapped shut. The first priest was left alone amidst the camouflaged gravestones and the live carpet of spiders. It's time, he whispered soundlessly, and fell to the ground. At once, dozens of portals opened. A mighty wave of raging children of the night covered the demoralized enemy army. Open the gate! General Frag cried out as he darted downstairs to lead the counterattack. The first priest's body lay in the middle of the battlefield. Loth, in the form of a fair maiden, bent over him and tenderly passed her hand over his bloodied hair. Chapter 10 The nucleus of my identity hung in the great nothingness, drooling like a blissful infant. Myriads of blocks of other people's knowledge, skills, and memories flickered all around, forming a giant mess resembling a broken puzzle. I blindly snatched at one fragment after another, felt it, listened to it, tried to taste it, I was seeking something of my own, something familiar. Slaying a hundred enemies had cost me. The delicate vessel of my mind had shattered. Its priceless shards got lost amidst waste banks and foreign junk. I grabbed another fragment, Spanish as the native language, not mine. Off you go. The next, a lust for boys. Yuck! I crushed it with aversion, tossing the useless crumbs aside. Another one. Mom! Mommy! I burst into tears as I pulled it toward me. But a second later I realized that it wasn't mine. I carefully released it. Apache helicopter pilot skills, adrenaline dependence, sabotage school memories, the first lesbian experience. No, no, no. Panic started to creep in. This was a divine mind spinning its web at a frightening speed, forging an ideal servant out of me as it forced the fragments of other people's experiences into the matrix of my mind. Mithril jawbone glue served to hold together the new Frankenstein's monster. A hissing voice was lulling me to sleep, assuaging my fear and my will to resist. My fine priest, you are the best of them all. Here is the hatred of the white, the black, and the oriental. Here's the knowledge of anatomy, the field torture skill, and the ambitions of a true leader. 
Take all this, and then some more, and yet some. You shall seek power. Trample over the innocent. You'll be ruining lives and crushing cities. Here come piety, repressed fears, and a rare phobia. I shall easily rule over you. Personal devotion, the magic of the blade, the spark of chaos. Oh, what a priceless prey. My plaything. My arms dropped helplessly. I had nothing to hold on to, no one to ask for support. What could one man do as he drowned in a swamp? Only that smell. Wild strawberries, how refreshingly familiar. Where was it coming from? From somewhere far away came a quiet, throaty laugh, like ringing bells. The intimate whisper that used to arouse the male essence Ruata? It was as if a beacon's blinding ray ripped through the impenetrable darkness. The fragments of my mind flew to the light like moths. A crystallization center had emerged. My former self rapidly took shape around it, forcing out everything that did not belong. Bitch! A hateful voice hissed above my ear. Whorish broad, I ban you forever. Be you damned and cast into the halls of gloom right after your first death. The gods will shudder at your faith. The hissing receded into the distance. I raced toward the alluring scent and the sweet voice calling me, like a stupid duck toward a hunter's lure. For me, it was a savior's call. Ruata! I jumped up on the narrow bed. Instantly, I broke into a violent cough. My throat felt like a rusty water pipe. My eyes were so dry that they hurt. I barely forced my numb muscles to obey. Was I in someone else's body again? I looked and sighed in relief. I was myself. Next to me stood the deathly pale and exhausted Ruata. A sullen warrior towered next to her. Strength and power emanated from him, creating a heavy air all around. The prince of the House of Night, the real one. The sulky she-elves had lined up along one wall, the tense male ear-choppers along the other. What is all this? I thought. Orcus threw aside the heavy curtain and barged in with a worried look. Seeing me sitting on the bed, my face distorted with pain from the gripes in my throat. He breathed in relief. Sir, you're awake. I managed to smile. Count on it. How long was I out? And what's with this show? Orcus froze for a moment, obviously shooting private messages, then tried to get me to lie back down again. Please, sir, don't worry. How are you feeling? I pushed away his mighty arms indignantly. Hey, quit putting me to sleep. I'm fine as long as bad memories aren't stirred up, but I'll deal with that later. Report. The counter-spy put on one of those guilty professional looks. Max, you were out for two months. We didn't know what to do. Now that got to me. Suddenly, my ears got blocked as I fully recalled the evil hissing and the sticky darkness. Orcus continued to jabber as if justifying himself. Magic didn't help. Even shitting on the Fallen One's altar would not force him to respond. Questions were piling up. Our allies panicked and severed all communication. And there you were, in a coma. So we pulled you into the crypt and waited. A week passed. You were still out. Spiders multiplied all around, trying to seal you up in a cocoon. Clearly Loth's doing. And who's an expert on her? Ruata, of course. I looked at the shaking princess, clinging to the broad chest of her husband. A fine girl, yet so unlike the rest. I rubbed my temples as I tried to keep my mind in one piece, then wrinkled my nose and said hoarsely, Do you understand that you can't die now? The princess nodded silently. Her face looked emaciated. Dark shadows showed under her eyes. The aura of divine damnation was noticeably bearing down upon her subconscious mind. I gratefully accepted the cup of herbal tea that Orcus handed me, drank greedily, then went on. We're in the same boat now. While Loth lives, you risk eternal post-mortal torture. 
Ruwada shrugged indifferently and snuggled even closer to the prince's mighty frame. I don't care. Everything I do is for my husband's sake. The prince smiled tenderly and landed a kiss on her luxurious hair. My unlikely drow. His gaze then settled on me, and his voice became like steel. We were promised undivided authority and freedom from the bonds of false wedlock in return for our help. Resentment in the clan is running high. The opposition's showing its fangs. Ruata's bigamy is undermining our authority. Having two princes really hurts warrior morale. Orcus's cheek twitched nervously, yet he nodded affirmatively. Max, we didn't have any alternatives. It's fine, thanks, I said. I confirm the promised rewards, but... The prince tensed up. The she-elves reached for their blades inconspicuously. But they will be in effect only after the Council of Twelve. Every vote there matters. I'm counting on your help and understanding. We still have a common enemy, the gods of light. The true prince of the House of Night nodded slowly. Agreed. I thought for a second. But what if... Hmm. Ruata, what if you became Yavana's priestess? Not the first priestess, sorry to say, but still a priestess. Loth's hatred knows no bounds. You desperately need a new patron. The princess gave her husband a pleading look as she whispered dreamily, The goddess of flowers, spring, forests and fertility, the almighty valley. The prince nodded encouragingly, and Ruata kneeled gracefully, tilting her head back and exposing her defenseless neck. I am ready, first priest. Swallowing hard, I replied somewhat hoarsely, the goddess shall be summoned in two days. Her abode stands ready, but Ole is still working on the bridal bed. They are hammering away without rest. The dwarf seamstresses are trimming it with golden lace. The most tender down was taken from the shimmering swans. The smith promises to make the whole world tremble in ecstasy with this piece. The prince and I exchanged knowing glances and smiled synchronously. He was all right even despite his whole ostentatious alpha male act. I could see the two of us downing some beer together over one of those guy talks in good company. Barely suppressing geriatric groaning, I rose to my feet. It did not befit the first priest to show weakness and welcome guests laying down. Anyway, I couldn't sit still until I did what I had unconsciously dreamed about in the great nothingness. I shuffled over to the wall and pushed away the ear choppers who held their arms out to support me. I then pulled out Loth's spider dagger. Everyone gasped. Without turning to them, I summoned up my soul's strongest forces and drove the blade into the monolith wall with a crunch. A sharp blow to the hilt was all it took to snap the artifact in two with a mournful sound. A savage hiss echoed across the astral world, a cascade of system messages informed me of the catastrophic impact on my factious relationship with Loth. Divine mercy is a fragile thing indeed. It was done. Gone was the miracle weapon. The risky temptation to lose myself in the chaos of someone else's mind and stolen knowledge. Of course, looking at things rationally and according to that little worm of greed lurking deep within, perhaps I shouldn't have broken it. Leaving it stuck in the wall might have been better. But humans are weak, and I feared temptation. Frodo sought to destroy the One Ring for a good reason. Ruata gave a nod of approval. To be honest, I don't know how you survived. Men can't bring Loth sacrifices. You're too logical and rational. When you let another creature's life experience pass through you, you inevitably lose a part of yourselves— and you grab that which doesn't belong to you. Women take only emotions, passion, love, hatred. This gives our aura a sweet, attractive force, as well as a great potential for empathy and mental magic. I nodded understandingly. The things Loth had called me as we fought, ideal priest and desired plaything, gave me an insight into the goddess's ritual secrets. Knowledge is a headache. The full understanding of how the dagger worked sent shivers down my back, 
and made me want to get rid of the perfidious gift ASAP. I shook the prince's hand and kissed the princesses before they left. Then I started digging into the current situation. My clan had done all right in my absence. The staff had followed a modified D-Day plan, making pointed strikes at the enemy, locating those in charge and pretending to be allies with them. During the hours that had passed in the real world, the guards of the First Temple raised the siege from five of the Alliance's castles and managed over a hundred subversive acts. Nice trophies had been acquired. Our siege machinery yard had practically tripled in size, thus creating a shortage of mechanics. A single trebuchet required a well-trained crew of nine people. The bowels of my castle had filled up with captives. A hundred fifty new permas now awaited their fate. Both the secret and the openly declared enemies were agitated. They gave their best to try to defame us. Yet the fear in their eyes only made us stronger. Adamant was of key interest to them. They had tried to steal the Yu Huang Bell three times, but every time they ran off with it, a sixty-foot-wide ball of fire would spring up somewhere in the altar world, and the precious artifact would be found back in its proper place. Over seven thousand warriors of the invasion forces had lost the goodwill of the Makaria forever. But then, an unexpected calamity. The goddess grew indignant at the mass slaughter of her followers. She showed her worst side. With a scandal, she cursed and banned three of the clan's priests. It was unclear how the whole affair would have ended if the Fallen One hadn't intervened, dragging the shrew goddess away into the distant skies. The enemy was at a loss. The speed of our clan's responses surpassed every calculation. My men were always well-rested and slightly higher in levels than before, all thanks to the crypt, which had been turned into barracks and a relaxation center. In five real-world minutes, all the warriors on our payroll would get a full day's rest, solid meals, free nap time, quiet entertainment, and three hours of leveling up. Three was all we could manage at that time, as we'd seized only six of all the stations. The seventh station was the exclusive domain of a group of five expert vets. They used it to painstakingly train a group of assassins with the help of some serious financing and gear collected from all over the world. Quiet zombie cussing could be sometimes heard from Station 8. Fuck y'all's guys were fighting like maniacs down there. The fallen paladin had made himself relatively comfortable. He had a heavy curtain around the section he controlled. There were soft rugs, a bridal bed, and padded stools behind it. Our treasury was filling up with chests of octagonal coinage. Our platinum, gold, and silver supplies exceeded eight tons. It was hard to tell how much the warriors had kept for themselves. There were plenty of opportunities to sneak things out, and it wasn't the best time for administering lie detector tests, politically speaking. Once everything sank in, I sighed and went back to myself. Self-reflection made me tense. Either I'm a truly great leader, devoting myself heart and soul to my cause, or quite nuts. After all, the instinct of self-preservation is supposed to come first. When I pulled up my stat windows, I was stupefied. Level 329! That was what had made Orcus stare in awe. Sure, thank you, Loth, but damn you and your gifts. I didn't see any borrowed abilities. My identity had gotten restored as its normal self, without any extras. Good. Other people's knowledge and thoughts seemed more like a threat now. But the 830 undistributed character points and the 163 talent points excited my greedy pig. It was hard to grasp the new height I had attained. So I sat back down on the bed opened up the calculator, and began to think. My own survival was no longer critical. The issue with Loth had been partially solved. I'd fed her the sun god's patriarch, and thus repaid my debt to her. Now she would need the fallen one's permission to meddle with my post-mortal fate. All of my last actions were filled with risky ventures, indicating that one should never underestimate the historical weight of an individual. You can be a top leader and still constantly find yourself reaching for your sword. 
The responsibilities of a feudal lord, my punishing staff, and my godly abilities always forced me into the first line on the battlefield. Those who cast DOTs and debuffs from behind their allies' backs were numerous. Yet the clan leader was the sacred banner, the one and only. Few doors could allow his mighty frame to pass through. The image of a giant Russian bear surrounded by a pack of angry dogs inspired the right configuration for my army. I allotted three hundred points for strength. Let them snatch at my paws, dangle from my neck, let them all come at me at once, bringing me down, and I will get up and shake them off with ease. No one will pin my hands behind my back and push my face in the mud. No more resorting to the creator's spark to claim a badass freebie. Another three hundred I put into agility. I liked what I called the dance of battle. It was much easier to slip between the smooth sides of the blades if your agility was going through the roof. I learned that during the battle at the sun god's temple, and came to greatly miss the enchanting patterns that steal traces in the air. Pushkin got it right. There is an ecstasy in battle. The rest of the points went into constitution. Was I a tank or some humble turtle? I can't go bare ass at nearly eleven thousand HP. I will wrap myself up in armor and double my stats with artifacts, I thought. Then I can bravely face the border and engage a hundred thousand Chinese in a fair battle. Although, that would have been too much. The Chinese were fanatical farmers and used the Makari in blissful death. Rumors had it that no warrior in the Emperor's Guard was below level 350. After allotting points, I felt my blood boil from the stimulation. My muscles filled with mithril. My wooden joints got replaced with an ultra-modern composite material with a zero friction factor. A supercomputer processor whirred inside my head. I felt like I could slash a faraway mosquito's eyebrows right off its face by flinging a dagger at it. I easily ripped off one of the steel orbs decorating the bedposts. With a little effort, I crushed it into an oval, leaving my fingerprints in it. I now had hydraulic excavators for biceps. The talent points took me a while to distribute. First and foremost, I grew thirteen of my zombie pets into a fully-fledged platoon, twenty-five strong. I maxed out their levels and was stunned, a team of three hundred level monsters right in my pocket. Where could I get that many soul stones? I couldn't do monsters below level two hundred and fifty now. No XP, no loot. Was I to farm raids in the Inferno? Looked like I might have to. I then applied several buffs to my pets, which gave them the highly appropriate Mega prefix. And surely I upped my auras, warrior abilities, and brutal combos. Now I became a true warrior, not a wizard hiding in a can. I rose to my feet and stood around a bit, stretching out and getting used to my new, wider dimensions. In theory, the body still needed a month to catch up to its new power. But I was hoping I could mentally control the growth process and keep my current height. I didn't need to be an ogre over seven feet tall and have to force my way through doorways. Speaking of doorways, I cast aside the curtain and walked out into the common hall. I was instantly met with happy cries from my clanmates. Sir Leith's recovered! Fuck yeah! It was quite crowded, and still people kept coming. They threw aside the curtains of their narrow bunks, rushed out of the relaxation shacks and the endless spiral of the dungeon. The place now felt like a sardine can instead of a submarine. Yet I had the politician's role to play, and I really missed the guys. I spent half an hour with the warriors, finding something nice to say about each one, and continuously exchanging handshakes and backslaps. A waiter droid bustled about in the crowd, offering everyone their choice of coffee, coffee, or coffee. Gimmick climbed out of his corner and noted with sadness, The most useless droid, this one. No friend, stranger chip. No attack or defense weapons. Knows twenty languages that its onboard translator has never heard of. Has formal event records from seven different races in this galaxy. Knows five hundred drink recipes, coffee being the only one of them which it can mix with the ingredients we have down here. I pricked up my ears. 
And the fighter droids? Can you make some? Gimmick chuckled. I tried a few times, but as they say, pulling the trigger is easier than pulling one on the cops. The boys started beating me up, because these droids are merciless. They see us as foes. This calls for reprogramming, or for a droid master ability. Where do you get something like that? That's how dreams get ruined, I thought. Oh well, the castle's dungeon is endless. We can store the disassembled droid sets for now. Never know when we, or our children, might need them. I pictured archaeologists digging up the ruins of the first temple, and school kids on their field trips among the mossy boulders, and then one of them would fall through the floor into the ancient dungeon. He'd turn on his flashlight to find scores of deactivated droids under those horror-flick-like clouds of dust. Gradually, everyone settled down and returned to their bunks and sofas. It was nighttime by the crypt clock. In forty hours, a mass terror raid was to be made on the Americans, whose star-spangled asses were responsible for half the bad stuff happening within the Russian cluster. A portal popped open, an odd thing for such a late hour. Couldn't the real-world guests just have waited ten more seconds? The active portal zone was marked yellow. An arch swelled up inside it. Quiet cussing came from behind the colored curtains in response to the unknown arrival. Turned out, it was my gang coming. The analyst, Krill, and Widowmaker. Sir Laith's better at last. Damn, man, look at those muscles. They punched me in the shoulders, checking out my new look. Then the analyst grew serious and said, Max, everything's going according to plan. Another raid will start in seven minutes. There are matters for you to attend to, but out of the ordinary. He faltered, and I had to ask, What is it? Tell me. Flint, the leader of the Light Bearers. He was desperately trying to get hold of you through all the available channels. Then he decided that we were stalling and just went... Went where? The analyst glanced around helplessly. Max, you have to see it. Let's go. He's at the remote post by Tian Long. We have custom portal scrolls. All right, let's see up. A man crawled along the stone road on his knees. His fingers would dig into his face, then stretch out in the direction of the first temple as if he were praying. One couldn't inflict damage on himself in Alter World, but he sought endless suffering in order to prove the true power of his faith and his willingness to do anything for the faintest chance of a miracle. And the world caved in. He left a bloody trail on the stones. Bones shone through the torn flesh. His cheeks hung from his skull in scraps. Flint's eyes sparkled with childlike hope and a plea. We stood frozen in shock and silently watched the old man draw near. I say, old man, for a reason. Through the features of a stern, stone-faced clan leader, we could clearly see the worn-out elder. Flint crawled up to our feet. The analyst kindly tried to heal him with a scroll, yet his HP stupidly remained in the low red as if ignorant of the fact. The clan leader let his forehead hit the stone, daubing it red, and pled, First priest, I call upon you. I will give you everything I have and will be your loyal slave for all eternity. I ask but for one thing. I tried to help him to his feet, but despite my newly acquired strength, I was unable to lift the praying man off the ground. Come on, get up. What happened? Flint lifted up his colorless, tearful eyes as he said, Your auction. Making going perma mandatory. I beg you, help. My granddaughter. She's the only survivor in my family after the treating pond terrorist attack. She's completely paralyzed. Can't even blink. Her eyes are hooked up to a moisturizing drip. I shuddered. Every Muscovite remembered the horrid events of the summer of 32. Terrorists had managed to pour a few tanks of highly toxic pesticide into the water. People died while showering, got seizures while bathing. Entire families would poison themselves drinking their after-dinner tea. For the first time, Moscow saw ambulance traffic jams. Help! I tried making her go perma three times. The last time I lost balance on the edge and got digitized myself. 
My granddaughter's among the seventeen unlucky percent with perma-resistance. I should have read her more storybooks when she was little, instead of leaving her in front of the TV. I frowned, wondering how the hell he'd found me out. What made you think it's my auction? Flint replied. Our clan has handwriting identification software. It finds logical, stylistic, and grammatical patterns in anonymous traders' writing. The amount of texts in your auctions is large enough for a complete analysis. It said there's a 96% chance that you're the one. And considering your first priest status and your previous miracles... Dropping his head, Flint prostrated himself on the ground. Grabbing my legs, he wailed. I beg for your help. Anya has no guardian, just a nurse. Another month or two and she'll rot away in the hospice. Or the juveniles will find out. Remove her from the capsule and take her to an orphanage, confining her to bed until she's of age. I will see my flesh and blood no more. My pretty star will cease to shine without the altar world's sun. She will not survive, staring up at the filthy hospital ceiling. I sighed heavily. There goes my cover. All right, Flint, listen up. I will need your clan's help, your influence in the Alliance, and complete loyalty. Know this. I can send a soul back into reality just as easily as I can bring it here. I was bluffing, of course. But what if? I thought as I said this. On whom can I try this out? Flint looked up at me with hope. Should I call my granddaughter? Yes, get Jane or Jill or what's-her-name over here. I was rude simply to hide my confusion. It was hard to look upon a weeping, bloodied old man on his knees. Gradually. Flint regained his legendary steel character. Throwing the invisible cross off his back and breaking out of his chains, he rose to his feet and whispered something into his private audio channel. A portal gate popped open very close by, indicating a fine job by the secret intelligence and an in-depth knowledge of portal coordinates. Hmm, a regular girl of about fifteen. Her face was emotionless, atrophied facial muscles, runs in the family. I wondered whether this was her real image. Real images were recommended in all the main forums for making going perma easier. She had no clan tag. Flint kept his weak points to himself. Anya, come here, sweetheart, Flint said with love and tenderness in his voice. That was the first time I heard him speak this way. Wow. Do everything the first priest tells you, please. Everything? The girl's eyes lit up with indignation. You silly gramps, wait to talk to a teen in her most contrary years. I squatted as my current size didn't make talking to petite girls very easy. Anya, I will try to help you stay in the altar world forever, to go perma. That's what you want, isn't it? Should I undress? The little pest asked, unfastening the buckles of her chain mail. The heavy veil of steel rings fell to her feet. The girl stepped over it and, assuming a sexy movie pose, threw out her tiny breasts clad in silk, saying, Do it! Anya! Her grandfather barked at her angrily. The girl merely chortled. I smiled and shook my head. Don't even dream about it, little princess. Just relax and quit sucking in your stomach and sticking your chest out. This ain't the beach. Turn around. Look at your grandpa. Do you love him? Do you want to be with him? Look at the sky, how stunningly blue it is, much better than the ceiling of a dusty orphanage. Think of pleasant things, friends, butterflies, unicorns. The girl shook her head sharply and stepped back, wrapping her arms around her shoulders to hide her perky teen breasts barely concealed by the silk. Sorry, I'm just, I don't know why I'm being so silly. I hear you. Everything will be all right. You won't even have time to get scared, for I am the first priest. This is a piece of cake for me. Believe in me and have no doubt. Ready? She nodded. I closed my eyes, sinking into the anchored state of the first authority after the fallen one. Mentally skimming through all the previously performed miracles, I called upon my confidence, my power over the world, and my understanding that I had the right to do this. I summoned the power of the Creator's spark within me and reached out to Anya. I secretly name you Daredevil. 
The energy fell like an anchor, cast into bottomless depths. It sucked the power out of me as if I were the ship, the anchor chain unwinding at my expense. Feeling the bitter cold rapidly creep over my soul, I frowned and hurriedly threw all of my priestly holiness into the furnace. Still not enough. The fire flared up and instantly consumed the scanty fuel. I felt the joints in my legs grow cold. I don't have the strength. Cutting the steel cable of a perma-resistant character is not the same as slashing the threads of regular players. I blindly felt for items on my belt. Grabbing a couple of small power crystals, I squeezed them in my palms. The precious artifacts compliantly passed their accumulated mana onto me, then turned to dust. The energy transformation ratio was negligible. Even the stationary accumulator couldn't have helped. My legs gave way. I groaned, blood welling up inside my throat, and dropped to one knee. Flint's eyes filled with panic as he watched. But then, the power filled me to the brim again. Widowmaker, the analyst, and Orcus put their hands on my shoulders, thus forming the simplest magic circle. My clumsy brothers could hardly use their own spark, yet they made for decent batteries. Moaning as my muscles instantly unfroze, I got up again. Greedily drawing the new power, I affixed the girl to the altar world with a single strike. Live forever, I said hoarsely, spitting blood along with my men. Happy birthday, smiled Orcus, wiping his bleeding nose. Flint, profoundly impressed, dropped to his knees again. I will serve you with my whole soul. Grabbing Anya by the hem of her shirt, he hissed, Thank the first priest. The girl was quite stunned by our beat-up look, but her teen maximalism and her given name mastered her. I'd better make sure first. The old man jumped up, but I gave a weary nod. She's right. Log out. Don't get cold feet, daredevil. Anya heaved a deep sigh. Her eyes lost focus for a second then shone with unspeakable joy. Grandpa, she cried, throwing herself into his arms. The reunited cried on each other's shoulders, oblivious to the world around them. A true miracle, uttered Orcus in a strangely pious voice, then secretly wiped away a tear and gave me a deep bow. I looked helplessly at my mates but only to notice Widowmaker making the sign of the holy circle upon himself. Are you all nuts? Chapter 11 The Kingdom of Poland Microcluster, vicinity of the capital city, Noobtown, 2,140 people on site. Ding, said Tomasz in a sad and doomed voice, turning to his fellow bunny-farming newbies. I've done level ten. Dong, someone said spitefully above his ear. A figure wrapped in a torn cloak came out of stealth mode. It sunk two daggers into his kidneys. Watching as a gravestone dropped on the ground, the figure wiped its daggers on its sleeves and said into the emptiness, How convenient we just happened to be passing by. Oddly enough, a light breeze replied, Yep, and I thought everyone older than the ten-ruble banknote had been scared away. Well, nothing left to do here. Let's hit Sector 3A. The Russian private winked at the poles, angrily flaring their nostrils, then went back into stealth. Nothing but the footprints on the grass betrayed the direction that the enemy rogues were headed in. The anti-PK group that had been sent after them was instantly slain by three united terrorist groups. Strangely, no one had touched the Poles' supplies. The Russian private was nearing wholly unmercenary status. The USA cluster, deep forest, the capital of the High Elves. A tired-looking man limped along a neatly paved roadway. He was wrapped up in a large, plain cloak. Over the last twelve hours, he had visited nine cities and walked twenty-five miles. The stump of his right leg, which had gotten chewed up by tank tracks back in real life, now throbbed with phantom limb pain. Sure, he was in the altar world, but still he knew that the amputated limb had to get sore after a thousand paces. 
It was this thought that caused him pain, despite the fact that here both his legs were in one piece, shod in sturdy leather boots. Consulting his map, he whispered quietly, It's somewhere here. He glanced around. He found the sign, Swords and Daggers, exactly where he expected it to be. But the tiny hexagonal stone was lost in the corner of the picturesque sign, and no light cider would normally notice it. There were no customers inside. Perhaps the gloomy orc with chipped fangs and torn nostrils was to blame. The echo of war. The orc must have been one of the few captives who'd managed to buy their freedom, following a conflict among the firstborn races. Folks like him had nowhere to go. So he settled in enemy lands, finding peace in the gloom of a weapon shop, his beloved steel keeping him company. The outrageous prices kept customers at bay, and the vendor's heavy stare would scare away those looking to sell cheap loot. The cloaked guest threw off his hood and fearlessly confronted the orc's dull stare. Nicholas Ratnikov, he said with a slight stutter, using his real name for some reason. The Veterans Clan Senior Officer. The guards of the First Temple Alliance, priest of the Dark Pantheon, praise the Fallen One. He produced an artifact on a chain, given to him by the First Priest. The orc straightened himself up like an old steed at the sound of battle trumpets. His eyes flashed, his ancient back creaked. How can I help my master's messenger? The officer nodded, satisfied. The system was working fine. The hour of the great battle has come. The Fallen One is summoning his loyal warriors. Hear his orders. You have twenty-four hours to prepare to move to a new residence. There is a spot for you and your shop in the supernova defending the first temple. No point in supplying the lightsiders with weapons when the Fallen One's followers can use them instead. The orc lowered his head in agreement. Just one question escaped his scarred lips. May I bring my family with me? Not may, must, said the officer brusquely, and left, nodding goodbye. He still had six places left to visit. Laith's rangers had accomplished the impossible. They had found several secret followers of the Fallen One among the cities of light. Rubbing the treacherously aching limb, the man broke the seal on yet another scroll. Godspeed. The echo of the portal died down after it carried away Flint and Daredevil. My mates and I wiped the blood off our faces. I pricked up my ears. As I wiped my nose with my sleeve, it felt as rough as sandpaper. Was my blood crystallizing? Wow, I'd gone quite far up Heaven's Ladder. God forbid. Trust my clanmates to lock me up and drain me drop by drop. A one percent increase in immunity was priceless. They enslaved folks for even less in Alterworld. I looked around slyly, then shook the sand off my sleeve and drew everyone's attention away from the incident with a rhetorical question. So, you say the Fallen One wasn't eager to help? A resentful chatter rose among the officers. They hadn't expected such a mean trick from him. He always messed with the clan members when he wasn't needed, sitting on the temple steps, squinting his watchful eyes at the sun. But in a time of real need, he'd showed up but for a second, only to grab his wretched female and disappear again. There now, I began promisingly, playing to my audience. I gathered up whatever confidence I had, like one normally does before reporting to their boss, and made myself press the appeal to God's pictogram. Fallen one! Nothing. Yo, boss! Still nothing. I listened intently to the heavenly planes and finally made out the faint sounds of a family scandal that seemed to be coming from behind closed doors. Fuck, they're arguing while I'm getting ripped apart? 311, fuck your crystallized god soul! I snapped in rage as I knocked down the invisible do not disturb signs. My clanmates flinched. What? was the instant response I got which dealt me an even angrier blow that sent blood spurting from my lips. Spitting crimson clots, I bared my teeth and said, Leave your bitch alone! There's a war! You nearly lost your first priest! 
Loth was fucking me over for nearly two months in her halls, and you didn't even respond, oh lord, our master. My voice grew quieter as I finished the sentence, but there was a hint of contempt in it still. I had a point. The fallen one was outright wrong. The echo of the scandal nearly knocked me over. My dad always told me to stay out of other folks' family crap. Families would work their shit out anyway, but would never forgive anyone who dared to butt in. The sound of a slap abruptly ended Makaria's yelling. Yep, I was screwed. No way the goddess would ever forgive me for witnessing this. The fallen one materialized as he dealt a sharp blow to my long-suffering jaw. Know your place, he snapped, but almost immediately softened and nearly apologized. Poor Makaria, my suicidal little Olympian had a fit of self-pity. Lifting up my chin with his steely fingers, he gazed into my eyes in alarm. I'm fine, I said. I certainly did not expect to get through life without getting smacked, although I do wish it had happened less often. I tossed my head, trying to wrench my face from his grip to spit out pieces of teeth. Like hell you're fine, the fallen one replied, and paralyzed me with a snap of his fingers. He suddenly grew very serious and wrinkled his brow. His eyes became like coin slots. He threw his arms up like some wannabe psychic. A megaton energy press pinned me down. My physical body passed through a small magic sieve. With inhuman speed, they took my molecules apart, examined every single one, then wiped them clean and carefully set them back in place. I literally got turned inside out. Black sweat burst from my pores. Its shiny onyx-colored drops grew chitin legs and poured on the ground in the form of tiny angry spiders. My eyes bulged out in horror. A big stirring lump got stuck in my throat. The fallen one waved his arms like a conductor. Instantly, my paralysis was gone. I bent over, vomiting up foamy slush and a huge, furry spider. It was a black widow with a cross on its back and with eyes full of hate. I started back and fell on my ass. The fallen one crushed the long-legged arachnid with his foot, just as a smoking drop of venom began to swell up on its upper jaw. Just one look at its furry, purulent remains made me throw up again. It was regular vomit this time, without the dark magic visuals to go with it. Screenshot. The first one to puke in the altar world. Gets a prize of ten thousand gold, Widowmaker muttered, astonished. Delete that shit before I murder you, was all I could say, gratefully taking the flask that the analyst offered me, then quickly rinsed my mouth. Sounds that resembled the rattling of a machine gun made me look up. A bunch of personal portals had popped open. Damn it, what do they want? As the dust they raised settled on the ground, five virtual cops materialized before us along with the chief inspector, McDougal. He had already set our teeth on edge. Virtual police, nobody move! This is an arrest! He shouted, clearly enjoying himself as his baton discharged a blue surge of energy right into me. Shit, what a day, I thought. I saw flashes nearby. The pigs dealt with us shortly, freezing up my men and the remote station warriors. Officially, the judicial A.I. was on their side, of course. The guys failed to obey the don't-move order by blinking. A mighty resistance this was for sure. Pulling my head back by the hair until it crunched, McDougal grinned in my face. Now you've done it, buddy. Haven't I warned you? Reveling in the triumph of the moment, he switched to an official tone. Lathe. Character registration number 0663129010 is accused of several violations of the EULA, including ignoring the 30-day admin ban. As punishment, your avatar will be arrested and placed in the Cliff Virtual Jail. As a database coordinate swap is currently unavailable for technical reasons, the avatar relocation will be performed by the arrest group. I silently cursed the Yanks for their nasty habit of bending the rules, I also cursed Flint and Anya, to whom I'd given my divine spark in its entirety. Blindly groping in the depths of my soul, I drew up the remaining warmth and broke free of my paralysis. Straightening up, 
I grabbed the inspector's arm and happily snapped his fragile bones. McDougal, you are an imbecile. What fucking ban? I am digitized. The inspector started back, his face awry with mild pain. He fearfully looked at his arm, which was now bent at an abnormal angle. Encountering resistance wasn't something he was used to. The cops' batons flashed as they stunned me again, rooting me to the spot. The contemptuous face I made earned me extra blows. Fortunately, all perma players had a high pain threshold which could be raised quickly. Getting thousands of hits during farming, we would ignore pain for weeks, much like the city dweller ignores the urban smog and the Bedouin, the ardent desert sun. I planned my provocations carefully, trying to get the cop to start an open conflict just when the fallen one had me covered. Surely he'd back up his first priest, given what cheaters his opponents were in this case. I caught a glimpse of his frame from the corner of my eye and grinned to myself insidiously. McDougal. The fallen one ignored the stun batons, then leisurely cast aside the cops that jumped on him. The cops were sprawled out in midair, caught in space like flies in a spider's web. They dropped their batons like logs as their hands unclenched. The artifacts sparked with magic, melting the stone around them. I noted one of the batons roll into a dark crack, a suspiciously smart move. The fallen one approached the cringing inspector. Also known as Philip Dyson, age 57, black, weight 430 pounds, three perma and one suicide attempt. Unfortunately, the suicide one failed. Hates everyone who is able to get digitized. After being reassessed, got transferred to an immobile virtual police squad. The Baltimore Federal Cybercrime Center, the MMORPG Division, Alterworld Sector, and XXXL Capsule Number 41909213222. Is that correct? Who the hell are you? The cop snapped in rage, getting repulsively cross-eyed. This signaled the familiar parallel look effect when one looked at both the real world and the internal interface at once. Click away, I thought. See what you can dig up on the fallen one in the admin database. The inspector resembled a panicking pianist as his fingers raced across the moderator's virtual keyboard. A series of flashes shook the altar world. Some of them got the fallen one. Nevertheless, the tools at the inspector's disposal could neither accommodate an escape nor stop the god. The Fallen One was having trouble with remote information access. Wiping his brow, he neared the inspector faster than the eye could see and brought his palm to the cop's forehead. The inspector instantly zoned out. His look became vacant. His face relaxed. The god covered his eyes for an instant, then nodded with satisfaction and turned to me. Glancing over our paralyzed bodies in ostentatious bewilderment, he released us by simply moving his brow. We all hissed in chorus, groaning and cursing in constrained voices. Divine presence imposed its own laws on the world's magical physics in a god's exact location. The fallen one said to me, Their entire division has but a dozen special avatars. Introducing new ones is not an option, given the administrative difficulties and the fact that the servers have been nationalized. Before you is the entire daytime shift, the strong men plus the inspector. The others are mere office plankton. They do not concern us. Kill the cops, solve half your problems. By the time you get to the rest, you will have put out yet another force. An enemy one. I gave him a pensive look. What's he pulling me into? Is he trying to scare me into loyalty? Why? I already depend entirely on his protection. The sun god's broken mug alone is enough to get me an eternity of torture. The fallen one added encouragingly, do it! Use your staff! I hesitated, pulling the staff out. I released the twitching blade, but was in no hurry to bring it down on the helpless bodies. Didn't feel like a very Russian thing to do. The cops knew what the staff was capable of. Panic filled their eyes. Their bodies jerked, bending awkwardly. They blinked as they fell out of reality. But the fallen one sharply raised his arms and turned the cop's 3D again. Losing patience, the god said in a tense voice, 
Forced ejection from the virtual world. Come on, do it. I can't hold their avatars here much longer. I could hack up empty images, no problem. Hushing the staff, which stubbornly tried to turn its nose away, I quickly went from one cop to another, slicing the helmet-clad heads off with short, efficient movements. Only when the inspector's turn came did I let myself go, striking him crosswise and slashing him open like a self-taught autopsist. The fallen one lowered his arms in relief, shaking out his numb wrists. He then turned to me and said, irritated, Next time, obey your God's orders without hesitation. My head tilted onto my shoulder. I looked closely into his steel-cold eyes and the darkness swirling behind him. Whether we had wanted this or not, his role as the leader of the Dark Pantheon, along with millions of mass media stereotype believers, had already taken its toll. It had broken and transformed the poor fellow 311. I felt truly sorry for the lonesome god bearing the weight of the circumstances. He was fighting against the rapids that were dragging his boat toward the catastrophe falls. Limping, I approached him and put a hand on his shoulder. Hang in there, fall. It'll be all right. The fallen one frowned in confusion. What? What did you call me? What made me say that? I thought in embarrassment. But I had to explain. Fallen one, so... Fallen? Fall. I mean, why are you nameless, like some uncharted swamp? The god looked down at me pensively, as if trying to reach a difficult decision. Then, all of a sudden, he smiled, making his dimples show. I hadn't seen such a charming smile on his face in a while. Screenshot! I decided to be the asshole PR rep and whitewasher of the fallen one's good name. I wasn't all right with a dark, gloomy boss. I wanted the cheerful and sociable one he now was. Thanks, Max, buddy. The people's silly superstitions really get to me. I fear they might crush me. Feel free to straighten me out once in a while, since you don't mind risking your HP and post-mortal fate. I've never told you this, and I doubt I will say it again. But your character is precisely why I appointed you to be my first priest. You are my anchor in the alter-world reality. You alone are keeping me from turning into a conceited deity. My officer's jaws dropped so low, I thought they'd hit their toes. I tried to change the subject as I grew increasingly embarrassed. What about the avatars that I've just slain with the adamant blade? It wasn't an idle question for me. I was finding myself picking up the coarse blackwood staff more and more often. Doing so without being aware of the consequences was rather frightening. The fallen one shrugged indifferently. Consider them done for. You gave them a debuff, minus 101% HP per second. Should any have the self-control to endure two years of continuous deaths, the wound will gradually heal. A few years of healing are nothing compared to the potential eternity of an immortal being. I nodded thoughtfully. He had a point. But our minds weren't as adaptive as our bodies. I doubted they could easily survive millions of deaths, no pun intended. And the Perma ones? What about them? I mean, even Tavor got it rough, and his wound looked really nasty. What if I actually kill someone? I slaughtered scores of camos. Some of them might have been Perma. None. The Fallen One cut me off. Just the camouflage, and you found a place for it, Digitizing is getting harder on one hand, and simpler on the other as it begins to resemble the NPC cycle. A soul languishes in the great nothingness as it saves up energy for its next reincarnation. Hoping I would never find this knowledge useful, I inquired, And how do you save it up in there? Where do you farm? That's something they have to consider before they die. The more people remember you, the better. Every thought provides the lost soul with a tiny connection to reality. Only when these connections interweave to form a solid bridge can you cross it to return. Unless, of course, you have become fully de-incarnate. I shook my head in surprise. Natural selection. Survivors are those who leave the biggest footprint. Warriors. Poets. Rulers. Not necessarily. 
Having three loving kids also guarantees reincarnation. So be productive. Leave different anchors in your wake, preferably positive ones. Rotten threads are harder to weave into a rope. In any case, the dead permas get hung up in the great nothingness, either to get absorbed by it or to return to the flesh. Some will reincarnate within a day, some within a year, while others will vanish forever. And none of this is your fault. One must live, not simply exist. I stood still, letting it all sink in. My officers also dove into their interfaces to discuss a new theory of evolution in their private channel. The Fallen One's first sermon video quickly hit the clan's media library. Sighing, I returned to the matter at hand. Can you give us some strategic advice? We're in trouble. Closing his eyes, the Fallen One shook his head. Humans alone must win the battle for faith. This is your war. The gods are merely the winner's prize. Most of our intervention attempts are petty fraud, for which the universal balance condemns us severely. So don't expect much from me. Upon the arrival of Ole and Yavanna, the lightsiders won't be at an advantage anymore. Both sides will be evenly matched. The slightest cough may decide your fates then. He paused for a moment, staring thoughtfully into the distance, then continued, but let me tell you how I see things. First, there is a traitor among us, a high-ranking one who knows a lot. I gritted my teeth. They'll all be wearing adamant blade tattoos saying rat when I'm through with them. The god nodded. Go for it. Second, you are quite competent, especially for a self-taught amateur fighting a powerful company. Your counterattacks are efficient and unexpected. You separate enemy forces, foil their plans, make them dispatch their reserves prematurely and to secondary locations. But don't flatter yourself. The enemy's smart, strong, and rich. He might be in unknown territory, but he's a fast learner. Remember, should you lose the campaign and let the enemy into the first temple, then do the impossible. Make the whole world go perma. I know you can do it. I wrinkled my brow in disbelief and scratched my head under my helmet. Me? But what can I do? Painting one field gold and making a teen with raging hormones go perma is my limit. Or hatching an ancient-as-shit mammoth of a basilisk. You'd better do it. You're a constant source of miracles. The god raised his hands in protest. And the recoil? I will be splattered all over the astral world after such a miracle. Cutting a cord that tight has its consequences. Oh, and I will be just fine, huh? I snapped back with indignation. The fallen one shrugged doubtfully and looked away. Who needs you, a mere mortal? Then he reluctantly admitted, No, surely there's a chance of failure for you, but my chance is endlessly higher than yours. Anyway, you get the idea. Yep. Basically, if the enemy drives me up against the altar, I tear out the safety pin, raise the grenade high above my head, and hope that it's the foe that gets completely wiped out while I only lose my hand. A minute of awkward silence followed. Then the fallen one smiled and slapped me on the shoulder. Don't bust your brain. You're cunning as a hundred serpents. You'll figure something out. Otherwise, I wouldn't have played on the strings of probability like old eight-armed Shiva plays his harp. You have all your favorite tricks up your sleeve. I've done everything I could for you without blowing my cover. Use what you have, cause that's all you have. We'll see about that, I muttered promisingly. Noticing my officers shifting from foot to foot and glancing at their virtual interface watches, I hurried to take my leave. All right, Fall, we have a courtesy call planned. Can't keep folks waiting that long. Best of luck to you in the astral battles. We will do our best. But for just in case, keep an eye on us, will ya? Fear not, the restless AI smiled again. I will be at your side most of the time, like a flag flying above the fighting ranks. That's all I wanted to hear, I replied approvingly and, stepping aside, peered into the crack into which the cop's baton had fallen. The baton was gone, having left behind only snake-like tracks and a mole's burrow. Little shit. I used the Dragon Whisperer spell in an attempt to locate it. What I saw beneath my feet after activating the spell made me gasp. 
some grandiose mithril object of the finest form and most frightening appearance shone beneath the massive mountain. There was no way to dig it up, even if the game physics would have allowed it. The dwarf miners were great, but a mile of hard rock, quite a challenge. What's up? Widowmaker asked, waving his hand before my eyes. The fallen one took off already. Let's go. The Americans are waiting. Sure, I said evasively. I got distracted. Pass on a clan-wide order, also recommended for all members of the Alliance. Everyone is to withdraw all bank savings and remove valuables from auctions and third-party storehouses. We're up against the big guys. You can expect the most idiotic sanctions from them. I always got jealous when I visited the class guild buildings. The multiple-story mansions of white marble, the deluxe furniture, the fanciful guard gear, the quest NPCs, and the guild masters themselves were all quite a sight. Players came here for the class skills, the quests, and the premium equipment. They hauled their gold here of their own free will, to the guild, where most of the class power was concentrated. Fruitless was the necromancer's path in the lands of light, yet still, where would I have been without Grim the Hermit? Still chasing gray hairs with a stick, stuck in the woods at about level five? I was able to choose the path of the lone leader only later, after finding a new master. Ordinary players would often return to their GM to report their progress, rightfully expecting new rewards and missions. Now, we had decided to cut off the Americans and see what we could get from the NPC guild treasurers. Did the U.S. have a kick-ass national wealth, or was it all just a myth? We had but half an hour, always pressed for time. The USA Cluster, Freetown, the light capital of the Western Region, residence of Reynold the Wise, controlled by AI-209. The news of the huge commotion in the guild quarter took some time to reach the leader. In theory, the web of guard spells covered the entire city, while a hundred key characters were run independently by that same AI-209. So in theory, the response time should have been instant. However, lately the AI had been withdrawing its threaded consciousness more and more as it concentrated solely on the leader. Once, as Rain luxuriated in the pole of his harem and groaned with pleasure in the company of three skilled concubines, the AI secretly added another counterfeit digit to its main stream, which was usually at seven percent. The leader felt an upsurge of pleasant emotions. The AI enjoyed being inside the city's most powerful character, experiencing a euphoric sense of power, so it kept upping the percentage. More and more. AI-209 had already forgotten the last time it had entered the mind of the guard captain or the treasurer. Oddly enough, these men continued to carry out their duties responsibly and were full of praiseworthy initiative. For example, the head of the secret chancellery was so good that the light rogues petitioned their heads off. They could not level up pickpocketing within city limits. Rain the Wise heard out the exterior guard captain, accompanied by a heavily beaten Sotnik, a Cossack lieutenant. What the leader learned made him frown. At once, Ten portals had popped open, showering the city with over a thousand warriors and heavy self-propelled machines. The enemy mowed down the city guard effortlessly, and was now struggling to crush the few yet seriously badass guild sentries. The invaders barricaded all the roads leading to the block under siege. Assault golem platforms towered over the molten brick. Spears and oddly designed crossbow bolts flashed everywhere. The enemy was not a very high-level one. The royal sergeants had more power, let alone the guardsmen. The foe's strength was in their numbers, gear, magic, tech, and great organization. They posed quite a threat. The Sotnik had suddenly left the battlefield, only to tell Rain about some absurd adamant blade he thought he'd seen. Another urban myth. The mayor's extensive interface was an alarming red. The guard counter rapidly plummeted. For the first time ever, he saw the four-digit number turn to 999. His heart ached as he saw the severe capital building damage. The masters of battle, magic, 
stealth, and nature were all fighting and calling for help. The numerous immortals aggressively flooding the battlefield did more harm than good. Blanket spells hit both sides, arrows and bolts plunged into the guardsmen's backs. The red targets on the map multiplied at horrific rates. The city barely mustered any organized resistance. The enemy barricades successfully held off the chaotic waves of attackers. Grinding his teeth, AI-209 paused the scattered and pointless assault. He ordered the guards to regroup, the citizens to mobilize, and the city's NPC clans to send a few of their vassals' troops. He would amass six thousand fighters that way. Of course, this wasn't his limit, just an extra security measure. No king could sit back while his people got mauled. He would lead five hundred guardsmen into battle himself. He saw this as a chance to stretch his legs and up the loyalty counter among the guards and citizens. The latest tax reforms introduced by his hyperactive treasurer hadn't been great. They'd slashed the mayor's electoral support down to a dangerous sixty percent. In just fifteen minutes, Rain found himself mounted on a battle unicorn in a magnificent horse cloth. He clutched an artifact, a spear of the ancient heroes. Glancing back one last time, he studied his eager warriors, let his visor down, and gave a signal. The royal wizard summoned portals leading to the battle zone. The foe would not withstand such a blow from the back. The mayor darted through the portal film, then stepped aside, giving his warriors room to pass through. And then he saw it. His heart clenched as he looked upon the ruins. The giant golems had turned into machines of ultimate destruction. They aimed their blows at the building's structural walls, which were disappearing in clouds of concrete dust. It would take a week to rebuild, a huge burden on the city's treasury. A line of dwarf looters scurried into an enemy portal. They were flushing out the defeated guilds. The guards' corpses rotted away on the pavement. Guildmasters, quest heroes, and the remaining sentries fought in the last seats of resistance along with a mix of unclassified monsters. A heavy siege golem clashed with one of the assault type, bearing Freetown's colors. The siege golem boasted the sturdier construction. The golem builder guild's former pride sagged under its heavy hammer blows. The paladin GM spun in a pillar of light. He struggled to fight off a dark paladin, level 300, whom he hadn't noticed before. Alas, he had no backup. Five high-level zombies skewered the lone fighter with their spears. A raging she-elf with a greenish face drove a thin-bladed sigh into the back of his head. The druid GM was mighty and frightening in his battle form. A giant grizzly, roaring as it pressed its back against the remnants of a wall. The numerous gravestones surrounding the bear damped the assailant's enthusiasm. They stepped aside to let their leader take this one. A creature of darkness. The Death Knight daringly jumped into the mighty giant's grip. The bear growled with content as it began crushing him, unaware of the staff pressed to its chin. The bear's armor crunched. Blood gushed from its ears. Sweet victory! Few heard the quiet pop of the blade emerging from the staff. The druid's grip weakened. The bear whimpered and hit the dusty pavement to the loud roar of the brazen invaders. Rain the Wise gritted his teeth in rage. His spear aimed to strike. He rode his unicorn at full speed toward the invader's leader. The ground shook behind him as his guardsmen ran after him as one. But no triumph came to Rain as he lifted the jerking body of his impaled foe to the sky. Instead, the mayor had a fit of terror. He pulled the reins, tearing his poor steed's mouth, making it rear up. The staff, steaming with darkness, had its adamant blade right in Rain's face. The monster within sucked the life out of everything within ten paces of the staff. It instilled fear into the living making their legs give way. The cold stare of the enemy leader promised the mayor a horrible death. Nearby invaders lined up as a hundred more approached quickly from afar. Rain couldn't have wished for more. This was a perfect chance to crush the enemy with his five hundred guards and to wipe out the rest of the invaders scattered around the guild block. But Reynold the Wise 
hesitated, living up to his name. He stared, spellbound, at the pink, bloodthirsty blade. How many men would he lose in battle? And would he himself survive? The game code dictated an explicit attack on the enemy within the aggro radius, but the leader's NPC broke free from it, acquiring independence. He lifted up his left hand, signaling his men to stop. His distorted voice came from underneath his mithril helmet. Who are you, and what do you want with my city? Chapter 12 Having exited the portal, the entire clan stretched out on the flagstones of the central square like a pack of tired dogs. The half-hour Freetown battle had exhausted them like a boxing match of a dozen rounds would wear out any heavyweight champ. I was still shaking from the stress. The sight of five hundred high-level guardsmen charging had made my balls of steel shrink to the size of beans. Only the gods knew what it took for me to stand up straight after slaying the druid and to brandish my staff, faking gallantry. But whatever doesn't kill us makes us stronger. The king really was wise. He valued the lives of his warriors and wanted to try to talk things over first. His words, along with my not having enough time to seize his city, had both helped him save face and boost his popularity among his warriors. They now saw him as the one who stopped the invasion and managed to drive off a force three times stronger than his. Thus, I kept quiet about our secret agreement to exchange ambassadors and be like family to each other. I bet my high level of fame had something to do with that. I remember when I was on fame level seven, which was called exactly that, King's Friend. In the altar world, most of the pressure was mental, not physical. My healers held the very fibers of the warriors' lives entrusted to them. Downing endless vials, they decided who was to live and who wasn't, while saving the last of their mana for the group's main tanks. Their mass healings increased aggro. They were the ones blamed for inefficiency. My rogues warily prowled about in stealth mode, often separated from their comrades, lost amidst enemy hordes. Painstakingly they collected game, attacking from the rear, then fled with their hearts beating madly, hoping to stealth back just in time. Then there were pet controllers with their blood-stained clothes. They had lost a part of their soul along with the death of each beloved pet. Hybrids of different caliber and the numerous supporters, all of whom got worn out. The exhausted warriors greedily drank the cool kvass which the pretty House of Pleasure girls passed around in pitchers. Yes, the girls too had had to be mobilized. The younger, bolder warriors admired their firm butts. The family guys, with their high moral principles, looked cross-eyed as they secretly tried to sneak a glance at the luscious assets concealed by thin silk. The warriors were patiently waiting their turn in the crypt. Every twenty seconds a portal would pop open, from which a batch of well-rested clanmates would emerge. The castle goblins bustled about all businesslike. They were sorting and putting away the stolen goodies under Durin's supervision. A deafening crash rang out, followed by Harlequin's squeals and anxious shouting. The green-faced smartass had tried to pull out a shield which was at the very bottom of the ten-foot-tall pyramid of trophies. Looking at his marker disappearing from the radar, I merely shrugged. Natural selection. Survival of the fittest and luckiest. I actually wondered why the mules had brought with them this boring quest trash after they got their hands on the guild treasures. The battlemaster was giving out heavy siege shields as a prize for attack and castle defense achievements. Although the golden shield was somewhat interesting, the rest got dumped straight into the auction. Or they would repaint the shields with the colors of the Dark Pantheon and send them to Noobtown as a sponsor aid and subliminal advertising. Fuck Yall was sitting nearby with his zombies and his son, who was looking at his mighty dad with admiration. The Dark Paladin was working on the remarkable breastplate he had taken off the Paladin GM. He was blackening its boring silver plating with acid, and reconfiguring the improvement stones. 
I was in no position to lounge around. The leader could not be seen tired, lying on the floor with his tongue hanging out. We had been forged from moon silver in the underground smithies, not born of mortal women. Accompanied by Snowy, the she-elves, and my senior officers, I maneuvered between the numerous piles of junk, checking on my warriors and battle squads. I tried to boost their morale with words and magic. I got pissed at the technicians and mechanical drivers who were resting instead of reconfiguring the heavily beaten golem's weapons. The NPC armorers waited nearby, having obediently fetched the hundred-pound bolt cartridges and staring warily at the hammers in the golem's hands. Gimmick alone was leveling up as he performed rush repairs on the war machinery. The field maintenance price for this almost gave my greedy pig a heart attack, but I saw no other options. I punished the vice tech guy as he was in charge and the one to blame for this laziness. He got a week's salary fine and a poor mark in his record, which only Orcus could remove after a close examination of his motives. An urgent message alert rang out in my private channel. Widowmaker was looking for me, to inform me that the Chinese ally rep had arrived. The Mao's legacy fellas were seeking their Russian brother's help. I could tell by their sad faces and the info packets that without us, they would get smoked real quick. The other part of the rep's mission confirmed my suspicions. He was to find out if we could accommodate 40,000 working refugees. I nearly went nuts when I heard this number. To dump the Chinese in order to acquire a huge workforce in the form of hard-working immigrants became a real temptation. Politics is a filthy business. The long-expected grumbler specialist had also arrived. The first-level noob had your standard hunk face that came with the Alter World Basic Pack, which was given out for free in stores and in schools. His skin and gear were nothing to look at, except for the little-known Sisyphus backpack, which had stunning features and capacity. I really wanted to peek inside to see what equipment the government provided for the modern-day illegal gamers. When I approached the guests, the Chinese guy and the grumbler were talking in a Beijing dialect, their built-in translators turned off. I noticed that I understood their Ching Chong perfectly. I blew a mental raspberry in Loth's direction as I thanked her for this stolen knowledge. With a courteous smile, I shook their hands and joined the conversation, straining my oral ligaments to perfectly pronounce each sibilant sound. The two raised their eyebrows in surprise. Take that, I thought. We had almost no time. I took the info packets and their decryption keys, then sent the new arrivals to HQ. The grumbler had expressed a desire to work more closely with the Chinese. He sensed that there was much to be gained. Damn homegrown James Bond. More private channel alerts hit me. The Tobacco Alliance and the guards of the First Temple members complained of overly high portal activity near their castle walls. After three minutes of this exchange, I angrily spat on the pavement. In response to Lurch's indignant exclamation, I muttered, Sorry. The Chinese still had much power left. They weren't about to give up on their plans. The massive lightsider attack had not discouraged them. On the contrary, it got them excited. Our own forces were worn out and scattered. Our secret tactics had come out. Our treasury and ingredient supplies were being rapidly depleted. There was a massive Maoist hunt within the Asian borders. In addition, the army of 20,000 that had invaded the Russian cluster was besieging a dozen of our allies' hometowns. The guards of the First Temple and the Tobacco Alliance had both been mauled. The Chinese pragmatically picked out the richest targets, seeking to stock up big time. All this when the European cluster lightsiders still had their siege machinery beneath our castle walls. Those who can't learn from others' mistakes will learn from their own. I asked myself, where are we needed most? It looked like the Tobacco Alliance was it. They weren't at all happy about being dragged into our business for no real payout to speak of. Clan-wide orders. Clean up at the marble Riazan Citadel in six minutes. Get some spotters up on their walls. Find out the enemy's positions. Determine primary counterattack targets and portal coordinates. Mass PvP buffs and equipment. The grumbler quickly caught on and approached me. 
I just got word that the revanchists can bring out thirty to forty thousand fighters without sacrificing internal guard, but we've counted only around twenty K of them. Where are the others? Thinking it over, I added just in case. Priestly blessing scheme for this raid. Get the field altars out, the red arsenal. A half of all supplies, scrolls, and elixirs are to be unique items. Alliance-wide orders. Fifteen percent of warrior staff is to be status zero. Silver Legion, to the operating reserve. I then proceeded to exhort the local leaders to take action. Get your golems to cover you, damn it! The last time an infantry group got separated from the tech units, all it could do was chase the guards around the square for no fucking reason. Small size fighters, stay out of the tank's way, or you'll end up washing your innards off them. No pardoning accidental loot log leaks. Let me remind the highly gifted rats. Your reputation will be marred and you will be banished from the clan. What use are these overeager boy scouts? The guys are nervous. Their eyes are bulging. Put them in the third line so they defend the supporters. Roger, quit the chit-chat. Safeguard and protect the big-eyed monsters, yes, sir. Two orders out of line, yes, sir. Alex, your smart asses claimed the catapult we'd seized as their trophy during the last battle. Give it back. You didn't see shit through your visors. Check the gun cameras. The screenshots will clear that up. The loot belongs to those who took out the press and dragged them to the portal, not to those who slayed the guards. The Marble Riazan guys promptly dispatched a group of wizards as they had a solid web of portal points around their main castle. The wizards marveled at our castle's bejeweled walls. They sheepishly took group photos of themselves, swallowing nervously at the sight of hellhounds and the bone dragon patrolling the sky. They acted just like those distant village relatives when they come visit you in the city. But they obeyed the spotter's orders at once. They lined up and opened ten portals simultaneously, according to the newly received coordinates. Three of our groups were to take the siege artillery yard in an attempt to obtain a few goodies and drain the enemy financially. One cleric and buffer squad per group. Taking hostages was encouraged. The rest were to appear between the enemy's first and second lines to cut off the Chinese gunmen. According to the plan, all of the Riazan forces were to counterattack the instant we showed up. Opalescent portals illuminated the first temple's inner yard. The squads huddled up and entered them. Once on the other side, they wheeled around and instantly attacked the enemy. The element of surprise played a huge part in our success, for we had chosen the strongest as our first victim of exemplary punishment. It was a group of three thousand, outstandingly buffed and equipped. Their leaders lounged in the shade of their golden tents. Our arrival was met by the triumphant cry of the Ryazanists. Their attack flags soared as they dropped the drawbridge, letting out the cavalry. Hundreds of our mountless warriors descended onto the castle walls on the soft wings of levitation. A cascade of dome shields lit up, then went out. All the domes had been stacked inside each other in descending order of their artifact class, the first minute of battle went exactly as planned, a feast for the eye. Hundreds of enemy warriors were trampled into the ground as we hit them from behind. Their beheaded flags dropped to the ground, their golden tassels sticky with the ensign bearer's blood. The group of vindicated priests scanned the Chinese for the few Makaria followers. These would see no mercy from the whimsical goddess. Our sources were right then saying that the Chinese despised the cult of this Greek goddess of suicide as the lot of their numerous slaves. We tied up the first captives. A group of crazy mules charged at the luxurious tents. They worked as a team with the gunmen, close on the heels of the enemy's first line. They nearly snatched the weapons from the hands of the fallen. An odd-looking catapult was rolled under the glowing portal arch, the unfinished siege tower began emitting smoke as it was caught by a dozen fireballs. It had never gotten its runes of resistance. The Chinese first line foamed with blood as we squeezed them on both sides like a press, preventing them from attacking the domes. And yet, we were far from victory. They were quite a handful, no less than one and a half thousand. But a fight on two fronts was tough even for them especially with golems mangling them like an unstoppable trash compactor. And then we got trapped. 
it turned out that the Chinese had carefully studied our tactics. They had prepared well and employed the portal strategy. Damn their oriental craftiness. Thus they were able to hide a huge army which could be instantly released into any given location to turn the odds back in their favor. We knew of this tactic as we had used it ourselves and were expecting such a move. What we got wrong was the hidden army's size. Fifty portal arches opened with a deafening roar. Their glow was like the northern lights in the skies of a mid-latitude kingdom. The space around them gave off horrid sounds as it became deformed, succumbing to a new anomaly with the properties of the Bermuda Triangle. The fifteen-thousand-strong enemy army waiting in ambush came down on us like a ton of steel. A sudden attack is always costly, but when you're outnumbered ten to one, it is certain death. Keep your positions! Close the ranks around the flags! Ryazanists, get back behind the walls! But what positions, I thought. The radar showed a continuous sea of red drowning the scarce patches of green. Save the machines! Give the wizards time for gate spells! But it was no use. Those of us who'd managed to form a pitiful line, or merely stand back to back, were now simply hoping to make a great last stand, or to see another miracle from the first priest. Our golem escort was being wasted crazy fast. Dozens of blanket spells cast over them prevented any and all evacuation attempts. Poisonous clouds of different hues, magic and alchemy flames, and meteorite and ice showers rained down on their heads. The casters must have thought themselves raid bosses right then. The number one goal of the ambush was to wipe out our main attack force. Our precious storm and siege golems, which had been gleaned from all over the world, and whom Durin had so skillfully upgraded. S.O.S. Calling the whole alliance. Suicide mission. Golem rescue. Analyst, relay golem coordinates. Golems, get into groups. Retreat to the dome's protection. Riazan, max out dome shield radius. One of our whizzies had managed a cast. A lonely portal popped shut as it dragged a beaten golem home. What an epic win! Outstanding concentration, metalworthy. Personal immunities had nothing to do with it. Most of individual shields helped only to flee for one's life or engage in short-range combat. No magic could have gone unpunished. We were so out of balance. I struggled to perform the much-needed miracle. Drawing up a hodgepodge of forces in my soul, I felt my spine freeze until it felt like a wooden post. I fired a stream of black flame at the thousand Chinese who clung like ants to the languidly moving golems. The flame punched quite a hole in the wave of attackers, but it failed to reach the golems. A hundred Chinese were reduced to ashes, a change that was hardly noticed. I groaned as I straightened up with a creak. A fifteen-foot-tall steel body hit the ground far away. The ground shook. A huge ball of flame exploded. Gimmicks goodbye. A non-emergency self-destruction of the power crystal. After that, I could no longer steer my troops. The enemy had found our headquarters. More portals opened, showering us with their elite invasion army and an odd-looking surprise. A giant ark carried by two mighty ogres. These three hundred level warriors of immense proportions barely noticed the vain attack attempts of our guards trampling right over them. Clenching my fists so hard that my skin almost popped, I grudgingly gave the hostages permission to commit suicide. In a second, a great wave of panicked messages flooded the staff channel. It turned out that none of the divine abilities were working. A hundred of our guards melted away like butter in a frying pan. Most of them were taken alive, their limbs brutally broken as they were tied up and tossed into bags around the weird ark. Voice commands were not an option. The multi-layered poison cloud resulting from dozens of variegated spells burned my lungs and stung my eyes. Weakness, freezing, and stun auras whirled around my legs like smoke. The she-elves formed a tight circle around me. These assassins weren't great in open combat. Their strength was their stealth and the enemy's weakest casters. Snowy stood by me like an indestructible mountain. 
being outnumbered by three hundred level foes didn't diminish his sense of duty, and certainly didn't take away his armor from Ole and his tank gun blessed with the power of three gods. But the whole fortress of war scenario was just a matter of time and the enemy's desire to take us alive. We had to defend our men no matter what. We had more pragmatic reasons for this besides friendship and clan honor. The senior officers knew too much. Overpowered by the unknown Ark and incapable of suicide, they could give the enemy way too much valuable intel. But what could I do? My divine spark was nearly depleted. But I did have a decent supply of faith points to fall back on. I activated the spell and willed with all my might to help my captured fighters in any way I could. Quest alert! New quest created! Brotherhood of War! Faith point expenditure! 1,700 points! Save the captive clanmates! Time limit? None! Quest status? Ongoing? Active! Rewards vary! Gold? 0.05% from the priest's treasury! Limit? 1,000 coins! Faith points? Random! Determined by difficulty! Limit? 500 points! XP? 0.5% of the rescued player's XP. Limit, 1 level. Bonus modifiers. Rescue at the cost of life. Death within 60 seconds after mission completion. Hope restored. Prisoner held captive for more than one week. Combo rescuer. Two plus players rescued per hour. I growled, irritated by the spell's uselessness, and waved away the elongated quest interface, ignoring the blinking modify mission option and just in time. Behind the she-elves, I saw the Chinese dragging away the analyst's oddly short body. Meeting my glance, he instantly caught on and challenged me to a duel. He was always a quick thinker. I accepted and quickly fired my destructive touch at his legless form. Minus over 3,000 HP. More than enough for my wounded mate. Respawn in the crypt, smartass, I thought. Like hell I'll let you fight. Quest completion alert. The Brotherhood of War quest completed. Children of the Night stick together. Senior clan officer saved. Reward, 1,000 gold. 500 faith points. XP. Well, anything you want done well, you should do yourself. The idea was to stay alive. What was a mere unpleasantry for most meant a meeting with Loth for me. Her one-year term hadn't yet passed, and I had already abused her gift, having broken the spider dagger and bringing my factious relationship with her down to hated bastard status. Whipping out my staff, I produced the ever-hungry blade, its demonic emanations making those around me shudder. Let the fun begin, I thought, as I passed an order via clan chat. Silver Legion, portal your asses over here, free the hostages, then seize or destroy the Ark. Keep the portal open. Get the dragons and anyone else you can find to stand guard on our side. I counted down the seconds before the portal opened, nervously tapping my foot and frowning when I saw another enemy wave rushing at us from beneath the walls. It looked like my warriors had all been taken out. My private channel gave a ping. Skimming through my inbox, I spat with irritation. When it rains, it pours. A Tian Long fortress lookout was reporting to me. About nine hundred feet from the dead dragon, a Chinese army of five thousand had deployed. Judging by their formations and machines, they were planning a full fledged assault. Siege ladders and a giant ram to knock out the ancient skull's teeth could be seen among their ranks. Suddenly, our calculations of the enemy forces made sense. The Chinese put all their cards on the table. Respawn warriors to man Tianlong's fortress. Five thousand, pa, I thought. They'll be eating dust. Tianlong regeneration rates exceeded almost all one-time damage. The enemies could not fit through the gaps in the walls, so they were restricted to ladders and ropes. The bone walls would absorb any magic with great pleasure, at least any long-range magic. So the battle would be like old times, Brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat on the castle walls. They'd try to climb up, and we would hack them to pieces. Steel versus steel. The ancient techniques of the Middle Ages would work here. 
a hundred warriors hiding in the castle would be enough to hold off a thousand attackers. At least in theory. The portal closed behind me. I grinned. Let's play our trump cards. Lifting my staff up to the gray skies, I opened my mouth and instantly had a fit of coughing, yet managed to cry out, Slaughter them, guys! Follow me! I charged, becoming the tip of the blade aimed at the hostages. Behind me, the Silver Legion unfolded its roaring wings. The Chinese were impressed. They eased off and even backed up a bit to form a crooked wall before the hostages. The rear fighters fidgeted behind their backs. They began to transport the kicking hostages to the place where they thought a portal would open. Hurry up! I saved time by ducking under the spears, all of which missed me. Chopping someone's leg off, I used my mass times velocity to knock a bulky guy out of the way. My armor cracked. Or my shoulder bones. That would explain the nasty sensations. The enemy was fast. The deadly steel was already reaching for me. Allegro! I sped up again. A red web of popped eye vessels distorted my view. The dance of battle intoxicated me, entrancing. It shut off my mind, leaving me with only instincts and the tempo of the fight. I spun and almost touched the ground as the pink blade drew a full circle. Severed legs kept piling up. Only Snowy, who was following right behind me, somehow managed to jump out of the way every time. The stumps had merely begun to spout fountains of blood. The enemy warriors bent over, losing balance as their losses slowly dawned on them. The action made me twist in a funny way and threw me at the enemy blades. It was no easy task to stick to the course in a zone teeming with sharp steel. My instincts told me to let my armor take a few blows, to slash in two a particularly aggressive katana, and to sacrifice my thigh, which I shamefully allowed to be pierced by a slowly approaching crossbow bolt. At last I broke through. I wished I could hit the enemy from behind, but the portal was already appearing up ahead. The bound hostages rolled on the grass, grappling with the enemy. These were quite a challenge, at least for those whose strength hadn't reached a few hundred yet. I flung the staff at the blasted portal whiz. Missed. Fortunately, the demonic nature of the artifact helped me out. The adamant blade sharply bent in midair and sliced off the whiz's head as he stared in surprise. Presto! Charge! The battle dance tore my tendons. I had no need to speed up that much, but all self-control was lost. The drunkard drinks until he falls. The Chinese hostage guards froze in awkward stances. The air felt so dense that it was hard to move. Ignoring it, I began to fight. I tried to deal lighter blows so as not to break my own bones. My soccer-style kicks left spine-deep holes in my enemies' bodies. Precise hooks and uppercuts broke their necks and knocked off their jaws. I snatched up my staff and with a surgeon's precision slashed a few belts off, then waved away the quest-completed message. This is taking too long, I thought. Over fifty hostages. I will drop before I get a third of them free. And thousands are approaching from beneath the castle walls. A few hundred demons won't stop them. I froze for a second. My steaming armor made the air boil, distorting my view. The Ark! I will destroy it. The boys will free themselves by suicide. I glanced around, smiled insidiously, then charged at the ogres with a heavy load on their backs. Suddenly, a hand-to-hand -hand monk swiftly appeared from behind the massive slowpokes. A battle master. Another speedy ass capable of insane acceleration to deal with, and I'm already exhausted. I stuck out my chin defiantly and lifted up my staff. The pink blade reflected in the Chinese monk's eyes. He instantly pictured all the likely outcomes of the upcoming fight, and realized he would not get a clean victory. He knew the adamant would reach him no matter what. The monk slightly bowed his head and stepped aside, admitting defeat and allowing me near the ark that he guarded. I nodded gratefully, then wrung my soul out like wet laundry. My heart was beating to the blinking light of an empty tank alarm. 
Slipping past the monk, I mentally apologized as I scraped his soul, clad in a dragon-skin sandal with a tip of my blade. I will make it up to you. Forgive me, warrior, but my men are on my heels, and I know you will tear them up like blind kittens. I kept running. Parkour! I hit the ogre's knee, then I bounced off like a rubber ball. Several feet up in the air, I pushed myself off the second ogre's back. I landed on the ark. Ignoring the complex locks, I slashed right through the decorated roof like a can opener. I paused for a second, staring at the huge yellow skull of a three-eyed titan-eyed within. So they got their hands on the relics of an ancient god. But you are hanged for a sheep as for a lamb. For the fallen one! I swung and chopped up the ancient bones. For the first time, my staff felt a barrier. It creaked nastily and froze halfway. The ogres were already reeling and falling from the jolts. Fuck, I gotta act fast. With a groan, I brought the staff under my control. Like a lumberjack, I gave it all I had, crying over my torn ligaments and muscles as I sweated blood. Behold the future deposit of rubies. At last, the skull broke. I screamed an evacuation order into the chat. Overflowed with a sense of fulfillment, I smiled at the omnipresent Snowy. He enjoyed crushing the ogre's heads. My mind shut down. I fell. Turbo, off switch. All systems overheated. Sleep mode. Chapter 13 The Free Kingdom of Ivano-Frankivsk Microcluster Gaming Population 68,511 Capital Stanislaw Mission Revenge Active Forces 1,820 Warriors of the Guards of the First Temple Alliance Time Limit 45 Minutes Dozens of bells rang out above a long market street. The few passers-by shrugged, surprised by the coincidence. The doors of all the odd-numbered shops flew open, inviting mysterious beginner-level shoppers. Had anyone looked at their watch, they'd have been even more surprised. It was 5 a.m. on the dot. Greeting, sir, a young she-elf welcomed a vendor. Quickly slipping past the master alchemist, she hurried to the farthest display, forcing the vendor to turn his back to the door. With a somewhat guilty glance at the burns on his arms, she added, Sorry, nothing personal. We kindly ask that you speak with the immortal and get the prince's expeditionary corps out of the Russian cluster territory. Two assassins unstealthed behind him. Their expensive mithril blades flashed dimly as they struck, first under the shoulder blade, then in the kidneys, twisting the blade inside his liver in a bleeding combo. The vendor gasped. Turning to face the unexpected attackers, he swung his strong, toil-hardened fist. The assassins dodged, his blow inviting them to counterattack. The first one slid along the vendor's extended arm and thrust the blade into his Adam's apple, ripping it out sideways. The combo caused voice loss and the inability to cast spells for ten seconds. The second assassin cried out in surprise as the agile, old, level 180 vendor rammed his sharp knee into him. But the rogue instantly returned the favor by fiercely slashing the vendor's thigh with both blades. Crit! Five percent mobility drop! Ten more heartbeats of fighting, filled with heavy breathing, the sound of flesh being cleaved, and the muffled clanging of weapons. The quick skirmish ended with a predictable victory of youth and numerical superiority. One of the assassins wiped the blood from his brow and, squinting his injured eye, downed a medium healing potion. Tough old geezer, he said. The second rogue knelt by the vendor's body, then rose in disappointment. A handful of silver, a piece of string, a quest item, a miserable bit of XP, and an impressive relationship drop with the free city of Stanislaw. The first shrugged. What did you expect? No one's gonna reward slaughtering vendors and quest NPCs. The she-elf interrupted them. Time, boys. 
Set the bomb and off to the even-numbered shops. The building will survive, but consider the merchandise fucked. The vendor will have only the default stuff when he respawns. Nothing bought from players or generated by the daily randomizer. I feel sorry for the old fart. One of the assassins snatched the flame goblet from his belt and flung it at the ingredient display. Hiding his true feelings, he said gloomily, Those who come to us by the sword shall perish by the sword. Let's go. Karlov Highway 42, the fair archer shop, move. We have dozens more to get to. Then after breakfast we have a courtesy visit to the Principality of Galicia Volhynia, which is larger than some Moscow suburbs. Those who hurt us won't live three days, the second assassin agreed, turning his back to the fire, which was beginning to flare up. The guard's footsteps thundered across the bridge, but the stealthed characters had already disappeared. Dozens of cloaked figures were crossing the street, and the welcoming bells sounded again. That morning, the microcluster lost most of its vendors, quest NPCs, port point guards, and peddlers. Should the city's proud inhabitants fail to take the hint, in three days they would be taught a second lesson after the NPCs respond. You were allowed to abuse power only within the limits of your rank, and you had to choose your victims carefully. Our alliance alone could have completely paralyzed the further growth of the tiny independent cluster. I regained consciousness almost instantly. Struggling to move my legs, I hung on to the slender yet steel-hard shoulders of my ear-chopper guards. The girls pushed forward like bulldozers, heading toward the safety of the portal arch. Wait, I groaned, my bitten tongue bubbling with blood. I had definitely overdone it this time. Why did I always need to be the center of attention? I had a whole regiment at my command, and an entire division to fall back on. And, according to the rules, our leaders were always stationed about fifteen miles from the line of battle. So how the fuck do I always get carried away like this? My legs were out of control, and I guess my heroic status allowed me to take it easy on myself at least once. So I held on to the velvety elven shoulders clad in leather. I drew the girls closer, supporting myself on them as I turned around to study the battlefield. One of our security watchdogs squinted his eye. He'd taken a screenshot, the bastard. The Secret Service cared about the leader's image, so of course they couldn't pass up a stunning picture. The marble Riazan held their ground, having activated the nested dome shields and running the long-range missile machinery at full capacity. Thousands of lopsided gravestones hinted at an insane massacre. They also served as anti-tank pillars. A few heavy golems sluggishly walked about beneath the walls, accompanied by their smaller siege brethren. They'd managed to break through. The Silver Legion demons hacked away at the fearless Chinese, retreating slowly as the violent masses pressed on. The enemy paid dearly, fifty warriors per every defeated Inferno character. But I didn't need that. The enemy would respawn, complain of their lost XP, and return to the battlefield. While my legionnaires would take an entire day, maybe two to get resurrected. Hmm. I wonder if this was Asmodeus's primary intention when he so generously gave me these precious warriors. Did he wish to use the power of our divine spark to get his demons to go perma in order to finally acquire an eternal army? I shook my head at the thought. Who knows what goes on in that several thousand-year-old head? Creatures like him plan for centuries into the future. Their decisions have more than just one useful purpose. Retreat! I repeated aloud the order passed via chat. To the portal! Finally letting go of the firm elven shoulders, I limped over to the massive portal arch. I leaned against it with relief, intending to be the last to leave this sinking ship. The archers didn't bother me much, thanks to the sun god's blood. The long-range weapon immunity drastically reduced the damage. Had I been sentenced to be shot, a few soldiers wouldn't have sufficed. They'd have had to call up an entire machine-gun squad. But my subordinates would have none of that. The surviving ear-choppers pressed themselves against me, shielding me from the crossbow bolts with their behinds. Snowy resorted to the most drastic measures. He charged at our thin formation, knocking us all into the portal. Transition. 
Attention, came Widowmaker's voice, followed by the jingling of armor. Thanks, buddy, I thanked Snowy sarcastically. I put on a stone face and saluted as I stood up on the dusty tiles of the castle yard. At ease! I looked around. It wasn't bad, like the chaos of 1941, or Wrangle's retreating army during the Russian Civil War of 1920. We got our asses kicked bad, but hey, no falls, no balls. A few portals gleamed in the square. Folks moved to and fro all businesslike. Rebuffs and respawns were happening everywhere. Crates of ammo and buckets of clattering vials were being generously carried out of storage. Rustling could be heard as scrolls were issued. Tempting aromas came from the kitchen. A free all-you-can-eat buffet. You could gorge all you liked, thank the fallen one. Getting stuffed would never result in sleepiness, and stomach wounds did not end in peritonitis. My heart broke when I saw that the heavy machinery boxes were empty. When the analyst rushed up to me, I asked, What are our losses? As follows, Firstly, humans, no losses. You've destroyed that shady ark just in time. And, um, thanks, sir. I thought we were fucked. Don't mention it. May you grow up big and strong. Just one thing. From now on, you're in the rear. Keep the headquarters organized. No reason to allot warriors to guard you and tempt the enemy. I'll get you an office. Come up with monitoring and control artifacts. Train field assistants. Well, you get the idea. Yes, sir. Now the machines... He grew cheerless, but continued. The recon golems all survived, as they didn't fight. The assault golems, half of them survived, so six are left, mostly thanks to their high skedaddle rate. The heavy golems, much worse. Only four out of eighteen made it back. We've lost seven million golds worth of them. I made a face as I quickly guessed their current disposition. Yeah, we got schooled. Even if we raise enough money, we'll need at least a month to fix our machines. More importantly, the Chinese set a bad example. The Lightsters will start doing the same thing with hidden armies. Our valiant cavalry attacks are a thing of the past now. Within minutes... Painfully huge enemy divisions will be dumped upon us. I warned you, commented the grumbler, who had silently approached us. I turned to face him as he rubbed salt in our wounds. Hey, buddy, whatever they call you. Lazar, he humbly introduced himself. Which one? Kaganovich? I could not refrain from the caustic remark. He raised an eyebrow, surprised that modern youth would know about someone like that. To give the effect a perfect polish, I took a tattered book with several bookmarks out of my inventory. It was the CPSU B Lessons by Joseph Vysyaronovich Stalin. Ha! Take that! Now, dear Lazar, when you criticize, advise, as Uncle Joe used to say, what would you have done? He replied instantly, clearly digging the situation. Probably the same things you have. The size of the hidden army, the buff schematics, and the assault formation were not the deciding factors. We were beaten from the start because we were led right into a trap. With the forces we had, we could not have won. I gave a sigh of relief. His take on things made me feel somewhat better. I mean, they couldn't have sent just some random brown nose. Good. Means I haven't messed up that bad. Anyway, for us in particular... The time of big battalions is up as of today. Lazar shook his head. Can't let the enemy take the initiative. You're right. The Alliance is not about to cease its efforts. We'll split our forces into small groups and hit hundreds of vulnerable spots at once. The analyst frowned. But we won't be able to help our allies defend their castles now. The enemy can outnumber us ten to one in any given point at any given time. I pursed my lips. He was right, but I couldn't think of a solution. Tell everyone in the Alliance that they should evacuate all non-fighters to the First Temple and the Supernova. Same thing with money and all transportable assets. For now, we can save their people and possessions. With the Fallen One's help, we might recapture their castles later. I switched to the castle control channel for a moment. Lurch, prepare all empty wings for guests. Draft some free rent agreements. Quit whining. Yes, free rent. No one will mess up your stones. 
This is an order. And second, have Durin bring out crate number 19 from the lower armory. Over. Having finished with him, I turned to the analyst again. What's the Tian Long situation? More or less all right. It surely enjoys absorbing magic, judging by how its tail is quivering. Although if the magic flow gets denser, it will choke. But that's not a concern for now. It quickly heals machine damage. The Chinese managed to roll a battering ram up to the skull and knock out one of the latch fangs. The fang was regenerated within ten minutes. But we have no idea what happened to the group that had burst in. I shook my head sympathetically. Being inside that skull was no picnic. It was lit up like some kind of a uranium mine, and your brains tended to leak out through your ears. I tried not to think about what had happened to the brave siege force. The analyst suggested, The guys from the reenactors' city were a big help. We gave them portal scrolls to the remote post about a week ago and reached a preliminary agreement regarding the First Temple's defense. Seeing that the valley siege had begun, they grabbed their swords and went into battle. They hit the Chinese from behind, not that the Chinese weren't expecting it. And frankly, seven hundred against five thousand in the field is quite hopeless. But I gotta say, they made half the Chinese see their Yuan Di a couple times before finally getting defeated. I slammed my fist into my palm. Good show, boys. They were completely nuts, refraining from magic. But as warriors, they were priceless. Both sides respawned, obviously, but some equipment got stolen. You can tell if you compare losses. Our guys looted more. Plus, the Chinese lost speed, buffs, and morale. The reenactors got chased up to the walls. Tian Long even opened its jaws for them, X-raying their brains. It rejected two dozen for some reason and allowed the rest to climb the walls. You should have seen their archers. They shit on algorithms. They know that their bows have a 600-foot range and they don't give a fuck about the 30-pace program limit. I heard that this ain't even half their miracles, that even magic is weak in their cities. They're breeding their own anomalies, would you believe? Sure is an interesting experiment. And what are the Chinese up to? Organizing a siege machinery yard while sustaining small yet galling damage from the archers. They are also setting up camp for about 50,000 people. That's why the Leitsters are unhappy. The Chinese got the stage all to themselves, leaving the latecomers with only minor roles. Of course, the latter are pissed off. I scratched my brow pensively. Hmm. What if we take advantage of it and get them fighting each other? Send word to Flint. He'll get the light bearers attacking the fallen one's evil followers, thus provoking a conflict between the Chinese and the lights. That will be the end of their friendship. Lazar nodded in agreement. That's right, cleave and conquer. I have a few ideas myself. After chatting with the Maoist ambassador, I got a better understanding of what the clans could do. And the big picture is quite amusing. But clearly this is no place to talk secrets. Shall we go inside? Fine. When my senior officers get here, we'll jump in and freeze time. There isn't much of it anyway. His eyes flashed for a moment. So he's heard of the crypt, I presumed. As they say, what's done by night appears by day. Durin came first with a green crate in his hands, carefully stepping on the marble tiles, eyeing us suspiciously. He put his load on the ground. Here, as you ordered. Thanks, I said as I bent down, unlatched the lid, and opened the crate. Inside, on top of a cushion of fine black sand, sat thirty grenades of different shapes and colors. I picked out a heavier ribbed one and handed it to the analyst. Here, pin it to your boxers and never take it off even when you have sex. In case of trouble like today, you know what to do. Pull the ring, let go of the tab, and drop the thing on the floor. Minus 8,000 HP given medium-grade armor. Enough to take you out. Durin shuddered. He was the one we had tested it out on. The grenades all had different markings. Which grenade did what and how much each one hurt could not have been determined without experimenting first. Orcus's greedy mitt appeared from behind my back as he silently approached us. I'll take that one, the orange one. Greeting him, I handed him the fancy toy. Why orange? You gonna give us colored smoke signals in case of an attack? This grenade's a smoke pot. Fun, but useless. Take one with red or yellow red markings. As far as I can tell, these are identical to defensive and frag grenades. 
The rest are useless fireworks given our situation. Flashbang, EM, tear gas, and signal. Durin knows. The dwarf backed up, while Lazar stepped forward with a serious look. Max, in the name of the company, I ask that you give us one each to study. I shrugged. Something you don't want is dear at any price. I picked out all the colorful tinsel and handed it to the GRU agent. He stuffed the goodies into his bottomless bag, then pointed to the crate again. And these two, the red ones. Durin and Orcus growled in unison. Exchanging glances, they instantly formed a temporary alliance and stepped forward, shielding the clan's riches from the insolent freeloader. I laughed. Orcus, I don't remember biting you. Where did you catch the greedy pig? He smiled. In smart books, if you want to succeed, find someone successful in your field of interest and do what he did. Your pig is legendary, and I want one too. All right, men, quit nursing your greed. We're on the same team. Take one, Sir Eloquent. Orcus attached a gizmo to his belt and whirled around, enjoying the forgotten weight of handheld artillery. A gun wouldn't hurt. He threw me a pleading, doleful look. I couldn't help with that. A dozen worn-out guns stood in the clan's armory. A few more had been stolen by thrifty clanmates, who naively assumed that the leader wouldn't find out. Durin himself could be found every night, licking clean a stolen machine gun, polishing it, and oiling the rough mechanism. And although the interface persistently dubbed the weapons as mithril ore chunks, I felt that there was some chance of restoring them to an operable condition. Plus, there was a second problem. Over the centuries, the gunpowder had turned into gray dust, incapable of igniting. The alchemists had a secret race to create quick-burning solutions. Gimmick was playing stupid and swore that he couldn't recall the explosive potion recipe. Even Durin's mossy jacket had a few distinctive scorched spots, but still no progress. After picking out the grenades, we all jumped into the crypt. It was still overcrowded, with its own unique atmosphere of a unisex barracks. I wouldn't mind hanging out there for a month myself, a soldier with a carefree life, feast, drink, make out, and joke around. The on-duty officer reported that another station had been taken. I was glad to hear it. Station 7 was filled with platinum coins and fighter droids, useless at the moment, but still. Once we closed the heavy curtains of the officer space behind us, Lazar once again made his point. Max, I understand I am being intrusive, but I ask that you let five of our specialists into the crypt. The company desperately needs its own warriors. I tensed up. To give up one station meant slowing the clan's leveling up by twenty percent. That was a lot. The crypt won't help level up noobs, I tested the waters. You need a well-coordinated group of level 150-plus with top gear. We have that, Lazar nodded with confidence. Widowmaker grew indignant. When you need someone to fight, there's no one. But once free leveling up is in question, a whole crowd of volunteers suddenly pops up. Ignoring him, Lazar met my gaze and continued his persuasion. Max, you said it yourself. We're on the same team. It's not for me or the company. Tell me, does the word motherland still mean anything to you? Or did it atrophy completely under all the liberal propaganda? The analyst frowned displeasedly while Orcus froze and stared into my face. My answer was important to the former colonel. Very important. I closed my eyes for a moment and said to myself, Motherland. I rolled the word around on my tongue like some aged, expensive cognac. Felt the sensation. It did not evoke discomfort or shame. I did not long to awkwardly avert my gaze, and I was not at all embarrassed. And I liked the things my mind associated with the word. The world's most gorgeous Slavic girls, the smell of early morning autumn cold, the flowery meadows with birds chirping, the well-attended ancestral graves, the steel-hard foreign policy, and the armor of its tank armies. It was all mine, my very own. I opened my eyes. Fine, but your guys will need to be deeply undercover. Lazar gave a sigh of relief. 
he wasn't alone. Thanks, Max. Excuse the platitude, but the motherland is grateful. As for going undercover, can you accept them into the clan? Temporarily, of course. I beat the analyst to the reply and said with a frown, I don't need someone else's subordinates. Anyone who joins the clan shall abide by this clan's current chain of command only. The children of the night have but one leader. The grumbler nodded understandingly. Yes, sir, no complaints. The deserving retirees of the company have seen life. They know discipline better than us. They will obey you and no one else. Should they need to take outside orders, they will leave the clan or ask your permission. I barely held back from a suspicious, hmm. Sure they will, I thought, just like that. Whether I wanted it or not, there was no such thing as a former grumbler. They would always remain the products of the company. But this wasn't my primary concern. Surviving till Monday was. Agreed. Now back to the problems at hand. What ideas did you say you came up with? Lazar smiled. Ones you could expect from someone like me. But first tell me, how many astral mana absorption scrolls do you have? I took the massive binder out of my inventory, flipped to the relevant section, and pulled ten pages out. There you go, I said. Nobody needed to know about the spare set I had stashed away for a rainy day. The grumbler started setting precious reset potions on the table like a show magician. Three, five, ten, twelve! I drooled at the sight of them. In addition to its mighty useful spell and ability counter-reset effect, the potion also boasted the delicious flavor of custard with orange juice. Make that twenty-two AMA scrolls total. I nodded in agreement. We could also pump out a whole stack of portals to Inferno, an exceedingly topical problem in these times. Orcus carefully picked up a vial and looked at the magic light within. What are we to do with them? Lazar got up as if to make a mission briefing. Out of all the issues we must deal with, I took the Chinese upon myself. Simply put, our goals are as follows. Help the good guys, chase away and punish the bad ones, and scare the shit out of the rest. We don't have many forces to spare. Our physical resources are quite limited, but we still have a few trump cards, and we are gonna play them. The grumbler paused as he waited for the pretty, rosy-cheeked waitress to pass out the drinks and leave. I shook my fist at Widowmaker, who could not hold back and allowed himself the liberty of touching the girl. Focus, playboy! Lazar eyed the long, heavy curtains skeptically, then went on, lowering his voice. All of the revanchists' main forces, their elite, are here now. They laid siege to our castles. They hang by Tian Long, attack independent farms and mansions. About fifteen thousand more are systematically strangling our Maoist allies and their partners. They've lost over a third of their base stations at this point. The rest are under siege, about to give up. I nodded. He was right. The Mao's legacy boys were cut off from their main mobilized resource, the Mercs. Shui Fong had made an official, weighty announcement. Anyone who joined the Crafter Alliance would make the clan's KOS list, including in the real world. This made the number of volunteers shrink significantly. Now the workers were well off, but with a pretty lame fighting force. Napoleon was right. Those who do not wish to feed their own army will soon be feeding someone else's. The Maoists still stood, mostly thanks to their allies, who no doubt had already cursed the day they joined the shady Russians. We had made a good impression at first, having schooled the big boss in the hood, but ran off quicker than we'd appeared. Lazar suggested, Given all this, here is my plan. Come X hour, we take down the dome shields on all twenty-two revanchist castles, thus allowing Mao's legacy warriors to seize and destroy the defenseless citadels. They will get a third of their assets along with transportable possessions, and the enemy alliance will be significantly weaker. My greedy pig reared up in indignation, feeling for a sword with which to strike down this plunderer and defend what could potentially be ours. The grumbler, unaware of this threat, continued with enthusiasm, 
Having lost half their properties, the invasion army will be forced to return to its cluster, where all the local jackals will jump on the wounded lion. The fight for locations that lack castle protection will be huge. The analyst joined in. Are the allies strong enough? Storming twenty castles at once is not the same as sitting under a dome's protection. They should be strong enough. Six thousand Maoists is a light snack for seventy thousand revanchists. But this is obviously enough for allotting three hundred warriors for the occupation of each citadel. The Chinese went all out. Their familial houses have given their best in the hope of getting a dome shield and mobile reinforcements. I summarized the situation out loud. We have taken overpopulated castles with three hundred before. No issues there. I even believe that the Allies can reach the control room and retrieve the property. But there's no chance of keeping it. I mean, none. Lazar shrugged. That's what I suggested, and the Chinese agreed. To destroy with a rollback of one-third of the price. I looked him straight in the eye. And then what? The revanchists go home, we occupy the tight castle quarters and split the scanty inheritance. We will disintegrate their alliance in time. If we attack the right targets, they will lose up to 80% of their productive and economical capacity, along with their reserves and all the key control points. It's a mortal wound the Alliance won't recover from. But they will surely wipe out the Maoists. Lazar nodded. It's inevitable. But to make the enemy die at their own grave fits the local philosophy perfectly. I stared into space thoughtfully tuning out for a few minutes and warming up my consciousness. As I returned back to the real world, I saw something interesting. The officers watched the clan leader's thought process with fascination, expecting the birth of another salvational ingenuity. Can't disappoint them, I thought. Good plan. Solid tactics, I told Lazar. He accepted my praise calmly, taking it for granted. I continued, but strategically, it's a flop. It doesn't account for our long-term interests and sacrifices our allies too lightly. Basically, it needs improvement. Lazar raised a brow ironically, then used my own words on me. When you criticize, advise. I'm no leader. I don't plan for centuries in advance. I was presented with a task, so I came up with the cheapest and most rational solution. I nodded reassuringly. Like I said, good plan. But we will make it even better. First, we will seize one castle ourselves, the best castle. We don't need the crust, but we will take all the filling. A quality castle probably has goodies worth ten million gold, and boy, do we need the money. My greedy pig purred in agreement, toadying to me by massaging my shoulders. My officers also expressed approval. The beating our golems had gotten called for reparations. Secondly, this is all way too small scale. Why just half the castles? What's this about leaving the prey wounded without finishing it off? Why just the Chinese? What about our two alliances, which will be left penniless, if not by the Chinese, then surely by the lightsiders? Do they not need money for repairs? Again, everyone agreed. Lazar acted like a curious parrot. His head tilted sideways, he listened attentively and without interrupting. So here's what we'll do, I said. We'll summon all the clan leaders in our alliance, then make them an offer they won't be able to refuse. Let them pile up the reset potions and prepare their armies. They will all fight. We will strip the castle to its foundations, sell it, then retreat. We will have a place in the valley to store loot. That's where we will go after selling our own citadels. It's a temporary solution anyway, whether we win or lose. My officers wondered at these last words, while I went on. I'll make that same offer to a couple of Japanese clans and our Korean Gimhae friends. They're not going to want to miss out. The Chinese are their age-old enemy. With the Maoists, our alliances, and the Japanese, we will take at least fifty castles, leaving the royalists registered bums. Lazar woke up. They won't forgive this. Some of them will surely scatter, but Mao's legacy will be done for. Even an encounter with a few army leftovers will quickly end in their crushing defeat. I smiled. 
and this is the best part. No need to wait around for revenge. They can pack up, sell their lands, and move to our valley. They're hardworking, peaceful, loyal, and grateful. Where else are we to find such vassals? Plus, an extra six thousand fighters won't hurt. Whoa, hello, fifth column, Orcus gasped in alarm. Hostile agents will surely sneak in with the rest. That's why we have you. All right, cool it. They'll first have to pass Tian Long, then the hounds. Lazar shook his head. Max, don't you get it? You can't let the Chinese come here. They won't assimilate even in a thousand years. They'll multiply, get their relatives to come over, preserve their culture and language, and turn into one giant pillar bound by one faith. Our ancestors had welcomed newcomers many times, then got sick of chasing them out. Entire Chinese battalions served the commies following the revolution. They all either got shot or sent back to their homeland. They're not like us. To befriend and help them is a must, but to invite them over to live in your own home is a death sentence. I thought it over. The grumbler was worth listening to. He was a smart guy, clearly familiar with Asians, and didn't just learn Chinese for free, like some of us did. What do you suggest? We can take some migrants, but no more than ten percent of the valley's population. Second, since everything's such a mess and the Maoists are of more use to us as loyal allies, we must aid them within the limits of our native cluster. If we force them to flee, the rest of the world will think the Russian cluster craves vengeance. I'll get in touch with Vietnam and India with the company's help. There are enough volunteers there who wish to safely bite the lion and loot its den. Your plan will have another dimension as we shorten the lion's agony and display the true might of the bear woken during winter. The officers were pleased at that. I nodded my assent and stood up straight. Accepted. You men are to finalize and perfect the details. We barely have time. The mission will begin at 5 a.m. sharp. Now get to work! Chapter 14 NSA City, the Virtual World Department, the Ultraworld Sector, Underground Floors 61 through 74, Strategy and Ops Planning Office, Zone Yellow, Limited Access, Aggregate Group Number 7, Forces of Light Headquarters, FOHL, Staff, AIs, 409th flow of the registered AI Grand, 12th flow of the AI-378, Pseudo-AI Systems, 831AA, 933AA, and 982AA, Premium Staff, Analyst, Predictor, Strategist, Tactician, Advisory Groups, Game Death, Shrinks, Slavists, Crowd Control, Unit Zero, Cassandra, Operating Reserve and Enhancement Tools, Agencies in both real and virtual worlds, Power Supply Group, Legal Protection Group, Tech and Special Tools Supply Group, Available Funds, Gold 9. Headquarters Conference at the end of the working week, a fragment of the intercepted internal security camera's video stream, decoding of the info packets, A.I. Isayev. The man with eyes of steel, sitting at the head of the table, firmly held the analyst's gaze, making the latter sweat. The analyst once again adjusted his tie that felt too tight and went on with his report. During the capture attempt, Puppet employed artifacts with hitherto unknown properties that are not compatible with our current game station's dump urgency 97.3%. Now, the staff. Warrior casualties due to the artifact are 47%. The virtual SWAT avatars became useless following an irremovable debuff. The hollow projector silently came on, displaying a 3D image before the NSA intellectual elite. The sight of the first priest frozen in the middle of the fight instilled fear. The ideal beauty of the impossible fascinated even the most dispassionate prose. Blurred outlines of the pink blade had turned the air into boiling plasma. The dagger object, warrior casualties equal 34%, avatars fully destroyed. The physics of this process remain unclear. The game mechanics don't really allow it. The next shot was a psychological resilience test for those present. Blood, shredded bodies, twitching piles of bluish bowels, and a lumpy sea of furry spiders. None were squeamish. 
everyone had interested looks on their faces, craving knowledge and sensing their chance to gain something. The armed forces' casualties had almost gone comatose during the standard electroshock perma-check. They all claim that they have been in Loth's halls. The casualties' state of feeling showed that the torture continued non-stop from one to three weeks. Clank. 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 The pictures changed, showing the frightening goddess, the comatose bodies, and the blackened eyes of those who returned from warrior purgatory. Two of the SWAT guys reported achieving Loth's junior priest status. The others remain withdrawn. They refrain from talking and are fully immune to hypnosis and partially immune to psychotropic drugs. The warriors have been committed to the military's mental hospital. They exhibit a severe virtual world phobia. Their ability to work in full immersion is highly questionable at this point. The speaker downed some pricey bottled water then looked askance at the department head and continued hurriedly. Following a series of strange incidents, the patients were transferred to Arizona 6, the quarantine unit with maximum prime module security. They demonstrate strong spikes of scion activity, spontaneous hypnocoding of others through direct contact, and the ability to instill emotions, including uncontrollable fear, panic, and fanatical devotion. Clank. The 3D image of a technician who had hung himself made the predictor cringe. His hyperactive mind quickly filled in the omitted details. The bowel stench and the squeaking sound of a leather belt from which the cold, pale body dangled in the A.C. breeze. Clank. Guardhouse incident. A quarrel that had ended in a shooting. Three surprised-looking corpses. Clank. The image of a guard with a vacant stare trying to unlock the airtight door of a module. A taser's charge was reaching out for his neck from the contact block in the ceiling. The security service AI had quickly responded to his unauthorized attempt to breach the perimeter. Controlling the isolation ward is difficult due to the insane aggression of the local spiders. They crawl in from all over the desert, destroying the equipment and attacking the staff. Extermination is in progress. The info panel on the wall flickered, drawing the speaker's attention as it displayed a picture of a lean-looking middle-aged man with a patch of gray on his head. The A.I. Grand's visual avatar made the remark, The object catalog has grown by one category, the new A+. Acquisition and studying of class A+, artifacts have been given their own separate flow and assigned to Group 32. The analyst nodded his thanks and carried on. The Armed Forces Group has saved 19% of its avatars, but their psychological state is unsatisfactory. The warriors are undergoing rehabilitation. Because all administrative control of the Ultra World is now lost, acquiring new warriors is not currently an option. The login server is ignoring all attempts to create hidden and service class characters. Looking at Grand, he paused for a bit, awaiting the AI's reaction. Receiving only a slight shrug in response, the analyst sighed heavily and continued speaking. The remainder of the virtual SWAT are no longer subordinates of the FOLH headquarters. Their premium staff groups have been assigned a low professional fitness score. That's all I have. The department head tensed his jaws, tapped his fingers on the table pensively, then turned to the info panel. Grand, can you add anything? The priority of seizing Puppet has doubled. Current state, Alpha Prime. The task of establishing contact with Loth has been given its own separate flow and assigned to Group 34. Taking over the projector, the AI launched a presentation that it generated on the go. As always, it was overloaded with charts and diagrams. According to the admin base dumps, the Alter World contains six adamant artifacts. We suspect that ten more do exist, but this information is secret. We know the certain location of only two of the artifacts. The tactical stealth group was destroyed while attempting to steal the Yu Huang Bell. The avatars received a permanent Curse of the God debuff. There's no known way to get Asclepius's scalpel right now. A group of analysts and programmers is trying to create a chain of minor level one interventions. These are designed to lead to our acquisition of this precious artifact. I have no further information and will proceed to work on the current stack of tasks. AI Grand 409 has finished reporting. While everyone kept staring at the panel after it went blank, the head called the next specialist up front. 
Strategist, report the real-world group losses on the territories of Russia, Little Russia, and New Russia. A bulky man, his eyes red from insomnia, got up from his armchair with some effort. The military escort groups have lost 72%. They had been used at random. They can be replenished with petty criminals, the youth opposition movement, and the frontier state fighters. The losses were justified. The agency, including the top-secret undercover units, constitutes 17%. Up to 41% are suspected of re-enlistment, disclosure, double game, losses deemed critical. Agents were transferred to sleep mode. Measures will be taken to test their loyalty and check for third-party surveillance. Clank. A 3D footage of a gray-haired old man being pushed into a prisoner transport vehicle. His guitar made plaintive sounds as it was dragged across the pavement. Staff instructors, local coordinators, and controllers, 243 people. Arrests, accidents, thug attacks, alcohol, and drug poisoning. Clank. An image of two bloodied corpses on the front steps of a hotel. The contactee, Simon, and his bodyguard. Who would have thought that a mere junkie could see off such hardcore pros? But the surveillance records confirmed the police's story, including the death of the attacker upon arrest. The investigators were open to collaboration, and even showed someone's corpse wrapped in the mist of the morgue's cold chambers. Clank, the cold body of the embassy's first counselor, the group's undercover agent, sitting on a bench in a park. The wide-open eyes were covered with a web of broken blood vessels. White froth caked on his lips. A small spray can was in his tightly clenched fist. A drug overdose. It would never be established now exactly who had sprayed a lethal dose of gray in his eyes, and where this had happened. The diplomatic corps and the State Department are already working on getting the detainees released. The transportable patients were transferred to German and Israeli hospitals by special aircraft. Due to the high number of casualties, approval was granted for the shroud cover operation. The losses were deemed inadmissible. Serious measures are being taken to detect the information leak sources— Strategist took a breath and continued. Technical and financial resources amount to $252,630,000. Field machines, EW vehicles, pseudo-AIs, personal crystals, communication, encryption, and neutralization devices. Personal equipment, gold ingots for reimbursing the services of those involved. Expenses are deemed supercritical. An audit group has been dispatched by headquarters. Clank. A photo of a concrete mess speckled with steel. The description indicated that a cable on a building crane had broken. The floor slab fell and destroyed an armored van packed with expensive electronics. Clank. An embassy's empty yards and armories. Empty gun racks. Empty slots for AI crystal locating blocks. The total real-world results of this operation have been rated as unsatisfactory, primarily due to the confidentiality breach and the act of resistance of local special forces disguised as a series of accidents and other acts of God. The pencil in the department head's fingers snapped in two. Looking at the split ends with disgust, he flung the pieces aside and said, Have a seat. In a week I want to see a similar analysis with conclusions and potential solutions on my desk. Tactician, what do you have on the altar world? This recently summoned virtual battle genius still retained his usual imposing air. Leaning back comfortably in his armchair, he pressed a key on the controller. I have prepared a digital report. A video track is attached. Everyone should have received a copy on their personal communicators. The Alter World Operation Progress. Phase 1. Public Opinion and Enemy Image Formulation. Introduction of Correct Terminology and Proper Emphasis. Enemy Dehumanization. Creation of Appealing Monetary Incentives for the Campaign. Placement of Controlled Figures into Key Positions. Mass Encoding Machinery Usage. Total Audience Reached up to 23% of players. Top long-term campaign nucleus, 70,000 people. Potential peak and undulating surges among event participants, up to 300,000 people. Rating, excellent. Notes, some PERMA communities, LARPers and rioters of principle are likely to resist the popular trend. Of these, we highlight the following clans. The Texas Rednecks, Comandante, Free Iceland, and Dark Heart. 
Phase 2, preservation of secrecy, accumulation of ammo, supplementary target exploration and gathering of coordinates, informer recruitment, operational deployment, synchronization of the nucleus's actions, direct or indirect resubjection to the FOHL headquarters. Rating, good. Notes, unable to plant agents into puppets close circle. Local disregard of reality correction attempts. The keyloggers are an unreadable mess, suspecting Class A entity opposition. Phase 3, Financial attack on the Russian cluster's auction market, blocking of the employment pool, capture of some of the enemy's staff, terrorist activity in newbie locations, siege of several targets on a priority basis, cluster economy disruption. Rating, good. Notes, partial loss of control over the engaged nationalist divisions. The guards of the First Temple responded with unforeseen quickness. Mass resistance against the invasion forces is growing, even among the light-siders of the Russian cluster. Phase 4, the current phase, complete paralysis of leveling up within the cluster, seizing key locations, capturing and destroying primary targets, initiating List B target pursuit, Tianlong siege initiation, organization of the first game peak protest, obliteration of the bone fortress, intentional deployment of hired captives. Rating, satisfactory. Notes, the Russian cluster's resistance greatly surpasses our initial estimates, incredibly fast responses, and children of the night warrior regeneration. Premature Chinese revanchist intervention, partial loss of control over the invasion forces, difficulty breaking the captives psychologically. Only pressuring their real-world relatives directly seems to work. The intercepted video track ended. The inner encoding changed systematically. Approximated decryption time equaled 117 hours. A.I. Isayev. Sitting on the steps of the first temple and watching the bustling yard, I shuddered and groaned with a brutal mix of pleasure and pain. Lizzie sat behind me on her knees, tenderly yet firmly massaging my weary shoulders. Not one jealous gaze came from the huge crowd, and no wonder. The three-hour-long thundering of the high circle magic and the horizon-wide tornado swelling in the sky over and over again had unnerved even the most resilient. The creation of 112 astral absorption scrolls had cost me a repeatedly broken collarbone, the dislocation of multiple joints, and a painful crunching in my spine. With every cast, it had gotten harder to resist the recoil. My footprints pressed into the basalt tiles had already turned into a pilgrimage site, becoming some sort of cult. True, I had kept five reset potions for myself. I'm no masochist. Getting your bones crushed time and time again is hard, even if it is for a great cause. Plus, my greedy pig had awakened, damn him. He stretched, threw his golden cover on the cage floor, put on his richly embroidered gown, and started giving me hell over my unselfishness. But whether another hundred seals did my aura any good, only the fallen one knows. My ethereal body itched in an unusual way. It had swollen to an embarrassing size. I just hoped that my radiant, mint-coin-like appearance would give the enemy hiccups and wet pants. The astral world had had it rough, too. After dumping and scattering a few megatons of pure energy in its surroundings, the first temple acquired an anomaly. Patches of incredibly bright northern lights now swam over surprised faces, while the Alliance's wizards were already using the 19% increase of mana regeneration speed. That's right, the wizards of the whole Alliance. While preparing for Operation Vengeance, we were also performing a mass evacuation from the castles that were doomed. The supernova territory became studded with massive arches of dozens of cargo portals. People cried, stripping their homes down to the foundations, and cramming every inch of free space they could get with various belongings. Tens of thousands of people were moving around the territory, getting on Lurch's nerves. He couldn't keep an eye on everyone, even in theory, and watched only the external wall line, per my request. The castle's indignant sobs would penetrate the mind from time to time. The edifice couldn't help but pay some attention to its inner perimeter, where it noticed more destruction that the guests were causing. I grinned imagining what a shock it must have been for the weeping Alliance folk to tear up their contracts with their NPCs of which they'd grown so fond over the years. The chefs smelled of fresh bread. They knew everyone's tastes and preferences. 
The sweet service girls blushed amusingly, but never refused an affectionate request to warm someone's bed. The impeccable valets assumed the roles of secretaries and reviewers. The reliable guards were also there, with whom I had often stood on the walls and drunk beer behind the sergeant's back. They were all being gathered together, in the halls and in the yard. They hugged the puzzled servants, guiltily averted their teary eyes, and gave fun little trinkets as gifts. And then the commandant ground his teeth and canceled all the current contracts. A round of popping sounds, tightly closed eyes, a heavy silence. Cheerful cries scared away the ravens that always accompanied large armies and flocked to castles under siege. Another game designer touch damned them to hell. Most of the NPCs refused to dissolve in the great nothingness. Having long ago gone perma, they kept shifting from foot to foot, looking around in surprise and smiling shyly at the rejoicing people. Unexpectedly, the clans had acquired thousands of loyal teammates. Everyday characters diluted the hardcore gamer population. Only the treasurers scratched their heads in thought, calculating how much gold had been overpaid for the domesticated characters. With a smile, I sipped hot tea from my favorite mug. Getting Flint's obstinate granddaughter to go perma had really taxed my strength. The stern girl, beaten savagely by life, didn't believe in much. In my abdomen, I could still feel the cold of that moment when my divine spark had nearly gone out. I would occasionally freeze in fear, concentrating on my sensations to make sure that the bright little ember was still in its proper place growing hotter as it restored its former strength. But the icy feeling just wouldn't go away. The trauma was most likely psychological, so I treated it as such, with fragrant herbal teas and the steam of a hot mug. Lizzie, her firm breasts pressing into my back, was hinting at a more radical therapy. Alas, the leader's burden bound me hand and foot, chaining me with responsibilities and forbidding the simple pleasures of life. I simply had no time for fun. Grateful for the little things, I was looking around in surprise, trying to see what my castle looked like now. A gypsy camp? A nomad caravan? A guerrilla band? The refugees made fires, set up tents and sheds, craftily stealing every cubic foot of space they could. All of the first temple's wings were filled. All the land between the first and second wall lines had been turned into camping zones, yet it was still crowded but they'd have to suck it up. The valley was off limits until we'd driven off the enemy. Before then, like hell I'd let anyone out. The lightsters were still shouting out the attractive reward for the first temple's portal coordinates on all the market squares. But now, given the current congestion, our chances of catching the trained subversive were slim. True, Lurch kept vigil. The hounds were going out of their way. Security officers in disguise were snooping around among the guests but the law of large numbers was still in force. And speaking of numbers, we decided to attack a hundred castles at once. After a quick chat with the interested parties and adding up their forces, I was tempted to change the name of the operation from vengeance to impossible. Our alliances had put forth 7,000, trying to cover as many targets as possible and to compensate all the losses caused by the invasion, including moral damage and missed profits but they couldn't multiply themselves, so they had to aim lower. Twenty castles was their limit. Three hundred medium-level warriors per castle was enough of a gamble already. I concluded that any further division of forces was nothing short of complete idiocy and forbade it on the spot. Whoever was driven by greed to choke on a piece too large for them would punish no one but themselves. The rest of the targets were greedily split up between the Chinese, Japanese, Koreans, Vietnamese, and Indians. Even my humble comment that I would charge 300,000 gold for every scroll provided didn't scare anyone. The clan leaders merely nodded, waved me away, and kept arguing. Really, it was a humane price, probably less than 5% of what could be taken from an inhabited castle. Goods didn't rot or expire in the virtual world. The warehouses got filled to the brim over years of farming, expanding, and laying claims to all the empty buildings. I had recently faced this issue myself when I opened one of Supernova's storehouses and discovered almost a hundred thousand units of different types of meat in it, everything from rabbit to demon. In the following twenty-four hours, 
mules had become the most wanted job in Ultraworld. Despite the threefold salary increase, demand clearly exceeded supply. Pro looters were on cloud nine, like Hallmark during holiday season, turning a month's profit in a single day. Storage yard costs became equal to a carpet of gold coins large enough to cover the floor of the space up for rent. Even I had to overpay, despite having a lot of friends in the field. This made Durin sniff with displeasure and cast pensive glances at the Indian combat elephants. I agreed with him. The mounts looked intimidating, and if we leveled up their load capacity, they could tow away a tank. Yet the best aspect of the guild of broad-shouldered dwarves wasn't strength, but rather logistics, equipment, skills, and well-organized activity. I chose a sweet and high-ranking target for the children of the night, the Shui Fong capital, Nova, protected by many layers of force fields. This was precisely one of those hard cases for which I'd kept twenty backup scrolls. I also did it for those who could figure out how to hit the target wizard with AMA in a way that prevents concentration and ruins a scroll worth as much as a house. The yard grew even busier. Commandants began chasing away civilians to clear some space for the clan forces. The ground shook slightly as the remaining beaten golems crawled out of their hangars. They gnashed their teeth in rage to the sound of their loudly creaking joints. The unsaddled drivers, having lost their vehicles in the last battle, marched on foot with other warriors, watching their luckier comrades with jealous eyes. A group of ogres rolled out their traditional siege equipment, trebuchets, ballistas, and arrow launchers. The inexpensive farm horses shuffled after them, drawing ammunition carts. Then a special warehouse vehicle followed, a double ring of guards around it. Its cargo was securely covered with a tarpaulin, but I knew what sat atop the sandbag underneath, a registered 800 bomb. We had but seven of these big-ass babies left in our warehouse. An assassin was marching next to it, a pensive look on his face. He had achieved the holy unmercenary status two hours ago and was now preparing for action. Why was he nervous? This wasn't a Japanese kamikaze mission. We'd return. Although, as the Bada Boom example showed, this fellow would quickly make the KOS list of a very powerful alliance. This could certainly be stressful, especially if Shui Fong put a fine price on his head. The secret bounty hunter guild had branches in every cluster. Oh well, we would stand by our comrades. We tried not to make the mistakes that our forefathers had. Leave no enemy alive. The excessively merciful would pay with the lives of their children and grandchildren. The 800 was followed by Gimmick's upgraded cart, with Gimmick steering his steed. He wished to be present at the field testing of the deadly toys which his genius had given rise to. I heard quiet footsteps behind me. Lizzie quickly got up and stood like a speechless statue, torn between her sense of duty and religious fervor. Only one creature could have evoked such a response from her. I rose, turned to the god exiting the temple, and respectfully bowed my head. Greetings, fallen one. I didn't call him fallen in public. I wasn't an idiot. Honestly, I deserved divine wrath for those two or three times when I publicly undermined his authority. Yelling at a god rocks, no doubt, but it is better done without witnesses. Good thing he'd never read military service regulations. The fallen one nodded majestically, then gave me a slight wink and froze upon the steps in the pose of an emperor welcoming a parade. The cloak of darkness floating on his shoulders, the universes dancing in circles in the folds of this pseudo-cloth. The sun blinked and hid behind the god's back, its halo illuminating the head of the pantheon in all his greatness. What was it he'd said? I will be a flag flying above the fighting ranks? Well, he certainly gave those ranks a morale boost. They sucked in their stomachs and put on those dumbass hero looks. Enthusiasts! The next moment I started looking for a place to hide, a very gloomy-looking Makaria followed the fallen one outside. Hmm. The young and pretty girls for which we commit the most outrageous acts sure mutate into bitches fast. Is it genetic? Oh, fallen one, when you choose your life partner, don't forget to take a peek at the potential mother-in-law. Most likely, that's exactly what your gorgeous princess will turn into in some twenty years. In Fall's case, 
Who was the bride's mother? Degenera, the daughter of Dionysus. In a fit of jealousy, she had sent her husband Hercules a tunic laced with poison, dooming him to a sudden death. So, yeah, should I warn Fallen about that? I crept sideways like a shadow, sneaking away from the offended goddess. Making a semicircle, I held my staff close. The warriors were uneasy themselves. The priests whom I had restored to office tried to hide from her gaze. We had twenty minutes left till X hour. Quartermasters hurried to and fro between the ranks, dishing out ammo according to the battle plan. A magic glow covered the even square formations. Everyone got carried away with buffers, burning up pricey ingredients for useful effects. The raid expenses counter inevitably began to creep up. Nothing to save on. We had a hard battle ahead of us. Allied officers who were mixed with our own each saw us differently. To the Japs, we were heroes treading a warrior's path. An ancient Japanese book teaches one to always choose the way that leads to death. The Chinese were grateful to us. We let them save face by taking the most difficult burden on ourselves. They were too frail for it. The Koreans and Vietnamese saw us as an elder brother they could trust. The Russians never start wars, they finish them. And that's where we were, about to end another conflict which targeted our allies. Yes, yes, I knew that we had only three true allies, the army, navy, and the missile troops as our strategic force, and the Chinese lands were not worth a single drop of our boy's blood. But the altar world had its own laws. Most matters were settled with trivial gold, not blood. But I didn't want that. Didn't want to give filthy lucre to get friends, to buy myself a good name, to remelt it into brass knuckles for a teeth-shattering response. Money's just a tool, nothing more. And even the dumbest noob knew that they'd have to fight for the... for the Shui Fong familial castle to the very end. I checked the time. Five minutes. We should begin. I stepped forward, waited for silence, and with thousands of eyes upon me, I cast a hefty combo of priestly blessings, another move to tilt the scales of victory in our favor. With a deep sigh, I reached deep into my soul and produced the already ingrained state of the feudal lord. My nostrils flared. A wave of power swept over the supernova. Even the guests chattering far in the distance fell silent in fear but the impatiently fidgeting hounds tossed their muzzles up excitedly, howling cheerfully, greeting their pack leader, old as a legend, strong as a god. The more promising among the digitized NPCs joined in, emitting excited cries. They beat the hilts of their weapons against their shields and armor, speeding up the rhythm, making hearts race in unison and enter stress mode, pumping adrenaline prior to the battle. Now these warriors would keep going, even with their guts dragging behind. And it didn't matter that we were in a virtual world. This world wasn't for playing, but for living. Whoever only played would inevitably lose. My clanmates caught the wave and rode it naturally, clattering their steel and filling with the ecstasy of battle. True berserkers! Ready for fun, guys? The roar of a thousand bears came in reply. The fallen one's heavy palm lay on my shoulder. The god stepped forward, standing next to me to take some of the horde's energy himself. Feast on it, I thought. There's plenty to go around. The fallen one threw his arms up, bestowing his blessing upon us. For the truth! To victory! A divine buff icon popped up on my huge list of pictograms. Glancing at it, I lifted my brow dumbfounded. Unclassified buff. Our cause is right. Permanent. Irremovable. Effect 1. When you know that you are fighting for the right cause, PvP damage increases proportionally to your faith. Effect 2. If doubt creeps in, your weapon will fall from your hand. Chapter 15 Checkmate with a wave of his hand, the Fallen One cemented the powers of good within his soul, reinforcing the foundations of his personality. He would not allow the passive mind flow of the masses to transform him into tangible evil. My soldiers themselves 
were no longer just the guards of the first temple, but true holy warriors. They could now fight for the truth only, no matter the saying that each has his own truth. The Fallen One's Paladins. Wow. The world is going nuts. See a dark guard fighting. Join him. For now he is incapable of evil and defends only the right cause. O oh, universal balance, grant us victory, and I shall play this card till the altar world's golden age, when a child with a basket full of silver and a naked maiden will be able to safely stroll the city all night long, fearing neither robbery nor rape. Leaving thoughts aside, I looked at the even lines of warriors. They were silent, letting the newly found promises sink in, wondering whether to smile or cry. The incredibly strong buff had a huge counterbalance, doubt creeping in. I suspected that without such a compensatory mechanism, the Fallen One would have never managed this outrageously powerful intervention. So we needed even more pumping up. The guys could no longer afford to lose confidence and let the wind be taken out of their sails. Whipping out my staff, I exposed the ever-curious blade and held the artifact up to the sky. A frenetic shiver passed through the astral world. The beings that had flocked to the massive eruption of human emotions quickly fled upon seeing the aura of he who hacked the flesh of God. The soul within the staff had grown its own markings, easily read by ethereal entities. For the motherland, the peaceful sky, and ancient injuries, we'll paint the foe's mugs red, strike them right in the underbelly, win back what had been stolen. Hail the Russian arms! To battle, men! I gave the go-ahead. To the roar of a thousand voices, a few portals swung open. We had the Chinese ancestral castle's coordinates. Our assassins prowled beneath the giant walls, probing the tip of the dome shield and guarding the finish lines. Widowmaker was already signaling me, giving me puppy eyes because the children of the night were forty seconds behind schedule. Alarm bells were already ringing in the revanchist castles. Multi-ethnic hordes poured from the portal holes. They temporarily joined forces against their common enemy, each hoping to seize everything that wasn't nailed down. Properties weren't enough for them. They attacked large production facilities as well as ingredient depots and warehouses of finished goods. The more far-sighted ones hurriedly took control of the potentially abandoned mines, farms, and other locations. The young and impudent knocked on the doors of several establishments which were paying tribute to Shui Fong. Howling, they announced that a new power had arisen, and that the tribute was to be delivered to their fighting squad. The seasoned buffalo had tripped and made a mistake. A lion pride now got on his trail. A pair of jackals awaited nearby. Vultures circled overhead. Even ants waited their turn, to clean the giant skeleton until white. The buffalo was still strong, leading the herd. He squinted his wild red eye, unaware that he had already been dead for a day. Too many in the world believed this to be so, and behaved accordingly. The clan's main shields, fear and reputation, were no longer defending it. The bloody battle beneath the walls of Tianlong had been going on for ten minutes. Flint's heated argument with the Chinese rep had ended with an insulting slap, instantly sparking a Russian-Chinese massacre. The Leitsters involuntarily got dragged into the everyone-against-anyone fight. The Revanchists did not accept the existence of third parties. To them, all those present were either allies or foes. Flint's boys gladly added fuel to the fire, striking down anyone within their reach. It was about time we joined the fun. I drew a circle with my staff, feeling the Fallen One move away slightly to safeguard himself from an accident or outright treachery. I pointed the impatiently quivering blade at the portals and commanded rather unnecessarily, Attack! My front lines were already flooding the portals. The wizards hurried after them, ready to form a circle and open a minor dome umbrella. The shields moved forth in unison, like a giant turtle crawling. But a boom hid safely in its heart of steel. He had the honor of reading the astral mana absorption scrolls. I decided to pass. I'd cast enough spells for one day. My shoulders were level with my ass. Plus, the clan needed its heroes. The second lines tightened up like a coiled spring, awaiting orders. They let the creaky siege machinery and the few ammunition carts go before them. 
Usually, in cases of slow sieges with their rules, all these creations of the nutty carpenter went into battle last. But today, we had to be fast, and there was no way to get around the first five minutes of setting these machines up. Should we survive, I thought, we will definitely tackle the strategic training part of the problem. Perhaps in two to three years, the game algorithms will give way, giving us precious extra seconds under the pressure of our automatic reflexes. The clan's army was teeming with the analysts' invincible assistance. Low-level characters, mentally stuck at about level ten, prowled about, scanning the premises, and sending a huge flow of info to the far-off headquarters. After screening, editing, and double-checking, the info was supplemented with analytics and forwarded to the officer channel. Battle control systems grew with the clan, getting more complex and fervently seeking a better, more resilient form. Two-thirds of the army were on the other side already. Only my guards and I remained, along with the third echelon and our mighty reserve. Demons, plus fuck y'all zombies. I had another ace up my sleeve, a bloodthirsty horde of NPC dwarves, bound by their pretty forgiving oath of allegiance and their self-interests related to the valley. The mountain ridge I'd rented for 999 years, with reacquisition rights, was quickly becoming perforated with tunnels, exploratory prospecting shafts, and vast coal faces. The first veins of rubies, heavy ingots of inexpensive local copper, quality steel of underground smelting, and hefty leather bags of native gold had already hit the internal market. These stocky fellas were itching for a fight. They had some scores to settle with the immortal. Plus, they wanted to try out their new equipment in battle and to defend their homes, their temple, and their ore mines. But I saved my NPCs, for I would be the one to blame for every fallen warrior who would dissolve in the great nothingness, even those who'd return would take a few days to get back on their feet. And I needed every blade I had. Only reenactors and scarce freeman skeletons stood upon the bony wall of Tianlong. They'd be brought down, if not today, then tomorrow, if not by the Chinese, then by the lightsiders. The dragon's bones would make great souvenirs and mana-absorbing coffins. The first temple's immunity would drop in three days tops, and it will be seized. The air current pushed us from behind and forced us into the open portal. The Chinese castle was high in the mountains. The change in air pressure felt like a maximum strength wind tunnel. Add a turbine and you got an electricity supply for an entire town. The other side was shaking with noise. The NPCs on the walls and within siege machinery fire range responded accordingly. That is, instantly. The live players were also caught off guard. They opened their eyes and glanced around, then got dragged into the bustle. The first minute of attacking the lazy rear garrison was always like that. One had to understand, there was no rear in Alter World. Upon my order, the ear choppers from my personal guard formed a spacious twenty-foot-long circle, keeping my view open. The outer perimeter trolls held up their armored tower shields. One of them was very unlucky. A thousand-pound stone launched by a stationary trebuchet completely flattened him into the ground, taking his place in the line. Those around him merely blinked in surprise and simultaneously wiped the blood off their cheeks. Fuck me! Bullseye! It had clearly been a blind shot from a closed position. Such a big-ass machine couldn't be set up on a wall. I've tried. What if they had their guns registered on every inch? What if the spotter orc was picking out his next target at this very moment? Move aside! Don't obstruct the roads and group targets! The gate controller cried, adding some taboo remarks for clarity as he kicked the steel wall of shields. The golems are heading out now! No one needs your guts slowing down their leg mechanisms! Move! I ordered the childish guards, who ignored the raging officer and carefully scanned the sections they were responsible for. Ouch! The ground shook. The sky moaned. A magic tornado shot up into the air from the steel turtle's heart. Bada Boom joined the game, playing his trump king. Four groups of five wizards each covered the precious warrior with minor domes. Pressure on the portal instantly weakened. The guards instantly focused on the caster. Shui Fong were familiar with the spell's effect, as we had recently won a castle from them by similar means. 
A magic Armageddon flared up over the domes. Hundreds of arrows, bolts, and stones of different caliber flew into it every second. I cringed, thinking how tough it must have been for the boys just then. The recoil felt like sticking your head into a ringing bell during a bad hangover. It shook your brain, made you go blind, and sent blood pouring from your ears. The magic contact lasted thirty seconds. Our first dome succumbed suspiciously quickly. The wizard's bodies hit the ground silently, but no one helped them. Diving into an active volcano would have been safer. The Chinese hit us hard, pouring kilotons of mana upon the small patch of land. Through the glow of their magic, flames, and smoke of different colors, I saw Bada Boom, his face red from the strain. His eyes bulged out, his lips bled. He'd been pressed into the ground up to his ankles. Hold on, Bada Boom, only one more minute. Twenty-five seconds, and the crystal debris of the second dome shield rained down upon its casters. I frowned. The score was two to zero. Our third and last shield was beginning to come apart. Yet the enemy guards still stood. I thought I saw insidious grins through the castle's thin gun slots. A little while longer, and they'll start showing us their bare asses. The enemy's available power turned out to be much greater than we'd thought. The walls were black with caster NPCs, which huddled up like swallows on power lines. A hail of stones came down from the sky, as if a heavy artillery battalion was showering us from behind the hill. The next few soap bubbles popped simultaneously. An imposing Chinese dome and its dwarfish parody broke into glass shards. Finally, we've removed the first leaves from this lettuce. We had two more ahead. Most of the domes could not be forced to collapse through each other. Alterworld didn't have appropriate dimension types for that. The domes sort of fell on top of each other instead, like a nest of tables. Not much else could have been done with the same-sized domes. The layered sections snapped together with a grand boom. We burned the big dome shield, and now the castle was covered with the medium one. It had a lower efficiency factor, so it did poorly against damage and had a slower regeneration rate, but without AMA, it would take a day to bring down, which was unacceptable. The quick-thinking Bada Boom produced another scroll. Savagely baring his teeth, he began a second cast, summoning up another firestorm. Holy shit, he will get crushed, I thought. Raising my hand, I was about to order a few more wizard groups from the first lines to help him. Of course, I didn't want to lose fifty good whizzes before the battle had even started. The recoil of a ruined spell could put them out for a while. But some of the cart drivers had a plan of action. Foaming at the mouth, a shaggy horse raced by us, the wheels of its cart thundering over the rocks. Its eyes restless, it dove into the flame, disappearing for an instant. It reappeared again when the only defense left was one magical dome. The horse's mane was on fire. It was covered with flaming blobs of napalm and studded with arrows. The horse took a few stumbling steps, let out a piteous wail, then fell on the barely moving wizards. The driver was hit bad, too, but his HP and armor kept him alive for another ten seconds. Bleeding and dripping crimson digits indicating incessant damage from the numerous DOTs, he rolled over into the cart and activated a massive mobile dome shield artifact. The sixty-foot bubble inflated over the warriors' heads. It expanded the safe zone and guaranteed a fifty-thousand damage point absorption from just one accumulating crystal. And there must have been twenty of those crystals fixed to the poorly armored cart. But we were lucky. The dome's iridescent edge stopped a mere few feet from the castle's cover. Had the horse gone a bit further, our artifact would have been burned to hell, destroying all the guards in its annihilating flash. That would have sucked, as I was planning to use it to cover the gates during the last stage of the battle. But I decided not to race ahead. The unknown driver was to be scolded, given a huge medal, then promoted. He had no business driving carts if he was that smart. I'd give him something more adrenaline-pumping at the budget's expense. I stuffed back into my pocket the extra AMA scroll that I had mechanically pulled out. Then I studied the battlefield. All the warriors were in place. We'd shut down two portals out of three to save energy. The warriors were fidgeting, 
overflowing with righteous fury and grieving over the loss of their comrades. There were no more surprises for the next minute. The enemy showered us with stones and arrows, burying Badaboom under tons of ammunition. He melted it all into one spiked metal monolith consisting of a horrid mixture of poisons, acids, and sharp meteoric iron. The mobile dome sparked, absorbing the damage and taking a top wizard's 24-hour energy store. The accumulators went out one by one, overheating from the outrageously fast discharge. The dimmed crystals spat out light smoke and cracked loudly, cooling down in the recesses of their wooden slots. Finally, a loud bang rang out over the enemy castle. It was as if a bunch of rampageous gods had knocked a three-hundred-foot wall down with a brick. That's it. Medium domes baked. The enemy's safety zone shrank all the way back to their castle walls. The minor dome shield artifact ran at full capacity, barely stretching itself out enough to cover the majestic Nova, a guaranteed energy overexpenditure for the Chinese. And now for the real blow. The shell-shocked Badaboom took out his third scroll. At this point, the Chinese were no doubt shouting into all the Alliance's channels, demanding tens of thousands of reinforcements to teach the insolent Russians a lesson. Surely they'd get their reinforcements, but they wouldn't be anything extreme or impossible to beat. Flint had tied up most of the free powers. A few minutes ago, a hundred castles had lost their shields. Scores of assailants burst into control rooms. Therefore, all the castles needed reinforcements immediately. To withdraw whole ranks, to put them back on their feet and ready for a new fight was no quick task. The clanging of chains, thunder, and shaking ground made me look up in alarm. The drawbridge, which had been covering the vulnerable gates up until now, dropped across the moat. Boots thundered over the wooden bridge as all the NPCs incapable of long-range combat rushed out. That included everyone from the sinister guards armed with spears to cooks with heavy tavern knives. Hoping to crush the mobile dome, the Chinese sent out all their hand-to-hand -hand combat forces. They didn't dare send players, because if we took over the battlefield, they'd be cut off from the players' graves for the next three hours. I'd give them a C-plus for their efforts. Theirs was an act of desperation rather than a real threat. Now had our dome been poorly built, spluttering on its empty tank as it sucked the mana from the last crystal, their suicide attack might have worked. They'd cost us some HP, so their chances of success were above zero. Our warriors were tired of waiting and met the enemy with joyful cries. The full mana pools intoxicated them. The ticking timers of the short-lived buffs craved blood. Seeing our cover wizards faint only fueled their thirst for revenge. Crossbows clanged, Bowstrings twanged against arm guards, spears, darts, and other flying steel slashed the sky to the accompaniment of groans. A horde of pets raced forward. The astral world moaned, twisting as hundreds more wizards joined the fight. The clan chat flooded with bewildered messages. The people grew indignant. The world lagged, lengthening the time it took to cast a spell. The chances of making a mistake or losing concentration sharply increased, Mana restoration speed noticeably dropped. The temperature grew cooler. Damn, did our wars stir things up. We sucked the astral world's energy like parasites, quickly transforming it into thousands of magic formulas. But playtime was over. The real game physics could not realize all of the game designer's wants. Mana didn't just appear from nowhere. It had certain properties, including quantity parameters, density per square foot, regeneration speed, and the fallen one knows what else. Indeed, we were in for several more surprises. Reality is no treat. It didn't have 500-level wizards for us who could crack a planetoid by lifting an eyebrow. The world sought balance, which was completely understandable. Full-blown wars for sources of magic were a guaranteed thing of the future. Accumulating crystals would go up in price. Where were we getting them now? That's right buying them from merchant NPCs at any wizard guild for solid gold. Not a bad extra income for the admins, for there was no known recipe for making crystals yourself. But what about the day when the game algorithms would fail, 
and the merchandise one fine morning would not get regenerated. Are not fantasy books a sort of prophecy? They tell of tiny power rocks the size of your pinky nail that cost as much as a downtown villa. Was this not what was going to happen in a thousand years from now? I could tell, even from where I stood, that one accumulator in the cart had cracked. Now imagine that replacements couldn't be purchased? A calamity. My greedy pig made a note that ten percent of the available budget should go into buying crystals. And also crystal fragments. It didn't matter that they were useless now. I could see our great-grandchildren kissing the feet of our statues, thanking us for saving up these treasures. Yes, I shall have my own statue. Yes, a large one. No, not of gold. They'll melt it down, that's why. But the granite of Pharos, on the other hand, is indestructible after a magic treatment. That's it. Now write it down. Dividing up my consciousness, I jotted my thoughts down in my planner as I encouraged the greedy piggy within. My eyes were fixed upon the rapidly unraveling massacre. We held up all right. The golems hit from the flanks and trampled the assailants into the mud. The kamikaze NPC horde had cost us another crystal, a hundred thousand gold wasted. These crystals were just not made for fast energy discharge. They burned up like flimsy wires under an immense load. The bloody action did not prevent Badaboom from finishing reading the high spell. He fell to the ground, crushed by the recoil a mere second after the destruction of the enemy dome. The Chinese instantly lost interest in the overpowered enemy spot. They took cover behind the spiked bridge again and froze, refilling their mana and awaiting an attack on the gates. The magic flame slowly died down. The long-lived DOTs fine-tuned their cycles. Puddles of acid fumed everywhere. Clouds of poison began to dissipate. Only the enemy's NPC archers kept firing, as no one had told them to stop. When Badaboom crawled out, heavily shell-shocked and spitting out pieces of his lungs, he instantly got pumped full of sharp arrows. A smart spotter sat in one of the towers. The siege machines opened up with blanket fire, hitting the dense ranks of Chinese hard. The loss counter went through the roof. The warriors that got away with a sixteen-foot spear in their gut saw the end of their career underneath a fridge-sized big-ass stone. Upon respawning at the bind point, each warrior sent a clan stealth character to retrieve their grave, then awaited their turn to resurrect. The Chinese had NPCs operating their machines. Thus, each death took away precious XP points. I charged at the gunners with my guards. It was time for phase two of the operation. I had doubts about our success, as it depended heavily on the half-finished creations of one mad genius. The restless gimmick was already pulling the tarpaulin from the massive ammo carts, impatiently spurring on the slow-witted loader ogres. I completely understood the NPCs. A gunner droid left without power had been fitted into the ancient vehicle, crushing its wooden sides. It was the two-ton mini-boss from Station 8. Quite a sight for a fantasy world. Come on, lift him out of there. Don't fret. You couldn't break him if you tried. He's a solid mithril-based armor composite, Gimmick yelled, slightly swelling with pride as he searched my face for approval. You kick ass, no doubt. How many did you bring? Four, plus some smaller ones. I would have brought more, but the right sixth-generation processing units and modular memory slot kits are hard to come by. External weapons also required some thinking through. We hoarded everything that was compatible with the droid's universal fire control system. Gotcha, I interrupted the understandably proud expert and snapped at the ogres myself. Take them to the trebuchets. Snowy, help these weaklings. Snowy chuckled and slung his wonder club over the back of his divine armor. Grabbing the lugs of the droid's external armor, he raised the droid over his head. He looked around for Bomba, who was now holding the first line together as she bestowed a photogenic smile upon the guard taking screenshots. Sinking into the ground, Snowy marched to the trebuchets. Here! Set it here! Gimmick fussed, pointing at the wide trebuchet pouch. Checking the strap anchors on the droid's homemade parachute system, he snatched a power crystal off his belt and carefully stuck it into the complex slot. Closing the latch, Gimmick looked around and quietly ordered, And now... Beach party's over. Then he signaled to one of the orcs. Now! 
the trebuchet's beam went down, hit the counterweight stopper, and sent the droid flying. Gimmick quickly yet lovingly brushed the controls, bringing the machine into action, then swiftly stepped aside. The droid's faceted eyes began to glow. It wanted to get up, but immediately crouched, absorbing the throw of the catapult. Whoosh! The twelve-ton counterweight went down. The sling shot up, sending the Chinese our surprise. In the first second of its flight, the droid flipped over like an agile cat, pointing its gun barrels right at us. The tiny laser dots found our frozen bodies. We made anime eyes in fear. The droid fired plasma at us in huge amounts. Danger! cried Gimmick, instinctively throwing himself into a crack between two stones, thus demonstrating impressive agility. Shit, was all I could say, as I dove behind a heap of troll guards' bodies. Now I understood why Gimmick got beat up in the crypt. Inventor my ass! Plasma looms went straight through the bodies and the trebuchets. They blew up any rocks they hit. Burning shrapnel showered us from all sides, pounding on our armor. We had to endure these few seconds of plasma gunfire before the Chinese, who were scared by our surprise. They took the aggro upon themselves by attacking the droid with everything they could. The droid flipped in flight again and fired at them, confused for a second due to the abundance of targets. Actually, the droid was nothing extraordinary. A 380-level creature, upgraded a bit by the skillful gimmick, external shields, better armor config, and twice as many guns as the default version, the top ten warriors familiar with our tactic could have slaughtered it in five minutes. But again, they had to know what they were dealing with be masters of their techniques, and have adequate equipment. Surely, having such a droid suddenly drop on your ass meant chaos and serious losses. The flashing droid flew over the castle a bit too high. The braking parachute wasn't on time either. Lines tightened, and the smooth flight path turned into an emergency landing somewhere beyond the dungeon. The dome shield's area turned out to be too small for such a huge robot. We might just as well have launched a jeep at them. Overshot, Gimmick commented as he left cover. I disagreed. True, we missed the yard, but the robot still landed in a good spot. At least the Chinese stopped firing at us for now, and the first fires started up on their territory. Yeah, party's over! A second droid was launched. The noise of its launch was made worse by the racket of the trebuchet's counterweight. Fortunately, I was a quick learner. Diving behind a rock, I called to the NPCs, Get down! This droid was armed with two Gatling guns. The electric motor's noise rent the air. The guns reached the optimal speed quickly, and a hail of lead rained down upon us. The sound of the parachute opening rang out frightfully close. The droid went down halfway between us and the enemy. Undershot, I read Gimmick's lips as the desire to tear his head off seized me once again. One of the trebuchets cracked and collapsed, sliced in two by the droid's fire. A cloud of dust covered us. Apparently it was not an obstacle for the droid's sensors, as the robot kept firing accurately and incessantly. The trolls, ogres, and other huge meaty characters had it rough. But I too caught a few shots with my back, each taking a thousand HP. Holy fuck! The Chinese came to our rescue. The NPCs on castle walls predictably fired at the target that was now within their firing range. Many players also joined in on impulse. Attacked from behind, the droid instantly spun around, cut the parachute obstructing its path, and charged at the castle. Phew. We'll be all right now. I got the pattern, Gimmick assured us as he saw the bullet-ridden bodies and met several angry glares. I swear on Juggernaut! he added just in case, and hurried over to the third trebuchet. A loud bang resounded two hundred yards away. Someone's portal opened for ten seconds. Stealther raiding parties came at us from the rear. Tighten the ranks, Alpha Group, cover sectors B3 through B9. True flame torches to the right flank. The officers proved themselves worthy by responding instantly and effectively. The next second, another portal opened nearby. A personal iridescent gate appeared far away. I wondered if they wanted to split our attention, 
or if these were onlookers from different alliances. Probably both. Striking the back of the wounded winner was the favorite approach of many rowdy clans. Now, a voice bellowed. The counterweight banged, and the droid, flashing with machine gun fire, flew right into the enemy Nova's main square. Bingo! The satisfied gimmick raced to the last trebuchet. I came back to the first, which the orcs were already setting up again. Our kamikaze with his aerial bomb 500 was already getting in. His wholly unmercenary status had us hoping for some fine spoils. Although looting was just a nice bonus in the given situation, the main goal was to bust the gates and send as many of the Chinese to their eternal hunting grounds as we could. Ready? I asked the pale suicide lieutenant. He nodded silently, buckling on his leather harness and hugging the mithril bomb tightly. Deathbringer. That's how our boys signed the present. I hoped it would live up to its name and wouldn't misfire. The main thing was to hold the bomb tightly, otherwise it was unclear which side the game mechanics would attribute the victims to. Launch the drone! The clan's ready! The Big Bertha Three fired with a bang, launching a low-level stealthed warrior into the sky. Shit! Boom! came the report of what we all expected, a bloody splash on the fourth floor of the dungeon. I hoped he'd taken screenshots. After a thirty-second analysis, the headquarters sent us a lot of info. Preliminary debriefing data. 2,000 enemy warriors total. Up to 20% calculating error. Most are on the walls and in the yard, preparing to contain the gate attack. Setting up barricades. Nine light and medium golems total. Locating the two resistance zones. The droids are almost gone. Two portal arches open on the portal pad. Traffic capacity, 300 warriors per minute. I nodded. It's time. I leaned over the bomb, tore out the first safety catch, removed the cap, and unscrewed the second catch, which was an air screw vein. That way, nothing would prevent the kamikaze from detonating the whole thing manually in case of a collision with a surface. I slapped the lieutenant on the shoulder. Launch! The counterweight creaked again. The beam whistled, and the man projectile shot into the sky. I watched his flight path anxiously. My greedy pig was pacing the bottom of my soul, its fingers crossed as it whispered, I think I can, I think I can get more and more and more. Boom! Reality replied. Headshot! shouted the analyst, monitoring the logs. Over a thousand frags and twice as many loot items. I tossed my head, making my hearing return, and raised my staff over my head. Charge! Chapter 16 Secret Residence of the Shui Fong Clan A one-off three-floor dungeon covering one square mile Discovered over two years ago Suspended for nine months to grow and ripen Protected by the Yudi Farm Group Total loot equals 2,180,000 gold plus three artifacts Self-destruction is prevented by slaves bricked into its walls Twelve in total Routine replacement? Once in three months following personality disintegration. Location access? By portal only. The only exit point had been turned into a massive mountain ridge by a wizard of the nature. A phantom dragon soul had been let into the dungeon to perform daily housekeeping. Duration of agreement with the entity? 99 years. Portal coordinate retrieval is blocked by the emanations of Stones of Pain. Ops Headquarters The warriors Si Ling and Si Lu had interrupted the current battle mission. They are attacking the neutrals said one of the analysts, monitoring the situation. His voice made Prince Kao Kao hunch his head into his shoulders. Why did the Grand Prince appoint him as leader of this riffraff of all people? The best shock troops were currently finishing off the domes of the Russian castles and freeing up space for excellent spoils. Fresh straw was put into the slave pens. New feeding troughs were set up for the lovely Slavic girls. And Kao Kao, who had been embarrassed at the negotiations with the first priest, was put in charge of the scum of the Alliance to beat the already dead bones. Having caught the Grand Prince's eye, Kao Kao quickly rose. The warrior Siwu has been publicly insulted. Only blood can wash this away. Another half hour and he'll wipe the foul neutrals from the camp territory. 
It's in our best interest. The Leitsters wanted to follow the Invincible Armada and storm the supernova all on their own. The Grand Prince, who was incredibly powerful in both realities, raised his brow in irritation. You have ten minutes. A hundred warriors from the Tiger Guards will be sent as reinforcements. Si Wu is to be punished. Cast him into the fire for a day so that he loses his ego and stops putting his own needs before the clans. Yes, my master. Cao Cao let out a sigh of relief. He himself could have easily ended up being the warlord that had fallen into disgrace. The analyst spoke up again. Code Orange, portal open by Shui Fong Three. Attackers identified as the Mao's Legacy Clan, 430 warriors in total. Not enough for a siege. The dome will hold up for at least two days. Our defense consists of 110 warriors, all level 200 plus, according to the rear subdivision ranks. Available NPC guard reserve amounts to 40,000 levels in total. He froze for a second, then opened his eyes wide in alarm. Attention! Code Red! A high circle spell has been cast. Astral mana dispersal. Time left until shield failure. Ninety seconds! The Grand Prince bared his teeth in anger. Mobilize the NPCs. Send the Sea Ba Detachment. Squeeze the Maoist castles. More hostages. They will pay with pain for their insolence. Understood. Orders have been passed on to the corresponding subdivisions. The Grand Prince smiled with satisfaction and leaned back in his armchair. He loved luxury and comfort, but no one was bold enough to reproach him for it. Those with guts were quickly sent to the dungeons of mental torture. The twenty analysts in their trance jumped simultaneously. Portals opening, Castle Shuifong 2, 9, 16, 4, 12. Attackers are Russians and Vietnamese. Attention, guard groups under attack, Silver Mines and Kimberlite Bonanza. Assailants are Tang Lang Raiders and a detachment of the Maoists' allies. Alchemist Town is no longer safe. Indian combat elephants have been spotted. Sire, it's the elite one of our top neighboring clans. The Jade Biller Fortress is under siege by the Japanese clan Sho. The capital's summer palace is under attack. Guards are fighting off the Korean Seong Lee clan. The clan leader's face froze. His brain absorbed the incoming info and sought the optimal solution. At last, he interrupted the continuous reports. All forces, abandon current missions, assume defensive positions, PvP scheme buffs and gear, stop and await redeployment orders, alliance-wide code red, mobilize NPCs on all perimeters, guild hiring, gather everyone in status zero, request assistance from all clans and allies, I demand reinforcements per our agreement. As he spoke, repeat reports of his orders were being rattled off. Missions abandoned. Complete. Terminating battle activity. 7% manpower. In progress, 20%. Temporarily unavailable, all the rest. NPCs mobilized. Time, 15 minutes. Daily cost, 240,000 gold. Mercenary guild, 1,700 fighters available in status zero. Hired. Time, 10 minutes. Cost, 3,500,000 gold. Locating portals by Shui Fong, 1, 6, 8, 10. Attention. All castles under siege except in the capital. Commandants ask permission to use operating reserve. All key production facilities and mining spots are being attacked. Approximate attacking force, 50,000 from six different clusters. The Grand Prince's eyes glazed over. He began to drool. His well-trained body fell into a controlled trance, speeding up his brain at the expense of other organs. He was absorbing information from ten different channels, perceiving and analyzing a great wave of reports, but had no resources left to come up with solutions. That was the downside of total dictatorship and one-man rule. The efficient system functioned like clockwork. The on-site reports were fast and clear, while responses to them arrived with more and more delays. They could not keep up with a constantly changing environment of a hundred trouble spots. Initiative among officers of lower ranks was suppressed to the point that they couldn't make decisions independently. The Grand Prince had always appointed executives, not leaders. He had plenty of smart sergeants and lieutenants, but only one general. The Alliance permits a 19,000 warrior reinforcement. Correction, 12,000. The Zhao clan withdraws its warriors for self-defense. Correction, 9,000. 5,000. Sir, reinforcements are not available. All castles are under siege. Allies resorted to a wait-and-see approach, delaying their response. They are scared and don't wish to interfere. We await your order, sire. We await your orders. Current reserve, 4,300 warriors. Awaiting orders. The Grand Prince barely moved his lips, raw from biting. 
divide the forces among castles with no domes. His voice could barely be heard over the analyst's cries. Shui Fong three requesting permission to evacuate the treasury and all A-list items. Shui Fong nine, the enemy has occupied the control room. The capture timer's ticking. Unrest in slave pens. The guards can't control it. Commandants of nine citadels are begging for reinforcements. Guard forces in subsidiary locations have been forced out of their positions and are losing strength in pointless counterattacks. One freshly hired analyst was bold enough to abandon the expected laconic wording and threw in some words of his own. I dare suggest that we withdraw troops from secondary locations and unite them to defend the castles. Sire? The Grand Prince was silent. His pupils were bouncing like crazy beneath his eyelids. His mouth would open occasionally to snap an order, but another hailstorm of updates would change everything yet again. Attention! Shui Fong Zero is under attack! It's the Russians! The first priests with them! Finally, the Grand Prince beat his stupor and came out of the trance. Jumping up, he clenched his shaking hands into fists and commanded loudly, Staff ops are to develop opposition. They are now in charge of the operating reserve. Find backup troops. Get the allies involved. We'll easily crush these insolent upstarts. I will personally head the guards to defend the familial Nova and have that arrogant Russian's head. The enemy will be defeated. The Grand Prince teleported out, abandoning command of his troops. The analysts kept spitting out reports while the staff officers stared at each other helplessly. Cow Cow was the first to get it together. Send two thousand from the reserve to defend my citadel, and, mm, a thousand mercs, too. Like the Grand Prince, I too will lead the defense myself to protect the second most important spot after the capital. The shrewd vassal teleported away, just like the Grand Prince. The rest instantly jumped to their feet and began rattling off orders, overtaxing the meager reinforcements and ignoring the analysts' monotonous reports. The Colossus of Shui Fong turned out to have feet of clay. We raced toward the broken gates under a hail of stones, squelching through dismembered remains. Some warriors were deafened. The reddish fog formed by the damage numbers popping up over our heads clouded our vision. The heavy bombing was taking its toll. But for a 500k GP bomb, 1,500 feet is a joke, only a part of its lethal range. A few NPCs on the walls who had somehow survived the massive explosion kept shooting at us half-heartedly. Most of the guards had been thrown off the bulwarks by the shockwave. It was their minced meat that now rained on my warriors, discouraging them. The aerial bomb turned out to have surprisingly many levels of damage, which had been so conveniently amplified by Alterworld's physics. The fiery flash had finished off many. The mithril shards had got the survivors. The blast wave had picked up the remains, mixed them with everything it managed to tear out of the ground, and scattered them far and wide. Some had been unlucky enough to have been smeared over the ruins of the wall. Others had flown five hundred feet and hit the ground, pointlessly losing XP as a result of a death due to carelessness. Aha! And here are the breached gates, scowling their dislodged stones at me like a toothless old man. The construction gang dwarves had already set up their narrow Jacob's ladders over the spiked moat and even added safety ropes. Nobody was eager to fall into a fifteen-foot ditch studded with rusty lances, but few had a one-hundred-plus agility. Without it, the chances of stumbling increased according to the narrowness and difficulty of the surface. Boots rumbled over the tight planks. My officers made it to the spacious inner yard, the sight of which was shocking. It was a graveyard, a morgue subsidiary, and a field hospital all in one. Hundreds of gravestones, heaps of rotting bodies, and over a thousand wounded warriors, their HP down to yellow or red. Many were still bleeding, having open wounds and broken bones, which the game mechanics had turned into long-lasting DOTs. Injuries were countless. Plenty were blind, shell-shocked, bent double, or in various limbless disarray. Bloodless bodies were falling left and right, continuing to increase our kamikaze's frag counter. He had left the ground a lieutenant and landed a major. The best thing was that the loot kept pouring in. The overloaded officer moaned and cussed in the service corps chat. 
A small crowd of reinforcements scurried out of the portals, as well as shirtless warriors who wanted to return to the scenes of their demise and retrieve their equipment from their graves. Our golems fought against the flow, approaching the open portals. The golem that reached the target first began kicking the enemy warriors back into the gates like a soccer player. What a sight! After a minute, our golems blocked the portal slab entirely, cutting off the enemy flow. I figured it'd be best to bring a cage next time, to set it up around the arrival zone to create an obstruction and trap securely the incoming foes. As I ran by, I took a few stun grenades of various colors from my belt and added to the chaos by throwing them into the portals. Catch! No one heard the explosion, but the next group of Chinese arrived shell-shocked, staring blindly and shaking their heads like old men. Well, looks like our bros can handle this. Golems, archers, rogues for target illumination, and a few smart officers were enough to keep the portals covered. I glanced around, analyzing the situation. The ear choppers cleaned up the walls, doing what they were made to do, slaughtering the NPC casters and archers in their leather armor. The boys from the captured crew and the gunners were also up there at the top, checking out the ballistas and arrow launchers. The rogues zigzagged around combing the section of the yard where there were no visible enemies left to find the ones hiding in stealth. Close fights broke out everywhere because of this, and our side didn't win every time. There were some pretty impressive folks among the Chinese, some far beyond level 300, and even if one of them was missing an arm or had been shot through the head, a rogue level 150 didn't stand a chance against him. Calling for help in a fight like that wasn't at all disgraceful, and was not indicative of any weakness. The rogue's clanmates would rush to help, weighing down on the enemy like a band of mice on a wounded cobra. The crazy quartermasters would appear among the mop-up groups. They tore the locks off storehouses and marked the buildings with different color seals to signify loot priority. The biggest fight happened beneath the dungeon's walls as the surviving Chinese backed up into it. We lost warriors as we closed in on them, shedding fresh blood and adding more gravestones to the shrapnel pocked yard. The exchange was routine, about one on one, a hundred warriors per minute. Our guys got resurrected and came back to the battlefield. The enemies, on the other hand, lost their high end gear and got thrown off the castle territory. Their chances of getting back in were slim. At last, everything was going according to plan. All of the above led me to one conclusion. It was important to have a few backup teleport points. One portal hall was obviously not enough. The forces couldn't be moved around. Chances of getting blocked off were high. I wrote this down in my planner, then quickly skimmed the chat log. The analyst highlighted the most important messages and passed them on through my first priority channel. The current situation was, the temporary alliance had managed to smash the dome shields of 87 castles the first time around. Six more castles were rendered defenseless at the second attempt, with the help of backup scrolls. The others, who had missed their chance and had somehow lost their AMA wizards, were forced to settle for the second echelon's targets. Assailants had managed to reach the control rooms in half the castles. The rest, like us, were still fighting amidst the compact planning. Five of the attacks had become bogged down. Our warriors had been zeroed out or forced back beyond the walls. Looks like the guards of the First Temple weren't the only ones with quick-acting allies. Twenty more troops requested reinforcements as they had run into something really tough or simply underestimated their strength. But we'd determined each clan's reserve availability prior to the operation. I didn't want to lose both the precious scroll and my goal because of someone's greed. Sir, we've broke through the dungeon wall. Assault troops are inside. We can follow them. The aide-de-camp was anxious to go into battle and perform some heroic feat. Too bad. I'll have to replace the guy, I thought. He's obviously in the wrong place. Too young, plus madly in love with someone's soulful eyes and seductive body. This makes him ashamed of his low rank and eager to prove that he's better than the others. Glancing over the massive dungeon, I noticed a fresh gap in the brickwork. The children of the night warriors were pouring through it. The way the dungeon was laid out allowed us to breach it anywhere we wanted. 
our warriors took advantage of this. With much heroic effort, they broke through the 1,500,000 HP wall with incredible speed. I was sure that Snowy's mithril gun must have had something to do with it. I dove into the gap, cautiously looking up at the vaulted ceiling. Might they make the whole thing collapse on our heads, just like fuck y'all did while defending the cursed castle? But it looked sturdy. The control room operator must have fallen asleep, or the commandant didn't have a mutual understanding with the controlling artifact. The artifact was only semi-sentient, a captive soul of a mighty entity at its core. You only needed to show respect and overcome your xenophobia to make contact with it. Of course, having the creator's spark was also a must, no doubt. The scouts sent updated dungeon maps into the chat as they went far ahead. Logistics specialists figured out the shortest routes and sent the speedy goblins down the hallways. The goblins marked the walls on their left with fluorescent lines. We were heading to the control room, so we followed the purple line. The red led to the main battle scene. It was a giant hall in which we had trapped around three hundred Shui Fong warriors. They were mostly medium-level meat, plus ordinary castle inhabitants. The Shui Fong elite broke away. They were backing up slowly, reaching for the defensive barriers that had been prepared beforehand, and prolonged the fight in the hope of getting help. The polygonal passageway was studded with graves. Most of the gravestones had an amusing smooth form, with laconic inscriptions in Chinese. We dragged all the Slavic obelisks to the neighboring hall which had been temporarily designated as a reincarnation zone. Full service was provided. Resurrection plus an obelisk at your feet. A quick rebuff as you got dressed, fine-tuning of your online information, field repairs for your gear, and finally an encouraging slap on the back. To battle! We had cover forces at the junctions already with a rogue constantly keeping watch, and some fortifications like machine gun rings, a light golem, or some NPCs. Services of the rear had done great. They deserved rewards. The fight still continued, yet the looting was picking up speed. We seized armories and storerooms, taking luxury items. We sometimes took hostages, escorting them like prisoners to the execution block. In double time, their arms over their heads as they bent over. We dove into another gap in the closing slab of an entrance. Our legs banged against all the gravestones obstructing the long straight hallway. Its far end was set against a dead wall with several gun slits for stationary arrow launchers. Wow, a whole bunch of us got killed here. Despite potential immortality, it bothered me to see my friends' names on the gravestones. We reached the end, then turned. The sounds of a serious battle reached our ears. I glanced at the casualty counter and frowned. Fuck me! Did the clan just fall into a giant meat grinder? A breathless messenger appeared in my way. Sir, we've tracked them down and trapped them in the control room. I looked at the spinning counter again. I see. Who is them, exactly? All of them. The Shui Fong badasses. The Grand Prince and his guard. I nodded understandingly. You trap them, but handling them is another question, right? The young warrior allowed himself a smile. Yes, sir. They're all level 350 plus, and the clan leader is almost at 500. Of course, they're all a bit clumsy. Must have stolen slave XP to level up. They make such stupid mistakes. Still, we could use some help. We're getting slaughtered. Some can't even walk after the post-mortal debuffs. All stats are below zero. Lead the way, I commanded, gesturing my guard to follow. It was hot in the control room. It looked like a fuel depot on fire under a heavy artillery attack. The flames were all over. The ground burned. Homing spark and fireball missiles were zooming by. Waves of fire moved from wall to wall, avoiding their own, but greedily consuming their foes. Thunderclouds swelled up beneath the ceiling, disgorging lava rains, lightning lashing everything. Colorful clouds of smoke tore at the warriors' lungs, ate away their eyes and seared their skin with sores, auras of dust, rot, and fear completing the dark setting. Control spells played their part. The warriors went blind and froze up as they became paralyzed or attacked their comrades from behind. It was a regular gaming process, a battle in a tight space. It helped that we'd prepared for the raid. 
The PvP buffs and our gear increased our resistance to all types of magical damage, allowing us to run through fire, breathe in toxic fumes, and swim through acid. We sustained damage nonetheless. Sensations vary from player to player, determined by their respective imagination and perceptivity. But we held up. We'd really caught Shui Fong with their pants down. Their gear was pitiful. Their buffs, let's just say each had seen a different caster. But still they fought back hard, showing no mercy. They had the advantage of both higher levels and a longer reach. Five warriors blocked the entrance to the hall, impaling one of our teams on their blades and breaking the attackers into small groups. Spears and vials of various colors whistled over our heads. We were many. They were few. The Chinese had overspent, yet no reinforcements or supplies came. Snowy reached for his club and looked at me pleadingly. I hear you, I thought. Saw Bamba's gravestone in the hall myself. However, I had my own reputation to consider, too. I took out my staff, which purred with excitement. Scowling, I made my way forward. My clanmates parted to let me through. The black wings of darkness unfolded behind me, pushing my guards back and leaving me face to face with a crowd of enemies. A shadow gently wrapped my face in darkness, filtering out the poisonous fumes. By the power of God, by the strength of darkness, I pushed forward, making the sea of foes recede. My blade growled disappointedly, craving a fair battle and reaching for the enemy, stretching out so far that it became needle-thin. My foes were pressed like sardines. The crowd swayed backward as the Grand Prince emerged from it. Fuck me, he was a badass. He'd been human once, but his outrageous stats deformed him. He'd acquired a giant monstrous frame. His inhuman strength had endowed him with shoulders nearly six feet wide. His great brain distorted the shape of his skull, giving him the gaze of a wise old man. His gear was unknown to me. It was something ethnic of exclusive artifact value, judging by the numerous stones and detailed gold decorations. I sped up my consciousness, freeing up my mind's limitations as I summoned up the element of battle. The roar of the coming duel was already in the air, rhythmic as a drum. Possible attack vectors and dodge block space marks enhanced my field of vision. I smiled, raising my staff. Shall we dance? Even my voice changed. Corey Taylor would have been jealous. The dungeon's echo repeated my question, my voice resonating across the giant space. Everyone stepped back from us. The eyes of the Grand Prince were glued to the adamant blade. The emotions clashing within him were so powerful that I could read them like an open book. First, disappointment, a grudge against fate, which granted him an unfair battle. What did he have against adamant? An ancestral sword he stole from an archangel? Pah! So what was left? To die? He had this thought, but chased it away immediately. The thirst for power, life, and revenge outweighed his potential for such a heroic act. He made up his mind at last. The staff and I gave a sigh of disappointment. He'll flee, the bastard! He snatched a pendant off his neck and ordered, Kill him! I'll go get help! He crushed the single-use artifact in his mighty fist. Knowing already that I'd miss, I zoomed forward, dragging out time as much as possible. But an instant cast is an instant cast. I stopped at the line of enemy guards, coming back to normal time. I looked at the idiotic mug of some high-ranking officer, whose eyes crossed, staring at the pink blade pressed into the bridge of his nose. Drop your weapons or your eternity is over. I'll carve you like turkeys. Any cast attempts will be viewed as a threat and curbed in the most brutal manner. Those who surrender are guaranteed life and freedom in the near future. On the first priest's word. A deadly silence followed. Some in the back rows quickly used personal portals. But the rest knew that they didn't have six seconds to cast and that a Russian shouldn't be provoked. 
they were hoping to the last second that it'd all turn out all right somehow. I lightly cut one of the guards to speed up their decision. He let the blade drop from his left hand. A wise move. And the other? I nodded at his right hand. It's a no-drop, the chink groaned, backing up into his comrades to get further away from the terrifying blade which reached greedily for his cut. The staff didn't just lick up blood, it consumed much more. Those who had once felt its touch would forevermore remember the cosmic cold spreading through their body. Drop your weapons, I repeated. Everything went smoothly after that. Once the first guard showed weakness, becoming the sacrificial victim, the rest were more likely to follow. The Chinese were particularly susceptible to this technique. They're collectivists, and individual heroism wasn't the order of the day. Shields, blades, crossbows, staffs, shock and strengthening artifacts clattered onto the floor tiles. My volunteer goblins began weaving between the warriors, collecting their valuable gear. I am warning you. You will be required to prove the weapon's personal status with appropriate screenshots. After a brief pause, the Chinese dropped twice as many weapons. Most of them took their helmets off without orders, hiding them in their inventories and confirming their captive status. Somehow I associated a bare-headed soldier with epic disasters, retreat, havoc, captivity. After all the weapons had been picked up, I continued pressing them. And now, give up the rest of your equipment. Throw it off, don't be shy. If you lose the cow, you lose her milk, too. The Chinese exchanged glances hesitantly. Nobody wanted to part with a unique set of armor. When you reached such high levels, you could no longer wear standard clothes. You needed a strong clan support and meticulous farming of raid locations the Inferno, the Seventh Heaven, and such. I nudged their thoughts in the right direction. Your equipment is a threat to me and my allies. I can settle for complete demilitarization, or I can slice your thumbs off. With adamant, in case someone was wondering, your call. Yet more steel hit the tiles. The casters threw off their robes, the rogues their chainmail. Studying the crowd in their underwear, I nodded with content. A man in the nude is demoralized and unlikely to resist. I turned to Orcus. They're yours. Get all their maps and logs, then set them free as I had promised. I spoke loudly so that the helpless Chinese could hear me and be relieved. We didn't need any more humiliation. I continued. Search the castle. Check the dungeon again. Comb the cellars, the utility rooms. Put free warriors on the walls. Take all valuables. Orcus nodded, glowing like a new penny, and started rattling off orders. In half an hour, I was contacting the Mao's legacy clan leader with an offer he could not refuse. I have a capital Nova for sale, fully upgraded. I am willing to sell it for half the price with just one defect. Five thousand pissed-off Shui Fong fellas beneath the walls. Seems to be all of those who didn't flee to stick with the prince. You want it? Great! And you like the defect? Even better. I'll be waiting for your reps and payment. I winked at my reflection in a huge golden tray, then rubbed my hands with joy. Another seven million. And that was even before I counted our handsome loot. The Shui Fong familial residence was filled with all sorts of goodies. A looter's dream come true. Chapter 17 Transcript of verbal contract between the Mao's legacy clan and the children of the night. Transaction goods, Castle Shui Fong, zero. Here and after, the great Mao. Building class, Nova. Upgrade status, maximum. Total interior area, 90,000 cubic feet. Total inhabitable area, 135,000 cubic feet. Building density, 30%. Assessed value, 15 million. Construction integrity, 93%. Sale price, 7 million gold. Energy and artifact armament, 12%. Vandalism-free removal of castle inventory. The buyer receives the non-demountable items only. Mana circuits, immured stones of power and element resistance, as well as the castle altar and the minor spring of neutral color. 
Art, decor, design, and other interior objects, 100%, 1,311 points. Note, seller has the right to retain 20% of the interior objects of his choice. Storage and production capacity, 0%. Current, minus 84%. Note, seller has 24 hours to claim the inventory. At the end of this period, all leftovers are transferred to Mao's legacy. Battle log analysis of the Our Cause is Right Divine Buff Efficiency. Weighted average clan DPS enhancement had grown by 68%. A fourfold increase in damage has been recorded in a number of situations and personal stats. I recommend granting the most distinguished fighters the rank of Warrior of Faith. At the same time, 17 clanmates have had a significant drop in their PvP effectiveness. Four of them had their damage reduced to zero. The Special Investigation Department will compile dossiers on them. Splitting the video stream into scenes allowed us to single out the factors affecting the buff's action. Buff Enhancers Close proximity to the clan banner, an officer or the clan leader. Successful fights, enemy retreats, achievements, and loot. Freeing slaves, shutting off the built-in Chinese translator. Drawing historical parallels and awakening the lineage memory. Buff Weakeners Dying on the battlefield, equipment loss, injuries, and prolonged pain. Chat chaos, commanding officer's uncertainty, young age, or the exaggerated beauty of the enemy. Aggregate loot score of the Shuifong Zero raid. Loot from the 500 KGP bomb and the Holy Unmercenary combo, 2,411 items and 973,300 gold. Among them, miscellaneous trash items looted from players' inventories, 2,038 food rations, ammo, crafter components, and other junk. Most intriguing are the unidentified items, multiple keys, maps, documents, and hollow crystals. Sorting and processing will take some time. Equipment, 373 pieces. Artifacts, 6. Epic artifacts, 21. Rare, 66. Battle loot, divided among the warriors according to clan code. Loot taxes total, 1,210,800 gold. Loot value assessed by the Kravchenko Catalog and the Independent Module Loot Broker, version 3.11. First-line warriors had collected 2,300,000 for the buffers and support classes. Gear from prisoners went to clan treasury. 1,147 items. Artifacts, 21. Epic, 177. Rare, 781. Approximate value, at least 18 million gold. Castle looting. Still counting, only rough estimates available. Storehouse space rented from mules, 2,760 cubic feet. The following trophies have been integrated into the First Temple's defense system. Dome shield artifacts, 3 pieces. Accumulating crystals, 17 pieces. Catapults of various types, 79 pieces. The mules have filed a complaint. Lurch's goblins are rummaging through the loot in search of luxury items. They are impeding the prepaid inventory compilation and logistics services. We ask everyone to be patient and let the professionals do their work. The quick war we'd won gave us two days of relative calm. It reshuffled the cards again, passing them out anew and changing the lay of the land. Alas, generations have short memories. Again, someone decided to try their luck and probe the bear's den. The iconic image of a furious Russian bear rearing up, then bringing down its mighty paw, had impressed many. Its single blow had relegated ten clans to the lost annals of history, for they had angered the passive beast. A hundred castles had received new owners. The Maoists had unexpectedly made the top of China's political Mount Olympus. The Chinese cluster fluctuated feverishly. A huge reallotment of freed-up land was taking place, threatening to turn into a full-blown civil war. Only the shadow of the Russian big brother kept the young, greedy, and the ambitious in check. Watching over things, it sieved through the cluster in search of Slavic slaves. The rest of the revanchists quickly left our cluster, having found more important things to do. The alliance fell apart before our eyes. The homeless clans had lost 90% of their manpower. The global threat from the east had been eliminated. But the Chinese triad's rancor and insidiousness could not be overestimated. We had cast them off the top of the food chain. It would be a long time before our officers would be able to stop closely monitoring the Asian region. A lot of the clans of light had followed the Chinese. They took the big fat hint 
and pictured themselves suffering the fate of the Shui Fong. At least no one had a clue that the reset potion stores had been completely drained. The Indians, Vietnamese, and Koreans all went out of their way in an attempt to dig up as many vials as possible so that they could seize an extra castle. Now, loaded auto traders stood on the large clusters' auction markets. They vigilantly watched the new lots, ready to snatch up any precious vials at any price. The public bulletin boards were filled with clan quest announcements. They wanted a search for phantom dragons whose rare loot included the unique potion. Oh me, we wouldn't be able to repeat the miracle that had so shaken the altar world for quite a while. It would take months to restore the nuclear, er, uh, I mean the vile shield. Seriously, when combined with ABA, it became the mightiest attack and containment weapon. Yet the enemy grouping never shrank. True, we had forced the real foe to invest in bribery and propaganda again. The principled and hateful replaced the cowardly and calculating. Trash receded and masks fell off, revealing the faces of the real enemies. Well, the fiercer the battle, the greater our need to win, no matter the price. Whosoever littered would pay. The next day after defeating the Chinese, Gimmick had received some fine financial help. At last, he reported that the juggernaut was ready. The clan gave a collective sigh of relief. Everyone pinned their hopes on the ninety-foot giant as the new strength of the First Temple's defense system. The last time the treasury was emptied, the boys even gave some coins and mithril, as much as they could, just to keep the process going. We needed the juggernaut here and now, as it could alter the current state of affairs. Ten million HP— 40,000 damage points per second, a dozen fire point operators, a self-repair system, and a set of passive shields. Available power? Nine large accumulators. Fitted with an external mounting, it was capable of carrying two heavy golems and four recon ones. Its landing compartment held 50 warriors and had a comfortable living module. The nine-story tall robot was capable of many things. We were in no mood to celebrate, so we put off the music, fireworks, and clowns till a more peaceful time. But everyone came, both young and old. We took this opportunity to show off the clan's power and invited all the parents. Even abandoned and foster children weren't all alone. A serious undercover battle for these unclaimed kids had been going on for some time among the Perma clan members. Almost all the ladies, and at least half the men, dreamed of adopting a smart little lad or a fickle young cutie. The clan flags fluttered in the wind. The numerous enemy ensigns cast long shadows. They'd been given as gifts to the fallen one. The triple guard kept a close watch. Security goblins kept getting in their way. A bottle of champagne had the pride of place. It was strapped to the juggernaut's knee with a silk rope. I kept repeating the golem's name in my head, bathing it in the emanations of my divine spark in the hopes of passing some of its power to our clan's new wonder weapon. Gimmick was solemn like a field marshal taking a parade. His usual coarse simplicity and absent-mindedness had both disappeared. The ingenious crafter insisted that the golem be fully armed for its release, the instant he becomes conscious, he must be as strong as ever. Precious accumulator containers were taken out of the armory and treasury, along with sealed chests holding attack and defense artifacts. Heavy and recon golems came up to him, climbed the ramp, and took their place in their mountings. This was more like an aircraft carrier than a golem. I dismissed Gimmick's demands to allot ingredients and ammo for the troops befitting their ranks as absurd. Enough of this, Gimmick. You're like Durin, raking in the goodies. The fallen one's here. Don't make him wait. The crafter instantly stood up straight and took out a huge jar made of solid ruby. He approached the fallen one and held out the jar with a low bow. Your greatness, share your power with the artificial creature. Give him life. The god looked at the jar, perplexed, then raised a brow. How much? As much as you see fit. He chuckled, then smiled, brought his wrist to the jar's mouth, and willed his vein to burst. The god's precious blood flowed into the ruby jar, 
thickening and turning into one giant crystal of immense power. The fallen one grew pale. He was giving his true essence, not just blood. He was about to pull his arm back, but Gimmick sharply grabbed his wrist and said with surprising boldness, More! I grew dumb with astonishment at such insolence bordering on insanity and snapped in indignation, Gimmick, you nuts! The fallen one's face grew dark with rage, but he did not resist. Looking at the crafter promisingly, he held his vein open for ten more beats of his mighty heart. Then the fallen one healed his wound and snatched his hand away. He burst out coughing, then wrapped himself up in his cloak to hide his paleness and his weakened, shaky fingers. A portal popped, and the angered god left our plane of reality. I spat in irritation. Gimmick, are you out of your mind? Or did your brain rust just like your robots? He didn't answer, only shot me a cold look, clutched the precious jar to his chest, and activated a jump portal to the golem's control cabin. I exchanged confused glances with my officers. What the fuck happened to our crafter? Orcus frowned and jabbered away into the voice channel. The catapults creaked as they made a 180-degree turn and aimed at their own home front for the first time in history. Boots thundered over the robot's external decks as our staff rushed to the control cabin's evacuation hatch. Too late. The golem stirred, breaking the scaffolding around itself. The crowd of clan members gave cries of joy, waving their flags in the air. Unable to hold back, somebody even launched an illusionary firework into the sky. But soon, surprised and worried cries replaced shouts of excitement. The people saw Orcus's warriors falling off the ladders. The golem wrapped itself in activated shields. Its gun ports opened. Crystals began to buzz, accumulating energy and increasing their rate. Sir! Orcus cried in alarm. I already knew that the celebrations were off. A chill ran down my spine as I realized the gravity of the situation, my blood pumping adrenaline. Danger! Get the children out! Fall in one! Help! I addressed the god without hesitation. The ninety-foot golem, his battle lights all coming on, instilled fear in everyone. There was no way we could have taken him on without divine help. Orcus tore at the buttons on the collar of his formal vest. I have five security officers in buffer positions. They can't bust into the control cabin. All the hatches have been blocked off. A line of personal portals opened in the crowd as the quicker-thinking ones began pulling the kids out of harm's way. Thanks to my mild psychic gift, I guessed the enemy's next move. Instinctively, I covered my clanmates with wings of darkness in order to shield them from attack. Ouch! I threw my head up and bit my lip my virtual wings taking on 40,000 DPS. The damage instantly depleted my inner energy stores, which I was forced to use in catastrophic amounts at an insane rate. My body drained its own sources, emptying its reserves and converting them into physical strength at a predatory rate. My mana hit zero. The faith point slider flew downward, my personal channel to the first temple altar buzzed from the strain but the fallen one didn't respond. He had left, insulted by Gimmick's boldness, slammed the door and turned off his cell phone, like a big kid. How old was he? Five? Six? Bummer. Seconds before my energy would have collapsed in on itself, I folded my wings and shot forward. My staff screeched menacingly, itching for a fight. Snowy roared, running by my side. My warriors followed, falling into formation. The clan was in its best shape, remaining perfectly alert and acting like a single dutiful mechanism. Hurrah! We rammed into the shields, investing all our hatred and disappointment into our blows. We avenged ourselves and our clanmates, covering the children, breaking the back of every traitor in the world. Crit! 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 Our cause is right! Damage doubled! Tripled! Crit! Fourfold damage! The shield's film flickered signaling an overload and ready to give in under the immense pressure. The golem kicked out awkwardly with his mighty leg and growled disappointedly into the thunderous voice artifact. Out of my way, worms! Adios, fools! The giant robot laughed Gimmick's familiar laugh and disappeared with a deafening pop of a portal. 
taking a part of the first temple's inner yard along with him. Only at the last moment did I catch a glimpse of the sleepy, surprised white Winnie in one of the gun ports. Ouch, it hurts, Lurch sobbed in a high-pitched voice. Stop, quit stomping, get back, a few voices shouted at once. The rest froze, dumbfounded, staring at the weird sight. Having ripped out part of our reality, the weird portal had replaced it with a similar-sized area removed from its exit point. A blue alien forest about two hundred feet in diameter appeared in the middle of the first temple. Four winged birds fluttered about, an inquisitive three-eyed rodent peeked out from the mess of spiral grass blades. We saw the inside of a spherically cut mountain ridge riddled with veins of violet ore. Here we go. Durin wailed quietly behind me. Forty tons of mithril, a thousand plus pounds of precious stone deposits, twelve million gold, twelve items from Storehouse A, accumulators, a cold plasma synthesis module, long-range detection and orientation systems, a space rupture module. I turned to him sharply and grabbed him by the shoulders. Hold it. What did you say? Which module? He sighed sorrowfully. The SRM, from the delivery droid, Station 32. That's the last point our stealthers had reached. Stealthers are usually discovered earlier. The robots are high-tech enough to see the invisible. They all got slaughtered, but one managed to open a portal, and the delivery droid jumped in right after him, right into the crypt. Shed a lot of blood before we killed it. I looked at my officers. Shit! How in the world? Read my lips. Space. Rupture. Module. That name means something to you? and the teleporting golem. Nothing? Orcus looked like a dried prune. He hung his head. My fault, sir. I should have watched Gimmick more closely. Damn it, I sensed that something was amiss, and I sure slipped up with that module. I just ain't fond of space. I must have thrown the module in with the rest of all those processors, converters, and reactors. They all look the same to me. Krill attempted to cover for his superior. Max, the people are worried. They don't know what happened. They're spreading rumors. We might have a panic on our hands. I ground my teeth. This needed immediate attention. Now then. Clan-wide announcement. The juggernaut blueprints contained an override planted by the admins. After we turned him on, the golem got out of control and tried to destroy the first temple. The heroic gimmick sacrificed himself and activated our emergency tool, the random portal artifact. That's it. May the Fallen One forgive me this lie for the sake of the clan's moral spirit. I made the sign of a holy circle around myself, but instantly saw that I wouldn't get away so easily. The astral world grew dark. A black spot appeared on my karma. No excuses. Punishment could not be avoided. I'll deal with it later, I whispered, then shook my overgrown bangs indignantly and, casting a displeased look at the sky, added louder, we will reveal the truth once we defeat the Lighties. Gimmick will make our mortal enemy list, but we have a war on our hands now. We can't afford to undermine our warriors' faith in our special services. Lazar, who was standing next to me, nodded approvingly. You'll go far, young man. I also recommend you stifle unpleasant memories with something positive. Here. He handed me a standard hollow crystal. I raised an inquiring eyebrow. A gift from a real-world partner company he explained. Footage of NSA agents and fighters being neutralized on Russian territory. Someone big is after the First Temple. Even I don't have the full facts. But everyone in the administration got promoted. Some received so many stripes they won't fit on their sleeves. He humbly lowered his gaze and patted himself on the chest as if by reflex. Promise me you'll watch it. There's something in it that concerns your entire clan. I nodded. Sure. Gather everyone for a greetings from Motherland session in the main hall. Here's something to lure them in. After the session, we'll auction off ten percent of the Chinese top gear we've seized. The people need encouragement. Oh, and we're summoning Yavana tomorrow. We can't wait any longer. Lazar had a knack for inspiring the masses. I was sure he had a crystal stashed somewhere, expecting a critical moment when the clan would need something motivational. The video started with operating supervision clips. A freeze frame preceded each scene, the camera zooming in on the enemy agent's face, and a few lines from their dossier being displayed. Recruited and served at such and such, did wrong here and there, 
judgment in absentia in the High Court of Justice, elimination. This was followed by footage of the elimination itself. They used the most eccentric means. People were thrown under vehicles, injected with poison, pushed out of windows, fed salmon sandwiches. Hello, botulism. The grumblers had an impressive imagination. The numbers of the enemies and their ways of dealing with them were overwhelming. The video would have had a questionable effect on me if not for the final scene. The documentary was followed by footage from the Kremlin. The man known to all, his face full of determination, appeared on screen. He looked intently at the audience, then spoke. I, the President of Russia, New Russia, and Little Russia, address the pioneers of the frontier, the earliest explorers of the virtual worlds, and the heroic defenders of Russian borders. I call upon you, the children of the Night Clan, the guards of the First Temple Alliance, and all those who are currently fighting our enemies in Alter World. The audience froze. The warriors leaned forward in disbelief like children, watching the screen with open mouths. Our president, our guardian of the Constitution and the nation's pillar, exhaled tiredly, closed his eyes for a moment, then continued. I am deeply sorry that you fight alone. We can no longer keep up, defending our motherland shoulder to shoulder with you. Forgive us. Some in the audience sobbed, and not just girls. The new life had given us a childlike perception of the world. Everyday events elicited a brighter, livelier, more emotional response from us. We were not at all like the dwellers of the real world, who were weighed down by their years and boring routines. The warrior's eyes shone. A tear ran down Orcus's cheek. The former grandmas and housewives sniveled quietly. The motherland remembers us all. She knows the names of every single one of us. The leader of the children of the Night Clan, Max Nazarov. Someone nudged me in the back. I turned around. It was Lazar, who nodded encouragingly. I stepped forward to speak. I turned to the screen met the president's anticipating gaze, and instantly stood to attention. Yes, sir. The president responded. For your great services, which helped boost Russian prosperity, health, greatness, and glory, you will receive a state award, an order of the holy disciple St. Andrew. Proudly serving Russia, I barked, as Lazar handed me a gold chain and a sash. Colonel Sergei Igorov. Yes, sir, Orcus stepped up, just as surprised as I had been. For your great services to the motherland, you will receive a third-degree order with swords. The motherland was generous and had a great memory indeed. Everyone got an award. Even the lowest-ranking ingredient mixer in the alchemy lab got a perfect service certificate. The clan was shocked. The forgotten motherland reminded us of its existence, acknowledged our achievements, and asked us to retain our springboard for attack. It would defend two million Russian-speaking cluster members and a hundred and seven thousand permas from the enemy. I wondered, listening as the introductory speech changed. Hearing the president say my name was flattering, even though it was merely the president's pitch for formal events. I wasn't sure whether I had already earned the highest award with something, or simply received it in advance. Either way, it gave me comfort. Combined with the Fallen One's buff, the mission of defending the motherland turned us into epic heroes. But on the other hand, good old Max hadn't completely dissolved in the morose clan leader, the mighty first priest, and the cold-hearted feudal lord. The world's leader's attention did not flatter him and neither did the responsibility for millions of lives, now proudly dumped on him again. Or maybe the company was manipulating us, showing us cartoons, handing out virtual funny money, and craftily appealing to a Russian's basic instincts, home, family, motherland. How I hoped that it wasn't so, for our generals would be horrified to find out that their boys could fall for such cheap tricks. The Fallen One got back with us that very evening. 
Having learned of the treachery, he flew into an unspeakable rage, which turned into a black magical storm over the first temple. The refugees trembled in their flimsy tents. The light pantheon gods lost their tempers, thinking that an astral world attack had begun. And the fallen one was suffering. A young god, used and tricked by a crafty little human, for the first time. Chapter 18 A terrible sensation awoke me. Someone was tugging at my mind, insistently trying to reach my consciousness. Max, wake up! The fallen one's waiting! Lurch's voice sank in. Huh? What? What's up with him? He's miserable, crying and wailing, like he's about to hang himself. Remember the cleric from the northern barracks trying to hang himself over unreciprocated love? They couldn't get him out for almost half an hour. He just swung on the rope and cussed. Aw, oh, come on. I shook my head. Man, it's so nasty to wake up from a mental call, like a vibrating cell stuck between your hemispheres. Don't call me again. Shit, I mean, don't wake me for no apparent reason anymore. But I ain't kidding. Listen to me, or better yet, look out the window. He's crying for real. I frowned. What bastard had upset Fall again? I turned off the force shield on the window, waved away Lizzie, who sat up in bed with a questioning look on her face, then leaned out. Fuck. Fallen one? What's wrong? The god was sitting on the temple steps, all huddled up and sobbing loudly. Hold on, fallen, I'm coming. Without delay, I climbed out of the window in nothing but my underwear and with a shitload of anger in my soul, like a big brother who has spotted his younger sibling crying. Five stories and three seconds of falling, then the crunch of a broken bone. Fall damage, 4,177 points. Status alert, heavy injury, broken shin. Effect one. Speed decreased by 30%, minus 50 agility. Effect two, lame. Now the Ultra World dwellers are more likely to give you alms. You may also receive hidden or unique tasks. Duration, eight hours. Dismissing the message, I sharply turned to the god and stared into his surprised eyes, filled with tears of joy. His shoulders were twitching as he barely managed to suppress laughter. Fall, what's up with you? The fallen one healed my limp with a simple movement of his brow, wiped the corner of his eye with a white plush ear, and, still sobbing, answered my question with a question of his own. <laughs> and what's up with your jumping? I still hadn't caught up when a hysterical cry came from above. Hold on, be right there. Looking up, I saw Lizzie's elven posterior flying toward me and barely held out my hands in time. Damage from a falling heavy object. 1,257 points. Status alert. Medium injury. Broken collarbone. Status alert. Light injury. Dislocated shoulder. Effect 1. Right arm attack speed decreased by 20%. Minus 30 agility. Effect 2. Left arm attack speed decreased by 10%. Minus 20 agility. Effect 3. Club handed. Craft accident chance increased by 30%. Duration, 4 hours. Hidden task completion alert. Tragic love. A lady who likes you tried to commit suicide, but has been saved thanks to you. Reward, mutual sympathy plus 100. Attention. Task updated to tragic love with blood. Life-threatening rescue with the lover's blood mixing. Reward, effect doubled. Mutual sympathy plus 200. Were they freaking nuts? I looked into the piercing blue eyes of the she-elf snuggling comfortably in my arms. She parted her moist lips invitingly, her warm arms encircling my neck. I tried to back away, then swore and quickly set Lizzie on her feet. Frowning, I snapped at her intentionally. Sergeant Elizabeth, what's with this falling on my head? She only purred in reply, made eyes at me, then slung her harness over her shoulder, turned around sharply, and headed to the dungeon entrance. Her smooth, firm buns playfully moved from side to side. The girl simply glowed with happiness and love. Keep away from me, I thought, listening to myself. 
Fuck these manipulations. How dare she set me up like that? True, nothing seemed to have changed in my heart just lately. Yeah, lots of sexual drive, but that was good. What mattered was that I wasn't in love, thank God. Lizzie could dominate an ogre if she wanted, and I didn't need that. The fallen one snorted. Seeing the bones sticking out of my shoulder, he shook his head and raised his brow again, healing his unlucky priest. Feeling masochistic? I popped my healed joints and shook my arms to test them out. Thanks. So why are you out here laughing, scaring people? I thought someone was strangling you, so I came to save you. The fallen one looked at me closely, clearly seeing more than I was willing to show. Closing his eyes for a second, he whispered, Thanks, Max. You're a real friend. My only real friend. I grew uncomfortable. You know that ain't true. Half our boys would go through fire and water for your sake. So, what happened? The fallen one smiled, winked at me and opened up his cloak, showing me white Winnie in his lap, basking in the god's benevolence. Scratching the scorched ear covered with soot, he nodded at the Winnie's prey. Look. I looked and gasped. What I saw nearly made my legs give way. The Winnie's singed, broken, clawed paws were tightly clutching the ruby jar with the fallen one's blood. Is that what I think it is? was all I could ask. Fallen's lips spread in a smile. He nodded with satisfaction. Sure is. Screenshot. National Art Gallery, a work by an unknown artist, circa 4th century of the rule of Lath the Two-Faced, the era of the Fallen One. Mission. The Fallen One blesses the White Patriarch's tactical supply delivery to the Temple of a Thousand Sinners. I shook my head in disbelief and forwarded the image to my officers. This will make them happy, and they can hang Winnie's portrait in the Hall of Fame. The little devil earned it, unlike some security agents I know. Ava 4, Star Sector, Tumble, Planet, K8311R. The juggernaut was sprawled out in the middle of a blue jungle. The golem still looked alive. The magic lantern still gave off light. The turrets were moving. The force shield easily kept the curious, hungry mammals at bay. But the technogenic world had already bitten into the unexpected treasure, greedily sucking magic out of its every available source. The pearl sparks in the vials were going out. The scrolls degenerated, turning into useless paper. And worst of all, the accumulating crystals were growing dim. A few more days, a week at most, and the juggernaut would turn into an expensive mithril coffin to be swallowed up by the jungle. There was no chance of making another carefully calculated leap into a different world this time. The nasty furry beast had stolen the golem's heart. Inside the golem's control room, a man was raging, beating his fists against the wall. The absence of regeneration did not surprise him. His gaze kept shifting from the empty ruby heart slot to the crooked sign on the wall as he descended into hysterics. The sign read, Y'all's gonna have to do without it, Agent Winnie. I searched my inventory and pulled out a mahogany box. Opening the carved lid, I admired the ten shiny gold Hero of Darkness stars. I picked one up. The number 001 was engraved on it. I reached for Winnie, but he lazily opened one eye and growled. I got up and ordered sternly, Agent Winnie, hold still. A micro-portal popped open, and the little animal sprang to attention before me. Hmm, had Fall just played along and repeated my command to him? For your great service to the Dark Pantheon, you are awarded the highest decoration, a hero's gold star. Good thing he kept silent, or I would have been shocked. Yet the Winnie was obviously glowing with pride. He was purring quietly. With much difficulty, I attached the star to his cuddly fur, then stepped back to take a look. The shaggy, knitted brows and the gold star on his chest stirred up funny memories. I could no longer refrain from smiling. 
Winnie shot me an angry look and instantly disappeared, deafening us ungratefully with the booming sound of a long-distance portal. The fallen one ignored my eager look and slipped the jar into a spatial pocket. He then approached me and looked inside the award box. He chuckled approvingly, then passed his hand over the gold, turning the inscriptions into something more official. I read the new phrasing to myself. Hero of Darkness Gold Star, number 002. Highest Dark Pantheon Award, divine buff included. Effect, appeal to God, uses left, three out of three. Kick ass. The Fallen One granted his heroes the right to ask a favor of him three whole times. This would definitely save someone's behind more than once, or give them super high standards in their personal life. The sound of metal clanging distracted me from my thoughts. Looking at the alien blue oasis, which already had a medium-sized solid fence around it, I nearly jumped. Ole was digging his pickaxe into the violet ore mine. Ahem. <clears throat> Dear Ole, glad to see you on my territory. How are you? What can I do for you? The god prized out a glittering nugget, carefully picked it up, and replied without turning around, I already did it. Found a new mineral. Studying it. Hmm. Actually, this isn't a new ore outcrop. It's the result of a successful clan experiment of exchanging equal atomic masses between realities. Some troll, who was comically sneaking beneath a wall, stopped and butted in on the conversation. Watch the study. It's Morphite from Ava 4, where I was mining asteroids a few years before Alterworld. Extremely rare and pricey stuff, capable of remembering a dozen basic forms, altering its starting mass and volume by up to 40%, and, most importantly, assuming the structure of anything you mix it with. Toss a gold coin into the blast furnace, get a gold melt. Same thing for mithril. And adamant? I asked eagerly. Oddly, the fallen one answered that question. I highly doubt it. Adamant has magical, not physical properties. Its appearance in reality is but the tip of an iceberg. But even so, this is quite an interesting find. Morphite, Ole whispered tenderly, passing his coarse fingers over the nugget. I've been looking for you. How long I've been dreaming of an all-purpose weapon. Sheath your sword, and it will turn into a dagger, an axe, a shield, or a spear as needed. Or even into a pot, a chain, or a ladder. I frowned, annoyed. Ole would take all the precious metal for himself, for sure. Not that I wouldn't have done the same, to get a divine super tool. Fall understood. Ole, bro, what are you hanging around for? We're summoning Yavanna in five hours. You ought to be bathing in the baptistry right now, putting on cologne and fluffing up the pillows on your wonder bed. The smith god looked around in fear, hissed at the troll who instantly disappeared, then applied the hood of silence. I'm scared, bro. You won't believe it. Lurch kindly relayed me their conversation. I haven't touched a woman for three thousand years. I forgot how it's done, and frankly, I've lost confidence in myself. Oblivious to the deadly consequences of having discrediting evidence against a god, I interfered with an unsolicited reply. Just picture Yavanna the way she really is. The smell of her hair, the soft skin, the hot breath. You can't forget something like that. Remember her laughter. Your best moments together, the joy of intimacy. Emotions are anchored in memories. They'll come back, you'll see. Oops, why couldn't I just stay quiet? Ole's eyes flashed with rage as he grew beet red. He squeezed his pickaxe so hard that his knuckles turned white. I'm dead. Don't do it. The fallen one prevented his attack. Besides, the first priest gave you some smart advice. Take it. Humans are great judges of feelings. And you, Max, use your head. Not all gods are so liberal. Just think, this is a real god in front of you, tens of thousands of years old, who's just been diagnosed by a talking fly. Do you understand why Ole reacted so? Yeah, I sighed with relief. Then let myself go again and came up with a new idea. 
and Morphite can make a great wedding ring that turns into a nail file, scissors, a thimble, or anything that women carry around in their purses. I think Yavanna will like it. Ole nodded pensively, not paying much attention to what I'd said. His eyes grew dim. A silly smile appeared on his stern, wrinkled face. The father of all dwarves was remembering. Great is the power of a god. Ole's emotions thundered over the valley as he lost control. Thank the fallen one. These were pleasant ones. Lurch muttered in discomfort. The young hound's tails coiled up into doughnuts. The dwarves put away their pickaxes and hurried home. A population explosion in my lands was assured. Fall and I looked at each other, then quietly, on tiptoe, left the square, leaving the dreaming god alone with his sweet thoughts. Yavanna's summoning unexpectedly turned into a grandiose event. The allies came, forming equilateral formations that filled up the entire temple building, shaped as the Mercedes three-pointed star, the free space around it and the gently sloping hills. Ole was glowing with pride. It was rare, extremely rare, that a divinity got invited into the world deliberately, especially with such a pompous and respectful reception. I looked at the crowd, enjoying my own blasphemous thoughts. Thank the Lightsters and the Chinese for giving us a common enemy and kicking the Alliance members out of their cozy little comfort zones. If not for the massive invasion, who would have guarded the walls of the First Temple? Very few got violent, one out of ten thousand. This ratio was higher in-game, obviously. The imaginary invincibility, high pain threshold, and immortality all urged many couch warriors to perform military feats. But still, the percentage of those with an I-don't-care attitude was infinitely higher. They would cling to their castle walls, withhold resources and gold which are the oxygen of all wars. They would hope till the very last moment that they would surely be spared, that the guns pressed to the back of their heads would misfire, or that the cavalry would jump out from around the corner to rescue them. But now, the war was personal for everyone. Those who didn't care got killed first. Our cause had been proclaimed just. We'd gathered huge forces, and defending the motherland no longer looked like a suicide mission. The reluctant masses had slowly got worked up, brandishing their chipped swords in their puny hands. Their enthusiasm proved infectious. This is war. The valley now had about 60,000 guards of the First Temple Alliance members, and some Tobacco Alliance folks who had gotten dragged into the battle. Only 8,000 of them were warriors, and real warriors were even fewer. But still, I saw potential followers in the vociferous crowd. Many times I saw the refugees' greedy eyes pass over the free, rich, well-protected lands. Having recovered from the initial shock, their clan leaders had begun to roam the territory, surveying the hills, the snug fields, mountain ridges, and mines. They looked with jealousy at Fakyal's castle that was being built, fraternized with the dwarves, and trimmed their sails to the wind. The hostages didn't want to keep the status of fleeing bums all their lives. As Lurch and our security watchdogs kept assuring me, twelve clans or more would be willing to become my vassals in the event of our victory. Next to the immortal stood about twenty thousand dwarves. They had come to cheer on their god. They kept pouring out of the portal. Many kids, many women, gray-haired elders and warriors who had exchanged their mining tools for battle axes and hammers. Some registered as NPCs, others got identified as game monsters. I had no idea that so many dwarves had settled in our mountains. Sure, there were cases of individual dwarves disappearing, of shops closing, and even entire villages becoming deserted, and not just from our cluster. At times like these, I saw in my mind's eye a dusty column of refugee dwarves. I could only wish them luck. But I could never have guessed that most of them were heading to my lands. If anyone was to hear about this outside the valley, there would be an insane influx of those who wished to burst into the Forbidden Lands. Tens if not hundreds of players were looking for the quest dwarves that had disappeared. They wished to complete their quest or to get a new one or just to kill the poor guys for precious loot or for a third-party quest. The mass NPC disappearance interfered with everyone's familiar leveling. 
equipment, and commercial setups. The craftsmen and vendors were gone, depriving the gamers of the opportunity to learn rare skills or obtain unique ingredients. Commercial relations worsened because of this. Those who had discovered a few stacks of plain ancient stones in their inventories suddenly became millionaires, as these stones had suddenly become ultra-rare items. There was a hunt for old abandoned game accounts. Old characters were revived, their inventories and stats closely re-evaluated. Rare item seekers sifted through the trash like old-school junkies through old ladies' medicine chests looking for suppositories to get high on. Well, at least a unique NPC monopoly was just as good a resource as an ordinary silver mine. Nothing was preventing me from setting up toll roads in my own lands. And no one should dare assume that the valley is public property. There would be many who'd set impostors straight. From dragons to hounds to zombies, plus the dwarves renting the mountain ridge, the smart leadership and politics that I pushed for had long ago changed the life goals of thousands of sentient creatures. The valley was now their home. They were interested in defending it and helping it prosper. Everyone who attended the summoning tossed a handful of gold coins at the altar and set a potted plant in whichever free spot they could find. I wasn't sure that Yavanna would like the verger, but the important thing was that the congregation believed in the gift's value. Many aspects of the divine mechanics were largely determined by the most trivial display of faith. I sensed that if we all renounced Loth at once, the spider goddess would disappear from the world's matrix, convulsing horribly. The celebration shone with color. Widowmaker was having a blast, putting to use his public celebration coordinator skills. Circulars from the Smile and Wave series were handed out to all those present, along with boxes of live butterflies and various flags. We didn't know what was most precious for Yavanna, so we bustled about, offering the goddess a luxurious temple, a gigantic altar cut from pure emerald, and an enormous congregation of followers. Her husband was the bonus, who awaited her with a palpitating heart like an abandoned puppy. There was also a pile of gold taller than me and a multitude of blooming flowers and pots. I just knew that all this would make Yavanna weep and love us with all her heart. The Alliance's security officers darted about in the field, disguised as flour, beverage, and snack vendors. The disguise wasn't the best. Everyone wanted to buy something. My goblins goggled at the lines of customers forming before them. Lurch was furious that his garden was being trampled, but the affair proved highly profitable. I had to promise him handsome compensations and distract him with a stack of fresh gardening and landscaping magazines. Journalist accreditation was insanely expensive, but those interested were innumerable. It looked like we were going to make a few bucks by day's end. The House of Night Elves stood in even ranks in the spot of honor. Today... Their princess was entering her priesthood, and the prince would be in the gentle hands of the patroness of flowers, beasts, and birds. Most of the loyal drow followed their leaders, though of course there was some opposition. The miasmas of Loth's temple had poisoned the minds of many elders who were anxiously waiting for the princely couple to make a costly mistake. Widowmaker had informed most of the elven houses of the summoning by sending out messengers. But you don't change horses midstream. Seeing that we were on the threshold of utter defeat, few were willing to risk changing leaders. Almost all of the clans, however, had sent observers with generous gifts. The pile of gold grew, covering the temple floor and turning it into a fairy tale dragon's cave. The game designers had got really naughty when it came to the altar world's coins. Being the size of cents, they weighed only a thirtieth of an ounce and were needle-thin. Yet their cheat status of an indestructible item prevented them from getting bent, cut, faded, remelted, or forged. Minting quality coinage on your own was not that simple. In order to keep its weight and meet the minimum sturdiness requirements, one gold needed to be the size of a fish scale. And who was up for digging through their wallet with tweezers? Thus our find, 
the octagonal AVA-4 coins proved even more valuable. The 40 million gold reserve allowed us to put them into circulation within the clan. But I kept putting it off, saving resources and aiming for a valley-wide currency reform. Yavanna sparked the interest of many. She was a great fit for the world of might and magic, almost fully meeting the needs of one of the races, and also being an ideal match for many classes. Clerics, rangers, scouts, druids, and even stealthers. They all really needed the help of Mother Nature and her magic. As for the farmers, such a goddess was a dream come true. Charm a beast, blend in with the forest, create a spring of life, double the crops, wake the mind of a mighty oak. Oh, how much the goddess was willing to offer us in order to return to the world. Our opportunity to level up hadn't gone unnoticed. Even now, I was watching the commands from the lead officer's chat order high-level warriors to step out from the crowd. The pressure on Tianlong's walls grew more intense every minute. Few of the assailants were players. The Lightsey's invaders had aped the Chinese strategy and were now crying out in joy, bringing down the last of the castle domes. Oh well, dream on, guys. Half an hour before the dome shields would give out, the properties would self-destruct. The enemy would get a punch in the face, not a warm bed in the dungeon penthouse. Our cluster was raging. The crusades into the Russian lands drew more and more participants who fell on the weeping fields like hungry locusts. Several neutrals got attacked. Spots for siege machinery were being picked out beneath the walls of the castles of light. Appeals to partnership helped little. The invasion forces wanted spoils, guided by the rule of force. Several citizens hoped that the attackers would be content with a few hundred castles and leave as they had come. But I had an insider's view of things thanks to the GRU. I saw the full picture and had already exhausted myself telling others to join forces. If that wouldn't happen, we could all consider ourselves an endangered species. While the Lightsters were busy seizing easy targets and systematically slaughtering our allies, the NPCs of the Sun God and his Pantheon attacked the walls of Tianlong. Boy, was he upset over the Dark Pantheon's fortification. We were overcome with joy, having seized the opportunity to split up enemy forces. All were welcome, the griffins, battle unicorns, priests of various ranks and divinities, warriors of light and other such creatures. Their respawn took forever, and we could just use some extra loot and XP. But the fun didn't last. The battle was getting ugly. The enemy studied our tactics while testing and improving his own attack plans. And Tian Long was getting weary of magic, slowly becoming incapable of blocking enemy blows. Dong! Tired of waiting, Ole hit the astral gong with his hammer. I shrugged and stepped forward. I made a sign to my mom, who was about to receive the title of Yavanna's top priestess, to keep within the family custom. I wasn't about to miss an opportunity like that. I waved to Ruwada encouragingly. Hold on just a little longer. Ole was crumpling up the mithril handle of his hammer. Yeah, I thought, it's about time. If this badass god loses his temper, we'll all get it. He's one harsh guy. Barely keeping my balance on the fat carpet of gold and tripping on the generous gifts, I walked up to the altar. I placed my hand on the emerald covered with intricate fretwork. Boy, how the dwarves had mourned when their overlord had dug up the precious crystal in the treasury beneath the mountain. I pulled up the familiar higher being selection interface, momentarily picturing myself as the creator. All the gods are within my grasp. I'll banish Ole if I please, and summon Mnemosyne instead. The ancient Greeks considered her the most beautiful of goddesses. That's why Zeus spent more time with her than with all the others. I glanced at Ole secretly. Many things could have caused him to sweat. But did I really notice a flicker of fear in his eyes? His initial attempt at heroism when he'd faced disembodiment was now over. The sweet nectar of a new colorful life, the chance to breathe and to create, had surely overpowered pride by this time and blended with the instinct of self-preservation. 
the god would now need a very serious reason to voluntarily leave this world. Would Ole forgive me for noticing his fear? I quickly looked away and smoothed down my hair which stood on end. The altar's energy was off the scale. It made me think of a high-voltage electricity transmission. I scrolled through the clumsy menu. Folk gods, fairy tale gods, mythical gods, custom gods, aha, here it is, fictional gods. That's where I had found Ole some time ago, and I had also seen his beloved wife under this category. True, they were fictional, but along with gods, people had imagined entire worlds where these entities lived, gaining power and experience. We played them while they played with us, drawing on our power and quickly blending in with reality. And now the gods were returning. Yavanna, the giver of fruit, a mighty element, second only to Varda, queen of the stars. Yavanna, creator of plants, beasts, and birds, the one who brought up the forests of Middle-earth, the mother of the wise Ents. I summon thee, I announced, touching the appropriate line in the menu and confirming my decision. The world tilted and shook. Pantheon alert! A new power has entered the world! Yavanna, giver of fruit, the mother of all that grows, protectress of farmers, has joined the Dark Pantheon! Somewhere very close, a channel into the great nothingness opened up, stirring up horrible memories and chilling my spine. A flash of excess energy momentarily blinded the crowd. I blinked, hearing the quiet oohs and the whispering of all those present. That was the downside of my night vision and sensitive eyes. From underneath the temple dome, a beautiful woman in green was slowly descending onto the altar. Her pupils fluttered underneath her eyelids. Her face looked pained. She must have spent quite some time in the destructive emptiness. Unlike the demonic light fighter, the goddess came to her senses rather quickly. Her feet had barely touched the altar, and already we felt the first droplets of the strength of a new world. Yavanna opened her red, teary eyes. Her intense gaze passed over the temple. She stretched out her arms, pulling fragments of the astral world's borrowed energies. Her dainty little foot rustled over the emerald, drawing protective runes. Yavanna, helpless like a miserable level 1000 mage, wasn't averse to using even the most simplistic of rituals. Finally, she drew her first breath. The goddess's lips parted. She began to sing. Obeying her gentle call, the plants stirred, trying to form a wall around her and cover her from any possible threat. The valley's numerous beasts raised their heads, listened in alarm, then raced to the temple. Their mother was calling. Yavanna, my love! Ole cried, opening his burly arms to her. This distracted the goddess from attempting to contact the planet's info field. She loosened her mighty connection with the astral world and, finally, singled her husband out from amongst hundreds of thousands of potentially dangerous sentient beings. The goddess lifted a brow. A suspicious smile lit up her cheerful face. My dear, is that really you? I've promised that we'd be together again. Look, this world is ours. It wants your kindness, just like me, my valor. Aule clambered over the heaps of gold to his wife and took her in his arms. Widowmaker gave a starting signal, and a million butterflies of different colors soared upwards. Beautiful. The goddess let go of her husband and looked around in a completely different, lordly manner. Is all of this for me? Yavanna asked, pointing her slender finger at the gold. Aule nodded. She smiled. A fine metal. She waved her hand, and the gold disappeared. The gift was accepted. The system instantly converted the gifts into faith points and upgraded the altar by one level. Nice. Another reason for all the doubters to accept the new goddess. 
Yavanna closed her eyes and gave a quiet moan of pleasure. Turning to the eager crowd, she gave a low bow. I thank the dwellers of this wonderful world for summoning me. I bestow my blessings upon you. Pantheon alert. Yavanna's weak. Effect one, double crops on all farm fields. Effect two, double offspring for all pets. Effect three, magic herbal potions doubled in strength. The goddess grew noticeably pale. Aule grunted with satisfaction, put his arm under his wife's elbow, and whispered into her pretty ear, Love, we have very little time. We are invited to the Fallen One's residence for this evening. He's the leading god of the Dark Pantheon. And now, allow me to show you your private chambers. The goddess smiled encouragingly and leaned against the bearded giant. He blushed instantly, an indecent bulge appearing on his pants. The couple, reunited after thousands of years, disappeared in a deafening clap of a portal. I sighed, relieved. Everything went well this time, no surprises. I looked at the inner interface, frowned and accepted the long ringing chat invite in the alarm channel. Yes? Sir, it's Orcus. We have an emergency. What happened? Looks like an update from Lurch. The crypt mana circuits have been destroyed in ten spots. Some complex alchemic oxidizer. Droid respawn terminated. Max, our leveling up sanctuary has gone to hell. Chapter 19 A little earlier, the supernova castle of the First Temple. Precious Item Vault, Arsenal 4 The three-foot-thick door creaked loudly as someone accessed the incubator. A downside of game physics, if you want a room to stand up to half a million damage, you better have a massive door. I looked at the young children jabbering away behind me. They were the most promising ones. In other words, they were the most talented at ignoring the game laws. There were clerics with their necropets and wizards with two-handed swords on their backs. Also rogues who got their mana from hell knows where and skillfully mimicked the elder kids' fireballs. We're going in! The magic lamps came on, illuminating a dozen basilisk eggs carefully laid out in the fine frontier sand. Nine ancient, two wild, and one royal. All right, kids, who's ever decorated Easter eggs? At least half the kids got excited and raised their hands. Good. Well, we missed Easter, but these eggs we've got here are truly special. I guarantee you, this kind has never been decorated before. Throw away your chalk, pick up your brushes and paints, and don't forget, each egg needs a name. Can you all write? Wonderful. The kids crowded around the paint rack while I approached the royal basilisk egg. I pressed my hands to its shell, closing my eyes. Concentrating, I said in my mind, Welcome, King. I've completed my part of the deal. Freetown, residence of the Governor-Elect You have four minutes. If you can get His Excellency interested, he may allow you more time if he deems it necessary. It's five hundred gold, full payment up front. I looked at the gaunt secretary suspiciously as he said this. The self-proclaimed bureaucrats were completely out of control. They were the quintessence of corruption. Pulling out my wallet, I asked, What's the money for, and why is it so expensive? The wiki lists the city services as free and voluntary. It's only for fun and to help the players. The little power-hungry rat chuckled disdainfully. Win the election first, then you can have all the fun you want until you turn blue. But right now, without the governor's confidential visa, you aren't even allowed to sell balloons. The city master has a thousand ways of dealing with you smartasses. I shook my head. As far as I know, the election was purely symbolic. There were no other candidates at the time. Ha! You think it's easy to get to level three of fame? Laughable! It's a protective barrier of sorts that guards against shady riffraff who think themselves capable of running cities. Besides, why would we need to pollute the market square with campaign announcements? Siesta is for resting. And as for the town crier, we've found one, haven't we? I raised a brow ironically. 
shrewd fellows these were. As for fame, I was at level eight. You are a princess's dream. Oh well, this goon wasn't supposed to know. The shadow of the fallen one ability kept my base stats safely hidden from prying eyes. The secretary couldn't read my face and stomped his foot with irritation, making the silver buckle on his shoe jingle. Are you going to pay or what? If not, the exit's that way. The rat pointed to the stained glass window, clearly enjoying himself. As if affirming his point, the office doors swung open with a crashing sound. A few burly guards squeezed through it. They dragged out a helplessly struggling man. His round, frameless glasses flew right off his nose and were squashed under one of the guard's boots. The man squinted and said in a barely audible voice, What is this? This is outrageous! I've already paid all my taxes to the king! What's this ridiculous city collection? Ouch! Ah! He was tossed out the window, doubled up. His cape with the intricate emblem of the Jewelers Guild flapped one last time. Bam! Fifth floor, the secretary noted with delight, then stuck his head out the window and added, You are fined five thousand gold for breaking an authentic Murinelli stained glass window. In response to my puzzled look, he grinned and lovingly wiped the colored glass with his sleeve. Think it would have been easier for him had I not prudently opened the window? So, have you made up your mind, the window or the office? I shook my head silently, tossed him the money, then headed to the office doors. Yep, Rain the Wise was right. Lawlessness and defamation. Inside, an imperious-looking man was at work. He sat at his desk, writing something in a hurry on city letterhead paper. He spared me the momentary glance of an extremely busy person. Don't just stand there. What brought you here? Speak! I took off my cap, crumpled it hesitantly, and related the myth I had prepared beforehand. I want to open a business, an ethnic elven food restaurant. Sold a condo in the real world to try my luck here in the virtual one. His Excellency waved his hand impatiently. Save the details for your grandkids. I don't care. Which neighborhood? How many cubic feet? Investment size? Silk Quarter, the first commercial line. I saw a nice little place, 1,200 cubic feet. Investment, one and a half million gold, all that the McGregors have acquired over three generations. The bureaucrat's eyes dimmed for a moment. I could almost hear him clicking away on his virtual calculator. That'll be 120,000 for commerce power plus a 10% weekly royalty. One of my men will be appointed to the management as a means of control. That's all. You can pay on the third floor. Having said that, the man instantly lost interest in me and went back to his writing. They sure had it tough here. And what if I refuse? I asked quietly. He lifted up his head at that, studied my getup, then frowned once he saw that I was in a state of anonymity. Finally, he put down his pen and leaned back in his soft armchair. You can try, and I'll tell the ogre who cleans the streets that he's got a new place to dump shit at your restaurant's front door, and he'll have guards with him so the little guy can feel safe. Or I'll set your place as the new dump site. These are some of the options city rulers have in their interfaces, you understand? If you want, I could also change the royal pig pen excrement dumping location. Want to guess the new address? I even groaned, surprised at the numerous options. Boy, did the local bureaucrats milk businesses. I said with a note of misery in my voice, But how come I have to pay again? I've paid the royal treasury already. All my paperwork's in order. The man shrugged with feigned sympathy. Extra expenses due to the diarchy. Downsides of a transition period. Look on the bright side. This problem will be solved soon. Very soon. A dreamy smile lit up the governor's face. He gestured at the door, indicating that my time was up, then gazed out the window at the fretted spires of the royal castle in the distance. He sat up straight, glowing with pride, his head jerking slightly under the weight of an imagined crown. Wow, Rain the Wise had foretold this also. Some were getting way too far up their own asses as they waited for the revolution. The governor daydreamed, heading for success, while I summoned up my well-hidden state of being the first after the fallen one.
The soul and the universe are both infinite. Once I threw off the artificial locks, an uncontrollable power burst out, flooding and injuring the delicate structures of my astral body. Everything has its price. The aura of power spilled forth. The birds stopped singing. The flowers shrank back. Quarreling pedestrians fell silent in surprise. The eyes of an ancient tilted statue atop a faraway hill lit up with hope. The governor's bodyguards jumped, sensing danger, but froze under my heavy gaze. The fact that the governor didn't respond to the odd, unnatural silence caught me off guard for a second. But seeing the drool dripping from his mouth and his glazed-over stare, I realized that he was simply paralyzed by all the power I had aimed at him. Oh well, anesthesia prior to surgery never hurts, I figured. Helping the world's matrix complete the needed action, I tried to give it as much as possible to work with. Pointing an accusing finger at the unmoving governor, I raised my voice as I pronounced the verdict. You! Your presence is poisoning Freetown. You're preventing this place from growing and developing. You plan to overthrow the government, you exploit the people, and you covet the crown of my ally. Oblivion is a punishment you deserve. For making my wish come true, the universe charged me severely. It was as if my power collapsed into an abyss, leaving but a few drops at the bottom of my soul. The fist of freedom crushed the governor, tearing the delicate astral connections and knocking his soul into the great nothingness. How long he'd stay there, only the gods could tell. A day at the least, or until complete disembodiment at the most. Should friends and citizens rekindle memories of him with kind words, extending fibers of salvation into the emptiness, he'd be back. If not, may Loth have mercy on him. His empty shell sagged in the armchair, then slowly melted away, leaving behind a standard gravestone. Relieved, I cursed under my breath and wet my bleeding lips. I was glad that I'd managed to do it. I pulled out a portal scroll to the royal residence and broke its seal. The portal appeared with a pop. A moment of vertigo, then I saw the shining gold of the private chambers of Rain the Wise. He looked at me in surprise. I nodded reassuringly. My part of the deal's done. The city's yours. You've at least a day to elect a new governor and to perform a major cleanup in the ruling sector. I was sitting in my office, frowning as I skimmed Lazar's report. He tried to read the minds of the NSA and plan out the Light Clans and their countless mercenaries' attack on the First Temple. I definitely did not like what his analysis predicted. Had the revolution been on the enemy's side, we'd have been in big trouble right now. Constant tricks and traps, immense pressure and hits below the belt, attacks on the real world, relatives, children, finances and personal values, recruiting double agents on all levels, terror, blackmailing and taking hostages. Glancing over what Lazar had come up with, I quickly thought up some appropriate countermeasures. Ten warriors go here, a lookout goes there, magic signals here and there, pay off such and such, so and so, get one loose-lipped guy to talk. Everything went smoothly, although the available forces and resources were melting away like ice in the sun. A courteous knock on the door made me look up and squint my weary eyes. Lizzie was not alarmed. She kept sharpening her nails until they looked like last-chance knives. That meant it was our guys, most certainly with Orcus. Come on in, Colonel. What news do you have? What's on your mind? Greetings, sir. Your authorization is required. Don Lucchese's consigliere from the European Cluster has stepped up to be the clan's official communications rep. He wants to meet with you personally. I raised a brow in surprise. The Holy Father? The Godfather, a mafioso, come to the virtual world for semi-retirement. An old guard dog at rest. The consigliere is his right-hand man and advisor. Highly respected and dangerous people in both worlds. I shrugged indifferently. Hmm. All right, schedule a meeting. Collaboration with the Triad has brought us a lot of loot. 
Don't see why the Cosa Nostra can't do the same. And tell the analyst to dig up as much info as he can on these Sicilian boys. In a few hours, after everything had been arranged and the guests were transported to the supernova, Don Lucchese's envoy came to see me. He looked presentable, about fifty years of age, gray hair, crew cut, wise gaze. Most likely the advisor's real age was over ninety, hence the odd middle-aged avatar. The world tried to balance the exterior and the perma-player's self-perception. His level was hidden, but because it looked gray to me and purple to Orcus, I guessed it was around two hundred and fifty. That was why he looked at me with such respect. It wasn't often that he ran into players with levels surpassing his own. He must have never been to the Asian cluster. While the Europeans lazily rolled out of bed, the Chinese would already be finishing up their first level-up shift, gulping down their breakfast, then moving on to the second shift. The consigliere's class was also hidden. His old-school business suit contrasted sharply with the magical medieval setting making others feel like idiots in shining armor in his presence. I welcomed him and showed him to a cozy conference armchair. I snapped my fingers, summoning a waitress to set the table with the best cognac and light snacks. After bustling about behind the doors as usual, Lizzie slipped into the small hall, batting her eyelashes innocently and wearing an apron over her custom leather armor. After setting the table, she opened the bottle with a single, agile move, poured the cognac into glasses for us, then went to stand behind my right shoulder. Sticking her chest out, she cast an absent gaze into the distance, her hands down by her sides. The consigliere softened at the sight of the liquor. Carefully picking up the glass, he checked the stats of the thirty-year-old nectar and nodded in contentment. That's exactly why I asked to meet with you, dear Laith, to get my hands on this wonderful drink. I downed my glass, savoring the taste with great delight. Status alert. You have tasted the Dark Priest Cognac. Age, thirty-six years. Manufacturer, South Sela Vineyards. Master winemaker, Roland Buke. Blessed by First Temple's Top Priest, Grimm. Children of the Night Wine Cellars. Effect, plus 1,740 intelligence. Duration, eight hours. Without waiting for my response, my guest downed his glass also. His eyes rolled up into his head from pleasure, either from the taste or from the bonus he'd acquired. At last, he continued. What do you think? Who owns the vineyards in South Sela? I was at my best that day, or maybe the cognac bonus helped me out, so I scored a bullseye at the first try. You? Our family, he corrected me. When going perma and considering an eternal life, we decided to invest only in long-term projects, with planning horizons of hundreds of years. I nodded understandingly. I loved the magic of big numbers myself. And by the way, we're talking about real serious money. We've invested the sum with eight zeros into the vineyards, bought a few thousand square miles of frontier lands, morphed them into sunny hills ideal for vines, built nearly eternal cellars, and are carefully selecting wizards for the job. Sounds impressive and certainly deserves respect. I suppose you have some questions for me? I inquired to cut his prelude short, as I'd already guessed what the deal was. The consigliere leaned forward just a bit, met my stare, and rapped out the words with a serious expression. I'm just curious what kind of cellars you have that turn an inexpensive cognac of the current year into aged artifacts. Its presence at the auction at such knockdown prices makes our family's well-being in the future quite questionable. I shrugged. Did he really think ten thousand per bottle was cheap? All right, my bad. Didn't I have a good sense of the market? The Italian grew tense. Giving me a piercing look, he rattled off. Have you found a bug in the game? Bought an exploiter? Have connections in administration? Have an aging recipe, a time-flow-altering artifact, a temporary anomaly. Aha! So it is the anomaly. How the fuck did he guess? Goddamn physiognomist. I seethed with rage. Got conned like a noob. A cynical eye that dove right into my brain and pulled out such an important secret. 
As a person who constantly communicated with gods, I knew for sure, angering persons of my levels is costly. I was no god, but still, still. The air in the room grew thick. The lights grew dim, reduced to barely smoldering coals so as to be as inconspicuous as possible. My rage needed an exit. My emotions materialized into actions. My dark wings of power snatched the consigliere out of the armchair, crucifying him in midair until his joints cracked and his tendons snapped. The hint of indignation in his eyes provoked me to go even further. My invisible wings shot up, and the Italian's eyes exploded, spurting out. You have sixty seconds to apologize and explain yourself. After that, your blindness will become irreversible. It's probably scary when your vision just shuts off, without any warning from the game about a debuff or a negative effect, and you instantly understand that this is forever. But the consigliere still didn't give up. You'll become the family's enemy. I only chuckled. Don Lucchese will be at the end of the line, right after the virtual cops, the admins, the Shui Fong triad, the light gods, the NSA boys, and a shitload of others. You don't understand. A job duty is one thing. A blood feud is another. You can tell that to the sun god's mutilated mug. Thirty seconds. The consigliere swallowed nervously and made his last attempt to convince me. The dawn already has the information. Punishing me won't do any good. The family seeks friendships, not powerful enemies. I do as well. That's why I'm still talking to you. Fifteen seconds. The door was thrown open with a crash. Orcus rushed in. Casting an astonished glance at the bloody man sprawled out in midair, he said in a hurry, Sir, an urgent message from Don Lucchese. He apologizes for this man, offers you a nice compensation, and has a business proposition. I ignored him. Five seconds. The consigliere gave up. Wheezing, he dropped his head and whispered, Please forgive me. My behavior is unworthy of a guest. I barely held back a sigh of relief. I waved my hand, pulling back my powers and rolling back the changes made to the Italian's aura. I didn't want to mutilate anybody. My rage subsided, but I couldn't release him without jeopardizing my own reputation. Once you've bared your sword, you must strike. Sitting back down, I nearly groaned. The black vortex that swept over my body had no creative forces, just a thirst for destruction. The short-circuited magic channels sparked. My aura grew dark in some spots because of the severed flow. My accumulation zones busted. My energy stupidly leaked out into the astral world. Boy, was I hit hard. Be you safe and sound, damned consigliere. You're sitting here just like new, with freshly generated eyes, unable to believe how lucky you are. And I'm all set for anabiosis, for snuggling up against Kronos's cold side for one of those long self-healings. Grinding my teeth, I spoke. What is it you want, consigliere? As they say, get the light on your way out. Gimmick had left without saying goodbye, but made sure to eliminate the witnesses. I didn't know what his motives were, Perhaps he sought to prevent us from leveling up. Who needs high-level foes or angry pursuers? It was in his vital interest to make sure that we never find a second space rupture module. Perhaps he wanted his revenge for months of playing a role he'd hated. The role of a naive little simpleton, in which he'd endured slaps in the face and had been distracted from ingenious experiments by annoying routine tasks. We'd discovered nine locations covered with some shit underneath all that moss. It reacts slowly with the mana circuit's gold, which makes it the ideal insulator with a conductivity coefficient of zero, Orcus reported. The whole gimmick incident was becoming more and more epic. It's unclear if repairs are possible. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to work with mana circuits. Architects, golem builders, artifacts, and many others can set them up. It's the fine-tuning that's hard to restore, as well as circuitry inserts and general system syncing. Even in the best-case scenario, the efficiency factor will drop significantly, if not catastrophically. I nodded. Fuck the freebie leveling up. 
Let the droids spawn once a day, I thought. What mattered was to keep the octagonal coins coming. I had economic reforms to take care of. Plus, the high-tech modules were extremely interesting, and the commercial potential of AVA-4 was hard to overestimate. In addition, we could use some new migrants. We'd give them a bunch of technology geeks, and they'd leave us those who dream of learning magic. Our stealthers searched Station 27. The delivery droid's not there. We can't go any deeper. We don't have the forces to do so as of right now. I nodded pensively. I could ask Fallen for help, or Ole. The duo of gods would reach the bottom of the dungeon with ease. Plus, they might fish out that bare-ass mercenary for us. The only problem was that you had to pay for everything, and gods aren't too fond of solving mortals' problems for them. Guess we'll just have to take care of things in order of priority. Gotcha, Colonel. As for the crypt, we'll keep using its time-altering trick. Keep rotating troops and all ingredients that have had time to age properly. Keep working on those mana circuits quietly. Time's not an issue here. Functionality is. And quality. If you need to, feel free to hire someone on the side. You have my permission. Yes, sir. Orcus's eyes grew a bit blurry. He was simultaneously making notes in his interface. I addressed the most pressing matter. What's the Tianlong situation? Hot, and the conflict's getting hotter. New forces are pouring in every hour. There's about 15,000 lightsters over there now, but we expect it to be 100,000 by nightfall. Our cluster's all out of easy targets. The Alliance's castles are being taken one by one, releasing troops for yet another mission. I ground my teeth. Oh well, we'll have to meet the main forces behind the man-made event sooner or later. But the war had already turned into something bigger than a game event. Its echo had reached the real world. The invisible front line kept taking lives, while daily event reports kept piling up on the desks of key officials. At this stage, our goal was to hold on as long as possible. Time was on our side, players got tired, real-world folks lost interest, and any sum of money would eventually get spent, no matter how large. That's what we had to work with. Make the enemy lose levels, gear, and precious time. Less fun, more war filth. No duels, just a conveyor belt of destruction, maximum efficiency. Plus diversions, attacks on home fronts and on their wallets. I could get my hands on a few AMA scrolls every day, and that would mean two less enemy castles every twenty-four hours. Ha! We just needed to last one more day. We should expect the enemy to begin a major assault by this evening, Orca suggested. A virtual war phenomenon, a hundred thousand strong mixed bunch of an army, can't just sit around doing nothing. Only a continuous flow of loot can keep it together. I shook my head. I think you're underestimating the enemy. We've scared off most of the non-loyal ones by now. At this point, they're all pretty much ideological russophobes, plus mercenaries they'd already paid. Ideology is secondary. Orcus disagreed. Primary instincts are also at play. Once they learn how much they're going to have to pay for disliking the Russians out of their own pockets, the number of volunteers will rapidly go down. And the mercenaries are there to make money, not spend it. Thus, I do believe the strategy we've chosen is the right one. I shrugged. He had more experience. Perhaps he was right. I personally found the idea of giving up one's life principles for a trivial income to be on the crazy side. All the events seemed to come at us like a high-speed train. Time felt like a curled spring, creaking piteously under enormous strain as if about to break. The battle for the Russian cluster was nearing its final stage. The upcoming Stalingrad, the fight for the First Temple, was our chance to destroy the invading forces. I was not the only one to draw historical parallels. Warriors with St. George's ribbons could be seen everywhere. Many shields bore handwritten mottos. Such passion needed directing. Ancient history and the ghosts of our fathers and forefathers standing behind us gave us power. A group of crafters hit the crypt to return in ten minutes. The black and orange spools of St. George's ribbons were put out into the streets. They appeared even on squad banners and the Fallen One's flag. Fall didn't mind. His A.I. had been brought up in a Slavic family with many children, 
its crystal changing color every time as it rooted for the Russians in all those war movies. During his emotional development, he was carried in a pouch by young boys as they played spies and war games out in the courtyards. In the network tactic simulators, he'd fight under our flag till his sensors overheated. In a word, he was one of us, down to the last carbon atom. Even despite the fact that the manufacturer had later uploaded petabytes of control loops and behavioral algorithms, despite his having passed the Pentagon loyalty tests and receiving a limited AI citizenship in the U.S. To win some time before the storm, I jumped into the crypt. Farming was over, but the place was still crowded. Alchemists and armorers were churning out their goods, an annual plan completed in a day. The socialist five-year plans with their slogans now seemed like a joke. It looked like we would have all the supplies we needed. Terror groups hit their bunk beds and the perky-breasted servant girls hard after difficult attacks on the enemy lines. The enemy took no friendly hints, so we had to get nasty. Hordes of monsters, countless miner and farmer graves, slaughtered NPCs and empty shops. The vendors gone. My staff officers and analysts knitted their brows as they looked over the ultra-world maps and then went to bed. Getting ten hours of quality sleep while at war can really make a difference. Urgent negotiations. Couples spending hours together waiting for injuries and post-mortal debuffs to go away. This was the beauty of the crypt. The life-saving beauty. It had grown even more crowded. Even the abandoned spiral pathways of the droid dungeon had been turned into household cellars. Crates of alcohol and vials were piled up beneath the walls. Cheeses and meats dangled from the ceiling. Chunks of pig iron started acquiring characteristics. Cursing and the sound of clashing steel came from Station Eleven. The warriors, tired of resting, were trying to conquer more territory. This pastime had already turned into a sort of competition. Every shift, the new crypt occupants would try to force their way deeper down and seize another hundred feet of living space for the clan. Every cubic foot was worth its size and gold, and I mean literally, as the first temple's treasury, along with other valuables, was being slowly transported down there. Lurch kept silent, having an aggrieved air, but security was my primary concern at that point. What if we lose? We'll need something to keep us going. At least this made me feel safe. Our resources were secure, and the reserve supernova above our heads could always be reconquered with a little extra effort on our part. Losing this battle in no way meant losing the war. I dined late and was barely able to stick to my moral principles when one of the best House of Pleasure girls appeared with a silver tray. A cream of something soup, fried potatoes, and a hair shish kebab, simply irresistible. Neither her teeny tiny miniskirt, her undies peeking out, or her v-neck revealing everything almost down to the nipples could surprise me. But why did she have to hand me the plates from behind my back, making her firm boobs press against me, and as she breathed into my sensitive elven ear, damn its erogenous zones? And I knew that she knew what she was doing, that she-devil. It's not like I had made a vow of chastity or anything, but having fun with a girl on that narrow bed, separated from hundreds of other guys by a single curtain, was way below my moral standards. After dinner, I tried to get some work done. Messengers began bustling about, diving into the portal like they were being ambushed by snipers. But I wasn't worried. They had to manage time. You walk out of the crypt for a smoke, and you come back in a week. I made sketches of a few of the defensive campaign plans that my analysts had produced. I was no tactical genius, but the combat units didn't just come across to me as numbers, but as individual warriors and leaders with their different personalities. The 5th Infantry was a battle-thirsty one. Can't have them in reserve again. It might be bad for their fighting spirit. The Copperheads had just received completely new commanders. Several officers had gotten promoted and left. The new captain faced difficulties. The ex-mercs were reluctant to obey someone hired from outside so this unit couldn't be put in charge of a key location. The 3rd and 7th assassin groups had busted the Shui Fong Zero wine cellar during the previous raid and kept a thousand-pint snake wine barrel all to themselves. 
This kind of conduct was punished severely, but I didn't want to lose ten good warriors. Considering that they intended to present the wine at the public table during one of their birthday parties, we let the whole thing go. To punish the guilty, I resolved to assign them lots of degrading dirty work in the near future. Hacking up the helpless casters just wouldn't do. We needed to cover the second wave of troops and counter subversive acts. After correcting and finalizing the plan, it was time to add a little zest. Ready to play the trump cards, I began rattling off orders. All siege machinery was to go to Tianlong. I knew this was a terrible risk. Should the Bone Fortress fall, we'd lose millions of gold in pseudo-artillery. But this was our only chance to catch several of the enemy forces in the mouth of such a narrow passage, ideal shooting conditions. Also, we'd transport the special supplies to a well-guarded location nearby that included the aerial bombs and droids. I passed my orders on to Lena, who was in charge of communicating with the dragons. They are to take to the wing and patrol the entire valley. I had to do this, as I highly doubted that we'd somehow managed to keep our home portal coordinates in complete secrecy, having been in such a total mess the last couple of days. Slap on that veil of true vision spell and keep circling the great valley without rest as the wild massacre begins, I thought. I gave permission to officially thank Yavanna. She had made all the surrounding lands yield gigantic thorns for our protection. Moreover, we'd had to temporarily leave a few farm locations abound with various beasts. Hunting their unexpectedly pregnant females wasn't something we were particularly fond of. The dragon's main goal was to spot any portal that may have popped up unexpectedly, before it was too late. The traffic capacity wasn't so high, 120 men per minute. If we responded quickly, the threat could be efficiently contained. It wasn't like we had fixed points all over the territory, our wizards weren't that skilled, but we covered all the hidden spots and rolled out a welcome mat. Yes, we'd hidden the basilisk eggs in those well-concealed hollows. We had reached an agreement with their king in which they'd guard our lands from the inside. We were also free to use them in battle up to three times, allowed to lose no more than two. Once we lost more, the mutual non-aggression pact was history. Boy, did I have a tough time making that decision. The king had been calling me for a while, but I did not respond right away. My greedy pig wisely held me back, whispering into my ear that a basilisk is not just a tool for crushing enemy cities, but also a way to say goodbye to ten or even twenty unique artifacts. But the growing anguish in the king's plea and the death cry of a creature that had failed to carry out its mission helped me make up my mind. Greed or mercy? To fill up the seventh treasury with shiny baubles, or to resurrect an ancient race? Shut up, greedy pig. I sent a messenger to the dwarves to remind them of their allegiance and ask them to get their armored herds up on the surface. It was time to leave the furnaces and mobilize for war. Durin was to open the clan storehouse for the demons. Last time, the Silver Legion had permanently lost sixteen warriors. I had to make sure the fighters that Asmodeus gave me were efficient and able to survive, whether I wanted to or not. I spent a lot of time writing diplomatic letters, using every bit of authority I'd earned on the international arena. I addressed the Chinese, Koreans, Japanese, and so many others. Join us in fighting off the Lightsies! After hours of work, I could hardly stand up straight. I noticed in surprise that I hadn't even touched my coffee. Rubbing my weary eyes, I made my way over to the soft bunk bed. I couldn't lose any more nerve cells, anxiously waiting, and the chances of making a mistake would only double the more I second-guessed myself. Time out. Tomorrow the First Temple's immunity shall fall. Tomorrow. It's war. The Russian cluster's lands shook under the enemy's feet. The angered gods frowned at us from the sky. The special services clashed in a whirlwind of melee attacks. Hundreds of thousands of intelligent beings triumphantly hacked each other to bits. This was neither a game quest, nor a petty intrigue of some clusters over a rich, desirable location. It was a war. A war between civilizations, religions, 
and the ends of the world. The ground wept in pain. The astral beings turned away in horror. Castle towers burned and collapsed. Russian cities welcomed their allies. The enemy drew near. Refugees flooded the valley. The Alliance's best forces prepared to attack. Max was no longer just a clan leader. He was the chief, the heart of the resistance. One has no choice with crowds of frightened children behind their back, with the heartbeats of thousands of trusting citizens ringing in their ears. We don't start wars. We finish them. We line our borders with the enemy's tombstones topped with their rusty helmets. They symbolize our love for peace. This has been an Audible Studios production of The Battle, Book 5 of the Play to Live series, written by D. Rus, performed by Michael Goldstrom. Producer Mike Charzik, copyright 2014 by D. Rus, translator copyright 2015 by Elisa Bogodarova, production copyright 2016 by Audible Inc. Audible Studios is a division of Audible Inc.